Ian looked flabbergasted. I mean, he crafted the camellia for you, which is the most romantic forge mastered piece I've ever seen. He even made you a tiara like those Alina and his sisters are wearing. I thought you were already part of the Verhen family. I'm a one-trick pony, okay? Lit was beat red in embarrassment. Circlets are the most elaborate pieces I can make. I'm a forge master, not a goldsmith. I practiced hard to make Journey's present and I thought it would be a waste to only use that knowledge to create a single piece. But you made camellias for the rest of your family too. Orion objected. How many times do you want me to say that I'm a one-trick pony? There's no hidden meaning behind them, they are not some kind of family trademark. What's a camellia? Queen Silfer asked. After finishing her rounds among the most important nobles, she had gotten curious about the fuss between the Inners and the Verhen. Chapter 521 While inwardly cursing his bad luck, Lith explained to her how he had devised the mystical flower so that it needed to be repeatedly imprinted to not wither. Marvelous! A magical item that needs to be tended, making the person who receives it think about the gift giver every time they recharge it. That's the most romantic betrothal gift I have ever seen. Silpha said staring at Camilla's wrist in admiration, making both her and Lith wish the ground would swallow them whole. It's not a betrothal gift. I made it as a spur-of-the-moment gift for our second date. I told you it was too much for a second date. Solus interrupted his inner swearing monologue, I never expected to be discussing my love life with the queen. Why doesn't everyone mind their own business? He replied. You are a very lucky woman to inspire such deep feelings after only one date. Silpha kept stirring it, making the matter become worse by the second. My thoughts exactly, your majesty. I couldn't believe it when Kalyan Nuriga dared to call it a trinket. Dot. Journey was unaware that the ship she was attempting to sink already rested on the bottom of the ocean. His heart must be as rotten as his eyes to say such a thing. Isn't that right, dear? The king obviously agreed, and as soon as the guest learned about the royal's opinion on the camellia, it became unanimous that Lith was a sensitive soul and Kalyan the scum of the earth. Silpha and Journey were happy to introduce Camilla to some of their most notable supporters. They boasted both her lovely appearance and the camellia, making her wish a sudden meteor could put her out of her misery. Don't worry, Journey will take good care of her. Orion said while dragging Lyft to the ballroom with the excuse that he needed his help to finish the final preparations before making, the guests moved there and commenced the gala. I know we have never been exactly on the best terms. Orion sighed. I'm too jealous of my daughters and I've often acted like a jerk to you. For that, I'm deeply sorry. Orion gave Lyft a deep bow, making his eyes open wide in surprise. The past is in the past. It's no big deal. Lyft's paranoia got knocked into twelfth gear, expecting Orion's next move to be asking him to dump Camilla and get back with Floria. No, it is a big deal. You saved my wife's life in offer more than once and now you have rejuvenated us both. I suck with words almost as much as you do, so I prepared a gift for you, Spellbreaker Verhen. Lith inwardly smiled at those words. Like any manipulator, he liked to be underestimated. Also, receiving a gift from a forge master as powerful and skilled as Orion was twice the treasure. He had learned more about forge mastering from Orion's weapons than from most books. Orion took out a ring from his pocket dimension and handed it to Lith. What does it do? Lith used invigoration on it, discovering he had never seen a pseudo core like it had. The ring was shaped like a coiling dragon and it was made of electrum, an amber colored alloy of gold and silver. It had a small purple crystal embedded in a socket between the dragon's folded wings. Invigoration revealed that the ring's surface was covered by unknown runes of power making Lith's curiosity kick up a notch. It's a cloaking device for your ring. Or should I say your secret artifact? Orion pointed at Solus's ring. Lith didn't even attempt to deny his allegation. His mind was running all the possible scenarios from how Orion discovered their secret to his chances of killing the man if push came to. Shove, if he knows, Journey knows. There's no telling what contingency plans she has prepared or what kind of arrays are surrounding us. He thought. We noticed it the first time when we were fighting Nalia, but we thought it was just something you kept in your dimensional amulet. At least until Journey saw it shapeshift before you fought Thrud. Orion pretended not to notice Lith's shock and his cornered animal gaze, talking like everything was normal, I'm sorry. Solus thought. Back then my priority was our survival, yet I shapeshifted only when I thought everyone was too busy staring at Thrud to notice. You did nothing wrong, Solus. We wouldn't even be alive if not for your choice. Besides, it doesn't seem like they want to blackmail us. Months have passed since that day and Orion is giving us a gift instead. Lith replied. I don't know where you found it, but since according to my daughters you have always had it with you, I must assume you have found some legacy hidden in the Tron Woods when you were still a nameless hunter. It was the only possible theory he had could think of which explained both Lith's mastery of magic and him possessing a mysterious artifact. Orion waited for a second, giving Lith the opportunity to answer, yet he was only met with silence. Whatever the answer, you can't just go around with that thing on your finger. If someone finds out about its existence, best case scenario they'll steal it from you. Artifacts capable of changing their size to such a degree usually hold great powers. It could tempt many to the point that they would be willing to face the wrath of the royals to have it. Also, you're not a shut-in, there are beings out there that don't care about the association or the army, like the undead courts. Why are you doing this? Lith moved his eyes from the ring to Orion non-stop, like he expected one if not both of them to sucker punch him. Kid, you really are a piece of work. Orion sighed. I told you, you saved my daughters and my wife more than once. That means the world for someone like me, even for Journey. Maybe we'll never be in-laws, but you earned your place in this family and the inners protect their own. Lith imprinted the ring to make sure it was really without a master and not some kind of slave item. How does it work? Lith asked. It's standard black ops equipment for those who carry weapons which are not supposed to exist. It suppresses the magical aura of an item, making it undetectable to most creatures and artifacts capable of sensing magic. Silver is great for forge mastering, gold is terrible, but if you mix them together the resulting alloy is capable of conducting magic like silver, but prevents it from leaking outside thanks to the gold's disrupting nature. Do all alloys have special effects? Lith slipped the ring on right in front of Solaces. You wish. Only some of them and only if used in the right proportions. 
This kind of knowledge is imparted only from master to apprentice. You'll not find any of this in any book unless it's part of a mage's legacy. By my maker. Solus's mana sense confirmed Orion words and revealed more. It's actually even better than he says. My aura has disappeared and you now you appear to have a yellow mana core, a static one at that. Do you mean that? Yes. The hep in Martianus Distar was is not meant to hide her mana core. That's logical if you consider fake mags can't see mana cores, or they wouldn't even perform the academy's entrance test. She hides some kind of weapon on herself. The cloaking of her mana core is just a side effect. Chapter 522. Okay, it can hide your magical aura. What about your life force? Lith couldn't believe his own ears. So far everything was too good to be true. That's what you have to tell me. Solus sneered. We must see if it shields me from outside detection, my invigoration is bound to work on myself. Lith focused on his breathing technique and discovered that just like Solus had predicted, his mana core still appeared to be deep blue to him, while Solus's had disappeared, her life force, however, was still there. Tiny, almost invisible, but still there, damn it. Almost only works with nukes and grenades, but at least it's a start. Lith thought, I never thought the day would come where you would see the glasses half full. Solus chuckled. Now I'm curious about what kind of weapon the Martianus always carries with herself, yet that was a question for another day. Thanks, Orion. Does it have any other properties I should know about? Lith was truly grateful, but he kept looking around like a trapped animal. Stop looking around like a trapped animal, damn it. I'm offering you my sincere gratitude and I'm also violating several laws by giving you such a magical treasure without official authorization. If anyone finds out, they would take away your ring and I would be executed. The least you could do is trust me a little bit. Orion blurted out in exasperation. Also, no. It doesn't have any other purpose. Gold is such a pain in the ass that even with the purple mana crystal and a whole network of runes, one spell is all it can hold without crumbling. Lith looked at the coiled dragon at his finger. He was so moved by Orion's gesture that he almost set aside his paranoia, almost. Why are you doing so much for me? Binding your fate to mine is too much. You never liked me and our relationship is shallow at best. You're right. Our relationship is shallow. Journey, however, almost cares for you like a son and my little flower, well, that's not up to me to tell. I know she would lose a big piece of her heart if something happened to you, and another one if she discovers that I could have prevented it yet I didn't do anything. Orion's big heart baffled Lith more than his reincarnations did. He couldn't understand how someone like Journey could love such a softy. Lith loved his mother, yet he wouldn't hesitate to kill Orpal or Tryon if they ever posed a threat to his family, no matter how important they still were to her. How he could risk so much to protect his family's feelings rather than just their safety was beyond Lith. I gladly accept your gift and your gratitude. Lith replied. There's not much I can offer you, but if there's anything I can do to return the favor, you just need to ask. Good gods, you're the spitting image of my wife back when we first met. It's not a gift if you pay for it. Anyway, while we are at it, Journey is about to ask you to become our family's healer. It would be nice of you to say yes. Are you kidding me? Quilla is almost as good as I am and Freya is an excellent healer too. What do you guys need me for? Sadly, almost only works for fireballs and meteors. Orion replied. Manoha is unreliable, while you are the next best thing and you are always just a call away. As our healer, no matter if you're in the army or the association, your patients come first. We get priority in case of emergency and you get a perfect excuse to visit whenever you want. It's a win-win. Think about it while I let my guests in. Lith inwardly cursed as he remembered he had yet to set up the ballroom. The place was as big as a football field, its floor was made of cream-colored marble. Together with the light brown walls, it gave warmth to the room and gave the light coming from the enchanted crystal chandeliers illuminating the room the same tinge as real fire. Would dot a small bandstand with a low wooden fence to separate it from the dancers had been prepared for the musicians near the east wall. Refreshment tables were lined up along all the other walls. Food and beverages were kept warm and cold by their magical containers dot on the four corners of the room. There was a flight of stairs which lead to a balcony on the first floor, where sofas and armchairs were arranged around small tables for those who needed a place to rest, eat, watch others dance or simply wanted to spend their time in conversation. All this waiting and you have yet to start. I hope a major disappointment wasn't what you had in mind when you promised me a memorable evening. Journey's expression while pouting was cute. Too cute, to the point that it gave Lith the creeps. Is this the effect I have on people when I go from friendly to homicidal in a heartbeat? Lith thought. Perfection requires time. Also, I thought you would enjoy the show. Lith lied through his teeth, fooling everyone but Journey. How thoughtful of you. Floria, Callion, come here. Lith says we're in for a real treat. Her fake enthusiasm held a tinge of cruelty while she called the couple and forced Lith to go beyond what he had originally planned. Floria was still holding Callion's arm, but her fingers were barely touching him. The coldness her plastered smile emanated could have easily turned Mogar into a frozen wasteland. Journey had just served him an opportunity to pay back Callion for his words and guaranteed herself that Lith would not spare any effort. Two birds with one stone, Lith accepted her challenge, raising his open hands while he took a deep breath. His shadow spread from his feet in every direction, like a black sun that engulfed the entire ballroom turning it into twilight. A few millimeters thick layer of water covered the floor, quickly followed by a fine mist. Mogar had no underwear, Lith didn't want people to look under the lady's ball gown thanks to the reflection. That's it? Cal Lyon sneered. First magic can hardly be considered a treat. It's a cheap trick just like that corsage. He was unaware his words were not only demeaning Lith's skills but also the queen's opinion. Rushes made of light sprouted from the floor as six different kind of flowers, one for each element, bloomed above the water. A silvery sphere enveloped each one of the chandeliers, turning them into small moons while small wisps appeared on the blackened ceiling like starlight. Oh gods! If I didn't know we were inside my own home, I'd really think we're under the moon. Journey walked above the water, discovering it wasn't slippery at all. She tried to touch the rushes and the flowers, but they were all ethereal. I'm not done yet. A wave of Lith's hand made some of the flowers turn into small fairies that moved around the room as shooting stars darted across the fake night sky. 
Together they formed a path of lights, leading the inner couple to the center of the stage where a giant reflection of the moon waited like a spotlight for them to open the dances. Well said, Mage Nuriga. It's just a cheap trick. Silpha's voice expressed all the joy she felt for being openly contradicted in front of such a large audience. I'm sure you can do much better. Chapter 523. Despite being calm and composed, the queen's voice echoed throughout the whole ballroom thanks to both its perfect acoustics, and a little air magic spell she added to make sure all eyes were on her victim. Her majesty is right, Cal Lion. Floria smiled warmly while hugging his arm, pretending that as his girlfriend she believed in his skills and words. You always tell me that back when you graduated from the academy, people called you, the Lith of the Fire Griffin. This is the perfect occasion to show both my family and the royals what you are capable of. Cold sweat ran down Callian's spine as cruel remarks filled the room. What an idiot to blatantly slander the camellia again after the queen praised it. Said a duchess well aware that the fan she was using to cover her mouth couldn't muffle her voice at all. He's worse than an idiot. Said another noble dame that despite her human appearance Solus recognized as an undead from her blood core. There's no glory being called the Lith of the Fire Griffin. It means he is still considered inferior to the original, otherwise they would call Lith the Callion of the White Griffin. In his shoes, I wouldn't flaunt such a title. Lith dissipated the illusion he had created with a snap of his finger, turning the fairy tale lake back into a luxurious, but ordinary ballroom. How many first magic spells did you weave together, great mage Verhen? Queen Silpha emphasized every syllable of Lith's title. Fifteen, your majesty. His words caused a small uproar among the guests, but Silpha only needed to raise her hand to make the room silent again. The crown praises your skill and relentless practice. A mage's worth can be measured by the number of spells they can cast. Anything else is just empty air. She turned towards Cal Lion, her gaze lost any trace of benevolence. Mage Nuriga, prove your worth. Cal Lion barely held in the hatred he felt when he noticed that Floria was still smiling despite his evident distress. I hoped she had changed her mind about me, but that which was only digging me a deeper grave. He thought while taking a few deep breaths to calm down and focus his mind he hadn't lied about his title back at the academy, Cal Lion simply had never understood the implications of being compared to someone rather than being the benchmark. Darkness spread from his body, making the room become pitch black. Only after several attempts did he manage to make the shadows fade enough to see further than his own nose. He then conjured a thin layer of water that drenched everyone's shoes and gowns, making many curse his incompetence. After that, a thick fog appeared, which made the air humid and sticky. This seems more like a marsh than a lake. King Meron grunted as he used air magic to find some relief, the laughs following his remark made Cal Lion lose focus, so that when he tried to imitate starlight, his light and darkness spells cancelled each other. I'm not going to judge until I see the final result. I counted four spells, so you still have eleven to go. Silpha never averted her gaze, making him feel the full weight of her disdain, Cal Lion did his best, but like most mags, he had always considered first magic irrelevant compared to tier five spells. His attempt to use a fifth spell while he still had to keep active, and balance the other four made them all disappear at once. A second and third attempt only resulted in more blatant failures, and further humiliation. At every iteration, he was more tired and angry, until he couldn't take it anymore. I can't do it, your majesty. Four is my limit. Cal Lion fell to his knees incapable of looking the royals or his peers in the eyes. Four. The queen echoed the word like it was an insult. Isn't first magic just a cheap trick? Isn't great mage Verhen just a maker of trinkets? How dare you belittle others when you're not even able to wield more than four spells at once? I can wield far more than four. Cal Lion raised his head and hands, conjuring eight different elemental effects on his fingers. Eight would be great if those were not unlinked spells and all the size of a pinhole. Can you at least do this? A Silverwing's hexagram the size of a handkerchief appeared above Silver's palm.it, was the impossible array that had earned Lith his admission with honors at the White Griffin Academy when he was still twelve. Cal Lion and all of those presents understood the question underlying the Queen's words. No. Cal Lion shook his head without even giving it a try. His spirit was already broken. Since another humiliation was unavoidable, he decided to make it last as little as possible. So much for the Lith of the Fire Griffin. Dot. Silpha turned her back to him. We've already lost too much time. Great Mage Verhen, it's your turn again. Lith had devised many ways to humiliate Cal Lion further, but since everyone was already kicking him while he was down, any more could have turned the spite into pity, so Lith only did as instructed. While Orion and Journey opened the ball by dancing the first waltz alone, Solus warned Lith about her discoveries. I've detected four undead and one awakened among the guests, is Kaelin among them? The vampire from Otha was the first one who came to Lith's mind. He discarded the idea immediately, since attacking him in front of so many powerful mags was worse than suicidal. Both the king and the queen had purple mana cores and many members of the house staff were actually elite warriors in disguise, no. Solus replied. I don't think they are here together, nor that they have an agenda. All they've done so far is mingle and gossip. I think they are just here to enjoy the gala, any idea what kind of undead we're talking about? Lith asked while the royals joined the dance, quickly followed by the others, none. All I can say is that the undead duchess from earlier is the strongest among the four. The other three are nothing compared to her, what about the awakened? Lith and Camilla joined the dance too, forcing him to add his own feet to the already long list of things he had to focus on. A woman in her mid-twenties, but she could actually be much older. Blue mana core, so her magic should be a bit stronger than yours, but her physical prowess is inferior to yours. I wonder why all the awakened we meet have this trait in common. Solus pondered, probably because I awakened at birth. Even if they were born with better mana cores than mine, my body has been refined while it developed whereas there's need to slowly adapt. Are you sure you can afford to dance? Camilla's worried voice interrupted their mind link. Keeping so many spells active at once must be excruciating. I've never seen you with such a stern expression. She wasn't far from the truth. Lith could either speak with Solus or with her, he didn't have the strength to do both. Chapter 524. I don't care what we do. As long as we are together it's a date to me. Camilla moved her right hand from Lith's shoulder to his cheek, caressing it gently. That simple gesture filled him with joy. Thanks, but there's no need for that. 
I was just thinking about how lucky I am to have you in my life. His smile and words made Camilla's heart pound. Lith wasn't one for sweet talk, he would only say such things when he meant them. Lith took a deep breath, using invigoration to replenish part of his mana and release death vision from its fetters. In his eyes, the entire ballroom turned into a grotesque nightmare where rotten corpses danced amid blood spatters. He tried not to look around, focusing only on Camilla's smile. As long as she was between his arms, she was safe from death vision's effects. A beacon of life in a sea of dead bodies, if I don't suppress death vision, I've more than enough mental strength to do everything at once. Camilla deserves to enjoy her first gala without having to constantly worry about me. He thought, she's so sweet and unaware of all the bad things which happened to me in the past. When I'm with her, I can forget about everything but the present. Camilla is my second chance, my opportunity to start from scratch. The only silver lining of death vision was that it allowed Lith to immediately spot the undead among the crowd. They were the only ones that would not age nor die of poison or illness, they weren't paying any attention to him, so he was careful not to stare while using their deaths to discern their nature. Point one of them would oddly always die in the same way. Her disguise reverted into a desiccated corpse before it turned to dust. Yet there was no sign of spells or injury, her body would simply collapse as if the magic animating it was gone. As if a switch had been flipped. Another would only die when his head was destroyed or his heart pierced. After that, his body would turn into ashes. The other two seemed to be much easier to kill. No matter if by weapon or spell, when their bodies sustained enough damage, they would respectively turn into a pool of water and be set ablaze. Lith was wondering why the bestiary stored inside Solaspedia didn't include the details about what happened after destroying an undead when the music ended, that information would allow me to use death vision to identify them. Without it I can only get a faint idea about their weak points. He inwardly griped. Between facing that cow lion jerk, meeting the royals, and being introduced to all those nobles like I'm some sort of a princess, I've really had too much excitement for one evening. I need a little rest. Camilla's cheeks were flushed red from the dancing but she wasn't tired. She was just worried about Lith and was giving him an excuse to relax a bit. Lith understood her intentions immediately and accompanied her to the first floor, where they were offered food and drinks by the waiters. How do you feel? She prompted after asking the staff to move a chair near the balcony for him, so that he wouldn't lose visual contact with his spells and with it the surgical control he had been exerting on them. Much better, thanks. Her care moved Lith so deeply that he would have kissed her if the rules of etiquette didn't strictly forbid public displays of affection. You were right. I let my anger get the better of me. Maintaining fifteen spells that interact with each other and the guests is a bit too much, even for me. He sighed as he moved the spotlight on the royal couple for the next dance. Why did you do it? That jerk isn't worth this much effort. Camilla switched his glass of wine with grape juice. Lith needed focus and energy, not to get drunk. But you are. He replied while taking a sip. After what he did to you, Mage Nuriga needed a royal beating. Lith had a hard time keeping the edge off his voice and his murderous impulses under control. His instinct had marked Cal Lion as an enemy, and he wasn't used to giving them a second chance, killing him was out of the question. Too many witnesses and too many arrays. More importantly, he didn't want to scare Camilla or his family. Some aspects of his life had to remain hidden. I in the opposite corner of the room, the inner siblings were resting their feet. Between handling the preparations and welcoming their guests, it was their first opportunity in hours to sit. Floria was in no mood to dance. After a single dance as a formality, Cal Lion had left the gala with the excuse of feeling ill. She had lost her date and her source of entertainment. Misery loves company and Floria was no exception. Seeing his anguish at every snarky remark he was the target of whenever they met another couple on the dance floor, was the only relief for her wounded pride. They had yet to get to the point where she started to plan their future together, but she had fallen for Callian's ruse enough that she had hoped there could be one. Freya had no date and was happier that way. Quilla was brooding because her boyfriend, Anathor, had not attended the gala, making her suspicion that he was just playing with her feelings even stronger. They also felt guilty for not defending Camilla when Cal Lion had tried to embarrass her. Orion's words had stung and even though Lyft didn't add anything, his disappointed look spoke volumes. Usually, I wouldn't approve of that guy. Gunyan, the eldest brother, pointed at Lyft with his glass, tired of his sister stealing glances at the couple and sighing. He's shorter than me and seems weaker than dad, but compared to that other guy at least he has talent. I think you made a mistake letting so much time pass. Is this your opinion, or are you borrowing moms as usual? Floria rebuked. For once, I'm with the beanpole. Tulian, the profligate brother, was shorter than Floria. He was 1.73 meters tall with blonde hair and blue eyes. He had taken his looks from his mother's side, yet where his attitude came from was still a mystery. Of all the boyfriends you've had, I've never seen you as happy as when you and the little monster were together. You know I like people staying out of my personal life just like I stay out of theirs, but I have to ask. What went so wrong that you decided on such a clean break? I mean, even Gunyan can tell you still have feelings for him. Gunyan nodded, not taking his brother's words as an insult so much as truth. He had been raised as the future lord, betrothed before he was ten years old and married right after he came of age. His skills lay in numbers, business, and politics. Everything else was just a means to an end, the glory of Hauseners. Chapter 525 During my fourth year at the White Griffin, I only approached him because I needed a friend. I was tired of everyone around me, even my family, trying to turn me into the person they believed I was meant to be. Floria cast a hush spell, to make sure no one would eavesdrop. Over time, I came to like Lith more and more not because he was powerful or talented, but because he was the only one that saw me for who I was and accepted me anyway. He never cared if I always had a sword with me or if I wore pants instead of a dress. It was liberating after being weighed, measured, and found wanting all my life, no matter how much effort I put in. Aside from Quilla, they could all relate to her words. Belonging to a noble family meant a life of duty, and competing with everyone from birth, no matter if they were peers or family members. That was the reason why during the academy both Freya and Floria were considering running away from their respective families. Why Gunyan's whole existence was devoted to ensuring their bloodline would thrive and continue. Tulian had chosen to become the Inez's black sheep to escape from such a destiny. Our relationship wasn't all sunshine and rainbows. There were too many silences, too many secrets between us. 
I waited for him to open up and tell me, but he never did. Breaking up with him was painful, but it was the right thing to do. We both needed space to grow and we did. Do you think Lith has opened up to Camilla? Quilla asked. No. Floria shook her head. How can you be so sure? Because I asked him. After all the things Mom told us about them, I hoped that Lith had finally found someone capable of cracking his shell, or at least someone he is able to show his weaknesses to. I can only pray that Camilla is stronger than I was, otherwise she's destined to follow the same path as I did. Floria sighed. Let me get this straight. Tulian looked her in the eyes. After scoping out the competition, you went straight to him to see how solid their relationship is. I don't know what you two talked about, but it's pretty clear that Lith must have shared something with you that he didn't with Camilla. So now you're waiting for them to break up to catch him on the rebound and make him open up when he's at his weakest. Your plan is vicious, cruel, and cunning. Mom will be proud of you. Agreed. Gunyan nodded, making Floria facepalm, I simply meant that, even though Lith has changed for the better during the past four years, it's still not enough. At least for me. Without trust and friendship, love is too fragile a feeling to last, the more you love someone, the more painful it is when you realize they have always kept you at the fringes of their heart. She thought dot asterisk 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 after several dances, the king had the musicians stop. Everyone on the first floor came down to the ballroom, leaving a circular space around the royals. My dear subjects, I'm glad to see that even the most reclusive among us have accepted my invitation and took part in the gala. I hope you've been enjoying the evening. Lith didn't miss how the king had looked directly at the undead during the first part of his speech. Tonight, we haven't assembled only to enjoy each other's company, but also to honor and pay our respects to those who have loyally served the kingdom, even at great personal cost, Lady Journeyers. Step forward. Journey did as instructed, kneeling in front of the royals with her head down. Houseiners has always been one of the pillars of our kingdom, but your meritorious acts as a royal constable have exceeded what any of your forefathers have ever done. For that, you are promoted to the rank of Archon. The crowd was left astounded. Archons were the supreme magistrates in charge of supervising the work of royal constables. It was a role usually reserved for members of the royal family because the authority it granted was second only to the crown itself. Stand up, Archoniners, and take the insignia of your new role. Journey obeyed, her face was a mask of joy and respect. Yet Lith could see she wasn't happy. Being an Archon meant more work, more danger, more enemies, I was expecting to be promoted to head constable, not this. Journey thought. There must be internal strife within the royal family, and the king needs someone he can trust. Great Mage Verhen, step forward. The king said as soon as Journey left the center stage. House Verhen is young and you are its very foundation. For freeing the kingdom of the eternal threat of the Black Star, for protecting the city of Otha, and for your contributions in vanquishing the monster outbreaks, I bestow upon you the title of Spellbreaker. You are hereby recognized as one of the kingdom's most trusted elite in dealing with rogue mags, and as such your help will be required in times of need. The title grants you the title of Baron and the annuities it deserves even though it comes with no fief. Money for my research and no new responsibilities. Lith inwardly sighed in relief. After what had just happened to Journey, he was afraid that his reward was going to be bittersweet too. Dot asterisk 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 after the gala, Camilla exchanged communication rooms with Quilla and Freya. They were truly sorry for what had happened with Cal Lion and were willing to make it up to her, they seemed to be sincere, but even if they are not, they are still part of Lady Inez's family and most importantly a part of Lith's life. He's very fond of them, so they deserve a chance. Besides, it would be nice to hear something about their days at the academy. Lith has never talked about his past except after I explained to him why I'm estranged from my family. I guess he's the kind of man who opens up only if I do it first. Or maybe I should just ask him instead on walking on eggshells, gods, now that he's a baron, my colleagues will never let me hear the end of it. Camilla thought, Journey and Lith congratulated each other, and so did their respective families. To Camilla Journey said, be ready to assume your role as field assistant constable. Now that I'm an Arkan and Lith is a spellbreaker, I'm sure that your application will coincidentally take priority. Her voice oozed sarcasm. I hope I don't have to wait for more years to see you again. Floria said with a sad smile. I'm only half responsible for that. You have my contact rune and I doubt it would be hard for a captain to locate a lieutenant. Lith stressed his point by giving her a salute. Even if you choose to avoid spellbreaker smartass here, feel free to visit us anytime. We missed you a lot and so did the kids. Rena hugged Floria, making her feel guilty for her prolonged absence. I'll visit you when I get my next leave. Unless it's a sick leave, I should have enough time. Don't worry, dear. Journey chuckled. I've asked Lyft to become our family healer and he accepted. The next time you get injured in action, I'll make sure you receive proper care. Chapter 526 Lyft resumed his duty as a ranger and since he had used most of his free days preparing for the gala and recovering from the clash with Tesca, his schedule was very busy, Chinyu, Freya, and Quilla would have to wait for their turn before he could help them. Weeks passed and soon the entirety of the north was covered in snow. Most of the time he was called to quell the riots caused by the lack of food in poor neighborhoods, or to discipline merchants who ignored the tiered food prices imposed by the crown thanks to the support of local mercenary guilds. The insides of Solus's tower had been completely redecorated with the coat of arms Lith had chosen for his household. It depicted a black and red dragon coiled around a tower. A magic staff and a sword were crossed below the tower, now it was embroidered on every carpet, curtain, and tapestry in every room. You really have great taste in coat of arms. Solus was proud of her complete form standing proud in the middle. Why the dragon? Is it because of what Floria said? She asked feigning simple curiosity. No. It's because dragons are symbols of power while demons are a symbol of misfortune. I already have the reputation of being bad luck, there's no reason to give more fuel to those rumors. Can you please remove some of the banners? I find them tacky. How can you say that? I even mimic the positioning they have inside Houseners and you've always said their house is classy. Solus was outraged at being called tacky. It's classy because with so much space and high-end furniture you can ignore those tacky coats of arms. Maybe it's because you are a shorty that you don't realize that the tower feels cramped with so much crap. He chuckled, ever since he had seen her light body after they merged for the second time, Solus had become sensitive about height issues. 
It had gotten even worse after Lith had grown so tall. I'm not short, you insensitive jerk. I'm petite, there's a big difference, Lith's army amulet interrupted their quarrel. Ranger Verhen, what's your status? Camilla's voice was worried. I'm still a bachelor, but who knows what the future holds. I meant your position. There is a huge snowstorm approaching the spot of your last report. Don't worry, I've created an underground cave as shelter. He said as Solus walked them from Lucia back to the north and modified the appearance of the tower entrance to resemble an actual cave. Lith gave Solus thumbs up for her excellent work and activated the hologram function. How are you? Do you have enough food? The storm may last a few days. Camilla was relieved that the cave was deep enough she couldn't even hear the wind. I have plenty of food. Anything else? Yes. As soon as the snowstorm ends, you're expected in Jambel. They have a problem with a dungeon. A dungeon? This time of the year? Lith didn't bother to hide his disbelief. Unlike in Earth's video games, dungeons didn't magically appear out of nowhere, monsters were chaotic and bloodthirsty creatures, unwilling to cooperate even with members of their own tribe, let alone with other species. Sometimes, however, a monster with great power and intellect was born. That kind of creature was capable of enslaving all the other tribes in the surroundings and create an underground fortress thanks to Earth magic. Such places were called dungeons or labyrinths and they were chock full of monsters and traps. Any sane person would stay far away from them and call the army the moment people started to disappear. Yes and yes. It's odd because there has been no sign of monster activity for months there, yet the town has been already attacked twice during the last week by a group composed of different creatures. How did they survive the encounter? Winter is a great shield. Deep snow slowed their movements and the strong chilly wind sapped their strength. Monsters don't wear warm clothes, so whenever they attempted to climb Jambal's high walls, the guards only needed to throw buckets of water on them to kill or incapacitate them. The problem is that the second group was stronger and better equipped, otherwise they wouldn't have called for our help. The people of Jambel are proud of their strength. Is that a polite way of saying that they're a bunch of pricks who despise outsiders? Lith asked. According to army regulations, my answer is no. Camilla said while nodding. Great. I can't wait to experience the local hospitality. Lith smiled while banging the back of his head against the wall. He was tired of being treated like crap just because his skin wasn't pale white or his hair being black. Your next report is due tomorrow morning. Over and out. His handler closed the communication too hastily, making Lith inwardly gripe in advance. What did I do wrong this time? He waited a few minutes before calling her with his civilian amulet. Their daily routine involved at least two calls a day, one during breakfast, while they were both off duty, and one at the end of her shift. Only one way to find out. Solar sighed. Hi, Cammy. Are you excited about tomorrow? It's your first day as field assistant, after all. Lith opted for a soft approach. No flattery nor small talk, asking her about something she cared to show her that it mattered to him too. You remembered. Yes, I'm very nervous but also very happy. It's a dream come true. Her frown turned upside down, bestowing upon Lith one of her warm smiles he loved so much. Sadly, it didn't last long. But let's talk about that later. Why didn't you tell me that Quilla had a huge crush on you back at the academy? She pouted with her arms and legs crossed. That day she was wearing a black pencil skirt, so that pose exposed and emphasized her slender legs, unfortunately, Lith didn't have the opportunity to enjoy the scenery. Why would I tell you something like that? It was just puppy love from a small girl. It was as irrelevant back then as it is now. Lith pinched his nose in frustration. First, because I'm your girlfriend and I would like to know when I meet one of your exes to avoid embarrassing situations. Second, it's not irrelevant at all since she's one of your best friends. After exchanging their communication rooms, Quilla and Camilla spoke often. They could both use a good friend, also, Camilla wanted to learn about Lith's past while Quilla was curious about life in the north and wanted to make sure Lith was alright. Journey's birthday had been their first meeting since he had joined the army. Quilla missed him dearly, the issue had come to light while talking about their respective past relationships. It had made Camilla fear she had overshared with Quilla, embarrassing her in their previous conversations. She's not an ex-Quilla has never been anything more than a friend, period. Do you want to know about my days with Freya and Uriel too while we are at it? His retort sounded too much like, do you feel also threatened by men, to Camilla's ears, but she didn't budge and rose to the occasion. Chapter 527 Actually, yes. I would love to. If these things are so irrelevant, why are you so secretive about them? We've been together for quite some time now. You can't keep me out of your life like that. Lith recognized this moment and hated it with all of his heart. It was the moment when things in a relationship went from simple fun to serious. Back on earth, it was his cue to dump or wait to get dumped, Lith called it, the nagging point, and it put him at a crossroad. He could turtle up, making their relationship turn sour, or open up with the risk that one question would lead to another until Camilla asked about something he couldn't share. Lith knew that she cared and she was trying to make things between them work, yet he was scared of the consequences the nagging point cold have dot he would have found it easier to fight, and kill several abominations rather than facing that choice. Until this point, their busy schedule and being apart for extended periods of time had made Camilla be patient, avoiding sensitive issues, for a moment, Camilla's image was replaced by Floria's. She had asked him to open up too, until she had given up. Back then he had been happy about it, mistaking it for acceptance. Now he knew better. Can this please wait for my return? There are things I'm not comfortable talking about from a distance. It's fine if you don't feel ready to share your past, I just want you to be honest with me. Camilla's voice lost its edge, turning sweet again. We'll talk once I'm back. I promise. Asterisk 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 the following day, Lith had Solus Warp as near as possible to Jambel, reaching it a few minutes after sunrise. Jambel was a medium-sized fortress city, entirely built of stone. It was too far from the commercial routes to depend on merchants, so it was designed to be self-sufficient all year round. The city was built near two big lakes, which provided fish and fresh water, while cultivated fields surrounded the city walls until the woods begin, they were the main source for game and wood, so the inhabitants of Jambel treated it with great respect. 
They planted two trees for each one they cut down and used turnover to give them time to grow. Unlike Makosh, there were no slums. Even the poorest houses were solid, the only wood buildings were tall sheds. Jambal's walls were 5 meters, 16, high and wide enough that two armed people could easily walk side by side. They were made of grey stone and smooth so that during the day they would partially reflect the sunlight and blind the aggressors. Lith landed a few hundred meters from the city gates, so as to not scare the guards. He was very surprised when he reached the gates without anyone ordering him to halt or identify himself, even more when the city lord came out to greet him while the soldiers stood at attention. Ranger Verhen, thanks for coming so quickly. We were starting to fear that we would have to face the third wave of monsters alone. Baron Aeros Wylan was a man in his late thirties, about 1.78 meters, 5 feet 10 inches, tall. He had red hair and a finely trimmed beard, with blue eyes as clear as the twin lakes in front of the city. He was wearing a light armor that emphasized his lean but muscular build, even the city guards had clean and proper uniforms. Each one of them was physically fit and their equipment well cared for. The Baron looked more like a soldier than a noble, just like his men seemed to be veterans. A third wave? What makes you think they will be back? Lith shook the Baron's hand. His grip was vigorous, but friendly. The noble wasn't trying to test Lith. After the second one, I sent some scouts to follow the survivors back to the dungeon. There's a lot of them and they're damn hungry. When they noticed their companions coming back empty-handed, they killed and cooked them on the spot. That's one heck of a hunger. Lith was more surprised at the scout's willingness to risk their neck. So far, every city he had been to was full of people who just whined and waited for his intervention. My point exactly. Wylan nodded while offering Lith a mount. There was one horse for each soldier, no stagecoach waited for the city lord. Thankfully, Lith had learned how to ride during the boot camp. Monsters cannot fish and most animals ran away when the creatures first appeared. We are the only thing they can feed upon for miles. With so little practice he was a lousy rider, but between his physique and the well-trained horse, he had no problem reaching the baron's mansion. It was a two-story manor, something Lith would have expected from a merchant, not a city lord. Each floor was barely as big as the inner's ballroom. Only brickwork and a small garden separated the mansion from the surrounding houses, and there was none more luxurious. Only a fool would waste money to build himself a castle if the whole city around him easily burns. Baron Wylan answered Lith's silent question. I prefer spending the gold from the taxes to make the whole of Jambel safe. People with a roof over their head and an honest day job don't turn to crime. Besides, my missus and I don't need much. Hungry. Yes. Can I be completely honest with you? Lith walked through the front door while a butler welcomed them home. The hallway was about 20 square meters, 215 square feet, with walls and floor covered by white painted wood. There was a cabinet for the clothes and a small fireplace above which was a series of hangers to dry coats drenched by snow. A soft carpet led to the other rooms, covering most of the floor and keeping the house warm. Absolutely. You're about to risk your life for my people and my city is under siege. I'd much prefer for us to drop the formalities rather than waste our time with pretty words. The butler took the baron's mantle while the noble sat on one of the chairs near the door to take off his dirty boots and replace them with clean ones. Lith shape shifted his clothes to show the man he didn't need his help, making him flinch in surprise. The furniture in every room was made of high-quality materials, but its design wasn't ostentatious. This isn't the kind of hospitality I was expecting. I heard things about Jambel. Unpleasant things. Lith took a mental note of everything, the baron's house wasn't great, but it definitely was a home. It was warm and cozy. Each one of its rooms was lived in, not just designed for impressing guests. It was like he wanted his own house to be. They are all true. The Baron said with a smug grin. We have little patience for outsiders who come into our homes and expect to be served like lords. We bow to no one just because of their wealth, status, or rank. So, rest assured, here you have only friends. Chapter 528. Meaning? Lith was starting to understand the Baron's way of life. You're my equal, but not because you too are a Baron, but because you earned your title. I've heard a lot about you and so have my people. You slew a wyvern as a boy and a dragon as a man. We respect strength here. It was just a man in dragon form. Lith pointed out. Strong and humble. Tell me, lad, when do you plan to start your hunt? When you point me the way. Lith shrugged. See? That's what I'm talking about. Come, there's a lot to eat and even more to discuss before you leave. Failure's not an option. Lith followed the Baron to the dining hall, where the Baroness and their children were having breakfast. The lady stood up to give their guest a proper greeting, quickly followed by her children. Baron Verhen, this is my wife, Miriam, and my children, Kotu and Ariel. The Baroness was a woman in her mid-thirties, with blonde hair and green eyes. She was a good head shorter than her husband and Lith would have considered her pretty, if not for the milky white skin typical of the North, that gave her a sickly look in his eyes, the siblings had to be twins, both with the red hair of their father and the green eyes of their mother. They too were so pale that Lith's healer instinct brought him seconds away from casting a diagnostic spell on the whole family. He gave them a bow, before sitting at their table, next to Baron Wylan. Only then did Lith notice that the table was actually an enchanted item. While the maid served them fresh white bread and porridge, a holographic map of the area appeared in mid-air. Lady Wylan's eyes narrowed in annoyance for a split second, but she said nothing. The dungeon is here. The Baron pointed at the base of a small mountain range a few dozen kilometers from Jambel with his fork, making the hologram zoom in. My scout spotted three entrances before the monsters discovered them and attempted to have them for dessert. Here, here, and here. Wylan drew three circles with his knife and the hologram opened as many small holes in the ground. There could be more. Also, I wouldn't be surprised if after finding my men lurking around, they put out some guards. If you need a distraction, my soldiers can accompany you and draw the attention of the monsters until you get inside. No need. Lith replied after gulping down some porridge. Both it and the bread could have used a pinch more of salt for his tastes. I prefer working alone. What I'm more interested in is what kind of creatures attack the city and a rough estimate of their numbers, if you have one. I'm sure that when I tell them, my men will buy you all the beer you can drink. They hate dying. The Baron laughed heartily. 
Dear, put down your cutlery when you speak. You're spilling food everywhere. The baroness tone was warm and her smile gentle, yet her eyes were icicles. Iriel too glared at her father, until she noticed Lith watching them. She lowered her gaze and blushed violently, giving her face some color as Lith's lost his own, oh, fuck. Another, please be my ticket out of nowhere, girl. I need to get out of here. He thought. I'm sorry, dear, but I'm sure our guest doesn't mind. Wylan was an ex-soldier, who had risen in the army ranks until he had exchanged his merits for a noble title. Even years after he had retired, he was still used to eating and speaking as fast as he could. Well, maybe some of us do. The lady's silvery voice struck like a fist, making the lord regain his manners and put the silverware down. The first wave was comprised mostly of small fry forty goblins, thirty-two ogres, and a dozen empowered orcs. I suspect the ruler of the dungeon might be a powerful shaman. Lith nodded him to continue. The second wave was way worse. Fifty ogres, twenty-three empowered orcs, and a few trolls. As for their numbers, I have no clue. The fact they have dispatched almost a hundred of them each time makes me think we are talking about at least one thousand creatures. Are you really sure you want to go in there alone? Positive. Lith replied. Numbers mean nothing in enclosed spaces and I can wipe out any number of non-magical creatures on my own. I can always fly or warp away if necessary. Can you really use dimensional magic? Iriel's eyes shone like emeralds, making Lith bite his tongue. That's the reason I arrived so fast. Since the horse had already bolted, instead of shutting the barn's door, Lith decided to follow suit. Thanks for the meal and the information. Your men's bravery has saved me a lot of time. I'll take care of the dungeon immediately. Wait. There's one more thing you should know before you go. One of my scouts says he saw a bailer flying around the mountain. A bailer? At those words, Lith flinched in disbelief. Such creatures were considered the nobles among the monsters. One of the few fallen races to have retained part of their ancient wisdom and power. I'm sorry, Baron, but if that was true Jambel should have already fallen. A 1,000 strong army of monsters with a bailer at its head could easily conquer this city. Also, didn't you say you suspected an orc shaman to be their leader? I agree it's odd, but only one of the scouts saw it. Maybe he's wrong, or maybe the attack on Jambel is just a diversion. The Baron nodded. I suspect an orc shaman because there is no other explanation to empowered orcs and because they would never submit to an evil eye. Baylors and orcs are sworn enemies, they would never cooperate. The truth was that with their demonic appearance, Baylors resembled the fabled creatures that according to orcs law had caused the fall of their race. Baylors had no grudge against the orcs that they didn't share with the whole of Mogar. Do you have any idea how so many creatures managed to spawn so close to your city without anyone noticing? Lith could already smell a lot of troubles. In his experience, the more things didn't add up, the bigger the underlying mess was dot a mess he would have to survive first and clean later. None, it's indeed a mystery. The Baron sighed, well aware of how silly his words sounded, before leaving, Lith used the holographic table to carefully study the region and plan his next moves. I'm afraid this will not be a simple clean up. An orc shaman can cripple our strength and a bailer might even be my equal. Lith regretted not understanding orcish language. Otherwise he could have learned many things from the shaman, back in Otha, Journey had given him plenty of tips on how to loosen the tongue of a captured enemy, both literally and metaphorically. Do you think an abomination is behind the dungeon? Solus was triggered at the thought of experiencing the event of Makosh again, no, unless it's the dungeon master. He replied. The anomaly here is the creature's behavior, not their abilities. Only time will tell us how deep the rabbit hole goes. Chapter 529 Lith left before the Wyland family was done with their breakfast, leaving Iriel no time for small talk. He took off, taking the quickest route to the Broken Spine, the discontinuous mountain range where the dungeon was located, Lith flew at an optimal altitude, which allowed him to safely scout the area around him with life vision and identify underground monsters' nests. He had to make sure the creatures weren't preparing a big attack, otherwise he might have been forced to retreat during the raid to protect the city. For a ranger the number of slain creatures was but a secondary achievement, the real source of merit was the survival rate of those they are tasked to protect. Monsters needed only days to become fully grown, while a single artisan needed decades to be trained, another good thing about Camilla, is that ever since we got together you've stopped pushing me toward every girl we meet. Lith inwardly grinned, well, that doesn't mean I don't feel bad for Ariel. For once you could help someone without getting laid as your hidden agenda. Solus rebukes, yeah, right. Going from princess of nowhere to a big city would be a death sentence to her unless someone takes care of her. I can already picture how any sane woman would react if I brought home an 18-year-old girl, Solus couldn't retort anymore. Even if Solus could read Lith's thoughts, in Camilla's shoes she would still kick his ass, the area was clear of any life form, monster or otherwise. Like the Baron had reported to Lith, animals and magical beasts had left the area. Those who had failed to notice their presence because of hibernation were all dead. Once Lith reached the broken spine, he didn't head directly towards the known entrances, but scouted the area to determine how smart and powerful his opponents were. I don't like this. Solus thought. My mana sense detects a series of powerful arrays both above and below the ground. Not only have I never seen most of them, but they also form an elaborate framework. Monsters aren't supposed to be able to craft something so complicated, let alone in such a limited time frame. Lith nodded as he read the floating rooms, trying to make a sense out of them. After moving all the warden books in their possession inside Solaspedia, they were able to identify at least the function of the unknown arrays, their design is very old. Lith pondered. None of them are designed to be offensive or defensive. I can see cloaking, containment, and even amplifying arrays, the kind which are used for a secret lab, not a fortress. I can't short-circuit them and get rid of the monsters in one fell swoop, they are all the permanent kind. To do that I'd need to tamper with the mana crystals fueling them, but they are likely to be scattered all over the broken spine. Judging by the size of these arrays, the dungeon extends throughout the whole area. I don't think that even a bailer could perform such monumental work, do you want to call for backup? Solus asked, and lose my loot? Lith sneered. If this really is the secret lab of an ancient mage, find us keepers. At least as long as I'm the only one who knows it, thanks to his exploration, he found several entry points to the dungeon, most of which were unguarded. 
Lith noticed that while the edges of the caves were rough and so was the surface of the corridors leading inside, the tunnels were smooth and flawless. To dig through so many meters of rock with their bare hands must have taken them months. Solus was horrified noticing the claw marks and bloodstains along the exits. The most likely hypothesis is that they must have been imprisoned here for a long time and they only recently managed to escape. Then why are they still holed up in here? Lith thought. More importantly, what the heck did they eat until they escaped? Both an orc shaman and a bailer could easily dig their way out. Why did neither of them take care of the exits? There were far more questions than answers, but Lith's loot sense was tingling. An orc shaman meant another huge mana crystal, while a bailer refusing to leave could only mean that the creature was after something precious. Bailers were smart enough to collect magical items to compensate for their innate shortcomings, but like all monsters, they had no dimensional items. They couldn't easily transport something fragile or huge, whereas Lith had no such problem. Lith kept his greed in check as Solus's words about the abominations echoed in his head. He found a guarded entrance and unleashed a pack of undead wolves on the unfortunate goblins on duty. They screamed and died like common goblins, without showing any sign of mutation or special abilities. Lith remained hidden in the shadows as his minions feasted on the corpses, if those goblins are like the wargs, the abomination inside of them should react to their deaths and call for reinforcements. Lith thought, but even after several minutes, no one appeared, during that time, he studied the goblins' clothes and equipment. They were well dressed, wearing cotton shirts, leather pants and shoes. The most intriguing thing was the coat of arms on their clothes, representing a black tower set ablaze with a golden crown on top of it. Even their weapons, lances and bucklers, were made of good quality metal. Their master had even had them customized to a goblin's proportions, once Lith was certain that no enemy was coming his way, he sent the undead pack inside as a diversion while he entered from one of the unguarded entrances. The corridor went deep underground, leading to what was definitely not a dungeon, but rather a home, monsters had no use for doors, magical lights or tags to identify each room. There were even signs at every crossroad, pointing toward different zones, if only I could read this gibberish. Lith inwardly griped after following one of them at random and finding the biggest glass workshop he had ever seen. There were vials, beakers, and many components for alchemical apparatus of every shape and size. His anger faded after noticing they were all of the highest grade and storing some of them inside his pocket dimension, suddenly, the link between Lith and his minions disappeared. What worried him was that they didn't die fighting, someone had slaughtered them all in just a couple of seconds. Undead are hard to kill and monsters are dumb. Could they have been so unlucky to meet the shaman? If so, he could have drained the darkness element from them for an easy kill. The explanation worked, yet it wasn't enough to put Lith's paranoia at ease. He moved toward the direction from which he had last sensed the undead wolves, checking every door on his way. Unluckily, most of them were locked and even more unluckily, not by a simple lock, Lith had no time to crack them open one by one, not with so many enemies roaming around nor with life vision telling him that there was nothing inside that had a strong magical aura. Chapter 530. Whoever had built the lab wasn't one for furnishing it. Every corridor was identical on every floor. The ground and the walls were constructed with a honey-hued mix of stone and soil, while the importance of every door could be determined by their silverwood ratio, silver was the best mana conductor, making it possible to store and amplify all the spells it was enchanted with. The corridors were wide, but offered no cover to move stealthily. Lith had to rely on life vision to spot his enemies from around the corners and kill them quickly after conjuring a silence zone. All of them wore fine clothes with a faint magical aura, yet it wasn't enough to explain how they could be so spotless and in mint condition after being allegedly worn by prisoners for years. Around the next corner there is a group of four orcs coming from the direction your wolves died. Solus warned Lith one of them has a bright green mana core and a powerful life force. He must be the shaman, what about the crystal? Lith's life vision confirmed Solus's reading but at the same time, it made him worry. There was no trace of the mana crystal and the shaman appeared to have an incredibly strong mana and life flow for his green core. I can't see it either. He has no magical equipment. Solus couldn't explain how such a small group of orcs could have killed a whole pack of undead so fast. Lith charged forward with the gatekeeper bastard sword in his hand, using gravity magic to run on the ceiling rather than the ground. Orcs were humanoid creatures, with an average height of 1.8 meters, 5 feet 11 inches. They were gifted from birth with a physique similar to that of an awakened. They were stronger, faster, and sturdier than humans. Their bodies were naturally resistant to most elements and they would rarely get sick. It was uncommon for an orc to display a talent for magic, but when it happened, the creature would always be born awakened. They were all bald, with skin as brown as tree bark and almost as hard. Orcs also had enhanced senses that made it difficult to take them by surprise and were able to display short bursts of fire or air fusion, but not both at once, the creatures paid no attention to the noise of Lith's approach until it was too late. A hush zone prevented them from calling for help and the attack came from above while they were still searching for the source of the footsteps. The echo of the corridors confused their enhanced hearing, making them look left and right. Thanks to water fusion, Lith's arm was able to move like it had no bones. The gatekeeper avoided the orcs' thick arms that were guarding their vitals and killed three of them with as many quick thrusts, the fuck? Lith thought as the alleged shaman deflected the tip of the blade with the back of his hand while taking a few steps back. Lith's surprise turned into amazement when he noticed that the orc didn't look like an orc at all. It had shoulder-length snow-white hair, a lean but muscular physique like that of a professional athlete, and long pointy ears. There was no trace of the orc's characteristic bloodlust in the delicate, almost feminine, features of his face thanks to his brown skin it would have been easy for him to go unnoticed in the woods, but inside the stone corridor, he stood out like a sore thumb, why does this guy look like an elf? Lith suddenly remembered how according to the law orcs were a fallen race descending from the elves, beats me, but his life force is definitely that of an orc. Solus pointed out. Do elves really exist? Are they also hot? Their enemy was indeed good looking, but Lith had other things to worry about. The orc was infused with all the elements and had conjured a sword made of ice from the humidity in the air. Both things were supposed to be impossible for members of a fallen race. It was you who sent those undead. Your corpse will make a fine dish. I'm tired of eating goblins. A cruel hunger deformed the orc's face at the idea of tasting human flesh again after so much time. Suddenly Solus didn't find him hot anymore. You can speak. Lith replied enthusiastically as he unleashed a plague arrow with each thrust of his sword. 
the orc nimbly deflected the blade, but the spells messed up his amateurish footwork by forcing him to dodge while he parried. Their physical abilities were similar, but the orc had no training in any kind of martial arts and was relying on his natural talents. The first thrust of the gatekeeper cracked the ice blade, the second and third injured the orc's legs, Lith could have killed him easily, but dead men told no tales. To make matters worse for the orc, he was not used to the abilities of his ancestral form. He tried multiple times to conjure a spell just for Lith to tamper with it and make it blow up in the orc's face. Soon the stone sword broke into pieces and the orc's body was bleeding from many deep cuts. Lith struck his enemy with a fist containing a healing spell that mended all of the orc's wounds, sapping a great deal of his remaining stamina. His knees buckled and Lith grabbed him by the throat, lifting the orc up as if he was just a stuffed animal. Tell me who you are, what is happening here, and how you killed my minions so fast. Lith used invigoration to find the nerve bundle's journey had taught him about and pressed them with his free hand, causing the orc to writhe in agony. I won't tell you anything. The monster managed to smile in defiance. It's much better if I show you. The creature used a breathing technique that closely resembled invigoration, but instead of absorbing the surrounding world energy, it was accumulated on the orc's right hand. You can cast tearful spells without consuming your mana? Not bad, Hannibal Lectalus. Lith reacted before the spell was fully formed by clenching his hand around the orcs and crushing it along with the suicidal attack. The orc screamed in pain for the first time as his hand imploded under Lith's grip and exploded due to his own spell gone wild. Interesting. Such a breathing technique is as powerful as it is flawed. It saves the user the strain of handling the mana, so they can cast even spells above their level. Yet because such spells are only made of world energy, they can still hurt their caster. Lith thought, why does he not fear death? Solus pondered. Even now, he is still smiling, Lith had to squeeze the orc's throat to stop him from making a second attempt. Lith crushed the creature's remaining limbs and knocked him unconscious before dropping him onto the ground, well, if he doesn't talk, let's see what I can find out on my own, scanner and invigoration revealed that there was something odd with the reverted orc. His life force was unnatural, squeezed in its actual form by a second life force wrapping the orcs like a shroud. Chapter 531 Undead life force? Solus was flabbergasted. Could he have evolved after absorbing the darkness magic animating your wolves? Lith had no explanation for the phenomenon, yet he noticed that the orc's clothes were too big for him. They were sized for a regular orc, which meant that either his transformation really had just happened or the creature didn't care about having them fixed. After a throughout body scan of the fainted elf orc, Lith and Solus had no idea what events could be unfolding in the underground lab. The creature's anatomy was almost identical to its corrupted counterpart. The only anomalies were the slightly different shape of his organs and his mana core resonating with the world energy, making him recover his mana faster than a human would. After waking the orc up, Lith discovered that all the means of interrogation at his disposal were useless. The creature would cut off his pain receptors at the first opportunity he got, and even if Lith could easily undo it, the orc proved to be resistant to pain beyond reason. Since more monsters were approaching, Lith killed to Orc while he still had some time left before being discovered, just as he expected, death reverted the monster to his original form. Life vision revealed the undead life force leaving the body, but unluckily it moved as fast as lightning and passed through the ground. Lith had no opportunity to follow it before it disappeared from his sight, it was definitely not from your wolves. Solus pointed out. Otherwise it would have just faded, Lith nodded and hid around a corner to avoid the next patrol. It was composed of five ogres. They were all very tall, above 2 meters, 6 feet 7 inches, with muscular bodies that could have passed for humans if not for their greenish skin, their spiky red hair and the long, pointy fangs protruding out of their lower lip, once again, one of them was very different from the others. He had no fangs and his hair seemed to be made of red autumn leaves. There was a calm, solemn light of intelligence reflected in his eyes, that deeply contrasted with the brutish appearance of his peers. Is it me, or does this guy resemble the dryads we met years ago? After meeting the wargs, Lith had started to wonder if even plants and magical beasts were part of the fallen races. The reverted ogre's appearance seemed to confirm his suspects. What happened to Kalil's unit? said one of the ogres. He stuttered every word with a pained expression, as if using human language poisoned his tongue. There is no sign of struggle. The dryad ogre calmly observed. And none of us would have wasted so much meat. Either Yosmo himself or one of his elite units must have breached the barricade. We need to split into two teams. One will bring the corpses to the kitchen and give the alarm while the other will try to slow them down. I'll do the tracking. The ogre started chanting in an unknown language as two of his soldiers picked up the bodies and stored them inside huge sacks, a barricade? Then the monsters are infighting, which would explain why they eat their own. How did they survive so long, though? To spawn fast they need to eat so much that they should have died of starvation long ago, Lith's musing was interrupted the moment the ogre dryad finished his chanting. Based on its length, it had to be a tier 1 spell. Lith cursed when he noticed red marks appearing on the floor, the ceiling, and wherever the bodies of the fallen orcs had touched the walls during the previous fight, among the red marks, there was a clear series of footprints leading to his position. Ambush! The ogre warned his soldiers a second too late. Ice lances pierced their heads and hearts, killing the regular ogres on the spot. They would have done the same to the ogre dryad, if not for two holes opening where the lances were about to hit, instead of flesh and bones, the creature was made of vines that normally were wrapped together so tightly that they gave it a humanoid appearance. An ogre's body is actually made of fossilized plants. Solus's scientific curiosity was on cloud nine. That's why they are green, I don't really care about that right now. No matter if Lith's attacks were magical or physical in nature, in its vine form the ogre was as able to split at will and dodge every one of them with ease. You don't chant, which means you're an awakened. The creature's voice was filled with surprise and envy. His body split into five bundles of vines, four of which dug their way into the dead ogre's bodies and reanimated them. Lith could see thanks to life vision that they were no undead. The vines were taking root, turning the corpses into clones of the original. Both their mana cores and life force had an energy signature identical to those of the original body. Lith struck at them with several flaming darts, discovering that the clones were incapable of turning into vines as well. The darts left behind burn marks and produced a pungent smell, yet the fire didn't take, the clones' life force was unchanged, while their bodies shrunk slightly, as if they had been starving for days, I think I know their weak point. 
Lith's smile disappeared as he heard five identical voices chanting as many different spells. He conjured a blizzard, but unfortunately, nor the wind nor the injuries opened by the razor sharp hail his spell produced could stop the enemy's casting. Vines had no mouths, and even if somehow they experienced pain, it didn't show. A small tornado formed around Lith, blocking his sight and restricting his movements. Wind blades were randomly mixed with the chaotic air currents surrounding him. Black clouds formed on the ceiling with a low rumble announcing a thunderstorm. Lith used life vision to detect the otherwise invisible air blades, and full guard to avoid the other spells incoming from his blind spots. The enemies had a limited choice of attacks, which he exploited to make them predictable. His blizzard was still ongoing, making most fire spells lose their effectiveness, while the whole underground complex was shielded by arrays which made it immune to earth magic. It explained why the creatures had been forced to dig with their hands, Lith stood his ground as long as he could, strengthening his magical storm by the second. He blinked away only when the lightning bolts from above, or the darkness spells the enemies threw at him from the sides would force him to walk into the air blades. It was a stupid move to use water magic against me. The ogre roared as it relocated the tornado for the third time. You should have used fire instead. Lith ignored the taunt and focused on defense as he gave his spell one last push. All of the enemy attacks disappeared at once when the extreme cold froze the abundant water inside the vines, and turned them into popsicles, what a moron. Lith thought as he crushed the ice sculptures that once were the ogre dryad. I was right about the reverted monsters not knowing anything about their own abilities, fire is only good against dry wood, whereas wet vegetation would only produce a lot of smoke and hinder the only one who actually needs to breathe. Me. Chapter 532. Why was he scared of fire, then? Solus asked, probably, because he was a normal ogre until not long ago. All living beings are naturally afraid of fire. He had yet to realize that with no vitals and with light magic at his disposal, fire is a small threat for a water-based creature like he was. Stop wasting time. You strong, master can use you. Lith turned toward the source of the voice, yet neither life vision nor mana sense showed anything. At least not until a hunched figure literally emerged from the shadows, the creature didn't resemble anything Lith had ever seen before, nor was it listed in any of the bestiaries he possessed. It was a small humanoid, barely 1.3 meters, for feet 3 inches, tall, with pale gray skin and thick grizzled hair. Judging by his appearance and his voice, he seemed to be a male. He had small pointed ears, pitch black eyes, and was wearing a mage's robe. Despite his jagged teeth and the claws at the end of his limbs, it didn't look menacing. The creature's life force was slightly better than the average adult man, while his blood core was almost completely black. Lith didn't underestimate him and silently weaved more spells in case looks were proverbially deceiving. How the heck did he escape our senses? Solus kept an eye on all the remaining shadows of the corridor, in case the creature was just a distraction, Lith had no answer to offer. His senses were all focused on his surroundings, since things were getting weirder by the second. The corpses of the ogres he had just killed turned into smoke and died into the ground, closely followed by the undead life force which had restored the dryad ogre's ancient might. Tell me who you are, what is happening here, and what you mean, wasting time. Either the creature really was harmless or wanted to manipulate him, at least he seemed to be willing to communicate. Me rat pack. The creature shrugged. War is happening, but fighters waste time, just like you. None can die. We banished from death thanks to master's power. Lith stared at Ratpack, waiting for him to continue his explanation, but the creature just stared back in annoyance. You deaf? Stop wasting time. Soon Kalil and Draga will be back. With reinforcements. You soldier. Ratpack pointed his grey finger to Lith's uniform. You act like one and obey. His voice was deep and rough. It was filled with an underserved pride which annoyed Lith almost as the vague answers he had just received. I obey no one. Lith replied while using spirit magic to lift the creature off the ground and slam him against a well-lighted wall. Choking an undead was useless, if not to prove a point. If you want my help, you'd better give me a good reason. Start by making sense, otherwise. Lith's threat was interrupted by Ratpack turning into a puff of smoke. It lasted only one second, but it was enough to escape from spirit magic's grasp and reach the nearest shadow. No, you don't. Lith snarled. He extended his arm to direct his tendrils of mana toward their target, who turned once again ethereal the moment Ratpack touched the edge of the shade. Only Master can harm Ratpack. Even Yosmo and Dankar, even their armies couldn't catch Ratpack. Obey or die. Lith didn't reply, redirecting the mana from spirit to darkness magic. He had learned a couple of things while fighting Thrud Griffin, it was time to put them to the test. Lith's shadow came to life as two blazing yellow eyes appeared on its face. The shadow's extended right arm stretched along the floor until it reached Ratpack's hiding place. Neither Lith nor Solus liked how his darkness magic infused shade resembled more his demonic life form, rather than his human one. The shadow's hand rummaged for a while before retracting. The elongated arm was coiled around the small undead like a snake. Ratpack screamed in surprise as soon as he felt something touching him. His master's coward's mantle was supposed to protect him from any harm, yet the ranger had been able to ignore its protection. To make matters worse, Ratpack could feel his strength getting slowly sapped, not even undeath could ward off darkness magic. Are you ready to talk? Lith said while pointing the gatekeeper at Ratpack's throat. The creature's eyes were filled with fear, which made him nod like a parrot having a seizure. Then explain things properly. Lith snorted. Me has many names. Squirm, Plague, Worm. Ratpack is master's favorite, because he says me very annoying, he is right, damn it. I don't care for your names. Tell me what's happening here. Servants rebelled against master and took master prisoner. After that, they fight each other. Two great leaders emerge. Dankar the Orc Shaman and Yosmo the Bailer. All servants join one or the other, forming two armies. They fight for. Ratpack stopped, not knowing how to explain. For. Freedom. And also for power. Ratpack clapped his hands, congratulating to himself for being so precise. Unluckily, Lith didn't share his enthusiasm. What freedom? If your master is already being held prisoner, they can just walk away. What power are you talking about? They can't leave. Ratpack nervously licked his lips, revealing such a black tongue that it resembled a slimy piece of charcoal. 
Master made them like him. They have no freedom. As for power, it's the masters, but they found a way to use it. To make them pretty again. Like Kalil and Draga. Yes, like them. The creature nodded again like crazy, feeling someone was approaching. What do you want me to do, exactly? Lyft dilated his nostrils in annoyance. He didn't know whether to find more bothersome Rat Pack's ramblings or the idea of monsters like a bailer regaining their full powers. Follow me to Master. Master explains better. You free him, he stops servants. Hurried footsteps were perfectly audible and quickly approaching, yet the ranger didn't seem to care. Why would I? If your master has already been defeated once by his servants, they can do it again. They have even robbed him of his power. What use do I have for him? Yes, he's weak, but he's still strong. You can't defeat all master's servants alone. Enough talk, we run now. The ogre dryad and the orc elf appeared from a corner, running at full speed closely followed by several members of their own kin. Lith raised the index and middle fingers of his right hand, unleashing the tear for spell death zone. A black cloud comprised of darkness element filled the corridor in front of them the moment the monsters were halfway through. No matter the direction they turned to, all of them died after taking a few steps. What were you saying? Lith's eyes were blazing with blue mana which deeply contrasted with his shadow's burning yellow eyes. It was still seemingly alive and moving around on its own, even though its main body was standing still, Rat Pack shivered in fear, wondering how powerful humans had become during the decades he and his master had spent in isolation. You, too strong. Why you struggle earlier if you can just. Rat Pack stuttered so much that he preferred to slam his fist onto his palm to stress his point. Chapter 533. Struggle? Lith sneered. I was saving my strength and making a few experiments. Finding a reverted monster is a rare opportunity. I just wanted to see what they were capable of. Lith had learned enough about magic to know that as long as he understood the underlying principles of the so-called innate abilities, he could find a way to replicate them and add them to his arsenal. Experiments. Rat Pack echoed, swallowing a lump of saliva. The word brought to memory countless unpleasant experiences. Master and you peas in a pod. You have yet to answer my final question. Lith pushed the gatekeeper's tip against Rat Pack's throat. Why should I free your master? What use do I have for him? Maybe you can slay all. Rat Pack licked his lips again. Maybe you can break master's device, but can you do both? You slay, but they return. The closer you get to the device the faster they return. Master can shut down device with one finger. Master is its master. Rat Pack made little sense, yet Lith considered he still had a point. If this master had been a quiet presence for so long, there was no reason for him to stir trouble, whereas the same couldn't be said for his rebellious servants. Why should I waste time cracking locks and arrays if he can just pass through them with a flick of their switches? Also, exploring the whole complex would take me months while I have days at best before the army sends reinforcements to help me. Lith couldn't afford the underground lab to be discovered. The kingdom would snatch the good stuff and leave him the crumbs, if this master is willing to compensate me for my troubles, I'll get what I want without wasting my time. Otherwise, I can always kill or imprison him again and test my luck with the doors. First things first, though. Does this master of yours experiment on abominations too? Is he the master? The title was so trite that it was likely that they were two different people, but Lith preferred to be sure who he was about to deal with. Master experiments on anything. Rat Pack sighed as even more bad memories resurfaced. Being undead didn't mean being spared from pain. My coward's cloak made from abomination skin. His words made Lith open his eyes wide in surprise. As far as he knew, abominations had no skin. He touched Rat Pack's clothes, using invigoration to observe its pseudo core, I got it, but I'll take some notes, just to be safe. Solace's memory was peerless, but she could also access to Lith's like it was a library. A messy and chaotic one, but after so many years, she knew her way. No, I mean, does he help abominations? Does he work with them? Lith tried to be clearer. No. Master helps only himself. Master works only with Rat Pack. Me assistant. The creature said with a proud voice. Then make way. Lith nodded. Be careful, we must move unnoticed. I want to avoid useless fights. Rat Pack knew the underground complex like the back of his hand, while Lith could detect enemies from afar with life vision. By putting together their resources, the duo quickly reached the lower levels of the lab along the way. Lith asked Rat Pack what the various signs meant to achieve a basic understanding of the ancient language. Just in case things with the master went sour and he had to explore on his own, Rat Pack was annoyed by his questions, but he didn't dare to displease Lith. The creature needed the ranger as much as he was afraid of him. Every time they were forced to fight, Lith would go all out, killing whole units of powerful monsters in the blink of an eye. The moment the monsters realized to be under attack, they were already dead. Rat Pack didn't like the human because he reminded him too much of the master. Rat Pack's undead senses could hear Lith's heart beating like they were just taking a stroll. Even though they were surrounded from every side by enemies, there was no sweat on his body nor emotion in his movements. Walking to his side felt exactly like when he accompanied the master before his fall. Rat Pack had the impression of being a mouse riding on the back of a dragon. When they reached the eight underground floor, the creature signaled Lith to stop. We arrived. Trouble is here. Rat Pack pointed at the many reinforced doors along the corridors. Each room was bigger than those on the other floors and was enveloped by multiple unique arrays. What is stored in the lower levels? Lith had expected the prison to be on the last floor since the deeper they got, the stronger the magical aura he detected became. Bad stuff. Horrible stuff. Rat Pack shuddered. Master love experiments and hate failures. He always destroy failures, but some he can't get rid of. Either because they don't die or because too valuable. Those master stores below, where Array keep them in another space ready to collapse. Thanks to all his questions about the road signs they had met along the way, Lith had understood what each floor was for. The ground floor was a storage area for non-magical equipment, the equivalent of a broom closet. The master's living quarters took all the first underground floor, while the servants' quarters were on the second one. Lith was amazed by how someone could be so conceited, that he had taken for himself the same space 1000 minions did. 
The third and fourth underground floors were the lab, the fifth was the ingredient deposit, the sixth was the treasury, and the seventh was a silver mine. According to Rat Pack, his master had chosen the broken spine as his residence because of the rich silver veins he had discovered. It was the only way to satisfy his need for the precious metal without the need for an external supplier. Is it normal for those doors to be opened? Lith pointed at the unlocked door of some cells. He already knew the answer, since the owner of the lab was the kind of guy to keep even the cleaning products deposit tight shut. No. Rat Pack hissed. Dankar and Yosmo must have freed them. They desperate to seek help from those who could replace them. Solus, can you see what's inside? Life vision is blurred by all the locks and arrays enveloping the cells. The doors must be made of solid silver, because I've never seen so many spells stuffed inside a single object. Lith would have loved to take a peek at their cores with invigoration, but they were infused with too many deadly spells, and he already had too much to do. Lith had already planned to raid the treasury and the ingredient deposit before calling for backup if things went south, sorry, but mana sense is useless here. The whole floor is so bright that it's like staring into the sun. A whole army of awakened could hide behind a corner and I wouldn't even notice them. Those doors are, just wow. Each one of the doors had a blue mana crystal the size of a fist at its four corners, and a different magic circle formed by small purple mana crystals the size of a nut. Chapter 534 Thanks to life vision, Lith could see that every inch of their surface was covered in mystical runes. Wait a minute. Lith snapped out of his reverie. How did they open those doors? They master assistants, just like Rat Pack. They have codes for all doors. Eighth floor is for specimens. If you can open your master's cage, what do you need me for? You really deaf. I need you deal with trouble. Rat Pack whispered while pointing at the next corridor to their right. Lith peeked behind the corner, noticing a bailer standing guard in front of the most complex door they had met so far. The creature was over 2.5 meters, 8 feet 2 inches, tall, with a humanoid body covered by small blood-colored scales. His head had three eyes arranged in a vertical line. A red one was in the middle of his forehead, a black one was right above his nose, and a blue one was between his lower lip and his chin. Three sets of black curved horns emerged from his head, his cheekbones, and the sides of his chin. His massive upper body was completely exposed and seemed to be comprised solely of bulging muscles. His legs were reverse jointed like those of a cat, and were covered by a black armor that only left the talons extending out from his toes and heel exposed. Two flaming red membranous wings were folded around his neck, almost looking like a mantle. That's not trouble, that's a bailer. Lith cursed at Rat Pack with a whisper. You wrong. He called himself Trublescamus the Fierce, but Master called him trouble because he escaped three times before Master could find a proper door to contain him. Trouble hate Master's experiments and hate Master even more. Lith ignored Rat Pack's ramblings and prepared a set of spells according to the information he had about bailers and his full blown paranoia. Despite their appearance, they were no demons, according to the law, before their fall they had six eyes, one for each element and colored accordingly. Their eyes granted them mastery over all the elements, but they were also their weak point. Losing an eye meant losing the corresponding element and since magic didn't flow through their bodies, they were incapable of mixing together different elements, leaving them stuck with the equivalent of tier 4 magic. After their fall, bailers could have from 1 to 3 eyes, while the others were allegedly fused within their bodies by the failed attempt to evolve and force the mana to flow freely. Any advice? Lith had never faced one, but could see via life vision that the creature's vitality was on par with Scarlet the Scorpicor. Luckily, its mana flow was way worse than the Lord of the Forests. If he wasn't stand in front of that fucking door, maybe. Lith was flabbergasted by Solus's swearing, I'm almost blind, so take my words with a grain of salt. The bailer seems to have four mana cores. A bright cyan one in its usual place, right below his solar plexus, and three green ones inside his eyes, got it. The good news is that he can't use light magic, so if I manage to destroy one or more of his eyes, he can't regenerate them. Lith was done with his preparations. He was about to step in the corridor when he felt Rat Pack tugging at his leg. Master told me that trouble has weakness, that even Rat Pack can face him if I wear magical protections. Master gave it to Rat Pack, Rat Pack give it to you. The small creature took out a bundle of shackles linked to several envelopes from his pocket, which was actually a pocket dimension. It made little sense to Lith, more so since according to life vision, they were not enchanted. What's this supposed to be? He asked. Isn't it obvious? It's a chainmail. Rat Pack puffed out his chest with pride while Lith opened one of the envelopes. If you're reading this, you're not the Moran I always thought you were. Happy Death Day, Zolbrish. Lith had no time to waste explaining to the Moran what a pun was, so he returned the gift and launched himself against trouble while infused with all the elements. The bailer gave no sign of being surprised by the sudden attack. Trublescamur's middle eye ignited with mana and what looked like a two-handed scimitar made of black smoke appeared in his right hand. Much to Lith's surprise, the gatekeeper clashed against the black smoke and the sudden impact threw him off balance allowing the bailer to send him flying away with, but a flick of his wrist, how is that possible? Darkness magic is supposed to be ethereal. I was expecting him to attempt to trade blows. What the heck? Only then did Lith notice that the blue eye was lit too, meaning the sword was composed of black ice. Seems that bailers can mix elements after all. Lith inwardly cursed at the army bestiary's author as the red eye too was set ablaze with mana, generating a pillar of cyan flames that filled the whole corridor leaving Lith no way out. Lith encased himself inside a massive ice coffin to protect himself and seal the corridor. His own spells couldn't harm him exactly how the Bailer's flames had no effect on their caster after rebounding on the enemy barrier. Soon the fire consumed all the air in the corridor, forcing the spell to disappear, the red eye to close, and the Bailer to fall to his knees gasping for oxygen, the creature's black eye lit up again, unleashing a pillar of darkness so powerful that the arrays protecting the lab became visible to the naked eye, as they prevented the Bailer's spell from turning the walls into debris, their positions were now reversed. Lith was stuck inside the ice just like the Bailer was trapped in the small corridor a second ago. To not lose his life, Lith was forced to lose his advantage and shatter the ice to blink to safety. Fresh air filled both the corridor and the bailer's lungs as he unfolded his wings to chase his opponent. Trublescamus flew in a spiral pattern, to prevent Lith from predicting his trajectory and using dimensional magic to stab him in the back. Contrary to his expectations, no attack came until he reached the T-junction where the two corridors met. 
Only then did he realize he had fallen into a trap. Lith knew that his enemy's physical prowess was way above his own. He had considered using spell sealing arrays, but they would cripple the only edge he had. Arrays worked both ways, affecting their caster along with their target. Hence, he had decided to stay at a safe distance and play it smart. Point two death zones were waiting for true Bleskamas, one at each side of the junction. The darkness spells resembled two small thunderclouds, which completely engulfed the corridors as they converged on the Baylor. True Bleskamas exploded in a wild laughter and opened his middle eye again. A second pillar of darkness clashed with Lith's death zone with such violence that the entire corridor trembled, and all of the arrays protecting the cells became visible. Lith was amazed by how a simple cyan core could emit such power without a moment's notice. His surprise only increased when, even as it was powered by his blue core and boosted by a continuous flow of mana, Death Zone was overpowered by the Black Pillar. Chapter 535. The sudden turn of events would have reversed the trap, turning Lith into the prey if he hadn't positioned himself in front of another junction, just to be safe. The moment he understood he was on the losing side of the battle, Lith gave his Death Zone one last push and rolled around a corner to safety, what the heck? They were both tier 4 spells, but I'm the one with a blue core. How could I possibly lose the confrontation? Lith's question was rhetorical, since the bestiary provided no answers to that impossible situation, yet Solus knew better. His cyan core is indeed weaker. The problem lies in the support the green core inside his eyes provide, if a green core could do that much, together we would be invincible. Lith griped, let me finish, dummy. Unlike a normal mana core, the ones in his eyes are able to draw the world energy and use it to empower his pillar-like spells to no end. It wasn't a blue core versus a cyan plus a green one, it was you versus Mogar, let me get this straight. Thanks to his eyes a Baylor can basically use invigoration non-stop even while attacking? Things were starting to make sense, and thanks to that Lith could adapt his strategy, yes and no. Like Invigoration, the eye provides a constant flow of world energy and also puts stress on the user. After using a pillar, the creature closes the corresponding eye. Unlike your breathing technique, it didn't heal him nor replenish his mana. Even a half-blind Solus was worth several Baylor's eyes in boosting Lith's understanding and battle prowess. Lith blinked away the moment life vision showed him true Bleskamas was around the corner. The Baylor blocked the corridor with his massive body as his blue eye emitted a pillar which turned air into rock-solid ice at its passage. The attack had a double purpose. If Lith was still there, he would have been frozen solid into an easy prey. If he had walked away as true Bleskamas expected, by sealing the corridor the Baylor was forcing the ranger into a head-on fight that he couldn't possibly win. Lith appeared in the middle of his second death zone. The mana thread which linked him with his spell gave him its exact position, you're right. He wiped out only one death zone, which means he can't use his eyes as often as I use my spells. Lith used invigoration to fill the remaining darkness cloud with endless mana, as it moved inexorably toward its prey. True Bleskamas cursed both the ranger's shrewdness, and his own stupidity in a language that sounded like a choir of tormented souls. Lith had no access to the corridor anymore, but neither did he, the Baylor flew away, trying to buy as much time as he could. Unfortunately, the only passage remaining led to a dead end and even though darkness magic was slow, it only took death zone a couple of seconds to reach the cornered creature. True Bleskamas used sheer willpower to force his black eye open, fighting the excruciating pain that moving the eyelid caused him. If Solus's mana sense worked properly, she would have seen that after conjuring the second pillar, the green core had turned grey. Baylors didn't really have four mana cores, just one like every other natural being. What she had mistaken for extra mana cores were just masses of world energy that a Baylor would refine into his own mana, and store it ready to be used. Baylor's eyes had an effect similar to invigoration, allowing them to draw the single elements which composed the world energy. Drawing so much and so fast came at a price. Tears of blood streamed down True Bleskamas' chin as the raw world energy he was forcing to flow through his eye damaged his whole body. The pain was unbearable, but he knew that it would be fleeting, whereas death was permanent. I haven't lived this long just to die like this. He roared, the two spells clashed again, but this time Lith boosted his own with a steady flow of mana until the last second before taking cover. At first, his precaution seemed to be unnecessary. As soon as Lith's death zone started to fade, True Bleskamas closed his eye with an agonizing scream. Its pupil was almost completely white and a small pool of blood had formed under the Baylor's feet. His breath was ragged from the effort of forcing so much world energy through his already exhausted focus, and of withstanding the pain that such a desperate move involved. Yet True Bleskamas didn't wait for the enemy's next move and sought to regain the initiative. A suit of ice covered his upper body as he launched himself forward as fast as a freight train, my flaming eye is almost out of mana. If that scum forces me to use it a third time, I'll be as good as blind. Awakened or not, he cannot cast spells if I manage to corner him. He thought, Lith was waiting for him with his arms extended, drawing in the air mystical lines that were taking the shape of a small array. True Bleskamas recognized its runes and rushed at breakneck speed to interrupt the casting, fire and water are all he has left. The best combo he can achieve with them would allow him to cook pasta, but it's a risk I'm willing to take. Lith inwardly grinned at his enemy falling for his third trap in a row. The forbidden array he had apparently almost completed was just a hologram. Lith couldn't afford to waste so much mana on a single enemy who was likely to respawn like in a badly balanced ARPG. When a gate suddenly opened in front of True Bleskamas, he was going too fast to change his direction in time. With only wings propelling him forward and no air magic, the faster he moved, the less precision of movement he had. The Baylor crashed against one of the most massive among the cell doors, triggering its defense mechanisms which unleashed a series of spells against their aggressor. Unfortunately, Lith wasn't aware that after decades of imprisonment True Bleskamas knew them like the back of his hand. The owner of the lab not only lacked imagination in decorating his own house, but also in forge mastering. All the doors were imbued with the same base set of spells, plus a few specifically designed against the prisoner they were meant to hold. The Baylor managed to avoid most of the damage and move away from the door before the most powerful ones could activate. Even on foot, the creature was as fast as a cheetah, reaching the ranger in the blink of an eye, Lith could have walked away, but between the confined space and the Baylor's speed, his exit point was bound to be easily predictable. With the closest junction still sealed by the ice, he could only blink inside the dead end the Baylor had just escaped from or move back in an almost straight line. The former option was beyond idiotic, while the latter would buy him a second at best. Chapter 536. Lith unleashed a barrage of plague arrows, against which True Bleskamas had no choice but to tank them. 
The mana imbued inside his ice armor lessened the damage, but the residual darkness was still enough to make the Baylor stumble and lose most of his momentum. The creature refused to yield and lunged at Lith with a conjured ice great sword. Lith switched to a two-handed grip while infusing the gatekeeper with fire and darkness magic. He sidestepped the incoming attack and performed a horizontal slash to the neck. Only then did True Bleskamas reveal that his moment of weakness was actually a ruse. He turned his tumble into a roll, dodging the gatekeeper and regaining his footing while his opponent was still off balance. The Baylor lunged at Lith again, who pivoted on his feet by using the momentum from his failed attack. The resulting spin wasn't enough to completely avoid the incoming strike, but it allowed him to adjust his stance and intercept the incoming blade. Lith aimed the gatekeeper at the great sword's tip, to push it away with minimum effort and create the opening he needed to win that fight. He almost couldn't believe his own eyes when the ice sword shattered on contact with the gatekeeper, revealing a flaming blade blooming underneath its surface. The ethereal fire blade ignored the bastard sword, keeping its trajectory unchanged. Despite their brutish appearance and berserk fighting style, Baylors weren't stupid. They were just so powerful that they usually didn't need clever strategies or tricks to dominate their opponents. Resorting to one wounded Trublescomar's pride, but it was much better than the alternative. The fire sword crackled as it pierced the skinwalker Amor's enchanted defenses, producing the sizzling sound of roasted meat when it bit Lith's flesh, thanks to Lith's earlier small sidestep, the Baylor had been unable to strike at the heart and had to settle for the shoulder. Not even earth fusion was enough to prevent the mystical flames from burning everything on their path. Lith felt his left arm suddenly go limp. Even shutting down his pain receptors didn't help against his now labored breathing. Trublescomar's blade had cooked his flesh, his bones, and part of his left lung in one fell swoop. By my maker, do you need my help? Solus asked while assessing the gravity of his injuries, thanks, but no. Your energy is limited, so it's better to save it for opponents in their reverted state. According to Ratpack, Yosmo is a Baylor too and he has access to his race's ancient powers. True Bleskamas is like a training ground for me, if I can't defeat him on my own, then it's better to call for reinforcements. Don't step in unless it's absolutely necessary. Lith's reply made Solus curse her weakness and wish for a way to improve her usefulness in battle, the lack of screams disappointed the Baylor, but his mood worsened when he saw the ranger blink away as a healing aura enveloped his body. True Bleskamas envied Lith for it and hoped that Yosmo would keep his word. The only reason True Bleskamas was still there was the promise of having his full might restored. Even if the abuse of my black eye and ramming against the door has weakened me somewhat, how did the human manage to avoid my strike like that? The answer to the Baylor's question was revealed when he attempted to give chase and finish Lith off before the light magic spell could take effect. True Bleskamas stumbled instead of sprinting as blinding pain spread through his body. Lith's previous failed attack hadn't been a complete failure after all. True Bleskamas' roll had saved his head but left his back and his giant wings exposed. Just like the Baylor, Lith had settled for a non-vital yet significant target, part of his right wing was gone, putting him off balance and allowing Lith to survive, even though the Baylor could regenerate his wing, it would take him days, whereas the fight was likely to last less than one more minute. Lith's checkmate spears surrounded True Bleskamas, striking at him from every side. The Baylor was done blindly charging ahead and recognized immediately the trap lying ahead of him. With his wounded wing his mobility had been crippled, he wasn't able to move fast enough to dodge them anymore. He could only use his flaming eye to destroy them at the risk of running out of fire mana, or conjure a defense made of ice that would act as a shield but also as a cage. It would further restrict his movements and leave him exposed to lightning spells. True Bleskamas snarled and opened his red eye, sprinting forward on all four. His envy toward Lith turned into unbridled rage, boosting the flame's temperature, and destructive power. A pillar of blue fire cleared his path toward the ranger as the Baylor dodged the remaining ice spears. Lith saw trickles of blood streaming down the flaming eye and unleashed the tier 5 spell Dark Ages. Black ice made from both water and darkness magic covered the ground as well as the walls, leaving only the silver doors exposed. It sapped True Bleskamas' strength every time he touched it, and forced him to slow down to not impale himself on the lances that randomly popped out of the ice from every direction. The growing crystals were quickly forming a wall in front of the Baylor, who had to slow down even further. The darkness infused in the ice not only made it more resistant to the flames by weakening them, but it was also released in the air as a noxious gas once the ice melted. When True Bleskamas finally reached Lith, his flames had died out and so had his red eye. Lith then conjured several streams of lightning bolts, shooting them at random in front of him. The Baylor didn't even try to shield himself, just dodging whatever he could to cross the last few meters that separated them. Only then did he realize that Lith wasn't aiming because he had no need to. The entire floor was covered in water and so was True Bleskamas. It was a perfect conductor which routed every bolt of lightning to its target, allowing Lith to focus on the power of his spell and to completely neglect controlling it. The Baylor gritted his teeth and used sheer willpower to resist the spasms that were ravaging his body, prideless mutt. Fighting dirty is a game two can play. True Bleskamas activated his last eye, using the water Lith had conjured against him. The area around them was instantly filled with sharp icicles, which drained the water from the floor. They were both lightning rods, which saved the Baylor from the thunderstorm and obstacles that limited the ranger's movements, allowing the creature to engage him hand to hand. Lith squinted his eyes from the surprise. He didn't expect such a degree of finesse in water manipulation from his opponent. The situation wasn't good. The back of the corridor was still sealed by his Dark Ages spell, and Blink's range didn't reach past the ice wall. The two of them were trapped inside a small cage filled with spikes that would harm only him. The Baylor's mana couldn't hurt his master. Lith backstepped while quick casting plague arrows and wind blades until he could feel the point of an icicle painfully stinging his back. Chapter 537 True Bleskamas roared in triumph. He had endured all those painful spells to make sure that his enemy would end exactly in that corner of the room. Agility and cunning meant nothing inside such a confined space, only strength mattered and he still had enough to uproot trees with just one hand, the Baylor was done underestimating the human. He jumped forward while swinging his giant fists down like hammers on Lith's left and right to cut off his escape routes. At the same time, his blue eye glowed with mana, making the icicles extend further, the trap was complete, the ranger's only choice was how he wanted to die, by fist, bite, or skewering. Lith switched them at the last second, making the ice spear that had been prickling his back pierce through True Bleskamas' blue eye, brain, and skull. The Baylor's body spasmed several times, gurgling blood from the several puncture wounds the rest of the ice spears had caused, that was close. Lith sighed while cutting True Bleskamas' head off with the gatekeeper, just to be safe. 
The Baylors are way too strong to face them head on and their eyes are weapons of mass destruction also capable of fine control over the elements. I almost fell for his mindless brute act, but unfortunately for him, I too like to be underestimated. Using my own conjured water against me was a smart move, exactly what I would have done in his shoes. That's why I used a tier 5 spell that used both water and darkness magic, once the water was imbued with his mana it couldn't hurt him, but the darkness was still mine. His lack of understanding of how tier 5 spells work was the deciding factor in his defeat. The barrage of spells Lith had employed while backstepping wasn't meant to harm to the Baylor so much as to keep him focused on Lith, and not notice the black veins tainting his own spell. Lith used invigoration to return to his peak condition while waiting for Rat Pack and studying Trubleskama's corpse. It didn't turn into smoke, allowing Lith to store him inside his pocket dimension, now let's hope this master is a reasonable guy, otherwise I'll call the army and I'll have him make this whole thing collapse. Lith thought. I found him. I found master. Rat Pack's voice was brimming with joy. He was holding an old battered skull with several teeth missing and cracks along its surface. Oh great, another lick. Lith said while rolling his eyes. The undead had a life force weaker than a regular human while his blood core, despite being almost completely red was reduced to the size of a pea. Nice to meet you, my name is Scourge. Do you have the strength to explain to me what's going on? Lith's magical beast name was his best alias available. Even in their evolved forms animals despised undead, they would never sell out one of their own in case the lick attempted something funny. Of course, dear Scourge. Licks didn't have any brain power to waste, so they would rarely care for names. Especially if they belong to an existence as fleeting as a human. It's so good to hear a voice which isn't mine or troubles. Is he already dead or can I have the pleasure of inflicting him with some pain, Forge? The red light of undeath animating the eyes stared in delight at the blood spattered on the walls. Trouble is dead. Do you mind introducing yourself and telling me what happened? Lith had a hard time not laughing. Between the liquor's weakened state and his memory, Lith's real identity was airtight. Right, sorry, Sarge. I'm Zolbrish. As for what happened here it's a bit of an embarrassing story. He said, Lith noticed that the cracks on the skull were disappearing and the missing teeth were popping up like mushrooms. As you surely know, being a lick isn't all fun and games. One of the most annoying things about it, is the need to keep your phylactery at hand. Zolbrish's words made no sense to him, but Lith just nodded and let him talk, according to Kala, young lichers would sooner or later go mad due to their prolonged isolation, or at least lose their common sense until time stabilized their mental condition, Zolbrish seemed to be a textbook case. Either that, or he had lost it after becoming an undead. It holds half of our soul, so the farther we get from it, the weaker we become. I set up this lab at the fringes of my phylactery's range. I was at my full strength and at the same time far away enough to check on the progress of my work. This whole complex was supposed to work as a relay point for my phylactery. If my experiment succeeded, I would have been able to expand my area of activity to the entire Keller region. Zolbrish sighed, damn it. Even becoming a lick is out of the question now. I always wondered why they never disguised their phylactery as a pebble and threw it in the ocean or something. I knew it was too good to be true. Lith thought. Everything was going fine. The mines provided me with all the silver I needed, the arrays amplified the signal, and my immortal minions provided me with an inexhaustible workforce. Zolbrish said. Wait a minute. Immortal minions? Lith echoed. Well, yes. Lesser undead are too stupid, greater undead are too dangerous in the long run, while living beings are so annoying. You have to feed them train them, and once they die you need to find a replacement. Rinse and repeat. To avoid the issue, I bound their souls to my phylactery, so that whatever happened to me would happen to them. It was the perfect solution. It guaranteed their loyalty and provided for most of their living expenses. Whenever of them dies, he is reborn with his memories. Whenever they are hungry, kill a few and let the others feast on the corpse. From farm to table. Zolbrish maniacal laugh gave lift the creeps, that's why some corpses disappeared upon death, while others remained. His device resurrects them only if the body is destroyed, or rather, stripped to the bone. This creature is raving mad. No wonder his minions revolted. The question is, how? Lith thought. Sure, the procedure has a survival rate of 0.01%, but monsters spawn fast and nobody misses them. No harm no foul. Or so I thought. Over time, I took two of my most intelligent minions as lab assistants. Dankar the orc and his mastery over magic crystals have proven invaluable for increasing the power of my creations. It took me a while to kill him into submission, but once the deed was done, the sky was the limit for my forge mastering. Yosmo the bailer with his eyes was a perfect amplifier for my spells. Sure, they would explode from time to time, but nothing that a swift death couldn't fix. What I didn't take into account is that, since their souls are stored next to mine inside the phylactery, the repeated cycles of death and rebirth allowed them to feel the energy flow, until they became able to manipulate it. Chapter 538 Those ungrateful dogs bid their time and waited for the moment when I was about to complete the amplification device to enact their plan. Yosmo attacked me while I was at my weakest, while Dankar used his crystal to redirect the energy from my phylactery to their bodies instead of mine. You can imagine the rest. Zolbrish said. His skeletal body was now complete and he was standing on his own. The liquor's blood core had returned to a normal size, but over half of it was black. So, after defeating you, they discovered they shared your limited freedom of movement. Lith said as Zolbrish nodded in approval. It explains why they didn't leave, despite having opened so many exits, but not what they are fighting for nor why they attacked the nearby city alarming the residents. There was never any love between Dankar and Yosmo, the only thing uniting them was their common enemy, me. Once they discovered how to use my life force to undo the effects of their race's fall, they wanted to kill each other. The first one who dies will be resurrected again, but will lose his grip on my life force, leaving the other one in possession of most of my powers. As for the attacks on the city, the explanation is quite simple. I chose only males as my slaves, to keep their number in check. Decades of sausage fest. With the monster's libido, it's no wonder they risked going so far despite their weakened state. They must have been looking for females. Lith thought. Why didn't trouble turn into smoke? He wasn't one of my servants, but one of my lab rats. 
With three eyes, he was quite a rare specimen, since Baylors usually have just one or two. I couldn't risk his life. I assume Yosmo didn't restore his strength, because he was one of the few that could leave for good. Zolgrish said. Only a few more questions. Lith said. What are you planning to do? And more importantly, are you willing to compensate me for my troubles? Well, dear Marge, in my weakened state I can take on my minions, but not their generals. As long as the amplifier is active, all the energy coming and going from my phylactery is under their control, while I'm stuck in the condition I was when they overpowered me. My plan is to shut down the device, get my strength back, and kill those bastards for good. I just need to touch my phylactery to banish their souls and send them. Into oblivion. As for your reward. Zolgrish walked to one of the open silver doors. A simple touch of his hand depowered it and another one took it off its hinges. Weakened or not, the lick was still quite powerful. Consider this an advance. Lith stored the door inside his pocket dimension, nodding in agreement. Yet he had no intention of trusting such a deranged creature. There was no telling what the lick would do once he regained his full powers. At the same time, turning down his help would have been foolish. Now that Lith knew about his opponent's limitations, worst case scenario he could always warp to safety and wait for the army. The two ringleaders would leave the complex and risk dying by his hand, while the weakened lick wasn't his match there, let alone if they fought near Jambel, away from the amplifier. Where is the device? Lith asked. On the fourth floor, but we better get moving. Without trouble constantly breaking me apart as a hobby, Dankar and Yosmo will have already noticed that I'm back at. Zolgrish waved at himself. Let's call this humiliating, inferior form my peak condition. He sighed. As I already told you, Bart, the three of us are linked. They are like dams that prevent the mana from my phylactery from flowing into me. I doubt they will come here in person, but their lieutenants are likely to be on their way. Lith cursed as he took point, moving towards the stairs. Master, Ratpack so happy to see you. Ranger and his bright lady scary. The little creature seemed to have gotten his spunk back. He looked at Lith with eyes full of disdain. Enough of your nonsense, Rat Pack. First, stealth is our best ally. Second, I told you countless times, ghosts don't exist. Lith didn't know whether to laugh or cry at an undead who didn't believe in supernatural. But master, she right here. She has very long hair, all dressed in gold and with many chains binding her. He said while pointing the air above Lith's right shoulder, can he really see me? Solus was astonished. Aside from the chains, the description fitted her. Sounds familiar. Can you describe her to me? Lith never stopped moving, looking left and right with life vision to avoid the enemies patrolling the seventh floor. She very tall. Ratpack said, good news, whatever he sees, it's not you. You're many things, but tall is not one of them. He's just delirious. Lith thought in relief, you jerk. I'm tall by his standards. With her 1.54 meters, 5 feet 1 inch, Solus was way taller than Ratpack who was just 1.3 meters, 4 feet 3 inches. Is she this big, with blonde floating hair, and a fat belly? Lith's words made Solus swear like an angry truck driver, it's not my fault if you don't have any other relevant features. Yes, yes, and Ratpack doesn't know. Dress cover her. Okay, now I'm positive he's delirious, no, think about it. Solus said. I'm in my ring form, so what he sees could be my soul, my real appearance. Ask him about my eyes, my face, everything. Can you describe her to me? Lith couldn't refuse her request, even though he found it ridiculous. She very ugly. Ratpack made Solus almost cry. She like you. Her brown eyes too big, ears too big, and her face creepy. She looks, kind. After a while Lith and Solus both realized that Ratpack used himself as a standard, making all humans ugly in his eyes. When he found even Tista's hologram disgusting, Solus sighed in relief, this moron can't distinguish Camilla from the queen, he's of no use. Lith thought, then, he asked him about what kind of dress the bright lady was wearing and if her chains had anything unusual. Both answers surprised Solus and Lith according to Ratpack, Solus was wearing a golden Roman toga and sandals. It was an attire outdated for centuries that Lith only knew about from the pictures in Mogar's history books. Chains all unusual. Ratpack said. She bound by two kinds of them. One is big and bind lady to you. Other one is thinner and restrain her. Two thin chains are broken and she keeps hammering a third. Chain makes sparks but hold, so lady never stops. How many chains are left? Lith's mind was spinning at top gear, but the only thing that came to him was the gemstones that appeared on her gauntlet form every time that Solus unlocked a new ability. She had recently developed a second one of which he had yet to make sense. Chapter 539. 4. You believe Ratpack? He asked. Yes. From your description, she reminds me of an old friend of mine who passed away long ago. Lith nodded, then, to Zolgra she asked, how can he see ghosts? What kind of creature is Ratpack? It would be nice if he could. The lick sighed. It would mean that at least he isn't a complete failure. Ratpack is a chimera, I made him by assembling the corpses of an elf child and a bailer. Then, I used necromancy to raise the corpse as a vampire. He was supposed to be the ultimate being. An immortal, natural shapeshifter vampire in perfect tune with the world energy like an elf, and with a bailer's evil eyes, capable of amplifying each of his spells. Instead, he kept the build of the child and the inability to handle the world energy of the bailers. Becoming a vampire messed things up even more because neither elves nor bailers usually become undead. That's why Ratpack is Ratpack. That said, ghosts do not exist. They are just a superstition, whereas undead are magical creatures, and magic is science. All undead can be killed and need to feed, but ghosts? What could they possibly eat? How could you destroy something that has no body? If ghosts were real, with all the people that die every day on Mogar, there would be more undead than living. Believe me, Snart, there is no return from death. The sadness in his voice surprised Lith, whoever she was, no matter how important she was to you, she's gone. The sooner you accept it, the better. Ratpack is funny and loyal, but he is not the sharpest tool in the shed. Yet Ratpack's words triggered something inside Solus, for a moment, she spaced out as unknown images and sounds flooded her mind. At first, she was running away from something. 
She had no idea what it was, but she knew that stopping or stumbling meant death. The vegetation of the woods kept whipping her face and a few pebbles had gotten inside her sandals, hurting her feet with every step she took. Her chest felt heavy, her breath was ragged yet she didn't dare to slow down. Then she was watching the sunset together with a woman so tall that she seemed like a giant, someone she called, Mom. Solus barely reached her hips, and was clinging to the woman's hand that was much bigger than her own. Stop daydreaming, child. A cranky feminine voice said. You can't become the next ruler of the flames if you don't focus on the forge. Yes, Master Mina Dion. Solus's voice replied as the purple flame in front of her shattered, returning her to Zoldrish's underground lab lift shared all the fear, the love, and the admiration she felt as the fleeting memories passed, but had no idea what was causing them until she shared her visions with him, are you thinking what I'm thinking? She asked, yes. As I've always told you, you are a person, not a thing. No matter if you were born human, beast, or tower. The moment you gained feeling and self-awareness you were a person to me. The only real revelation is that your memories aren't entirely lost. Lith replied, they both had hoped that, since she still remembered what the complete tower looked like and the passing of time after her late master's demise, Solus could recover part of her past together with her powers, yet after so many years with no sign of improvement, they had relinquished that thought. At least until that day. Now Solus could remember picking out a dress among many and the feeling of a silver hammer in her hand, they were too faint to be memories. They were more like impressions left by an action performed so many times to have left a mark in her subconscious. Solus didn't let herself be swayed by the joy those images brought her dot on the contrary, Master Manadian's words made her focus even more on their predicament, Lith, we need a plan. She said, to make one, we need information and rest. Have Zolbrish opened one of the rooms for you. Remember that you have been fighting non-stop ever since we entered the underground complex, Lith nodded. Even though he had used invigoration only twice, healing his wounds had taken a toll on his body. He needed to eat to restore his natural stamina, Zolbrish didn't like being ordered around, but without Lith his only asset was Rat Pack. He could only suck it up and open one of the doors on the seventh floor. After making sure no one had followed them, Lith sat down and took some food out of his pocket dimension. I get the part about shutting down the device, but how do you plan to do it? If it's the key to their power and they know of your escape, it's likely to be heavily guarded. Lith said while chewing beef jerky. What plan? You were so confident that I was just following your lead, dear Garb. It's not my problem if something goes wrong. Rat Pack and I cannot die. The Lich shrugged, Lith took some deep breaths to calm himself. Suddenly the underground complex looked like more like a tomb than a magnificent loot crate, this idiot is even more deranged than I thought. I need to contact the army as my backup plan. Worst case scenario, they destroy the complex, the Lich returns to wherever his phylactery is, and I can stage my death to get plausible deniability, if I make Zoldrish believe I'm dead due to the lab's collapse, he will not resent me. He thought, I don't get why Borge is so nervous. Zoldrish thought. Worst case scenario, I'll make the array surrounding the lab collapse and flatten the mountain. Sure, I'll lose my lab and Borge will lose his life, but he's just a human, that way, I get my powers back and destroy the device. It's a win-win. At least for me. Mean minds did indeed think alike. What kind of weapons do your minions have at their disposal? Lith asked. Only those I made for the kitchen staff. It's unbelievable how they struggle to butcher daily specials. I had to forge a few tools because they refused to give up. Some monsters are tough to kill barehanded and the meals ended being delayed. What about the treasury? Or the armory? Double lock. To open them they require my mana, to which sadly Yosmo and Dankar have access, and a combination. I never shared it with anyone, not even Rat Pack, so they should be safe. Zolbrish drummed his fingers on the ground. There was something he was missing. Oh, yeah. They're not proper weapons, but they could use the excavation and lab tools. They were never intended to be used in battle so their effects are simple, but they are quite powerful. That's just great. Lith said. Can you please tell me that you know what the abilities are of all the monsters who reverted to their pre-fallen state? I need at least one piece of good news. Sorry, but no. It was an unexpected development and they never bothered to share their discoveries with me, except when they used their newfound powers to kick the crap out of me. What I can tell you, is that Dankar has somehow shrunk his purple crystal into a ring. It allows him to stir the surrounding world energy as if it's a soup and to cast tier 5 spells non-stop. And he never learned tier 5 magic. Chapter 540 as for Yosmo, he went from a two-eyed bailer to a six-eyed one. The change made him physically weaker than before, but the raw power of each one of his spells is unparalleled. Fuck it. I need some fresh air. Lith said as he opened a warp steps which led as far from the lab as he could manage. Even if somehow someone followed him, they would be so weak that he could pulverize them in the blink of an eye. Rat Pack, the human seems to be a little touchy. Are you sure he is the strongest, smartest, bravest champion you could find? Zolbrish asked. Of course, master. What makes you so sure about it? He only survivor. All others died, so he best won. Ratpack said, Zolbrish slapped Ratpack's on the back of his head, wondering if Lamb would ever return. Asterisk, 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 while the Lick was cursing the gods for giving him Ratpack, Lith took out his army communicator the moment the warp steps closed behind him and called his handler. I've disposed of the next unit of monsters. Jambel is safe for now, but I've got bad news. The dungeon has turned out to be the abandoned lab of an ancient mage. It's not just their numbers that are a problem, but also the fact that some of them are mutated. Mutated how? Camilla asked. That word reminded her of the past monster outbreaks, making her worry. They are not like the wargs. Lith replied, almost reading her mind. Their behavior is like I expected it to be, only their abilities are boosted. Either it's selective breeding or magical enhancement of sorts, I don't know. The situation is very volatile, there are two dungeon masters, not just one. An ogre shaman and a bailer. Lith could almost hear Camilla flinching on the other side of the conversation. Lith was reporting nearly the truth, sticking to what Lord Wylan had already reported. Is there really a bailer? Camilla asked. More than one. Lith took out Trouble's body as proof. What's worse, they have access to some magical tools they managed to repurpose into weapons. 
So far the two groups were too busy fighting among themselves, but if they get out of there, we're talking about at least a thousand mutated monsters armed to the teeth. What's your plan? The more Camilla heard, the more worried she became, why the heck did I start an argument about his past? I don't want our last conversation to be a stupid quarrel. She thought. The complex has no array blocking dimensional magic, so I can get in and out of it fast. My plan is to create a distraction and kill the two leaders. If I manage to cut off the head of the snake, the rioting caused by the power vacuum should do the rest. I know I can do it, but I want you to keep a group of wardens on standby. If you don't hear from me within a few hours, send them to these coordinates and have them bring the whole complex down. Lith then confirmed the position of the entrances Baron Wyland had found to her and explained the nature of the arrays surrounding the place, making the wardens work much easier. If only I was a better warden and there wasn't a frigging lick involved, I could do it myself. This way when everything starts collapsing, Zolbrish will have no reason to suspect me. Copy that, Ranger Verhen. Please, remember that you can always pull out and wait for reinforcements. Camilla's hologram appeared suddenly. Her voice was professional and detached as always, but her eyes contained a desperate plea. I wish I could. That part at least was true. There's a big snowstorm incoming. If we don't settle this now, Jambel and its citizens will be completely isolated for days. Bad weather is nothing to an orc shaman, the monsters would slaughter them like lambs. Or rather, I can't live with a lick breathing down my neck for the destruction of his lab, he actually thought. Copy that. Camilla said. Before the hologram could completely disappear, Lith's civilian amulet pulled at his consciousness. Are you insane calling me from work? Your supervisor will flay you for that. Who cares? Are you all right? You have never called for backup before, not even for the Black Star. Be honest with me, how bad is it? She said, damn it, now I understand why on earth relationship in the workplace were frowned upon. Lying to my handler is one thing, doing it to my fear-stricken girlfriend is another. Lith thought. Pretty bad. Don't worry, though. If shit hits the ceiling, I'll warp out of there in the blink of an eye. Even a vengeful lick was better than a dead ranger. Please, be safe. Call me as soon as you're done with the mission, no matter the hour, okay? Lith nodded, knowing that no words could reassure her. He closed the call and walked back to Zolgrish. Did you have any brilliant ideas during your stroll? The lick sneered. Actually yes. Why don't we take a few weapons from your armory to make our lives easier? Lith asked. Because if I imprint them with my mana, Dankar and Yosmo could use them too if they get their hands on them. I don't trust Ratpack to use anything more dangerous than a broom, and whatever you imprint I would have no way to get back. Unless I were to kill you, of course. What if you consider it the rest of my payment? Lith couldn't refute that logic, but he could propose an alternative. And what would prevent you from abandoning me here? Maybe even taking a few souvenirs? It's not like I could stop you even if I wanted. I prefer to keep you motivated, Nolan. As Lith had predicted, they found little surveillance on the road to the fourth floor, where the device was located. Unfortunately, it was because most of the guards had been recalled to right in front of the lab's door. The orc shaman and the bailer hated each other, but they knew that if their former master were to regain his powers, he would turn their eternal lives into a living hell. Lith, Zolgrish, and Ratpack were stuck near the stairway leading from the fifth to the fourth underground floor. How does your minion's resurrection process work? I need to know if fighting them is worth the effort or if it would just be a waste of time and mana. Lith said. It works just like mine. Zolbrish replied. His condescending tone showed once again how the lit considered such information to be common sense. If my body gets completely destroyed, it takes me between one and three days to be regenerated near my phylactery back to my peak condition. The stronger one is, the longer it takes the phylactery to store enough word energy. It shouldn't take it more than a few minutes to restore those weaklings. Yet remember that if you don't destroy their bodies, they will remain corpses for a couple of hours. That's the optimal time required to feel dress and consume them. It should be more than enough to get in and shut down the device. You're worrying for nothing. I don't think so. We don't know who's inside the lab. Unfortunately, the lab was so full of powerful magics that life vision was as useless as mana sense. Chapter 541. And if they stall us long enough, reinforcements could destroy the bodies we left behind. If that happens, we'd end up surrounded and killed in no time. Luckily for me, I've got a better idea, Lith said. He was so used to relying on Solus's mana sense and on life vision that using fire vision felt wrong. It was one of Lith's oldest skills that he now used mostly to cook since life vision had proved to be superior in combat. Fire vision granted him the magical equivalent of thermal goggles, allowing him to see in the dark in a scale of colors according to the temperature of his surroundings. The lab was lit by light crystals that didn't emit heat, otherwise he would have been blinded. Fire vision provided no information about the strength of the enemy, but still could identify their position and size. Lith stood still for a while, studying the patrol's timing and routes, I can't afford to make mistakes. One false step and we'll be swarmed. Meeting Ratpack was a blessing in disguise. Without his information, I would have taken my sweet time opening the doors and who knows what could have happened. Lith thought that he worried more about the orc shaman than the bailer. As far as he knew, only the former could block his dimensional magic thanks to orcs' innate ability to manipulate mana crystals. Dimensional magic was a powerful tool. Lith relied on it for both offense and defense. Most of his contingency plans were impossible without it. After he was sure that he had a clear understanding of their situation, Lith went upstairs and followed one of the patrols. He cursed when he saw that they were all orcs reverted to their elven state. They moved lithe as cats, with lean limbs more fitting for a professional dancer than the brutes they were. The enemies would have spotted Lith's group immediately if not for the hush zone and the smell cancelling spell he had enveloped them with. Lith kept several spells at the ready while intently following the patrol movements with fire vision. The moment the orcs met a patrol of reverted ogres, Lith unleashed the spirit magic tendrils he had prepared and snapped their necks. Then, he waved his hand, making a warp steps appear below their feet. It moved the corpses into one of the cells on the seventh floor, of which Lith had memorized the coordinates and closed the door before leaving. Point ten elite enemies were swallowed by the dimensional corridor, and locked away in one fell swoop. No one could destroy their bodies now. Quick! We must move before the other patrols notice their disappearance. 
Lif said. Zolbrish nodded at what's his name ingenuity and followed his lead, together they quickly cleaned the external corridors of patrols. Even in his weakened state, Zolbrish had no problems using water magic to freeze his opponents and dimensional magic to lock them away. Once they reached the lab's nearest door, Lif made way for the lick. He didn't need life vision to know the door was enchanted. The many mana crystals fused into its surface couldn't be just for decoration. Zolbrish raised his skeletal right hand in front of the solid silver door, making a holographic spiral made of runes appear. Interesting. He said after the door refused to open. They have managed to tamper with my code. I wonder if their newfound intelligence comes from reverting the effects of the falling, or from mastering the connection with my essence now inhabiting their bodies. The latter possibility is kind of disturbing. The tinge of worry in the licker's voice made Lith even more paranoid than usual. While Zolbrish worked the door's command panel, he checked their surroundings again and prepared a few extra spells. My preparation was meticulous and the execution of my plan flawless, yet I can't help being worried. If Dankar and Yosmo really are this smart, then they're bound to be close. He thought, to make matters worse, they just need to tamper with one of the elements composing the world energy to seal my dimensional magic. There are too many things that can go wrong. Solus, be ready to intervene, she was careful to shapeshift slowly from under his sleeve, while the lick was still focused on the door. When her arm protector form manifested, she made it appear as though he had simply taken it out from a dimensional item. Zolbrish finally cracked the code and turned towards Lif. We're in. The lick said while looking at him like it was the first time they met. You seem different, somehow. Have you done something with your hair? The door opened, revealing the biggest forge mastering lab Lith had ever seen. It extended as far as the eye could see, taking up the entire floor. There was no room or wall separating the various sections of the lab, only pillars to keep the ceiling standing. The stone walls had been carved into bookshelves and each one of them was filled with ancient tomes or scrolls. The richly decorated spines of the books were the only element of color in the otherwise honey-hued stone surface. A blue, translucent force field covered all the bookshelves, protecting their content from the energy employed and released during the forge mastering experiments. Lith counted at least 20 forges. Forge was how forge masters referred to the silver tables they used for their work. Every forge inside the lab was covered in runes of power, which formed magic circles still pulsing with blue energy. Some circles were complete, others were works in progress, but all of them had an object resting on their center, ready to be enchanted. Much to Lith's surprise, the books were arranged according to a color code that went from black to white, going through the complete light spectrum. What the heck? Could he have split the books according to the mana core required? Solus, are you sure he isn't an awakened? Lith was already worried about orc shamans always being awakened ones. The idea that even the Baylor could become one by accessing Zoldrish's memories was enough to reconsider his plan, and call the army to have them raise the area, pretty sure. So far he has chanted all of his spells and his mana flow is static. Either he is a fake mage or he has lost his status of awakened together with most of his powers. My money on the former. She replied. What does the color code mean? Lith asked. He needed to make sure it was just a coincidence. What code? That would be an idiotic thing to do. The books are in alphabetical order. I had them bound that way so that each forge has its own room. Zolbrish walked double time towards the forge at the northwest end of the room, unlike the other silver tables, there was nothing on it except five concentric circles of runes that glowed with a golden light instead of the common blue. Where's the device? Lith said while sighing in relief. You're looking at it. The lick replied. Only amateurs use common silver tables for a masterpiece. True forge masters use adamant. It conducts mana as well as silver, but it's hundreds of times more resilient. Plus, you can shapeshift it into any form you may need. It makes it much easier to inscribe runes with perfect symmetry on the vessel for your spell since you have an ample surface that you can, later rearrange in the shape and size of your choosing. Chapter 542. At a wave of his hand, the silver table turned into a giant ring as big as a double door. Mystical energies flowed from the air into the construct as the space inside the ring was filled by a red and black essence that Lith, recognized as part of a blood core. I don't like it. Why is there no one in here? Lith asked while using all of his senses to scan the area. Because the security level was set so that anyone without my energy signature would die upon entering. At those words, Lith conjured several barriers as the gems on Solus Arm Protector form glowed with mana. Relax. I've disabled them. Zoldrish laughed at the ranger's panic. You idiot. Doesn't that mean that every one of those who share your essence could be waiting for us? Lith rebuked. Oh, please. You're simply. Zoldrish's amusement disappeared as dozens of reverted monsters wielding magical tools appeared from thin air. Right. Damn it. The lick waved his hand again, causing the ring to shapeshift back into a table. Not so fast. A deep and melodious voice said point two humanoid creatures appeared right next to the device. One was wearing a grey magician's robe, leaving only his head and hands exposed. He was 1.78 meters, 5 feet 10 inches, tall, with light brown skin and shoulder-length golden hair. His pointy ears parted his hair, revealing a slender neck which together with his delicate features gave him a feminine look. Only his pupils, flaming from the red mana coursing within, betrayed his real nature. On the ring finger of his right hand rested a purple ring made of crystal. Now that Dankar had activated it, it was filled with so much mana that it eclipsed the rest of the lab to Solus's mana sense. Whatever it is, it's not just a simple crystal. Solus tried to make sense of what she was staring at, it contains multiple different energy signatures, like it's composed of several living beings compressed together. How could an orc create a cursed object in so little time? The answer was that he didn't. Whenever an orc shaman used a powerful mana crystal long enough, they would leave an imprint on it. Their successors, if talented enough, could use such imprints to access part of their ancestors' experience and their most used spells. Recalling the spells of a single shaman was a hard and complex matter because the further in the past they had lived, the fainter their trace was and the harder it was to find it. Dankar was different. After recovering the abilities his race possessed before their fall, he had discovered that he was able to activate all of the imprints left by his forefathers. 
It was the residual mana from the past shamans that Solus had mistaken for life forces. Dankar was using part of the liquors, undead energies to keep them permanently active and have access to tier 4 and 5 spells. The residual mana mixed with the undead life force gave those echoes from the past semblance of life. Dankar believed he had conjured his ancestors' spirits and that they were guiding him from the netherworld, bestowing their knowledge upon him. Unfortunately, the truth was that by having so many memories flooding his mind along with centuries of hatred and rage, Dankar was on the verge of madness. He was constantly shaking his head, but not because of the effort from undoing Zolbrish's will. He was trying to make the voices in his head shut up long enough for him to achieve his goal. The second creature was bare chested, wearing only pants. Yosmo was 2.3 meters, 7 feet 7 inches, tall, with pale blue skin and a cascade of long silver hair reaching his waist. He had the body of a Greek god, with muscles that looked like they had been chiseled rather than trained. He had six eyes on his face, and six feathered wings emerging from his back. Each one of the eyes was a different color, based on the element inhabiting it, and so were his wings. The eyes on the creature's forehead were red and blue, those under his eyebrows were black and white, while those on his cheekbones were brown and yellow. Both Lith and Solus wondered if there was any connection between Baylor's and Lith's hybrid form. Aside from lacking a seventh one on the forehead, the Baylor's eyes were positioned exactly the same way. The wings on his back followed the same pattern as the eyes and seemed to be made of pure elemental energies. Power down this damn lab or they'll use it against us. Lith said as he conjured several streams of lightning to disperse the enemies and stop whatever Dankar was doing. Yosmo's yellow wing crackled like thunder, and suddenly Lith's spells were drawn to it like the wing was a powerful magnet. The yellow wing stored the energy and purified it from Lith's mana before transferring it to the yellow eye. Humans should not fight their gods. Yosmo said. His voice was quiet and solemn. There was no arrogance nor threat in it, he was only stating what he considered to be the truth. The dryad ogres joined their hands, forming a wall of vines that quickly surrounded Lith as several reverted trolls activated the tools in their forehands to strike him down. Through the openings their companions created for them, each troll wielded two golden staves, each with what looked like a ruby the size of an apple on their tops, which emitted jet streams of blue flames, while Zolbrish and Dankar were engaged in a battle of sheer willpower. Ratpack fled from the scene and hid inside the closest shadow, hoping that no one would notice him. The liquor's blood core was diminished, but his mind was intact. Even though Dankar was several times stronger than him and wielded the same energies, keeping them in check was a constant struggle for the orc. Zolbrish had no such problem. It was his energy, his lab. They both responded to his thoughts like they were an extension of his body. What are you waiting for? Destroy him. Dankar ordered to his orc elves. He was well aware that if it weren't for the purple crystal on his finger he would have already been bested. The mining tools the reverted orcs were equipped with looked like silver rods, about one meter, three, three feet, long, with topaz embedded along their sides. They amplified the mana they were imbued with to generate energy blades capable of easily cutting through rock. The orcs had spent countless hours in the mines, slaving away for the lick. Their mastery with the cutting tools was equaled only by their resentment for him, so as soon as Dankar gave the order, they had the rods in their hands shape their mana into the form of a mace and struck mercilessly at Zolbrish from every side. After being pulverized by trouble for months, what such weapons could inflict to the lick was merely discomfort. His pride was almost crushed seeing his creations used against him, seeing his slaves dare to raise their hand against their master, almost. Now that he was so close to the device, which Dankar was so kindly keeping half open, all the energy he would lose due to the wounds inflicted upon him would be absorbed by the ring and returned to him in barely a second. Countless possibilities appeared in Zolbrish's mind and a cruel smile would have formed on his face if only he had one. The situation is much better than I predicted. Mario is unlikely to survive, but hired help is always expendable. The Lick Thought Chapter 543 Zolbrish ignored the pain from his skeletal limbs being constantly crushed and regenerated, focusing on the adamant forge. Yosmo and Dankar are too close to the amplifier for me to open the control panel and shut it down. Dankara's obstinacy to keep it open means they needed me to activate it. Their control over my essence must be poor. He thought, I don't get why Luigi wants me to shut down the lab, but since he is likely to die, I might as well grant his last wish. The Lick stomped his foot on the power line of the array fueling the lab. Everything that didn't have his own pseudo core went dark, we're back baby. Lith and Solus thought in unison as most of the interference from their surroundings disappeared, making life vision and mana sense useful again. Lith had managed to survive up to that point only thanks to his multiple layered barrier. The wall of vines made up by the reverted ogres limited his movements, and the trolls would strike at him with their enchanted tools whenever he tried to escape the encirclement. Their staves emitted blue flames which reached thousands of degrees, capable of turning a man into charcoal with just one hit. Even when they missed, they made the air too hot to be breathable unless Lith cooled it down with water magic. To make matters worse, up to that point Yosmo had neutralized the spells Lith had conjured to defend himself with his wings. Not only did he almost cause Lith's death multiple times, but also all of his eyes were brimming with stored energy. I'll deal with him later. First I need to get rid of the trolls. Lith thought as he blinked right behind one of the reverted creatures. With life vision working again, the wall of vines no longer blocked his line of sight. Behind you. Yosmo warned them as the ranger came out from his exit point. Lith had Solus keep an eye on him, he couldn't afford any distraction in the task at hand, his arms moved like snakes, striking at each troll multiple times. The trolls laughed at his wasted efforts and unleashed new jets of blue flames. With their thick skin and powerful muscles, that kind of attacks didn't even tickle. On the contrary, they felt full of vigor. Or so they thought before falling to their knees, riding in agony. Lith's hits were weak because he knew brute strength and normal magic were pointless. Normal trolls' regenerative abilities made them hard to kill, whereas those in front of him would resurrect in a matter of minutes. Lith had to save his strength for and from Yosmo. He couldn't afford the bailer stealing any more of his mana, so the strikes were merely a vessel, each one imbued with a light spell. Healing magic was the troll's bane, overloading their already too efficient metabolism that caused their perpetual hunger. Lith's spells had pushed them to the brink of starvation. Their massive bodies shrunk like each passing second was a day spent fasting. Impressive. Yosmo gave him a nod of approval. Let's see how you fight when even your eyes betray you. Yosmo revealed that he was holding a small mirror in his left hand. He pointed it at the wall of living vines and then to himself, making them both disappear. 
There was no dimensional door and I can still hear the ogre dryad slithering on the floor. Is that invisibility? Lif asked. It must be that mirror's effect. Solus pondered, my guess is that it uses gravity magic to bend the light. That must be how they hid themselves waiting for Zoldrish to activate the device, thanks for the explanation, but how does that help? It doesn't. The field it creates is so fine that not even mana sense can pinpoint them. I can only give you an approximate location. Solus said as Lith felt a living wave crushing against him, the vines coiled around his body, turning visible once again. They tried to dig their way through his skin and orifices, gross. They didn't even buy me a drink first. Lith activated his tier 5 spell, setting Sunday. It generated a globe made of darkness imbued flames around him that engulfed all of the dryad's ogres attacking him. The two elements were fused together, allowing the dark energies to move at a speed that would otherwise be impossible. Setting Sun was a perfect offense and defense that would stay up until all of its mana was exhausted, but Lith didn't plan to use it for long, I thought you said that ogre's vines are resistant to fire. Wouldn't it have been better to use Ice Age, instead? Solus asked, that's exactly why I'm using it. Just like with the trolls, I don't want to kill them, just to make them suffer. Otherwise they'll just pop up again in an endless loop. Lith explained, the darkness magic quickly sapped the ogre's vitality, while the fire magic of setting sun inflicted them blinding pain but dealt little damage. The moment the vines writhed in agony off his body, Lith expanded the sphere of black flames outwards, revealing Yosmoa's position. As the Bayless gravity sheath dissolved, Lith could see Yosmoa's red and black wings brimming with power. He was trying to rob Lith of his spell, but to no avail, over the years, Lith had fought opponents more powerful than he was many times. It had almost cost him his life, but at the same time, the experiences had given him the opportunity to learn from them. He had devised setting sun after fighting Nalia, while Thrud Griffin and Manoha had taught him how to defeat an opponent capable of draining his mana. Just like the vortex generated by Thrud's meat puppets, Yosmoa's wings couldn't affect a spell animated by its caster's willpower. Lith had understood the nature of the reverted Baylor's powers after he had literally stolen his thunder, but feigned ignorance to lull Yosmoa's conceit. Such a powerful spell and no chant. You must be an awakened. Surprise and joy appeared on his face despite the black flames withering his skin, Lith had no time to waste bantering. He focused setting sun on his fingertips, making it rotate faster and faster, until he released it against the Baylor in the form of a giant spinning thorn. Meanwhile, the battle between Zolbrish and Dankar took an unexpected turn too. Hey, idiot. Do you know the origin of the term Lick? Zolbrish said. He grabbed one of the orc elves who, in the heat of the battle, had fallen prey to the orc's natural bloodlust, and come within arm's reach. A simple touch was all Zolbrish needed to leech the vitality of an opponent, but this time that wasn't his goal. The undead life force Dankar had shared with his lieutenant recognized its only true master and returned to him. Thanks for the meal. Each reverted orc contained only a small portion of Zolbrish's power, but it was enough to tip the scale of the battle in his favor. The orc elves attempted to escape, but the lick only needed one of the cantrips he kept at the ready to stop them. Some even conjured world energy to commit suicide, yet it only backfired. They were closer to Zoldrish than to the Amplifier, so the undead energy released upon their death ended up being siphoned by him. Chapter 544 Ragged clothes appeared on Zoldrish's skeleton as well as flesh and muscles, restoring part of his original appearance. Dankar started to panic, his willpower was consumed on too many fronts. He had to keep at bay the voices in his head, prevent the Amplifier from shutting down or lose any chance to control it, and fight the undead energies within him which were trying to return to their rightful vessel. How the heck does Yosmo control them so effortlessly? I'm a natural awakened, whereas Lix use fake magic, and Baylors are limited to tier 3 magic. Why am I losing against a pile of bones? He thought, the answer was actually simple. In his arrogance, Dankar had spread his resources too thin. As for Zolbrish, he had prepared plenty of spells on his way to the lab. Until he lost his focus or run out of spells, he was as powerful as an awakened .to add insult to injury. He only needed to beckon to call back his energies and the closer he got to Dankar, the harder it was for the orc to keep them in check. Zolbrish was solely focused on the shaman, so Yosmo could afford to let the undead energies escape from his body just to capture them again with his black wing. Dankar called, upon his ancestors to conjure the ancient elven tier 5 spell, Lighthouse. It trapped the lick inside a hard light construct shaped like a cube that contained a small tornado. Zolbrish wasn't afraid of being ripped to shreds by the violent air currents, so much as he was surprised by the offensive light spell. He had never seen one before. Not bad, but let's see if this thing is as strong as it looks. The lick snapped his fingers to release the tier 5 spell Raging Sunday. It filled the cube with a blast of purple flames that dispersed the air currents forming the tornado, adding the orc spell power to its own. The resulting explosion made the sides of the cube crack as the lick took control of the shockwaves it generated with air magic, and sent them back and forth against the weak points the two colliding spells had created. It was an impossible strategy for any creature, living or not. Zolbrish could ignore the damage he received only because he had no vitals. You fool. He laughed as his bones kept cracking and healing. You should have let the device shut down. It would have taken me hours instead of seconds to regain my strength. The closer I get to it, the stronger I become. It's like being next to my phylactery to me. Thanks for the information, old man. Dankar replied. He sent the cube rolling to the opposite side of the room, following it closely to not lose control of his spell. If darkness magic's weakness was its speed, for light magic it was its range. But I need the amplifier to take everything from you, just like you took everything away from me. My dignity, my honor, even my life. I'll use your life's work to escape from this cage and torture you until the end of time. What a coincidence. It's the end of time o'clock for you. Right, Rat Pack? At those words, Dankar realized to have brought the lick in the spot he had seen the small maggot disappear, Rat Pack emerged from the shadows, stabbing Dankar with his coward's knife multiple times before the shaman could even turn around. The enchanted blade was a long dagger for a man, but it was a short sword to Rat Pack, Zolbrish had infused it with light and darkness magic. The darkness spell acted as a venom against living beings and as an acid against everything else. The light element closed the wounds the moment they were opened. The forced healing would sap its victim's stamina and accelerate the spreading of the venom through their body by enhancing their metabolism. 
Dankar managed to stop the darkness spell with one of his own, but he was helpless against the light magic which broke both his focus and his spell. As soon as the cube shattered, Zolgrish dashed forward and grabbed the shaman's face with his hands as he summoned back the undead energies that had been stolen from him. Thanks, you idiot. I would have never escaped from that thing on my own. Zolgrish said. You're welcome, master. Rapak said while turning into a puff of smoke to avoid the lightning bolts the orc had unleashed trying to get rid of the small pest. Not you. I mean, yes you helped me, but it was sarcasm. Zolgrish sighed at the ruined moment. He had been on his last leg, focusing all of his remaining mana on the healing process to pretend that he was stronger than he appeared to be. Recovering from small wounds like those the tools inflicted was one thing, withstanding tier 5 spells was another. The Lick had deceived his captor hoping that Ratpack would find the courage to step in the fight. The moment the Lick and the Shaman came into contact, they started a tug of war for the control over the undead energies trapped inside the orc's body. Point one second the Lick looked almost human, with pink skin covering his face and pretty clothes over his body, whereas the orc was once again a bald, tall brute. The next moment, Zolgrish was reduced to two arms connected to his skull only by the shoulders, and Dankar looked more magnificent than ever, the world energy would burst out of his body, forming a crown of pure mana above his head and making his skin shine as he had turned into a god. Oh crap! Zolgrish said. He hadn't realized that the channel he had opened between the shaman and him could go both ways. Even though the undead energy well remembered his touch, now that they were so close Dankar could use his crystal ring to steal the little life essence that the lick had left. Ratpack! Zalma! I need help! He said, unluckily, Ratpack had run out of courage, and Lith had his plate full. Damn it! Do you want to dance? Fine, but I'll lead. The moment Zolgrish regained the upper hand, he walked them away. Yosmo was still busy dealing with Lith, but after the Licker's call for help, he had noticed how dangerous his situation was. If Zolgrish managed to strip the undead energies from Dankar, he would be the next. If it was the Orc Shaman to emerge victorious, they would no longer be equal and the Baylor's fate would be sealed anyway. He ignored Lith's setting sun and darted forward to stop Dankar, but the Lick beat him to the punch, moving his fight to an unknown location. A searing pain spread from the Baylor's light wing as Lith pierced it with his spell, if I'm right, as long as he has all six wings, he should be able to use some kind of invigoration by absorbing the six elements that make up the world energy. To gain an edge, I must cripple his recovery abilities, without his light wing, all the damage I inflict to him will be permanent and he will be unable to recover his mana too. Two birds with one stone. Lith thought, Yosmo couldn't agree more. His conceited expression was replaced by worry as the thorn made of black flames turned most of the white feathers into ashes. He turned around to protect his exposed back, but Lith managed to follow his movements thanks to air fusion. The Baylor yelled in outrage realizing his mistake. His power was unmatched, but he couldn't cast spells against someone outside his line of sight. Chapter 545. A Baylor's body was unable to channel mana. It was one of the reasons why millennia ago such a powerful race had attempted to force their evolution, and ended up joining the ranks of the fallen races, unlike all other creatures, they could conjure spells only through their eyes, making it vital for them to always face their opponents. Their other biggest limitation was their inability to cast spells above tier 3. The highest tiers of magic required to fuse, and manipulate multiple elements at will, while each one of the Baylor's eyes could only handle one specific element. Activating more than one eye at a time was possible, but they were unable to cooperate. The only exception was the creation of hard constructs, like weapons or armors made from ice. They could be infused with multiple elements, but always one at the time, Baylors couldn't use gravity magic, dimensional magic, nor complex arrays. They were unstoppable soldiers on the battlefield, yet as a race, they had been dependent on others for the creation of even the simplest enchanted item, Yosmo activated his red eye, turning all the agonizing monsters lying on the floor into cinders. Their corpses turned into spheres of smoke that orbited around the amplifier. The device started to reconstruct their bodies at a speed visible at the naked eye, then, the Baylor activated his yellow wing, obtaining the same effects of air fusion. The sudden boost in speed allowed him to escape from Lith and put some distance between them. Lith cursed when he noticed that Yosmo was capable of using his white eye to slowly regenerate the white wing, yet his mood improved when he noticed that the mana it stored wasn't being replenished, it seems that wings and eyes are connected. Lith thought, indeed. Unlike trouble, Yosmo's eyes cannot accumulate world energy on their own. A wounded wing means he cannot recharge the corresponding element, we can't allow him to buy even one second. Solus pointed out, Lith darted forward, using a flight spell to match the opponent's speed. The Baylor was forced to interrupt his healing spell to activate his yellow wing. It allowed him to negate Lith's air magic and unleash the lightning bolts he had previously stored. Or so he believed, after fighting Thrud, Lith had spent hours learning how to infuse his will even inside low tiered spells, so Yosmo's attempt to slow him down failed. The focus needed to succeed prevented Lith from retaliating to the incoming lightning pillar, but he didn't need to. Solus opened a small warp steps in front of them, which redirected the massive spell against the amplifier. The adamant it was made of and the enchantments protecting it resisted the assault, but the monsters surrounding it weren't so lucky. They had yet to regain half of their bodies that they were once again reduced to smoke and ashes. Nice artifact, human. I have some too. Yosmo said. A small silver sphere in his right hand shone with the intensity of a small sun as he launched himself against the enemy. Lith was aware of the enormous gap in physical strength between them, but time wasn't on his side. Stalling meant giving the Baylor the opportunity to recover his light wing and his minions, to add insult to injury, I don't know if Zolgrish will prevail. I might be able to deal with one of those reverted monsters at a time, but if they team up, I'll be forced to leave. I'm greedy, not idiotic. He thought. Lith had noticed several completed artifacts still lying on the forges. If the Lick failed his mission, Lith was willing to collect everything he could on his way out as compensation, Lith dodged to the side, avoiding a head-on clash with the Baylor, and cast another tier 5 spell, Stormnado. It was a mix of air and darkness, that conjured a thunderstorm of poisonous gas. The destructive mass of energy and the lab defenses clashed as Lith made sure the amplifier was caught in the area of effect of his spell, delaying the reverted monster's resurrection even longer, Yosmo appreciated Stormnado's prowess, considering the pain it inflicted him like a foretaste of the power he would wield once he completely assimilated the Licker's essence. His plan was now actually twofold. 
If before his aim was to undo his own fallen state and overcome his ancient limitations, capturing Lith would open endless possibilities to him. If I can steal the secret of awakening, Dankar will be no match for me. Both my body and magic are superior to his. If not for him being an awakened, I would have long had him under my heel. He thought, Yosmo activated his yellow and black wing, but this time he didn't try to absorb Lith's spells. He instead reverted the flow, sending mana from his eyes to his wings and making the corresponding elements in the world energy unstable. No matter how much, Lith focused, nor the amount of mana he pumped into Stormnado. The spell waned as the two elements composing it became unable to coexist. What's happening? Lith took the gatekeeper out of his pocket dimension. His flight spell failed him too, and he couldn't afford to waste more mana. It must be what Zoldrish talked us about. A reverted Baylor can not only drain the world energy through their wings, but they can also use their stored mana to upset the balance and disrupt our magic. To cast an air or darkness spell, you have to counterbalance the distortion Yosmo caused. Solar said, easier said than done. Damn lick, stirring the world energy my pale ass, this is jamming. Lith didn't like his odds. The Baylor spell seemed to be unaffected by the mana distortion, making him apparently even more dangerous than the Orc Shaman and his crystal. Lith infused himself with all the elements and prepared for the worse. Yosmo's eyes lit up one after the other, emitting highly compressed elemental beams. Lith dodged with a roll, but the beams kept following him wherever he moved. They were so powerful that even the blue translucent barrier protecting the library couldn't keep up. Only the presence of a second barrier below the first one prevented the precious tomes from being destroyed. Stop running. I need you alive, not healthy. Yosmo said as his eyes darted along the room to follow Lith's irregular footwork. Despite his words, every one of his attacks had been aimed to Lith's vitals, any brilliant ideas? Lith was almost out of breath. Escaping on foot from a flying enemy while dodging the elemental beams was a mammoth task, yes. Don't get caught. I don't like how he keeps that shining sphere at hand. Solus replied, the good news is that between his jamming and his unrelenting attack, Yosmo is almost out of darkness and air magic. Lith didn't find any solace in her words. Three or five rays made no difference to him, the Baylor only needed one to kill him. Lith took cover behind the amplifier, hoping that the enemy wouldn't take the risk of damaging it. He was right. His move caught Yosmo by surprise, forcing him to spin like a top to look away from the priceless device. Lith managed to get a single breath worth of energy from invigoration before the Baylor resumed the chase, but it was enough. Chapter 546 the short moment Yosmo needed to deactivate his elemental beams allowed Lith to feel with his body the change caused by the Baylor in the world energy and react accordingly. He took flight again and activated a second Stormnado, which sent Yosmo crashing against the wall. I stand corrected, this guy is less dangerous than a shaman's crystal. He can't deplete the world energy of a specific element, only alter its balance. I can still use all elements as long as I compensate for the disturbance. Lith thought, his enthusiasm was short lived. Yosmo kicked the wall with all of his strength, turning into a living bullet. Lith managed to dodge and put some distance between them, but another barrage of beams aimed to his heart, forced him to slow down enough for the Baylor to catch up with him. A fist the size of a bowling ball struck at his chest while he was in midair, crushing his ribs and squeezing the air out of his lungs as he was sent flying. This cannot be. Lith thought. Not even the idiot in dragon form hit me so hard. How is? He almost choked on his question when he noticed that the skinwalker armor was now of the same plain gray color it had before being imprinted with his mana. Yosmo caught up with him again, ready to strike, but Lith intercepted his fist with the gatekeeper sword. The blade infused with darkness, fire, and air magic made short work of the Baylor's fingers until it hit the silver sphere and went dead. Without its enchantments, the gatekeeper couldn't resist the impact, and a cobweb of cracks spread from the point of impact to all of its surface. Lith had barely the time to store it inside his pocket dimension that Yosmo's right hand closed around Solus's arm protector, fuck, I know that spell. That's clean slate. Lith thought. It was a tier for Forge Master spell, which generated a combined pulse of light and darkness magic. It temporarily short-circuited the imprint on any magical item, making it useless. Lith had learned it after becoming a spellbreaker, but he had never bothered to convert it into true magic because of its harsh limitations. It required physical contact, hence it was useless in battle any enemy he could touch, Lith could kill. Death too would remove any imprint and he could inflict it from distance. Clean Slate was also ineffective against booby traps and barriers. The two effects combined meant that any explosive device would blow up in his face, and that he couldn't use it to open shielded doors like those of Zoldrish's lab the arm protector didn't budge, but Lith's shoulder wasn't so lucky. Yosmo dislocated it with the same ease as if he was breaking a twig and kept pulling. The pain was enough to make an adult man faint, but Lith had already shut down his receptors. A second flash from the silver sphere and the arm protector went as limp as Lith's arm, allowing the bailer to take it away. Impressive. I would have never thought there was something Zoldrish's magic couldn't steal. Lith replied by stopping his attempt to fly away. Air magic supported the bailer's wings, making him faster than he ever could. While they were fighting in midair, Lith grabbed Yosmo's silver air with his good arm and struck at his nose with a knee. Blood and teeth scattered throughout the room as Lith used the energy that his tear for spell, vampiric touch, stole from Yosmo to fix his injured arm. Lith followed up by extending his leg like a spring and kicking the Baylor's chin like a horse, Yosmo crashed against a library, but he never stopped smiling. It's over, human. He said showing Lith his perfectly healed right hand and light wing. We can do this all day and the result would be the same. You can fight, but you cannot win. Lith sneered, using the time the Baylor was wasting trying to crush his spirit to use invigoration and recover his strength. Foolish mortal. Through his white eye, Yosmo could check Lith's condition with the same accuracy as a diagnostic spell. He spread his six wings, sucking the world energy and returning to his peak condition. You only have two choices. Teach me the secret of awakening or die. Why do you think you're still alive? Because you're weak. Not for a lack of trying. Usually, Lith wouldn't speak to the daily madman, but by breaking his imprint on Solus, Yosmo had managed to accomplish something that many before him had attempted and failed to do. He had made Lith angry. Stop wasting my time with your yapping and give my artifact back to me. Yosmo laughed and pressed the protector against his right arm. The artifact grew in size until it fit like a glove. The lick is a thief and a liar. He trapped you just like he trapped us. You had no chance to begin with. 
Soon Dankar will be back. Soon my minions will revive. You couldn't defeat me even with all of your precious artifacts. What do you think you can do now that you've got nothing and are alone? No. Lith shook his head while emitting a strong deep blue aura which infused him with all the elements. Not alone. As Lith bolted forward, Solus's arm protector shrunk again, using spirit magic to boost her own strength and crush Yosmoa's arm in the process. At the same time, she unleashed both her most powerful spells against her helpless enemy, Clean Slate could break any normal imprint, but not the bond between her and Lith. Only specific artifacts, like Nalia's box, were capable of such a feat otherwise destroying cursed objects like the Black Star wouldn't have been so difficult. Solus had a will of her own, so she could restore Lith's imprint the moment it was jammed. Clean Slate was like getting slapped to her. It was painful, but far from enough to make her lose consciousness, still, both Lith and her could feel their bond was being threatened, their mind slipping out of cinch, even though for just a split second. It triggered the trauma Nalia had inflicted them when she had forcefully separated them. Solus injected her tier 4 death zone and tier 5 spirit of decay directly inside the Baylor's body to vent out her rage, spreading them like a disease that made her victim rot from the inside. Physical contact made darkness magic capable of achieving its maximum potential, even more so now that Solus had the inside of the arm protector turn into countless thorns that pierced Yosmo's flesh until they cut his bones, the two darkness spells coursed through Yosmo, draining his vitality like he had been gutted and making him fall to his knees. He activated his black wing to stop or at least weaken them while his white eye mended the damage. It was bound to work since, Solus's green mana core couldn't resist for long to the raw strength Yosmo possessed. As long as his light wing was undamaged, it would provide his white eye endless mana, when the infinite clashed with the finite, the outcome was written in stone. That was why Lith's first move was to pierce the white eye with his extended fingers while releasing electricity from his fingertips. Chapter 547 Even though their improvised trap had been a success, Lith lived it as a defeat. The enemy had forced Solus off his arm and stolen her from him. She had left of her own will, to prevent Lith's limb from being ripped off and then planned the counterattack with him via their mind link. Lith appreciated the brilliance of their plan. It had created an opportunity and broken the slippery stalemate they had been stuck in, yet he didn't like it one bit. He had already spent one lifetime being robbed of everything and everyone he held dear. Lith wasn't willing to lose anything or anyone else. After losing Carl to a drunken driver, after almost losing Solus due to Nalia's scheming, Lith had sworn that as long as he drew breath, his destiny would be his own, clean slate had hurt Solus, and her pain was his pain. In Lith's eyes, Yosmo was Nalia back from the grave, attempting once again to take Solus away from him. Lith was happy the Baylor couldn't die, because it meant there was no end to the pain he could inflict him, Solus did her part, forcing Yosmo to focus on his rotting body and almost forget about Lith's existence. When he darted forward, the Baylor activated his other four eyes. Rat Pack emerged from the shadows on his blind side, spinning above his head the bundle of chains and envelops that was his, enchanted chainmail, the small undead threw it at Yosmo's head and hitting him with a thud. The chains melted over his face while the burning letter set the Baylor's hair ablaze. The sudden distraction plus the close range made the elemental beam's trajectory telegraphed, Lith dodged them and struck at the white eye, pumping bolts of lighting inside of it so that they would strike the Baylor's brain and burn the surrounding tissues. Yosmo screamed in outrage as his light wing went dark. It works. I knew not even master so cruel to deceive Rat Pack. Chainmail really is Baylor's bane. He said as his coward's mantle made him ethereal again. Taking a cheap shot was one thing, facing Yosmo was another, without the eye to store the light element, the white wing was no better than a pigeon's. Now only the black wing's jamming effect remained. Solus pushed forward with the last of her energy and spread the dark energies to the creature's lungs. Darkness fusion prevented Yosmo from feeling pain, but he still needed to breathe. His body wasn't able to follow Lith's speed anymore. The bailer extended his left arm to grab the ranger, only to have it deflected to the side as Lith struck at its exposed elbow with his OWN.N no matter how strong the enemy was, joints couldn't be trained. With his right arm turned into a pulp and the left one shattered at an unnatural angle, Yosmo couldn't react when Lith moved behind him, and ripped off his black and yellow wings. Solus's spells had corrupted his lungs to the point that he could barely breathe. After that, she focused the dark energy against the bailer's eyes until only empty sockets remained. Yosmo was helpless as a newborn in front of an adult as Lith removed his wings and then his legs, are you alright, Solus? Lith asked as soon as she returned to him, Peachy, thanks. I'm just exhausted for going all out. I need to use invigoration or it will take me hours to recover, take your time while I fix the last details. Lith took out the gatekeeper's sword and opened a warp steps that sent Yosmo inside one of the closed cells, Lith couldn't afford to kill him, otherwise Dankar would become even stronger by assimilating the liquor's life force that resided within the Baylor's battered body. The skinwalker armor was still inactive. But it had suffered only minor damages. The gatekeeper, however, seemed to be on the brink of shattering, so Lith placed it on a nearby silver table, waiting for his enchanted items to reactivate. Sola stored both the invisibility mirror and the clean slate sphere inside her pocket dimension, alongside with all the artifacts she had stolen from Yosmo while pretending to be under his control. They still bore his imprint and couldn't be used until he was alive. Only when she was sure that their defeated enemy had no way to harm them did she activate invigoration to refill her green mana core. While she wasn't linked to a mana geezer, her only medium with the world energy was Lith's body. It made her recovery speed much slower than a normal awakened, and put stress on her companion who had to absorb and refine the world energy for her. Performing the breathing technique with his mouth while keeping his strain to a minimum required her full focus, making it impossible for her to use any of her magical senses. It was the reason why she avoided taking part in the fights unless it was strictly necessary. Not having much to do, Lith studied the items on the forges looking for something useful, unluckily, Dankar and Yosmo had already taken all the artifacts the Lick had completed, leaving behind only items that had yet to be enchanted. Even the library proved to be off limits for him. The translucent blue barrier didn't harm him but didn't let him reach the books either. I can't give it a try at cracking those protections until I know what happened to Zolgrish. If he comes back and finds me messing with his stuff, he will not be pleased. Lith thought. As soon as the monsters who had died during the previous battle resurrected, Lith crippled them too before sending them in an empty cell. At that point, Clean Slate's effect wore off, Lith imprinted and restored the Skinwalker armor before moving to the gatekeeper. 
Invigoration revealed to him that although the sword's pseudo core was still intact, the damage was so extensive that even a weak impact could bring it beyond the point of recovery. It was like a patient on the verge of starvation. Lith couldn't infuse it with massive doses of mana, otherwise, the same energies meant to save it would make it crumble. He injected into the blade small amounts of mana, triggering its self repair properties. Now that Solus was done recovering, she helped him by coating the blade like a mold and redirecting the energy where it was needed the most. It's better if we stop now. Solus said, The pseudo core is almost exhausted. It needs some time to recharge. Lith observed the sword for a moment before sheathing it. It was still too damaged to be of any use in battle, but at least it was no longer in danger of shattering. Rat pack? Lith called, the small undead emerged from the shadows a few seconds later, when he was sure that no enemy was still around and that Lith wasn't angry at him. You welcome. Rat pack said. I told you chainmail powerful artifact. He puffed out his chest with pride. Your help was unnecessary. I was about to blink, but your meddling ruined my plan. If Yosmo had started shaking his head in pain, no exit point would have been safe. You welcome. Rat pack didn't budge. Chapter 548. Lith looked at his clock. There was still half an hour before the warden sent by the army would start tearing down the underground complex. He had no intention of calling off the attack. Not until he was sure that the orc shaman was no more. Can you turn off the device? Lith asked Ratpak while pointing at the amplifier. No. We must wait for master. Lith cursed his bad luck and used clean slate on the barrier surrounding the amplifier to no avail. The spell required physical contact to work and the paranoid lick had shielded his creation on purpose. Invigoration 2 worked in a similar way, so that Lith's only way to pass time was to study the pseudo core of the various barriers around the lab, hoping that Solus could reproduce them to improve her tower form's defenses. Asterisk, 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 Zolgrish, and Dankar were locked in a deadly embrace. None of them could allow to let go of the other because the undead energies kept moving back and forth from their bodies. Choosing the wrong moment to push away the opponent would have meant to lose all hope of regaining their freedom. The lick would end up being trapped inside a body even inferior to that of a skeleton forever, while the orc shaman would have been reverted to his fallen state. To add insult to injury, he would be crushed under the weight of his magic crystal, and be defeated without even getting a chance to fight back. He was able to keep the crystal compressed in the form of a ring, only thanks to the undead energies coursing through his body. They restored the powers his bloodline possessed before the fall and granted him the lick's inhuman strength, even if it appeared small, the ring actually weighed over a hundred kilograms, something he couldn't lift with just one finger in his orc form. The tug of war of sheer willpower was quite balanced. The orc elf drew his strength from the grudge he held against the lick and from the echoes of the past shamans inhabiting his ring. The moment they perceived the Licker's mind, they stopped harassing Dankar and joined his efforts. Having mistaken Zolgrish for a member of the dreaded demon race, despite his current madness, Zolgrish had the indomitable will of all those who had not only sacrificed most of their humanity to achieve lichhood, but also had survived the excruciating pain that severing part of their soul and mana core involved. He had the home advantage as well, since it was his body that the undead energies were supposed to inhabit. Unfortunately, the long imprisonment the Lick had undergone and the support the magic crystal gave Dankar were enough to even the field. I knew I should have never bestowed upon you such a huge crystal, you ungrateful dog. Without me, you would be no better than a wild beast, only worried about your survival. The Lick said. Without you, I would still have my tribe and my dreams. You slaughtered them all for your experiments and enslaved me. Yours are no gifts, but curses. Dankar rebuked, Zolbrish had walked them to the disciplining hall, where he had killed Dankar over and over again to break him into submission. He hoped that both his words and the dreadful memories linked to such a place would give him an edge, yet the orc elf didn't flinch. Contrary to Zolbrish's expectations, his maneuver backfired. Up until that moment, the Lickers will have been like a black fog, slowly engulfing everything on its path, whereas the orcs had been like a fire fueled by his hatred that consumed the darkness on its wake. Now the fire in Dankara's mind became a focused jet stream of flames that pierced the black fog, forcing Zolgrish on his knees. Dankar could feel the undead energies abandoning the lick and submitting to their new master. You're finished old man. You'll spend the rest of your eternal life as a slave in my minds. Dankar cast the tier 3 darkness spell corrosion. It conjured a thin fog that consumed what little was left of Zolgrish's body to finish him off. Am I? Zolgrish replied with a smug voice, using magic required focus, focus that Dankar had to withdraw from their battle of will, leaving himself exposed. The black fog which represented the Licker's dominance let the orcs fire pass, attacking it from the sides and the back. Dankar lost control over the undead energy as well as over his spell, which faded into nothingness. No matter the form you take, an idiot will always be an idiot. Zolbrish was now dressed in a luxurious golden mage robe. His face would have been mistaken for a human's if not for the red light of undeath burning in his eyes. Instead of pupils. To looked like a skeleton, a rotting corpse, or exactly as they were on the moment of their death, it was just a matter of choice for a lick. Rage by itself it's useless. I knew that if I'd have you worked up enough, you'd do something stupid. Once you get an edge, you have to consolidate it, like this. Zolbrish was aware, that it was only a matter of time before Dankar recovered. He had only a few seconds left before they went back to a stalemate. So, instead of wasting focus casting a spell he couldn't control, he used it to grip the orc's finger strong enough to take off the ring and throw it away, suddenly Dankar was alone and much weaker. Without the crystal, he couldn't draw upon the world energy to heal from the wounds that the Licker's deadly touch inflicted upon him, nor he could use his ancestor's will to reinforce his own. I need no crystal. Dankar said. Just like Zolbrish had done a second ago, now it was his turn to retrieve most of the undead energy. His rage burned stronger for having fallen for the Licker's trickery and allowed him to push the black fog back. A crown made of world energy materialized above his head and his grip grew in strength to the point of cracking the Licker's fingers. Zolbrish inwardly cursed his bad luck. Apparently, what his unwilling assistant lacked in cunning, he made up with fury. Asterisk 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 Lith had just finished studying the pseudo core of all the Licker's creations, he could put his hands on when a warp steps opened right in the middle of the lab the humanoid figure who stepped out of it was that of a tall man with pointy ears wearing a golden magician robe. The world energy accumulated inside his body formed a crown of pure mana above his head, and made his skin shine like the god of light had descended among men. Dankar defeated master. Every undead for himself. 
Ratpack had prudently remained near the door and so had Lith. Yet while the small creature bolted away, Lith stood still with a warp steps at the ready. There was something odd in the Orc Shaman's energy signature. Zelda. It's so nice to see you defeated that treacherous Baylor. I was going to thank Ratpack too, but that idiot ruined the moment. Again. The lick side, Lith wasn't upset by Zoldrish not remembering his name right not even once, as much as worried by the inexorable ticking of time. Chapter 549. Pointy ears, shining skin. Were you really an elf when you were alive? Lith asked. Less than twenty minutes remained before the army brought down the house, yet while dealing with a deranged immortal, he needed tact an opportunity to break the bad news. That or a timely escape pretending to not know anything about what was happening. Lith had to play it by ear. What? Gods, no. It would make me a self-righteous jerk. This is just a side effect of draining so many pseudo-elves. It will fade in due time. I am, or better, I was human. Zoldrish walked to the device, dispelling the barrier which enveloped it with a wave of his hand, then, he needed a short chant to turn it off and a longer one to make the spells imbued inside the adamant ring go haywire and destroy the artifact. Once a forge mastering process was complete, it couldn't be redone. Yosmo and Dankar had corrupted the amplifier forever, Zoldrish had no way to amend their tampering. The artifact's destruction freed the souls trapped inside the spheres of smoke which were orbiting around it, waiting to be provided with new bodies, each one of them released a small pillar of light that shot toward the sky, filling the lab's stale air with a feeling of joy. Lith instinctively released death vision to watch at the scene unfolding in front of him. I in his eyes, the space occupied by the amplifier looked like a black hole collapsing on itself. Without its constant pull, the souls of the creatures imprisoned within the underground complex were released. At first, only a few managed to leave, but as the black hole disappeared, more and more souls escaped its grasp until a hail of shooting starts almost blinded Lith. Yet he had no time to appreciate the light show, nor to wonder why he could feel the souls' fleeting emotions where a soulless couldn't. His eyes were fixated on Zoldrish, who under the effect of death vision died several times in the space of a few seconds, but always in the same way. His body would revert into a cracked skeleton before it turned to dust, just like the Duchess back at Journey's birthday party. Fuck me sideways. That woman was a lick too. That must be what happens when you break their phylactery. The only question remaining is if the royals are aware of the Duchess' real identity and if so, how they deal with the undead nobles under their rule. Lith thought. This is a disaster. Zolbrish sighed. Without Dankar and Yosmo I can't make another amplifier. I wasted years to build this place, more years to equip it with all the instruments I needed, and decades to make that goddamn thing. It's the biggest failure of my career. His rage was almost tangible and the mana currents he was emitting were so violent that Death Vision stopped showing his demise. To make matters even worse, those horny monkeys and their raids have given away the lab's position. Even if they didn't, only someone dumb, blind, and deaf could miss all those fireworks. I need to get out of here. Zoldrish restored his lab's power, making life vision and mana sense useless once again. About my payment. Lith didn't like the sudden turns of events. The lick was in a hurry, turning lots of levers and pressing even more buttons on the various holographic panels which appeared above the various forges. The amount of mana in the air was getting thicker by the second, making Lith's skin crawl. Yes, yes. I haven't forgotten. Usually I would give you a tour of my treasury and let you pick a reward of your choice within reason. Unfortunately, I don't have much time. You are a ranger, right? Zolbrish asked, Lith nodded in reply. If even Ratpack recognized his uniform, deranged or not, Zolbrish was bound to be able to do the math. That means the whole army knows about this place. They will raid this place in hours whereas I would need months to take everything away with me. I'm weakened and almost out of mana. A few hits would be enough to destroy my physical form, and after being away from my phylactery for so long, I don't know how much time it would take me to be back at full strength. Rather than being robbed blind, I prefer destroying everything myself. The determination in his voice didn't leave space for debate. What about me? Lith refused to change the topic. Oh, yes. Zoldrish pushed another button and the holographic interface turned from bright blue to a blinking deep red. You can keep whatever you took on your way to save me, plus I want you to have this. A clap of his hands made a mint condition forge appear in the middle of the room. It's the only unspoiled one left, and after collecting my most precious belongings I have no space left inside my dimensional items to store something so bulky. It would be a waste to destroy it. It's pure adamant. Lith put his hand on the massive silvery table, feeling his mana flow through it without encountering any resistance. Yes, it is, dear Ferran. Now give me the artifacts Yosmo had on himself. They are the last batch I made with my treacherous assistants and they are priceless. They should be, Zolbrish listed them with uncanny memory for someone incapable of getting Lith's name right even once. At least Solus got some time to study them. The problem is that aside from the mirror, I have no idea what they do. Lith thought. He also had this. Lith handed the lick the silver sphere. He still considered clean slate trash compared to invigoration. My eraser. That bastard even dared to steal my office supplies. You can keep it. I produce and lose them in bulks. Those little buggers disappear like they have a mind of their own. Now you better go. The whole place will blow up in less than a minute. Lith stored the adamant forge and walked away. Only then did he allow himself to smile. He had given Zoldrish all of the artifacts he had listed, but Yosmo had actually more. I would have returned the mirror and the sphere anyway. Ratpack witnessed Yosmo using them. I couldn't afford being ratted out and then living watching my back from Zoldrish, now I have a purple crystal, a lot of ingredients the dryads gifted me, and an adamant forge. I have all the necessary to craft a masterpiece. Lith thought, yeah, too bad, we have no idea what to create. Solus pointed out. Either we get the blueprints for something worth using such treasures, or you need to stop for a few years to devise one of our own and do some tests. We have only one block of adamant, after all. Lith was about to rebuke something about an improved version of the gatekeeper when his military communication amulet drew his attention. Ranger Verhen, do you copy? The hologram of Brigadier General Vorg appeared. Sir, what are you doing here? Lith asked. 
We lost your signal about half an hour ago, so your handler sent the wardens to check the situation. The timing matches with the ambush. Probably the lab's shields blocked the external interferences. Lith thought. They found a small army waiting for them and almost got killed. Where are you right now? Outside the complex, why? Lith said Dotvorga's answer was covered by the rumbling sound of an earthquake which made part of the broken spine sink several hundred meters, below the ground level. Chapter 550. That was way less than a minute. It doesn't make sense, if Zolbrish wanted to kill me he could have just tried to tamper with my warp. Lith thought. Good gods. I have been ordered to make the arrays collapse and kill all of the monsters inside, but not like this. Vorg said. A whole ancient lab, centuries of knowledge. All lost forever. What the heck happened down there? I have no clue. Lith lied through his teeth. After defeating the leader of the Bailers, I had no strength left to fight the Orc Shaman. Between his powerful purple crystal, his mutated minions, and their magical weaponry I had no chance by myself. A shaman with a purple crystal? Vorg said. Was he tampering with the arrays? I don't know. I was too busy saving my skin. All I know is that he was using his crystal to seize control of the facility. Lith replied. Damn it. Why didn't you tell us earlier? My spell and his meddling must have triggered a domino effect. Now there is nothing we can salvage. With all due respect, sir, I stated in my earlier report that there was a shaman. I didn't know about the crystal until I saw it with my own eyes and as you said yourself, my amulet was blocked. Lith didn't like the allegations implied in the brigadier general's voice. He was right, of course, but that didn't make them any more pleasant. You are really lucky, son. Had I not waited to hear from you before activating my array, you would have died along with the monsters. We can't afford to have a nest so close to the borders. Especially one full of well-armed mutants. Vorg sighed. Lith's doctored version of the story made sense, but the general wasn't going to apologize. The high command would hold him responsible for the loss of the lab and fry his ass. Being nice was the last thing on his mind, Lith gave him a salute and hung up before calling his handler for a full report. Even though it was already nighttime, Camilla replied immediately. After returning home from work, she didn't change her clothes in case something happened, so she was still wearing her uniform. Her relief hearing Lith was alright didn't last long. After all that time, she was used to hearing him casually talk about risking his life in battle, but when he told her about the lab's collapse, Camilla went pale and almost dropped the communicator. She called him from her civilian amulet the moment Lith was done with his report. Those idiots. When I lost your signal, I asked for reinforcements to check your status, not to have you killed. Thank the gods nothing happened. She said. Don't worry, you just followed procedure. None of what happened is your fault. The worst thing is that I succeeded in protecting Jambel, but recovering the lab was an utter failure. No leave for me this time. Lith sighed, Lith had gained quite some loot from the mission, but he had nothing to offer the Griffin Kingdom. Before revealing the existence of the Silver Mines, he wanted to check if he was entitled to a share of them or just get a thank you handshake, even that was a long shot, since the destruction of the underground complex had probably scattered the silver veins everywhere. Recovering some of it from the debris might turn out to be even more difficult than finding a new vein. About that, there's already a new assignment waiting for you tomorrow. Camilla was depressed too. She had hoped they would have some time to spend together since there were many things that she wanted to share with him. At least tell me it's a routine job. Lith said. I don't want to jinx it, so I'll just tell you what I read. A local noble, Viscount Crane has hired an entire adventurer's guild, allegedly to protect his household and properties during the winter lockdown. The city lord called the army a week ago, saying that Crane was using his private army to harass the citizens of Zantia and ignoring the local constables. We haven't heard from him since then, so it's up to you to go check on the situation. Great. A normal case again. With my luck, this Crane is trying to resurrect an ancient god, or maybe an abomination has replaced him and is building an army of greater undead. Lith said, his ridiculous scenarios made her giggle, at least until she remembered Thrud's scheme, the Black Star, and suddenly they didn't seem so far-fetched anymore. Wouldn't you like to talk about something more cheerful? She said while taking off her jacket and letting her hair down. Like what? I have yet to report what happened to Lord Wylan, then I have to find a place to sleep before diving into the next mess this job has in store for me. I even have our big talk waiting for me in Belius. You'd find more cheer in a graveyard than in my life. Like the fact that my first day as a field assistant went great. She replied with a smile. Oh, shit. Sorry Cammy, I completely forgot, or about the fact that I keep practicing my cooking. Camilla cut him short. She had risked losing him too many times in a single day to care about such a small matter. I work from 9 to 5 and then return to the safety of my own home, whereas Lith is on a deadly clock 24-7. She thought. Gods, I'm all sweaty from the stress. Let me take a quick shower and then I'll call you back. No need, I want to hear everything about your first day on the job. I'll gladly keep you company. Lith said after making sure that he was completely alone. Did you miss me so much or are you just a pervert? Yet she didn't wait for his answer before bringing the amulet with her in the bathroom, as she undressed. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk the following day, city of Xylita going back to her hometown was never easy for Camilla. Thanks to its flourishing commerce, Xylita was the smallest city in the Keller region to have a warp gate. It was far from being a metropolis and it was resistant to changes as well as its inhabitants. Camilla had many memories from the time she lived there, but none happy. She would return solely to visit her sister, Zinia, and it wasn't an easy feat the two sisters loved each other, but Zinia's marriage crippled her more than her blindness ever could, her husband, Fallmug, forbade her any social relationship without his supervision. He considered Zinia a clumsy, useless thing. Her helplessness was cute in the bedchamber or as long as she sat still, like the pretty flower, she was. Fulmar couldn't bear the thought of his wife bringing him shame with her disability, or even worse, pity. His business rivals had spread many rumors about why he had chosen a blind woman for wife and each one was rude at best. Ever since Camilla had disowned her family, he had forbidden her from setting foot in his home. The two sisters could only meet during Xenia's birthday. 
On every other day, Camilla needed to bribe the house staff or wait for a letter from her sister to casually mention an event. She would attend so that they could casually meet. This time, however, things were different. Chapter 551. Zinia's house was a two-story building in the middle rim of Zylita. Her husband came from a family of merchants that had been on the rise during the past decade. Camilla shivered at the thought it could have been her living there. To bind the Sata and the Retta households by blood, her parents had offered the young Formuk his choice of their daughters to be his bride. Back then, she was still obedient and naive. Only after seeing her sister's misery had Camilla found the strength to rebel against the fate her parents had set for her, and join the army to escape from the marriage they had arranged for her. Formuk had picked Zinia because she was prettier than Camilla and also because back then Camilla was too young. In his eyes, there was no point in having a toy if he had to wait a couple of years to play with it, Camilla steeled herself, trying not to think about the lust-filled glances Formug would give her whenever they met or his creepy remarks about regretting his past choices. She knocked on the solid wood door and waited. Vilna, one of the housemaids, opened the door. Her countenance went from surprise to contempt in the space of a single moment when she recognized Camilla. With her pretty face and curvy body, she was currently her master's favorite, making her more powerful than the lady of the house. In her eyes, Camilla was just an outcast from whom she could make some pocket money from time to time. You're not welcome here. Please leave, or I'll call the guards. Vilna said when she noticed that Camilla wasn't handing her the usual two silver coins. Vilna wouldn't risk her master's anger for a smaller sum than what a lieutenant made in a week, Camilla grabbed the door's edge, blocking it with ease. She was weak for a soldier, but she had always kept herself in shape, whereas Vilna was just weak. Good morning. I'm Lieutenant Camilla Yerval, Field Assistant Constable. I'm here because we have received an anonymous report of domestic abuse. I need to speak with Lady Sata. Camilla shoved her badge in the housemaid face and rejoiced seeing her going pale. Master Fallmug doesn't want you in here, badge or not. Vilna stuttered. You can't come inside without a warrant and I doubt there is any report. You're just making it up. Yet she was wrong. Camilla had written it herself and submitted it diligently following protocol. For once, the inescapable tendrils of bureaucracy were on her side. Your unwillingness to cooperate with the investigation forces me to ask for a search warrant. I'm sure Mr. Sata will be grateful to you when his house is turned upside down by the officers. I wonder what the neighbors will say, though. Camilla took out her army amulet and called the local authorities with a voice so loud that many people stepped out of their doors to see what was happening. Please stop, Miss Yeval. You can come inside. Vilna grabbed her hand as fear quickly turned into panic, having a constable at the door was already bad for the Sata, getting their house searched like they were petty criminals, might ruin their reputation and business. Fulmug would flay her alive if he lost even a copper coin because of her. It's Constable Yeval to you. Camilla broke Vilna's grip, her voice oozed poison. She was seconds away from slapping the maid's face, but she held her temper unwilling to taint what her uniform stood for by abusing her powers. Touch me again, and I'll arrest you for assaulting an officer. Vilna seemed to shrink. She lowered her head, incapable of looking Camilla in the eyes anymore, and turned around to show her the way. Just like Zylita, the house hadn't changed, the floor and the walls of the house were covered by deep brown wood briquettes, giving it a warm appearance of hospitality. The hallway was filled with portraits of smiling members of the Sata family. There was even one of Zinia with her husband and their three children. The hypocrisy of it made Camilla want to spit on the precious gold embroidered sky blue carpet that led from the hallway to the tea room on the ground floor, aside from the heavy steps and the voices of the house staff, the place was silent. The walls were pristine, and judging by the many fragile ornaments decorating the furniture along the corridors, the kids weren't faring better than their mother, thank the gods I'm not a mage, otherwise not even my sense of duty would stop me from destroying this accursed place all the way down to its foundations. Camilla thought, her rage peaked when Vilna used a key to unlock the tea room's door. I see the claims were accurate. Lady Sata is prisoner in her own home. From the moment Camilla had stepped through the door, she had never stopped typing on the holographic interface of her amulet nor taking pictures. It's not like you think. Our poor lady is blind. We do it for her own protection. Vilna said with a quivering voice. It's exactly as I think. Now leave us alone. Camilla took the key from her hand, just in case, and pushed her out of the room before locking it from the inside. Just like the rest of the house, the tea room was pristine, the white sofas and armchairs looked like they had never been used. The center of the hardwood table in the middle of the room had been carved out and replaced by a crystal slab. Several vases containing fresh flowers were gracefully arranged around the room along with white cotton doilies. Zinia was sitting on a chair near the glass-paneled east wall, as if she was looking at the outside. She was so still that with her light brown hair, pale complexion, and immaculate yellow day dress, she almost looked like a doll. Zin, are you all right? Camilla was sick with worry, but she only spoke after activating the silencer, a magical device that prevented them from being eavesdropped on. Cammy? Zinia turned around following her voice, breaking into a smile. I thought my ears were playing a trick on me. What are you doing here? Camilla rushed to hug her sister as small tears streamed down her face. Gods, I've missed you so much. Why are you so pale? Is something wrong? The healer says it's just depression. Since the children left the house, I feel very lonely. Zinia replied. What happened to them? Camilla's voice was filled with concern. The oldest one was almost 10 years old, so she could have been sent to a boarding school, but the other two were too young for that. Business isn't doing good, so Fallmug is often in a bad mood. I know how to be quiet, but the children scream and run a lot when they play. So their grandmother took them with her to avoid further accidents. You have yet to answer my question, Cammy. I'm here for your eyes. Camilla said almost choking on her rage. Thanks to my new job, I can now afford to get you cured. I can't bear to see you like this any longer. You deserve a better life, and I know someone that can help us with that. Chapter 552. Are you talking about your new boyfriend? You two are the talk of the entire family. Mother always tries to convince me to change your mind about helping the family business. Full mug too. Zinia said. Did that bastard dare to touch you? Camilla unconsciously took out a lightning wand from her dimensional amulet, wishing Fallmug would give her a reason to use it. 
Of course not. She shook her head. He considers me like a property, and as long as I behave, he takes care of me. Isn't it nice of him to buy so many flowers for me? Between the sunlight from the window and their sweet scent, it's like being in a park. Yes, it's my boyfriend. He can give you sight if you allow me to bring him here. Camilla said, glossing over Four Mug's character. Why did you say afford, then? Xenia asked. Because the procedure costs a lot. I can't ask something like that of him and expect that it wouldn't weigh on our relationship. Between the gaps in age, social status, and career, I still have no clue how we ended up together. I can't let money tip the scales even further. It would make me feel indebted to him and if things ever go sour between us, I'll never know if I would be staying with him because I cared or just out of guilt. Oh, my. Xenia chuckled. You put a lot of thought into it. You are still determined not to marry, I see. I did because you are the only family I have left. As for not marrying, you're wrong, you're wrong. What I'm determined about is to not become dependent on anyone. I'll pay for your treatment with my own money, because you are my sister. And if I stay with him it will be because I want to, not because I have to. I prefer owning a bank some money than him your life. Some debts can never be repaid. All more the reason for me not to undergo the treatment, Cami. I'm sorry you came here for nothing. Xenia released her sister from the embrace and sat down again. What do you mean? The last time you said you wouldn't do it because of its price. Now I can afford it. Even if I don't become a royal constable, as a field assistant I can pay the debt in a few years. What made you change your mind? I never changed my mind, I simply lied to you because it made things easier. Xenia wiped the tear she didn't manage to hold back. I know how it works, I've spoken to countless healers. Back when business was good, Fullmug wanted to heal me to save himself to further embarrassment and be free to parade me around like the trophy wife I am. Yet I said no, even to him. If something goes wrong while altering the life force, I could end up worse than just blind. I could become also deaf, if not mentally ill. I don't want to risk losing the little I have to live for. If I couldn't even hear or feel you and my children, then I'd really become nothing more than a baby-making doll. I'm afraid, Cammy. I'm terrified of what could happen to me after the procedure. Lith is one of the five best healers of the kingdom, he is even able to use rejuvenation magic. The god of healing himself respects him, and believe me, that alone is an inhumane feat Manoha doesn't even respect the royals. Camilla said. Your condition gets cured every day by far less competent healers. There's no need to be afraid. Quite the contrary. Xenia shook her head. If he succeeds, things will get worse anyway. My blindness is the reason why I can accept living this life. Without hope for a better future, Fullmugs is a decent husband. His constant cheating on me, how he treats the children, everything I can't see I can pretend never happens. It makes this cage bearable. If I'm cured, I could never tolerate this situation. Then get cured and ask for a divorce. Camilla blurted out, obtaining only more denial in response. And where would I live? Our family would disown me like they did you. What would happen to my children? No constable would entrust them to a penniless mother. I have no house, no job, no skills. If you report the domestic abuse, you can get custody. You can all live with me, in my house. Camilla said. What can I report? I'm blind. What I hear and think happened has no value in a court of justice and the house staff would back Fullmug. Even if somehow, I did get custody, how could I ask you to pay for everything on top of your debt? Cammy, face reality. Could you really afford to support four more people with just one income? According to the healers I've consulted, it would take me months just to be able to distinguish between colors, give a name to everything I see, or learn how to write and read. How could I ask you to burden yourself with all of those things on top of your debt? I'm already old and you're not getting any younger. You'd lose any chance of making a life of your own. My life isn't good, Cammy, but there are a lot of people that have it worse. Let's drop this subject please. Zinnia's voice was calm and composed like they were talking about someone else. Seeing her sister resign to live the rest of her life as a property rather than a person, realizing how useless all of her efforts and sacrifices to become a constable had been, Camilla Yerval felt as lost as the day she walked into the army's recruitment center, back then, she was a homeless orphan with nothing but her first name and the clothes she wore as her possessions. Over ten years had passed, yet her helplessness hadn't changed. Asterisk 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 the same day, city of Jambel, what do you mean, failure? Baron Wyland couldn't believe his own ears and neither could all the people he had assembled for the celebratory banquet, he had organized in Lith's honor. You solved the problem with the monster nest in one day. One thousand enemies gone from dawn to dusk. What could you possibly do better? The nest was actually an ancient lab. Lith tried to explain. The kingdom could have learned a lot from it, maybe even have salvaged some of its master's wisdom. Lith kept a straight face, but he shuddered at the thought of Zoldrish's madness spreading. I call bullshit. The baron said, causing all the noble ladies in attendance to gasp at his rudeness his wife to give him an evil eye rivaling that of a bailer. It's easy talking big when you are the one who risked his neck to explore the place and find the creatures. I feel much safer knowing that no idiot mage can dig more trouble out of the broken spine. A mage lab is as twisted as his mind. No offense. He said after realizing who he was speaking with. None taken. Lith replied. He would have really liked to avoid attending the banquet, but the Baron was a good man and his report was worth much more than General Vorgas' grievances. Chapter 553. I read about you, lad. You are an overachiever. The Baron said. In life, especially in marriage, you have to slack off from time to time, or your missus will set the bar higher and higher. Sometimes it's better to let people down, or they will start taking miracles for granted. As for me, I'm plenty satisfied with you solving the crisis without even one of my men dying or my city getting breached. Honestly, I never believed a single ranger could take on so many monsters alone, and I was ready to spend winter in a constant battle of attrition with them. The army will only hear praise about you from me. I know there isn't much to see here in Jambel, but feel free to come back here with your girlfriend once spring arrives. You'll always be welcome here. At those words, Ariel became even paler than she already was and left the table with an excuse. 
Neither Lith nor the Baron missed how she was all dressed up and had been trying to work up enough courage to speak with Lith for a while. Seems the Baron did a thorough job while researching me. Lith thought, he's a strong and smart man. He saved me the bother of turning down his daughter and if he keeps his word, my merits will not be affected too much by the lab's destruction. Thanks, Baron. Camilla is a real explorer. She loves visiting new places, but I usually drag her down. I travel so much that as soon as I get leave the only thing I want to do is sit down and relax. Lith said, his reply was the last nail in the coffin for Ariel's naive dream of finding a knight in shining armor. She audibly broke into tears and ran away, of all the nerve. Solus blurted out at his blatant lie, what relax? You don't even sleep at night unless I force you to do so. The only reasons you spend so much time with Camilla is for the benefits, and because you're afraid that if you treat her like you did Floria, she'll leave you too. Solus's words stung hard. If it was up to Lith, he would spend almost all of his free time inside the tower conducting experiments, setting everything else aside for later, only after Floria broke up with him did he realize that although they had lived together, practiced together, and trained together during their time at the White Griffin, they had actually spent little time together. He had been so focused on his work that he had neglected his girlfriend, his friends, and even his family. But whereas his relatives could accept him growing distant with time and wanting space, Floria became tired of all his silences, absences, and being always a low priority in his life, she had given up on the hope he would open up first, then on attempting to become a bigger part of his life, and finally on their relationship, I wonder how she put up with me for so long. Lith thought, you're right Solus, but where would I be if I didn't work so hard? I've made sacrifices to build a better future for myself. Everything comes at a price, even happiness, you spent your first life loveless until you died alone. I'm not saying what you did was wrong, just that finding someone special is a small miracle. You should treasure such a person, instead of hoping to find another one once she gets tired of your antics. Solus thought, Lith mulled over her words all the way to Xantia, his next destination. He took into account the Baron's teaching, and after calculating that without Solus's tower warping ability it would take a normal ranger a full day to cover such distance, he took the rest of the day to study his loot and restore Trouble's body. Lith had yet to attempt using higher necromancy, mostly because creating a sentient undead was almost like having a child. Even though greater undead were smart and matured fast, they would still start as clean slates, needing parenting and guidance. Otherwise they would turn into mindless monsters and attempt to destroy their creator. Lith much preferred lesser undead. They were mindless, disposable, and maybe one day, they could work as a temporary body for Solus. He had long since learned how to use necromantic energies to regenerate corpses. Itu, the Clacker's Queen, and now Trouble were all fine additions to his collection. The Bailer's Black Eye turned out to be capable of absorbing darkness magic like a sponge, even in death, a Bailer's Eyes are great magical amplifiers for the corresponding element. Why the heck doesn't the army bestiary mention any of this? Lith thought. Maybe to prevent rangers from poaching. I wouldn't be surprised if your superiors asked you to give them the body. Even though they are monsters, Bailers spawn slowly. They are as rare as they are powerful. Solus pondered. Fuck. I wouldn't have shown it during my report if I knew it wasn't just a corpse. Then they wouldn't have taken you seriously. Without the threat of the lab becoming a Baylor's spawning ground they would have not sent reinforcements so when the lab exploded, you'd have been the fall guy instead of Vorg. Solus said. If you keep everything for yourself, sooner or later someone will get suspicious about your activities. We've gotten away with stealing the purple crystal already. If the army wants the corpse, give it to them. You can't always win. Lith sighed recognizing the truth in Solus's words. Without the army, he would have never heard about Jamble's crisis. The adamant forge and the enchanted items he had acquired there were priceless treasures. Let's see what happens when I turn a bailer into an undead. I never met a corpse capable of storing so much darkness magic. Lith said. What about resting? You haven't had a proper night's sleep in days. I've still got a lot of time. I won't go to Zantia until tomorrow and I don't know if I'll get to keep the corpse. If I don't experiment now, I'll never learn anything about bailers. Solus had many things to object with, but since they were inside the tower, there was nothing that could go wrong. Lith followed all of the steps of true necromancy Kala had taught him. He conjured a pseudo blood core made of darkness magic with a spark of light magic at its center. It served as an imprint to create a bond between the undead and its maker, which ensured its loyalty. The moment the pseudo core touched the corpse, it moved on its own, finding the remnants of the Baylor's mana core and using them to spread its essence. That never happened before. Solus, control arrays. Lith started weaving several spells, but it was too late. The corpse stood up, looking around the necromancy lab instead of waiting for orders like a common lesser undead. To make matters worse, the red light of undeath, which usually animated Lith's minions, was replaced by a blazing violet light. Red is for autopilot, blue when you possess them. What's violet? Solus asked. Beats me. Lith replied as he tried to move the undead at will. He could feel his mind resonate with the spark of light in the pseudo blood core. The orders arrived, yet there was a resistance, like a second will battling for control. Chapter 554. Or so Lith thought for a couple of seconds, before the creature started moving around obediently like it was supposed to. Something is wrong. I'm not using tendrils of mana to fuel it since it's an experiment, but I can feel it getting stronger. Solus. It's the eye. Or better, the eyes. Even as undead, they can gather world energy. The black one, in particular, has formed a mana pool with a strength on par with a red core already and it keeps getting stronger. Ma master. Trouble stuttered, giving Lith the creeps. Shut it down. Solus said. I'm trying. Both his attempts to retrieve the undead energies and to possess the bailer's body to crush the pseudo core from within had failed. Lith didn't care if the thing called him master, lord, or hubby. He didn't trust anything he couldn't control. I have no master. The creature roared. By receiving a constant supply of darkness element from the black eye, the pseudo core was becoming more stable, independent from Lith's energy flow, the red eye lit up, emitting a tiny jet of fire like it was a gaslighter. He has retained his skills. Solus and Lith said in unison, although the former with worry and the latter with joy. There's nothing to be happy about. 
Given time, he will gather enough mana to use his real powers, and if we destroy the body you'll end up in trouble with the army. Solus said as she activated her defensive arrays. A force field trapped the bailer, forcing him to his knees. You worry too much. Lith walked toward the undead, his right hand extended toward the location of the pseudo core. The closer he got, the stronger his hold over his own mana became, trouble crawled back until he hit the force field, then he lashed out, emitting a black pillar against Lith, who took it in head on. The darkness magic passed through him like it was just colored light. Even the tower's walls came out unscathed. Whatever is happening, while this thing runs on my mana, it can only hurt me physically. I'm not stupid enough to use a perfect pseudo blood core for an experiment. I gave it barely enough strength to walk. Lith explained to the surprised Solus, trouble snarled one last time, before collapsing on the ground. Now what? Lith asked. The undead was back to being a corpse. It had no life force, nor mana flow anymore. He used all the energy he had, even his pseudo core. Solus said. This is great. If we can understand what happened, I can build a small army of elite soldiers with powerful abilities. Soldiers that will revolt against you. Solus sneered. That thing had a will of its own, his life force was growing on top of yours. It would explain the purple light. Lith pondered. Red is for the natural state, blue when an external will flows into an undead. The question is, what was the source of the external will? The eye? After all, they are the core of a bailer's power. Maybe the black eye amplified your spell to the point of turning it into greater necromancy. Solus said, Lith surgically removed and stored it inside his pocket dimension before making a second attempt. This time, despite all of his efforts and mastery, the pseudo core was unable to take root. The corpse straight rejected it. Let me guess, since bailers cannot process mana without their eyes, I can't resurrect it after removing the black eye. Lith said. It makes sense. Solus's wisp nodded. Yosmo had six eyes, while Trouble only had three. According to the best theory, the remaining three are fused with Trouble's body. To test this theory, we need a bailer without the black eye. If we can raise it normally, then we are one step closer to fulfilling your crazy plan of making an undead army. Otherwise, back to square one. Yeah, tomorrow I'll buy a bailer at the market and we'll test your theory. Lith said while putting the eye back into the empty socket. Even his sarcasm couldn't hide that the idea of losing Trouble's body pained him. Even if everything failed and bailers turned out to be impossible to reanimate as undead, it would still give him more insight into necromancy. After discarding vampires and liches as possible ways to escape from his resurrection cycle, Lith needed something new. Guess we'll never know. Solus sighed. They were both aware that conducting a series of experiments to uncover an unknown phenomenon required time and effort. Unfortunately, they only had a few hours before they had to be at Xantia, and Lith was tired. Solus put Trouble's corpse inside her pocket dimension, making sure that no trace of life nor undeath remained. Trouble was the first enemy they had fought inside her tower from and she had no desire for a second round. The following day, Lith's mood was even worse. He had remembered how according to Zolgrish, a bailer's eyes were powerful magical amplifiers. Failing an experiment was irrelevant to him, back on earth, his science professors always stressed how many trials and errors were needed before making a breakthrough. Losing his specimen and three amplifiers at once, though, was a loss from which it was hard to recover from. To add insult to injury, when he had called Camilla, hoping she could cheer him up with one of her smiles, she was in an awful mood too. Lith asked her many times if there was something wrong to no avail, when he reached Zancha's walls, Lith was itching for a fight. It was a medium-sized city, famous for being surrounded by a luscious forest where it was possible to find several rare mystical plants. Many magical beasts resided there, keeping bandits and monsters alike at bay. Zancha was one of the few cities in the north to have not faced a monster wave in decades, unfortunately, the forest was both a blessing and a curse. As long as they weren't provoked, magical beasts were peaceful, but the same couldn't be said for some aggressive species of plants that kept growing no matter how many times they were burnt, cut, or destroyed with magic, even magical beasts were forced to avoid specific areas of the forest. Merchants had a hard time reaching and leaving Zancha in one piece which created a vicious circle. As long as Zancha was cut out of the main trading routes, it would never get a warp gate. At the same time, without a warp gate the city would never be added to the main trading routes. None of it was a problem for someone like Lith who was capable of flight, when the guards at the main gate stopped him, he could already smell trouble. The man and the woman who donned the uniform of the local militia were clearly afraid, and not of him, let me pass. Lith said showing them his golden badge. I'm Ranger Lith Verhen and I've been called by the city lord, Count Sester to oversee a matter of public security. We're very sorry to have wasted your time, Ranger Verhen. Said the male guard, a man in his early thirties with blonde hair and grey eyes. You are free to go. The Count has waived your protection since everything has already been resolved. The man handed him a piece of paper with the Count's seal. Lith's surprise only grew when his army amulet confirmed both the documents and the seal's authenticity. Chapter 555. Everything seems to be in order, but I can't follow such a command without hearing it directly from Lord Sester. Lith said while stepping forward, the two guards crossed their lances in front of him, but he didn't stop. Even if the document is in order, I need to make sure it's not forged. Anyone could use the city lord's seal. Lith was now just a few millimeters from the blades. The count requested the army's help and we've not been able to contact him ever since. Before I can leave, I must speak with him. Stand down and let me pass, because the moment your weapons touch my body you'll be persecuted for treason against the crown. Lith's eyes flared up as he released a bit of killing intent. The mental pressure exerted by the mana filled with his violent emotions overwhelmed the guards, who turned pale but only took one step back, Lith was surprised by their obstinacy. Without proper training or a mana core strong enough, killing intent was more than enough to send normal people running for their lives. Their fear had to be deep-rooted to allow them to hold their ground. Fine. A wave of Lith's hand generated two streams of lightning bolts which nailed the guards against the city walls. Their bodies trembled in seizure before falling unconscious onto the ground. Point three more guards rushed to the gate after hearing the screams. They were about to unsheathe their weapons when they recognized the ranger uniform. Arrest and detain those two, I want to interrogate them later. Lith said. The shocked soldiers kept moving their eyes from Lith to their companions, never removing their hands from the hilt of their blades. 
Their lack of discipline annoyed Lif. He was used to being harassed by the inhabitants of small cities, but even there the local guards knew their place. Where is your sergeant? I want to give him a piece of my mind about how he trains his soldiers. Lif said. You just knocked him out, sir. Replied one of the guards after snapping out of his reverie. What happened? Lif explained the reason of his coming and his need for meeting the Count Sester. I understand, sir. I apologize on behalf of the sergeant. I can assure you he is a good man. It's just that these days we are all jumpy. The soldier replied. He was a young man in his early twenties, with light brown hair and blue eyes. My name is Fergan Heckless. Nice to meet you, sir. He said while giving Lith a salute. The other two took care of the injured guards before cuffing and moved them to the nearest jail. What reason could possibly lead your comrades to commit such blatant insubordination? Fergan led Lith to the city lord's mansion while explaining to him the details about Zancha's recent events. Please, don't be too harsh on them. Their families are going through a tough time. Not only is this winter really harsh, but a lot of people are falling ill. Healers are powerless against the disease and many of the relatives of its victims have joined a shady cult that claims to be able to treat any illness. Fergan said. Are you saying there is a plague here in Zantia? Not a plague. Fergan shook his head. Technically, it's not even a disease. Every person displays different symptoms, so we don't even know if they are all suffering from the same thing, and it never lasts long. The problem is that after some time people get sick again, like it never heals. We call it, the griever, dot. What about your healers? Lith found the story ridiculous. Illnesses and even poisons acted all the same. Someone poisoning several different people each with a different substance was as cruel as it was idiotic. They have confirmed it's not poisoning, but an affliction of the body. They can cure it, but it only makes things worse. Whenever the disease gets removed, it returns almost immediately stronger than before. Fergan replied. I can sympathize with them. One of my sisters has been ill for a long time, but that still doesn't explain your sergeant's odd behavior. I'm afraid it's because of the Church of the Six. Fergan sighed. Life in the North is harsh, so a lot of religions are born and die every year. They try to give people hope about the afterlife, but usually their absurd dogmas are just a cover to rob believers of their money. The Church of the Six is different for two reasons. First, they don't ask for donations, for everything, and second, whatever they do, it works. Or so they say. Some of them get rich, others get healed, and stuff like that. People whose relatives got the griever became fanatics after word got out that the clerics can cure it for good. The bastards only treat the most loyal worshippers, though. I've traveled quite a lot and have never heard about either the Church of the Six or the griever. Lith pondered. It's not a surprise. The church was founded only last year and it would have already disappeared if not for the griever. Let me guess, your sergeant is a believer. Lith said. Yeah, a big one. He recently became a father, and there's nothing he wouldn't do to spare his son from all that suffering. His wife's hair is turning white from the fear. When did the griever appear? Right after the winter lockdown started. The worst stuff always happens during that period. Bad luck loves company. Lith nodded and decided to let the sergeant off the hook. The man was already suffering enough, I doubt the griever is a real illness. Most likely his son is terminally ill. If I accuse him of treason, he will lose his job, his life, and the little time they have left together. Lith thought, why don't you cure the baby? It shouldn't be difficult for you. Solus thought, I sympathize with him, but that doesn't mean I care for him or his son. Especially after he pointed a blade at me. He made his choice when he preferred listening to a cleric rather than ask a healer for help. After another few questions about the situation of Zantia, they reached Count Sester's house. The city lord was a short man in his mid-fifties, around 1.62 meters, 5 feet 4 inches, tall with white hair and thin mustache, the count was sickly pale, far more than what passed for normal in the north, with bloodshot eyes and so many nervous tics that Lith suspected him of drug abuse. I'm really sorry to have wasted your time, Ranger Verhen, but as the guards told you at the city gates, our issues are already solved. I'm sure there are plenty of cities that need your help. His voice was firm, yet it sounded old and tired like he hadn't sleep in days. Why you didn't just cancel your request? We've tried to contact you for several days. Because I've seen the light, Ranger Verhen. Magic is the sad attempt of men to play God. Our arrogance has long since blinded us and angered the real gods. Only by relinquishing it can we pray to receive their mercy. Lith was tempted to give the man a soapbox and a, the end is near, t-shirt as the count looked at him with the ill-concealed contempt a self-righteous man usually reserved for a non-believer. Chapter 556. Sure, right. I'd love to hear more, but alas I'm a busy man. Lith's tone was as condescending as it was full of sarcasm. He took out the army amulet from his pocket dimension, suppressing a chuckle when the count yelped at the sight of it. Lith reported everything to his handler, then he had her confirm the count's well-being and record his request for cancelling the mission. I need you to state the reason why you requested the army's intervention in the first place for the record. Camilla said. Because Viscount Crane's mercenaries were harassing several upstanding citizens and interfering with their religious freedom, but now everything is resolved. Those sinners have received their retribution. The Count's fervor put a dent in even Camilla's perfect poker face, making her raise an eyebrow in confusion. Do you mean that the local guards dealt with the problem? No, the gods did. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have a lot of work to do. When will Ranger Verhen leave? His services are unrequired and his disrespect most unpleasant. The Count asked her, like Lith wasn't even there. Right after lunch. Since you have already wasted my time, the least I can do is to get a hot meal and restock my food supplies. Lith left the Count's office, never hanging up the call. I've resolved two missions in as many days. I would like to apply for leave due to outstanding performance. He said. The second doesn't count since it was cancelled, but nice try. If you need any kind of supplies, buy them from the local army store. Merchants inflate their prices during the lockdown, whereas we keep ours fixed. How cute of her worrying about my expenses. She seems to be faring much better than yesterday. Lith thought, yeah, but isn't it odd that she is still your handler after becoming a field assistant constable? Solus pondered. 
It didn't make much sense, unless someone was attempting to manipulate their relationship again. Lith cursed himself for forgetting about her promotion again and called Camilla during her lunch break to make sure everything was fine. I was supposed to be replaced after I started my training course, but I asked to continue being your handler. I don't know if it's because of Ladyanas or Commander Berrian, but the Central Command accepted my request. Camilla said while unpacking her chicken salad, having a sedentary job and practicing cooking had made her gain some weight, so she was on a diet. To make matters worse, Lith's training routine gave him his lean muscular build and made her self-conscious about her body. Is that why you look so tired recently? I don't want you to overwork yourself. Starting a new job is already challenging enough, you don't need extra stress. Lith ordered a whole roasted chicken with gravy sauce and potatoes, almost making her drool. Don't worry, it's no big deal. This way we can keep in touch even when we are away from each other. Being sure you're alright is worth a little overtime and I can use a little extra money. Camilla needed to save as much as she could for Xenia's procedure. I'm glad to still have you as my handler, but most importantly, as my girlfriend. I wish you were here. Lith caressed Camilla's hologram's cheek while she intently stared at his meal. She was already done with her food and yet she was still hungry. I got to go. Have a nice meal and remember to tip the waitress. Camilla said when the gong signaled the end of her break. Her hologram disappeared, leaving Lith's full-blown paranoia to worry about why she seemed to be on edge the whole time. Maybe she is sick of our long-distance relationship, or maybe she met someone else. Someone better than me. Lith had no idea that it had been his meal upsetting her. Camilla couldn't forgive herself for speaking to the chicken the whole time instead of Lith. Hey handsome, is this seat taken? Said a honeyed feminine voice, Lith was so focused on his alleged troubles with Camilla that he almost choked on his lunch from surprise. Aside from noble girls, no one had hit on him since he had started working as a ranger, without waiting for a reply, the woman sat in front of him while crossing her legs in a slow, seductive way. I'm flattered by your attentions, but in case you missed it, I was just talking to my girl. Lith looked up from his plate, too dumbfounded to continue his speech, aside from Tista, Tiris, and Thrud, it was definitely the most beautiful woman he had ever seen. Long silky black hair framed her delicate visage, emphasizing her light chestnut eyes and her fair skin. Her soft curves, an ample bosom were so voluptuous that not even her comfortable adventurous clothes could hide them more than a passing cloud can eclipse the sun, can you take me to a healer? Because I just broke my leg falling for you. Lith replied, making her giggle. A group of adventurers sitting a few tables apart were currently split between those two shocked to speak, and those cursing out loud. Since when does the captain have a thing for tall guys? She even rejected Hosung, and he was a giant. Said a red-haired man currently green with envy. Who cares? It's the first time I've seen her hitting on someone, let alone laugh at a cheesy pickup line. Said a young woman with light brown hair and her uniform dirty from spilling her wine all over it. What the heck are you doing here, Freya? Lith said while embracing his old friend and causing most of the male customers of the restaurant to choke on their food from resentment. I could ask you the same thing. The North is a big place, I didn't expect to meet you so easily. Freya was still giggling at their flirting routine. It was an inside joke between them, from the time they both were assistant professors at the White Griffin, whenever they met, they would pretend to not know each other and spout the cheesiest lines they could think of. It helped Freya to keep annoying suitors at bay and she usually found the people's reaction to the scene to be hilarious. There's only one reason for me being here. They requested my presence. Luckily, I'm already done with my business and I'm about to leave. What about you? I've been here in Zantia for a month. Viscount Crane recruited my whole guild to protect his properties from the local nutjobs. She shrugged. No offense but, why you? There are a lot of mercenary guilds in the north too. Finding you here, in my same restaurant can't be just a coincidence. There are several reasons for calling me. First, my guild has still a perfect score. Second, having a capable healer during a lockdown is always a plus. Third, Viscount Crane is one of those stuck-up idiots that look down on anyone who isn't a noble for at least three generations. There aren't many guilds lead by a noble, also he hopes that by hiring me he will get the opportunity to suck up on my parents, especially dad. Freya said. No sane man would approach your mother. Lith still found it odd meeting her like that. Chapter 557. Indeed. As for the restaurant, I just kept tabs on you after I heard about a ranger zapping the guards. I followed you here to surprise you and I accomplished that. Your face was priceless. By the way, do you need help with that? Freya pointed at his meal. Thanks, but no thanks. I'm a firm believer that it takes two to truly appreciate a chicken. The chicken and me. He replied while pulling the plate away from her fork. Always the gentleman, eh? Freya pouted while ordering a smaller portion of what he had taken. Speaking of gentlemen, Count Sester called saying your guild harassed Zantia's citizens and that you've got some kind of divine retribution for it. That's rich. We harass no one. Viscount Crane owns many magical workshops, mostly small stuff like enchanted home appliances and ornaments. Those jerks from the Church of the Six pestered his customers and his employees with their fanatical propaganda. We simply kept them away from private property, that's it. As for the divine retribution, the children of the Viscount got the griever, but my guild members are fine. Freya's gurgling stomach forced Lyft to share his plate while she waited for her own. What can you tell me about the griever? Lyft's professional curiosity was piqued. It's no illness, that's for sure. I suspect it's caused by something in the water, because all three of the Viscount's children presented weakened organs and random damage to the skin, but I never managed to identify what caused the phenomenon. Not even after it returned for the third time. Since those noble idiots seemed to be unable to follow even the simplest orders, I had to give them a detail 24-7. Playing babysitter means my men can't protect all of the shops anymore, but since we still get paid in full, I'm fine with that. I'm sorry to bother you, Captain, but are you not going to introduce us to your new friend? Said a young woman in her early twenties. She had a pixie cut and a round face, she could have been considered cute, if not for her thick muscular build and square jaw. Coupled with her fierce eyes, they gave her a cold demeanor, like a disgruntled drill sergeant ready to dish out a punishment. He's no friend, Wyra. Freya said with a suave voice, while taking Lith's hand and threading her fingers through his. 
We've decided to marry. At those words, several mugs of beer shattered on the floor as many members of Freya's guild either dropped them, or made them fall by standing up abruptly in disbelief, seeing their bewildered expressions, Freya burst out in laughter, shocking them even more. She rarely showed her emotions to them. A mercenary guild was no charity, nor was it like the army. They followed her to make a profit, not because of honor and blind loyalty. They were all mags from minor academies or had graduated from the great ones yet failed to master any specialization. They were jacks of all trades, but without the means to make a living with magic. Freya knew they could leave her the moment they received a better offer or if they thought the mission was too risky. She trusted only the core members of her unit and kept the others at arm's length. She's joking. Lith said since Freya was still too busy crying from laughter. I'm Lith Verhen. Nice to meet you Miss Wyra. Lith offered her his hand and she promptly shook it. It's an honor to meet you, sir. You're a beacon of hope for us mags of commoner origin. Wyra blushed while squeezing his hand with enough strength that she would have crushed it if not for Lith's enhanced body. Did they send you here for the griever? Zansha could use a great healer's expertise. Said the red-headed man, making Freya angry. Hey, I resent that. I rank second after him, both overall and in the light department. I'm a great healer too. She said while stabbing her chicken with anger. No, they didn't. I'm leaving the city after lunch. After meeting Freya's ten men unit, Lith understood why Quilla didn't trust them to accompany her during her travels. Most of them were either trying to suck up to him or staring at him with envy or contempt, only a few, like Wyra, were just trying to befriend him, judging from Freya's expression, some of them are going to get kicked out of the guild as soon as their current mission is over. Lith thought after paying his bill and offering them a round of drinks. He tried to push open the door of the restaurant, yet it didn't budge. Only when the hardwood started to creak did it open, but a chilly wind slapped his face and big snowflakes entered the hallway. What the heck? Where did this storm come from? Lith asked the head waiter. From the sky, I guess. The weather changes often in the north. The man replied with a condescending tone, like he was talking to an ignorant kid. Lith ignored the waiter playing Captain Obvious and closed himself in the bathroom. After checking with Life Vision that no one was inside, he opened a warp gate leading as far as he could, using invigoration to boost the spell's strength, this is all too odd. First, they call me here for nothing and send me away despite there being an odd disease spreading. Then I meet Freya and I casually get stuck here because of a sudden snowstorm. Someone is playing with me. Lith thought, yet despite Lith's full-blown paranoia, no matter how far the dimensional corridor went, wind and snow would always strike his face with so much strength that it was impossible to see further than three meters, you're right. Clearly the sky spirits conspired against you. Solus chuckled. Yet she checked as far as she could see with mana sense, making sure the storm really was natural. Just to be safe, damn it. This is even worse than I thought. This isn't my first snowstorm, but I always manage to spend them in the tower with you. What am I supposed to do until it blows over? Lith thought. Maybe spend some time with your old friend? Help the people of Zancha with the griever? You two have a lot of catching up to do. Freya was really happy about the snowstorm and offered Lith an accommodation as an honorary member of the Crystal Shield, her adventurer's guild. Lith didn't miss that such position would put him under her command, but he accepted anyway, the count is a nut job. He didn't want me setting foot inside the city, I doubt he would offer me a place to stay. This way I get a room, the opportunity to make up with Freya for not inviting her for my birthday, and I can take a look at the griever. When shit hits the fan, it would be up to me to fix that mess anyway. He inwardly sighed, unfortunately, Viscount Crane didn't share Freya's enthusiasm. Another mouth to feed during winter is a burden, Lady Inners. The Viscount said. He was a man in his late forties, around 1.68 meters, 5 feet 6 inches, tall with thick black hair and a finely trimmed goatee. Chapter 558. Everything about his appearance spoke of order and control. He was wearing a perfectly ironed black suit that didn't show a single wrinkle despite having been used for half day. Not a single hair on his head was out of place, every one of his movements was slow and calculated. His stern expression was reinforced by his gold-rimmed glasses which made his calculative gaze look cruel rather than wise. Your guild is doing an excellent job, I don't see why I should welcome this man into my home. I'm sure there are plenty of free rooms in the city's hotels and that he can afford to pay for his meals. Crame only spoke to Freya, ignoring everyone else, wow, this guy is as stingy as you are. Solus thought. Both her and Lith were surprised at being treated like that. It was the second time in a single day that someone had looked down on him. Your lordship, Lord Verhen is an excellent healer and the ranger in charge of the Keller region. I'm sure you realize that his presence can be of great help. The snowstorm could isolate the city, if not even your mansion, for days. Freya said. You are an excellent healer, Lady Inners. Why would I need to? Besides, I doubt he can be of any use. No truly talented and sane man would ever work as a civil servant. It still has the word servant in it and proves a lack of ambition. What about my mother and my father, then? Freya hated to use her parents' names. The whole point of leading a mercenary guild was building her career outside of her family. Yet that sane part prevented her from using Manoha as a model. Please. The Viscount scoffed at her naive attempt of manipulation. Your mother chose a noble career that allows her to uphold and influence the law. She protects us from the scum of the earth. Your father's talent is bottomless. He is an archduke, a warrior, a forgemaster, and a leader of the night guard. This man, instead, took the job of a watchdog with no further career path. Rangers usually drop out of the army or drop dead. He's barely more than a vagrant with a hundred masters, and as soon as the winter lockdown ends, I'll be one of them. Now please get out of my office. I have work to do. What a dick. I'm sorry, Lith. Freya said after they left the Viscount's office. Follow me, I'll show you your accommodations. Didn't he just say that I'm not welcome? Yeah, but he never said no either. I know the type, if I take you in as my guest, he'll never dare to complain to my face. You've changed a lot, you know? The old Lith would have glared at Crane until he pissed his pants. Freya looked at him with curiosity. That's unfair. If I killed every single noble that treated me rudely, I'd have been called the new Balkia for years by now. 
I don't care what Crane says. He's just an irrelevant road bump on my path. Lith replied. I wouldn't be so sure. He's using the events caused by the Church of the Six to get Count Sester removed and become the next city lord. He's likely to succeed if you ask me. What events? The Griever is not a plague and a few nut jobs aren't enough to dispose of a loyal servant of the crown. You would be right, if Sester was competent. Ever since he joined the Church of the Six, those fanatics have harassed every mage of the city. They say that magic is an insult to the gods and all that crap. Freya said. What? That's enough to outlaw such a religion. Harming mags is a serious crime. Why has no one contacted the army or the mage association about this? Because the city is split into two factions. One follows the church's dogmas and wants to kick mags out of the city. The other one is collecting evidence to get rid of their opponents and seize their properties. Neither faction wants to involve the army, it would ruin their plans. Freya said. Then why did the count call me? Wasn't that shooting himself in the foot? Beats me. Maybe he really has gone mad. Freya shrugged as she opened the door of Lith's room. It was barely bigger than a storage room, with just enough space for a bed and a wardrobe. Sorry to give you the worst room, but it's all that's left. Don't worry, I've been in worse places. Lith lied. The only reason he had accepted staying there was to keep an eye on her. The situation in the city was too odd, and Lith had noticed how Freya was on edge while dealing with some of her guild members, damn, I can't leave the city during a snowstorm. The army locates my position every time I make a report and a single warp steps only crosses about 10 kilometers, 6.2 miles, dot. I can reach a mana geezer with it, but for a normal mage it would be suicidal. Now that I have a better understanding of the situation, I might as well play ball. As soon as he was alone, Lith called his handler and explained everything to her. My assessment is that Count Sester is insane or being manipulated, while Viscount Crane is willing to exploit the chaos that will ensue as the conflicts escalate to further his political agenda. Lith said. Agreed. I'll contact my superiors and let you know their decision. Until then, investigate this Church of the Six and the Griever. If your friend is right about the means of contagion, then Zantia could be the rehearsal for something bigger. Gods, I'll never understand why people are willing to hurt those closest to them for the pettiest reasons. Camilla's voice was so sad that Lith understood she wasn't talking about Zantia, but rather about herself. He called her on her civilian amulet immediately after ending the call. He had recognized the hologram's background as her home, so there was no risk of interrupting her job with his paranoia. Cammy, are you all right? Lith said noticing she was crying, which made him sick with worry. It's just a rough moment for me. Everything is fine. Those words made Lith shiver. In his experience, when a woman said those three words, they were usually a lie. No, it's not. Yesterday you were in a bad mood, then you behaved oddly during lunch, and now this. Cammy, if you don't talk to me, I don't know what to do. He said. At the mention of lunch, she laughed amid the tears. I was perfectly normal at lunch, silly. I'm just on a diet and couldn't stand watching you eat while I starved. She chuckled. But you are right about the rest, I'm not fine. I went to visit my sister and seeing her like that broke my heart. I don't know if I can save her anymore. I feel so helpless that it's driving me crazy. Lyft didn't understand much from her rambling, but he let her talk and cry as long as she needed to. Seeing her breaking apart like that hurt him deeply. Camilla always smiled and she always had a nice word for Lyft, turning his perpetual frown upside down. He wanted to drop everything and run back to Belius just to embrace her. Is there anything I can do? It was all he could say when she was done talking. No, but thanks for the offer. I'll explain everything to you once you get back. I promise that the second time it will make sense. She chuckled. Thanks for listening to me. I feel much better now. Don't worry, you did nothing wrong. This time. She laughed harder, making him smile. Chapter 559. I'm going kill that fucker. Lith's smile disappeared as soon as the call ended. He didn't understand everything, but based on what he knew about Xenia's situation, it wasn't hard to guess who the root of Camilla's problem was. Calm down. Making Camilla's sister a widow isn't bound to make her happy, especially if she finds out you are the culprit. She isn't as morally flexible as you are, and she isn't stupid, if what's his face dies, she'll understand the truth and you'll lose her. Solus said, quenching his anger, Lith looked out of his window, noticing that the intensity of the snowstorm had decreased enough to allow him to move safely, now that I have a mission, I can't ask Freya to go against the interests of her client. It would ruin her reputation. Lith walked outside, and asked around for directions to reach the main temple of the Church of the Six. Sorting out its believers from regular people was quite easy, rangers were known to be mags, so whenever he met the former, they would either shudder in fear or call him names, whereas the latter would warn him. Be careful, son. Those nut jobs are a dangerous bunch said an old man who was taking advantage of the temporary relief from the snowstorm to stock up groceries. They will try to beat the crap out of you at the first opportunity they get. To make matters worse, if you retaliate that idiot count will hold you responsible for their injuries. He spat on the snow as if Sester's name tasted like horseshit, unlike most cities of the north, Zantia wasn't divided into rims, but into two districts. The eastern one, where Lith currently was, was the residential area. The noble or rich households were the farthest ones from the city gates, whereas the poor people lived in its proximity. The west district was the commercial area, where one could find shops, hotels, and restaurants. The main church of the six was located in an old warehouse near the center of the city. Lith shapeshifted his clothes into a commoner civilian attire before proceeding any further. It would be a good idea to not stir unnecessary trouble. I'll get in, check out the most notable members of the church, and get out. If not for the griever and the count's support, this would be an open and closed case. Let's hope things keep being so simple. Lith thought, when Lith reached his destination, his mouth almost fell on the ground from the surprise. The temple was exactly as he expected it, a simple rectangular-shaped building made of wood with a sloping roof. What stunned him for a couple of seconds was the insignia hung above the double doors. 
It represented a handsome young man with silver hair and seven eyes, arranged exactly like those which appeared on Lith's face during a world tribulation, yet they weren't yellow, but each one was a different color with the exception of the seventh eye in the middle of the young man's forehead which was completely white, with no pupil nor iris, if it wasn't for the seventh eye and the pink skin, I think the church of the six venerates the Baylors. Solus thought. Agreed. The question is, how do they know what an ancient Baylor looks like? What does the seventh eye mean? Lith pondered, despite the bad weather, a lot of people were entering the building. Lith waited outside, using life vision and mana sense to check on them. He soon noticed they could be sorted into two different kinds of people, those who had a really weak mana core and looked really angry, and those who had a normal bright red or yellow one but looked to be in anguish, I can't feel any magical aura coming from the temple. It has no defenses nor arrays. Solus pointed out, Lith only had so much time before he was forced to get inside. The snow had turned the city white, making any passerby stand out. The sloping roofs didn't offer any cover, while patrolling from the sky limited his field of vision due to the still ongoing storm. He didn't want to go inside before, whatever ceremony or ritual they were about to perform started. He suspected they would use it to spread the griever with magic, yet he couldn't afford to do small talk with the church's believers. If they see a new face, the ones behind the scheme might get spooked and just spout bullshit, wasting my time. I'm too easily recognizable as a stranger. It's better to wait for all eyes to be on the altar. It will be easier to go unnoticed. Lith thought while hiding behind a corner, from above. Solus's warning made Lith dodge to the side with a roll. Nothing was falling from the roof over his head but a piece of snow, yet he knew Solus wouldn't yell like that without a good reason. He was right. A split second later, two deep footprints appeared in the snow and a thud could be heard. Someone almost invisible had just landed. Lith could see the air in front of him slightly distorted, but it was otherwise unnoticeable. You're better than I expected, Ranger Verhen. Said a male voice quickly closing into him, Lith activated life vision and took out the gatekeeper sword from his pocket dimension, making it shrink to the size of a short sword to more easily maneuver it in the alley they were in, thanks to life vision. The distortion was now evident enough to see the human figure hiding behind it, whoever this fucker is, he's not on par with Zolgrish. Lith struck forward with the gatekeeper, too fast and too close for the opponent to dodge his lunge, the moment their blades touched, a young man with blue eyes in his early twenties seemingly appeared out of thin air. He wore what seemed like black assassin garb, covering him from head to toe and leaving only his eyes exposed. He was wielding a couple of long daggers. One of them had just deflected the gatekeeper, while the other was aimed at Lith's heart. His first instinct was to grab it with his free hand, but his paranoia stopped him, solace, analysis. He thought while taking a step back and a dagger out of his pocket dimension. Lith had no idea how to dual wield, but at least he could parry with it, red core, normal weapons, and great life force. At least on par with Orion after you rejuvenated him, if not better. She replied, something is off with his blades, though. I can see they are coated with something viscous, but colorless, it can't be a simple poison. He knows I'm a ranger, normal weapons can't even put a scratch on my uniform. He's hiding something. Lith thought as he kept being forced on the defensive dot he had already infused himself with all the elements, but the enemy was incredibly fast, plus he had the poison and was better suited to fight in such confined space. Lith suspected that there was more than a trap waiting for him. He was careful not leaving an opening that a second camouflaged enemy could exploit. To add insult to injury, the assassin had taken him by surprise, so Lith had no spells at the ready. He quickly jumped back, gaining the split second of respite he needed to blink behind the enemy and finish him off. Lith was flabbergasted when the enemy turned around, deflecting the gatekeeper with inhuman speed as his second dagger, positioned exactly in front of Lith's exit point, skewered him using his own momentum. Chapter 560. I spy with my little eye someone who's going to die. The assassin laughed merrily as he exploited Lith's shock to push away the gatekeeper and struck at his neck to finish him off. The first dagger had pierced Lith's chest, but thanks to his reflexes, which had allowed him to stop at the last second, and to the skinwalker armor, it didn't go deep. Lith knew that a normal weapon couldn't cut his skin, let alone his armor, which meant that they were anything but normal. No one can move that fast. How did he predict my exit point? Lith thought, his mind spun at top gear as he used the dagger in his left hand to defend himself while he stepped back. The blade in his chest only needed one more push to pierce his heart and Lith had no desire to test if he still needed it to survive. The assassin wasn't willing to let him go, but keeping his arm so close to the opponent left it exposed. He was forced to retreat to avoid losing his wrist to the gatekeeper, but he left behind a gruesome present. He dodged Lith's slash while twisting and pulling the dagger away. The movement ripped the flesh apart and turned the already deep wound into a gaping hole. Life fusion started to heal the damage the moment it was inflicted, yet it only made things worse for Lith. As Solus had predicted, the assassin's blades were coated with some kind of venom that the light element boosting Lith's body was now quickly spreading through his blood. System, fuck! I can't use darkness fusion to cut my pain receptors this time. Otherwise, I won't be able to notice the venom's effects until it's too late and it cripples me. I need to focus light fusion on flushing it out of my body. Lith thought. I was wrong. You're such a disappointment, mate. So much for Treyas Killer and the Destroyer of the Black Star. The assassin sneered as he relentlessly attacked Lith with inhuman speed and surgical precision, not giving him any time to think. The wound on his chest burned as if someone had stabbed him with a burning spear and was twisting it inside his flesh. The venom coursing through Lith's veins made his heartbeats hurt like his blood had turned into sand, and now it was scraping at every fiber it met on its wake, with every heartbeat, the venom spread further. With every breath Lith took, his brain went on fire, blurring his vision, this is no normal venom. I'm analyzing it with invigoration and it's magical in nature. What the actual fuck is going on? Solus was desperate. Her words fell on deaf ears and she knew it. Lith was too focused on survival to listen to her advice, and she was too shocked from mana sense failing her in such an obnoxious manner to think properly. Lith's knee suddenly went weak while he was trying to keep his footwork on par with his enemies and two small cuts opened on his legs. The assassin was not only inhumanly fast and precise, but he was also well trained. Since he had failed to overpower Lith he had changed his tactic. The cuts by themselves were enough to slow Lith down and the new doses of venom they carried with them made his situation even worse, then, all the pieces of the puzzle fell into place and Solus regained her cool. She took a lightning wand out of her pocket dimension and shoot at the assassin. He managed to dodge it, but his assault was interrupted. 
Not cool man. How did you do that? His eyes were flaring with mana. He had clearly managed to follow the wand's movement with life vision, son of a gun. Solus cursed while weaving several spells at once. Lith had only one breath of time to rest before the opponent came charging through the barrage of lightning bolts she unleashed. That single breath allowed Lith to regain his footing as well as his focus. The detoxifying spell from his magic ring coupled with life fusion gave him a brief respite from the blinding pain. That was crippling him, this venom alternates waves of pain with sudden weakness. If I had used darkness fusion to cut off my pain receptors, I would have missed the pain fading right before my body goes limp and I would already be dead. I only have a few seconds before the spell stops blocking the symptoms. Lith thought he stored the gatekeeper inside his pocket dimension and had Solus assume her gauntlet form. He deflected the first blade with his own while using his open palm to thrust at the opponent, the assassin smirked, thinking Lith had lost it. He lunged with all of his strength, boosting himself with air and fire magic to cut Lith's arm from wrist to shoulder in one fell swoop. Only when his blade struck the stone covering Lith's arm did he realize something was wrong. The impact made him almost lose his grip on his weapon as Lith's palm stuck at his nose, crushing it flat. Blood started to stream and his vision became blurry as the sudden injury made them watery. He tried to step back, but Lith had stomped on his left foot, crushing it and locking him into place, the palm slid on his face, followed by an elbow blow that shattered his jaw, the stunned assassin had no idea what was happening. His enchanted garb was supposed to absorb most of the damage, yet it seemed to be nothing more than a tacky cloth in front of the ranger's assault. Solus had simply taken out Zoldrish's eraser from her pocket dimension at the exact timing of the impact, shutting down the magical protections. Also, by cutting off his pain receptors, the assassin had missed both the pain and the stomp, now his foot was stuck under Lith's, making it impossible for him to get away. At that distance, his weapons were useless, whereas Solus's gauntlet reached its apex. Whenever the thin blade struck the thick stone, the impact made his hands go numb. They couldn't cut, nor express the full strength of their wielder, whereas the stone gauntlet was fast and hit like a hammer. The assassin ducked under the claws aimed at his face, but they still managed to make a small cut on his forehead. After his breathing, the assassin also had his vision impaired from the blood trickling in his eyes. He activated life fusion to stop the bleeding, only to suddenly feel that something was wrong. Solus had coated her claws with Balkius venom to return him the favor. It was a special substance devised by the god of death, which directly attacked its victim's mana core. The assassin felt no pain, yet he noticed his fusion magic getting weaker, making the difference in physical prowess between them grow even wider. He activated one of his magical rings to turn the ranger into a popsicle, but at that distance Lith had the time to react at his weak mana flow by grabbing and crushing his hand, so that the twisted finger threw the spell in a random direction, making it useless. The assassin lost one of his daggers, which Solus promptly stored away, and tried to use the remaining one to stab Lith in the neck. Lith reacted by deflecting the blade with his stone-covered arm while the dagger in his left hand pierced the assassin's right side, and cut him open until his ribcage stopped it. Chapter 561 the tables had been turned, but both Lith and Solus knew it didn't mean much against a fellow awakened one, whoever the assassin was. He only needed to use invigoration to go back to his peak condition and get rid of the venom, but luckily the same applied to Lith, behind you. Solus yelled as a new enemy blinked at their back, Lith turned around as fast as he could, noticing that the newcomer was swinging a curved blade at him. He was a young looking man, barely in his twenties. He had light brown skin and several tattoos on his face. He reminded Lith of the man who had fused with the Black Star to prevent its destruction. Unlike the assassin, he wasn't wearing any cloaking device, so his body shone like a light bulb to mana sense. Bright cyan mana core, infused with all the elements, and everything he wears is enchanted. Solus said without waiting for Lith to ask. He could see the weapon's trajectory, but unfortunately, his body couldn't keep up with it. Lith was still bleeding profusely from his chest and the venom was still ravaging his body. The best he could do was intercepting the scimitar with his arm protector. The enemy was fresh and charging with all of his weight and fusion magic, whereas Lith was running on fumes. The curved blade pushed Lith's arm down and opened a deep cut from his left shoulder to his right hip. The assassin's venom coupled with the blood loss made Lith fall to his knees as the new enemy spun on himself to decapitate him with a horizontal slash, the blade hit only air as Lith was suddenly swallowed into the ground. Solus could use only a few powerful spells before running out of mana, so she had to pick them carefully. The first one she had weaved was a warp steps leading back to Lith's room. She placed it under his feet, turning gravity into their ally. Had she chosen to heal such deep wounds, the spell would have drained what little stamina Lith had left, while countering the venom would have required for her to not take part in the fight. Lying on the floor of his room, Lith gasped as blood kept gushing from his wounds, forming a small pool under him. Breathing was becoming harder by the second dot he shut off his pain receptors to gain enough focus to be able to use his breathing technique. Invigoration healed his wounds almost instantly, yet the venom proved to be harder to deal with. It had caused extensive damage that couldn't be treated without first cleansing the toxin. Whatever it was, its maker had infused it with darkness magic, making it capable of rotting its victim's body and using the light magic used against it to empower itself, that was awfully close. That assassin knew who I was and that I'm an awakened. The venom, the cloaking of his mana core and of his equipment, everything was made to counter how an awakened usually fights. Lith thought. It took him only a few seconds to get rid of the toxin, yet the process seemed to last hours to him. He kept looking around his room, waiting for his enemies to open a warp steps, and finish him before he could recover. Asterisk 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 right after Solus had brought Lith to safety, the youth with the scimitar was giving his all to save his comrade's life. Wake up, Kieran. You know I suck at healing. He was mostly talking to himself since Kieran was unconscious. Being gutted like a fish with most of his organs damaged, was already bad. Balkius venom eroding his body and turning his mana core grey only made things harder for the second awakened. He was forced to gamble what would kill his friend first, if the bleeding or the never seen before toxin. He could only treat one at a time with invigoration, at least on someone else. As most awakened, he had always considered healing magic a waste of time, since there was nothing that branch of magic could do that invigoration couldn't do better. Duraniel decided to bet on the awakened's iron body and remove the venom first. As soon as Balkius' toxin was cleansed, light fusion started working again, making Duraniel work much easier. What the fuck were you thinking, man? He said as soon as the assassin regained consciousness. Your stunt might have compromised the whole plan. 
Besides, we came here to see if the guy is as strong as that old bat Ragu says, not to kill him. Talk for yourself. Kieran said while using invigoration to return to his peak condition. I'm sick of hiding like a thief. Tired of my master always reminding me of being careful of fake mags, undead, guardians, and all of that crap. Damn, we trained for over 15 years, spitting blood every single day, and yet they always treat us like kids. I want to prove to that old fossil that there's nothing we awakened cannot face. Yeah, right. Remind me again, who saved your sorry us? Daraniel sneered. That's different. The fucker took me by surprise. Right. Your ambush took you by surprise. It totally makes sense and doesn't sound like a pathetic excuse only a ten-year-old would use. Daraniel was already regretting having saved Kieran's life. Asterisk 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 only when both Lith and Solus were back to their full strength did Lith allow himself to relax if they didn't barge in here already. It means they have no idea where I am. Who are those guys and what's the beef they have with me? Lith thought, the assassin mentioned the Black Star and someone named Treus. Maybe they are friends with the Awakened from the Blood Desert you killed a few months ago. Solus said, unlikely. There was only spite in his voice, not rage. My guess is that he had to be quite young. Aside from his carefully planned attack, everything he did and said seemed like a teenager during a measuring contest. Like he had to prove something. The real question is if he attacked me because I was near the Church of the Six or for a completely unrelated reason. Lith's paranoia could easily trace a connection between two awakened, a new religion, the Griever, and even with J.F. Kennedy's death. Whatever the answer is, maybe it's better to ask Freya's help. She's bound to know something about the Church of the Six, and awakened cannot show themselves to the public. Together you can take both of those guys out. Solus said, unless they decide to go all out despite the presence of witnesses or there's more than two of them. Anyway, I've lost my opportunity for today's ritual, so second-hand information is better than nothing. Lith thought, while watching the storm intensify again, for a second, he considered the possibility of the awakened assassin using the venom to cause the griever, but he discarded it immediately. It's made to kill, not to incapacitate. Also, someone as skilled as Freya is would have detected and extracted it. Unless someone baited me in this house, meeting Freya might actually be a blessing in disguise. I can use her guild to collect the information I need and maybe even get access to some victims of the griever. If really there is a link between those two awakened and the illness, by understanding how it works I can guess what their endgame is. Lith used accumulation to refine his core while waiting for dinner. Without his tower and with the storm raging outside there wasn't much he could do. A couple of hours later, someone knocked on his door. Chapter 562. Hey Lith, mind giving me a hand before we go get our dinner? Freya asked. No problem. What's the matter? Lith stood up, feeling a little light-headed. Are you alright? You are way paler than when we met earlier. Freya cast her best diagnostic spell on him before he could even open his mouth. Just tired from almost dying. No biggie. He shrugged, Freya was happy when her spell confirmed that he was perfectly fine, just a bit famished. Yet the dying part made her flinch. Forget about my problem. What the heck is going on here? How did you put yourself in trouble so fast? Off the record? Because it's ranger business, so I need you to keep it a secret. Lith replied, if I have to ask for her help, I need to tell her everything. Otherwise I could endanger her life for nothing. He thought. Sure. I'm your friend before being an adventurer. She said while forcing him to sit on his bed and giving him some beef jerky. Lith told her about his new mission concerning the church and how an assassin had ambushed him while he was on Reckon. Good gods. Freya blurted out. Your skinwalker armor is superior even to a ranger uniform, yet you're saying this guy had poison weapons capable of piercing it. Worse. Even the venom was enchanted and the kingdom has very few alchemists capable of creating such a thing. Lith pointed out. You said you took one of them before retreating. Can I see it? If we identify its design or the venom, we could get some clues about the assassin's identity. Freya said. No. If I take it out from my dimensional item, I risk them learning my position. Tracking spells are common for precious weapons, not to mention the possibility of a self-destruct spell. Assassins aren't supposed to leave clues behind. Lith shook his head while munching. True. How many people knew you are in Zantia? I mean, you arrived just a few hours ago and now there's a snowstorm. How the heck did the assassin made it here in time? Good point. Lith nodded. Only Camilla, the city guards, Count Sester, Viscount Crane, and your men knew about me. He stressed the last two possibilities, making her turn pale. Why would Crane put a bounty on your head? For the same reason he doesn't want me here. To get Zantia for himself. If I solved the problems with the church and the illness, he would lose the merits from exposing the Count's collusion with the church and with them the chance of becoming the next city lord. Freya was about to ask why Lith suspected her men too when she realized she already knew the answer all too well. Money. The idea of having a traitor in her guild made her furious, even more so since it wasn't the first time. Calm down, Freya. I'm just looking at all the possible angles. My main suspect is someone else. He said as she bit her lower lip out of frustration. The Count? After all, he turned off his communication amulet after requesting your assistance. That way, he forced you to come even if he wanted to cancel the mission and had all the time to call for an assassin. She said. My thoughts exactly. The only loophole in this reasoning is that he had no way to know the snowstorm would stop me from leaving. Anyway, what do you need my help with? Duluth, the Viscount's youngest son, has the griever again. It makes no sense since we kept him home all the time and checked the preparation of his meals. I said the others it's just the flu to buy some time. I need a second opinion. She said. Fine. If you screwed up, you owe me dinner. After eating the jerky, Lith had realized how hungry he was. Between the adrenaline rush and his paranoia, he had forgotten that invigoration was helpless to replenish the nutrients lost after healing. And if I didn't? You owe me dinner anyway. You can't put a price on your pride as a healer, can you? That would make you stoop to my level. Lith's reply made her laugh, yet she didn't yield. No way. 
With an assassin around, you need my help, so this makes us even at best. She warped them outside Dulufa's door, making the two guards she had left outside point their weapons at their throats out of surprise. Lith caught both short swords between his fingers, locking them into place like they were just pesky flies. At ease, guys. No need to make a scene every time. Free aside as she took a mental note to kick them out of her guild. Them being on alert was a good sign, the rage in their eyes instead of relief once they recognized her, not so much. Having failed to learn dimensional magic even though they attended one of the six great academies seems to bother them to no end. If they get any sourer than this, I'm sure, accidents, will happen. She thought. Sorry, boss. Said a blonde mage with a snarl. She could barely stand free a casually flaunting her dimensional magic instead of walking as any normal person would. Lith blocking her swing with just three fingers added insult to the injury, yet Freya didn't walk just for showing off. The Viscount's mansion had many floors and extended for hundreds of meters. With an ill patient waiting for her, she had no time to waste coddling her subordinate's feelings, when they walked through the door, Lith whistled in appreciation. Dolitha's room was actually an apartment bigger than his own house. Every piece of furniture was made from the finest materials and had the Crane family crest engraved on it. I can clearly see the hand of a true artisan at work and the ego of a true self-centered asshole messing with him. He's so stingy that he preferred masterpieces to look tacky rather than risking them being stolen. Lith thought, oh yeah? What's the difference between the two of you? Solus giggled at Lith criticizing someone for being stingy and paranoid, I don't wear glasses. His reply made her laugh harder, the hallway also served as a living room, with several padded sofas arranged around a square table with a cigar box and a tray full of flower petals on it. The wood of the sofa was painted gold, while the silk covering them was deep green, to match the pattern of the precious carpet covering most of the floor, the walls were pristine white, emphasizing the gold of which were made or coated all the ornaments in the room, even the frames of the paintings decorating the place. After entering inside a bedroom similarly decorated and with more gold than a jewelry store, Lith expected the king-sized bed to host a profligate teen. Yet Dolith was barely ten years old, with black hair like his father and covered in sweat. Lith chanted some gibberish and activated invigoration, performing a full body scan of the child. Are you sure this is the griever? It takes a tier one spell to cure it. Lith said, yeah. It's the fourth time in less than two weeks, so I'm pretty sure. Fever, bloodshot eyes, weakness, and black spots on his chest. Freya lifted the bedsheets and the youth's nightgown revealing what looked like oversized blackheads. I have good news and I have bad news. Which do you want to hear first? He asked after creating a hush zone around the two of them. Chapter 563. The bad news. Freya said almost holding her breath. This is most likely to be an inside job. Noticing her shock, Lith beckoned to her. Use your diagnostic spell and follow my instructions. Can you see the grayed out zones near the blackheads and what's his name's organs? He said as soon as Freya did as instructed, why not use a random name like Zoldrish Wood? His name is Doloth. Solus rebuked him. Of course, I can. Why? Her answer surprised him quite a bit. Are you telling me you noticed them, but you don't know what they are? Yes, is it a common illness? She felt greatly embarrassed by the knowledge gap between them. No. It's what remains after someone gets tortured with magic and only partially healed. Didn't Journey teach you anything? Lith asked. Mom is no healer, how does she fit in? Since when did it stop her from being good at her job? Your father provided her with plenty of tools to make up for her lack of magic. We exchanged a lot of pointers while we were in offer. Bottom line, a wizard did it. Lith pointed at Doloth. That's the bad news. The good news is that you were right. There is no griever no poison going around. Someone is harming people with darkness magic just to heal them immediately after. That's why the symptoms vary from person to person. It depends on both the mage's skill and how the victim's body responds. A simple wave of Lith's hand restored the youth's health. When you said inside job did you mean my men or the house staff? Freya asked. Both. The culprit only needs to have access to delicious here and some sedative to not wake him up during the process. It would explain why it's not contagious and how it can return so fast. Freya pondered. The culprit only has to repeat the process as soon as the healer leaves the house to make them appear like a quack. To what end, though? This is what I need your help for. I need a list of all the victims of the griever and all the information you can get about the Church of the Six. After all, the main reason why religions don't take root is because of healers being good at their job. I'll ask Wyra to learn everything she can about the church and the Viscount for the list. If he refuses to help, we'll be on our own, though. We? You're an adventurer. As far as I know, you can't serve two masters at once. Neither of you is my master. Freya gracefully showed him Orion's masterpiece she wore on her middle finger while making a fist. You are my friend whereas Crane is a pompous idiot. It's not difficult for me to pick a side, even though I doubt we'll come to that. She took out her communication amulet, and gave instruction to the core members of the Crystal Shield Guild to investigate discreetly about the church. I'm no expert, but while we wait, I can give you an abridged version of their teachings. I listened to their ramblings so many times that I got the gist of it. Lith nodded at her to continue. The Church of the Six preaches that in the beginning there were six gods. Each one of them controlled a different element and together they created all of Mogar's life forms. According to the church, the world energy also comes from the six elemental sovereigns. They also say that long ago the world was at peace because the sovereigns distributed their gifts equally with every living being. Then, some nondescriptive elders plotted to overthrow them and steal their powers. They succeeded yet failed at the same time. The weakened sovereigns fell into a deep slumber instead of dying and magic as we know it was born. According to this cult, mags are the descendants of those who stole the gods' powers. This is ridiculous. Lith blurted out. How could normal humans and beasts take down gods? Also, how do they explain the fact that mags can be born from non-mags? What good can relinquishing magic do? Beats me. Freya shrugged. Do you have any idea who is the guy with seven eyes on their poster? The supreme deity, the All-Father. Each one of his eyes became one sovereign while the seventh became Mogar, bestowing mana upon all of his children's creations. 
Freya said. The Allfather, eh? A cruel grin appeared on Lith's face as a plan to use the church's teaching against itself formed into his mind. Are you sure you're not adopted? Freya interrupted his musing. What? Why do you say that? It's no wonder Floria likes you so much. You're getting as tall as dad and your expression right now is identical to mom's when she's hunting her prey. What's our plan? First things first. Dinner. Lith replied and his gurgling stomach agreed. Are you free tonight? I wish. Now that I have an idea of what the griever is, I'll take credit for it with the Viscount and after that, I'll need to change the detail schedule. I'm sure he'll try to switch the blame on my men and the worst thing is that I have my doubts too. Why? I'm planning to return the ambush. If I catch the guy, I can get new intel. Otherwise, I'll take out one enemy. It's a win-win. That's the dumbest thing you've ever said. If they are looking for you, they might even know you're here. Two against one is too much for anyone. You need my help. Freya said. I'll need you for the second act, that's for sure. First, I need to probe their strength and wits. Don't worry about me. I'm not the master of space, but I can still blink to safety if necessary. Gods, don't use my title from the academy. I can't believe I used to find it flattering, it's embarrassing at best. Seriously, what are you thinking? Solus asked, I doubt someone as skilled as the one who made the dagger didn't insert a tracking spell. Mostly because its cloaking effect makes it impossible to distinguish it amid normal weapons. Lith thought, so what? Life vision is no mana sense, but they can still recognize your energy signature. If they see you near the dagger, they will either stay away or attack together, first, it's two against two. They have no idea of your existence and if we prepare the field, speed and coordination can make the difference in mana call level irrelevant. Second, they will never see me coming, as you said, they can recognize my energy signature, but I have more than one, right? Lith inwardly grinned, Viscount Crane was stingy, but it turned out that his avarice only spread those outside of his house. Both the kitchen staff and the ingredients at their disposal were top class, allowing Lith and Freya to enjoy their meal while reminiscing the old days. It was part of Freya's plan to weed out the most likely members of the Crystal Shield, that would betray the guild at the first opportunity they got. It wasn't hard to spot them since they almost popped more than one, vain whenever they talked about their specializations, their dreams for the future, or even talking about the inner's couple after. Dinner, Lith returned to his room and checked with all of his magical senses that no one was spying on him. Then, he stored away the Skinwalker armor and assumed his hybrid form before walking away. Chapter 564 Back when Lith had just acquired his second life force, he had joked about slaughtering people and pinned the blame on a black-scaled monster. He would have never expected that the day would come that he would turn the joke into reality, Lith flew towards the commercial district. He needed an isolated zone for his ambush, to have as few witnesses as possible. He couldn't afford to raise rumors about a demonic being appearing in the same city he was. His nature as a hybrid was a double-edged sword. It gave him an advantage against most human enemies, but it had to remain secret at all costs. It was necessary not only for it to keep being an effective weapon, but also as a matter of survival. Lith doubted that leiches like Inxilot or even the Human Council of the Awakened would leave him alone if they knew about the existence of a new power. He was certain of it because it was what he would have done. He picked the warehouse district for his plan. That late at night, with the snowstorm still ongoing, there was no one around aside the men of the Night Watch. Lith took the enchanted dagger out of his pocket dimension, collected all the venom still coating it, and then he hid as far as he could before dropping it in an open space between buildings. I hate fair fights. Lith thought, against any other enemy, I would leave Solus to stand guard on the dagger and ambush them. Too bad I only have one cloaking ring. If I keep it, then those two would discover her existence, while if I give it to her, my blue core would be like a goddamn sun to their life vision, if I'm right about the tracking spell, the only thing I can do is to remain close enough to the blade to spot the assassin, but far enough from it to be mistaken for a guard. As long as I wear Orion's ring, I look like an inconspicuous yellow cord individual, what about me? I can't take my gauntlet form. It would give your identity away and defy the purpose of this charade. Solus asked when she noticed that Lith was casting only a few spells, there was a limit to the number of spells one could keep at the ready. Each one of them would exert mental pressure on the mage, wearing down their focus and willpower. They had no idea how long they would have to wait, mindlessly going all out meant getting tired even before conjuring their first attack. Save your strength and cast spells only when we have a grasp on the situation. Try not to draw attention to yourself. Lith replied. The wait turned out to be so long that Lith had to dispel even the few spells he had prepared. He kept moving around the warehouses, following the pattern of the guards for more than an hour before something happened, a red core is flying fast toward the dagger. Solus warned him, he didn't rush in, but bid his time and watch from afar instead. Lith thought, clearly he has been trained well, but flying while wearing a cloaking spell is a blunder. There's no way a red core could fly. Either he got impatient or training aside he is a moron, or maybe it's a trap to lure you in the open. Solus pointed out, if you're right, it's naive and poorly executed. If he walked, I could have mistaken him for a guard until it was too late, whereas by flying he made an easy target of himself. Unless he is the bait and his companion is the hunter. Solus couldn't believe the levels of paranoia she had reached. It seemed that bad habits did indeed rub off, like Lith had predicted, the enchanted dagger had a tracking device. It alerted Kieran the moment it left the pocket dimension. The assassin had reached the warehouse district as fast as he could, smelling the trap from miles away. His problem was that even though he knew there was a trap, he couldn't find it. There wasn't anything magical near his dagger, no array surrounding the area, and only weakest cord humans patrolled the area. Whenever he spotted a yellow cord human, Kieran checked his energy signature to be sure it wasn't the ranger, but even after more than an hour, the area was still quiet, damn. He can't have dropped my blade here without a reason. I waited for so long that now I have no time left. If I don't imprint the reaver every two hours or store it in a dimensional item it explodes. That stupid master of mine is so afraid of others stealing her secrets that her safety measures border insanity. He thought .to make matters worse, only Deraniel had accompanied him to retrieve the lost dagger. The other members of the group blamed him for his solo stunt and aside from laughing at his expenses, they did nothing to help. Even Deraniel would have given him the finger rather than a hand if not for their masters being good friends. 
He was following Kieran from a distance thanks to his surveillance mirror, ready to walk to his side if necessity arose. It was an enchanted item that allowed him to see everything in the vicinity of its transmitter, a small pin that Kieran wore under his cloaking garb. As the assassin was about to reach his blade, the reaver, Lift took out a wand from his pocket dimension, then, he broke it in half before tossing it inside a warp steps leading directly beside the enchanted weapon together with a hush spell. Although it produced no sound, the following explosion sent the reaver flying against his owner. The sudden flash blinded both Daraniel and Kieran, so neither of them could see a second warp steps opening above the assassin's head, nor Lift emerging from it. The rapier in his hand lunged at Kieran's right arm, yet he reacted by infusing himself with air magic and managed to avoid the strike despite being blind. The black scales covering Lith's mouth opened as he breathed a stream of origin flames against the enemy. The blue fire ate at the black garb, revealing several overlapping auras, the cloaking aura was the first to fall, allowing Solus to distinguish its pseudo-core, okay. This guy has a bright cyan core, a physical prowess slightly inferior to yours, and the dagger stuck in his chest. She inwardly smirked, glad to have left enough venom on the reaver in case something like that happened, his armor has a defensive barrier, a cloaking aura, and something that reminds me of full guard. They were arranged so that the cloaking function covered them all, lucky bastard. They thought in unison, full guard was one of the most useful spells a mage knight had. It created a spherical blue aura with a radius of 1.65 meters, 5.41 feet, around the caster. Thanks to full guard, a mage knight had no blind spots. Whatever entered the sphere would be detected, allowing them to counterattack and dodge with surgical precision without even looking. That's how he reacted so promptly to my blink, earlier. Full guard's biggest downside is that it turns you into a neon sign, but the cloaking aura solved the issue. I need to get my hands on that thing. Chapter 565 even though their thirst for knowledge burned bright, Lith and Solus knew better than meaninglessly rush forward. Lith expanded the silence zone to not be interrupted by the city guards and unleashed a volley of lightning bolts. Even full guard was useless if its user wasn't fast enough to react to the information it provided. Kieran cursed as his body went into a seizure. The blade stuck in his body was a perfect conductor, allowing the lighting to bypass the armor's defensive barrier. Darkness fusion prevented him from feeling pain, but the electrical current still triggered his active motor neurons. Having the opponent lost his mobility, Lith pushed the reaver through Kieran's body until its hilt struck his chest. With a pierced lung and the venom flooding the assassin's blood system, Lith was almost sure to have absolute control over his enemy. Too bad that almost is never enough. He thought, at least now he can't use invigoration. I could question him, but if the scimitar guy is around, he will have all the time he needs to cast his best spells, if not even an array. Time to find out if we are alone or not. Time to die, human. You shouldn't have messed with my turf. Lith's voice in his hybrid form was a low grumble, as if the words were half-spoken and half-roared, making it unrecognizable. The rapier went straight for Kieran's heart, forcing Daraniel's hand. The man from the blood desert had no choice but to open the warp steps he had at the ready, while unsheathing his sword. It cost him the array he had been preparing from the moment the ambush started. Another of the strong points of the surveillance mirror was the possibility to project arrays from a greater distance than it was normally possible, making it a perfect tool for awakened working as a team, that idiot. Not only did he get his ass handed to him before I could finish my spell, but he also managed to anger an emperor beast. Fucking animals, they are almost as annoying as Kieran. Daraniel thought, behind you. Solus warned Lith as her mana sense detected the opening of the dimensional corridor. It was too far for Lith to stab the opponent before he could react, so Lith feigned ignorance until the last moment. Only then did he dodge the attack by rolling to the side while using spirit magic to toss the helpless assassin against his companion. Fuck. Daraniel said, unable to express how frustrated he was. He had only two choices, to blink away and be at the enemy's mercy or kill Kieran with his own hands. Dimensional magic was the only way he had to alter the path of his blade, but Lith took the choice out of his hands by hurling a stream of origin flames against the two awakened who were about to collide. Daraniel cursed again, blinking both him and his companion in opposite directions. He didn't do it to protect Kieran, so much as to create two exit points at once. He gambled on his luck, hoping the Emperor Beast would follow the wrong blink. Lith activated the spirit magic variation he had learned while in Zolgrish's lab. Demons of darkness. He shouted despite being deeply ashamed of his current persona. Talking like an evil overlord made him cringe to the bone. He injected his pure mana inside his shadow, and then he expanded it like a black sun. Blink had an area of effect much smaller than spirit magic, so both awakened were still within his grasp. Kieran was too busy spitting blood to not drown in his own fluids to notice his shadow coming to life, whereas Daraniel activated fusion magic as soon as he realized an invisible force was constricting his movements, what the? Not only the grip he felt all over his body was getting stronger instead of fading, but his life force was being sucked as well. It took him just a moment to notice that his own shadow now had yellow eyes, and was wrapped around his limbs. He freed himself with a small flash of light that dispersed the darkness and then he blinked away, damn, the shadow version of spirit magic has a weak spot even easier to exploit than the regular one does. Rat Pack didn't notice it because he's an idiot. Lith thought, instead of wasting his time giving chase to Daraniel, Lith went after Kieran. Preventing one enemy from running away and the other one from healing himself was impossible, so he decided to cut his losses along with the assassin's head. We need help. Daraniel yelled at his communicator amulet panicking. Two against one? How pathetic are you two? Replied a feminine voice full of disdain. You can't kill me. I'm. Kieran attempted to say, but Lith enchanted rapier fully infused with air, fire, and darkness magic made a short work of the black guard's barrier. Dead. Lith completed the phrase for him, oh, shit. Forget about the loot, this thing is going to explode. Solus said when she noticed that all of the pseudo cores of the assassin's equipment were becoming volatile, no need. Lith chuckled as he blinked both himself and the corpse at Daraniel's opposite sides. Daraniel now had to take his chances with two kinds of demise. Either he faced the explosion and took the demonic beast sword in his back or he took the explosion in his back and got skewered from the front. Panicking and using the communicator amulet didn't leave him enough focus to cast a blink fast enough to save himself. Luckily for him, the person on the other side of the call wasn't really refusing to help. She just needed enough time to lock into his coordinates. 
She appeared in the nick of time, using the multi-layered barrier she had prepared to save Kieran to contain the explosion instead. Her companion blocked the incoming rapier with a great sword that he was able to wield with only one hand. He was a handsome man who seemed to be in his early twenties. He was even taller than Lith in his hybrid form and had the build of a mountain. He wore a set of light armor that covered his vitals, and his joints with small metal plates over a set of high-end hunter clothes. Lith recognized it as a style originating from the Gorgon Empire. The youth had blonde hair and sky-blue eyes. To kill Kieran so fast you must be a worthy opponent. He said. Too bad you can't harm me with that needle, scram. Lith roared while infusing himself with all the elements as the youth did the same, deep blue mana core, strong as a bull, good equipment. Especially the sword, Solas said. What the? Pelion couldn't believe his own eyes when the shorter and much slimmer creature pushed him aside. Lith's hybrid form had the same abilities as the human one. Yet despite the difference in build, thanks to his constant training and body refining, his muscles were even more powerful than the giants. The moment Pelion tried to fight strength with strength, Lith sidestepped, making the enemy be thrown off balance by his own charge. The youth was an excellent swordsman, but the nimble rapier exploited his weakness and slithered like a snake through his guard, opening deep wounds on his four limbs and crippling his strength. Chapter 566. Pelion managed to block Lith's last lunge with the hook-shaped hilt of his weapon, shattering the rapier with a quick flick of his wrist. I'd run if I were you. He said with a grin. The creature was now unarmed and Aelia was done with the explosion. Together, they were unbeatable. Because I've lost a toy? The demonic beast sneered. The rapier was just one of Lith's failed prototypes in the attempt of replicating the gatekeeper's properties. Having sparred a lot with Floria and Freer in the past, it was one of the weapons Lith knew best. Also, due to its light weight, it required a minimum amount of ingredients. He would have preferred to avoid using the gatekeeper while he was in his hybrid form. It was Lith Verhen's signature weapon, but he couldn't afford to hold back now that they were three against one. Besides, he had come prepared. Come forth, my soul. Feel my wrath. A set of giant membranous wings popped from his back as the space in front of his hand was torn apart by emerald flames. An eerie light painted the night green, sending shivers down the spine of both the men of the night watch and the awakened ones. A small sphere of stone emerged from the fissure, and it grew into a huge black sword. I'm not going to fight a wormling who possesses an omni pocket just to avenge an idiot like Kieran. I'm out of here. Aelia grabbed Pelion and Aranial from the collar of their shirts and walked away. The several spells Lith had just conjured hit only air, so he dispelled them before the ruckus could draw too much attention. After checking with his mystical senses that he really was alone, he followed suit and opened a series of warp steps leading to random destinations before returning to his room in Crane's mansion. Both Lith and Solus were racking their brains trying to decipher the awakened woman's words, What's a wormling? What's an omni pocket? And how did you do that thing with the emerald flames again? Lith thought, Me? What about your wings? Since when can you do that? Solus had no idea what he was talking about. I was just flexing my shoulders for the evil overlord pose while you coated the gatekeeper to make it unrecognizable. Maybe my second life force is growing over time. Why every single time we go out for answers, we only get more questions? Lith had no way to know that the reason why Aelia had preferred retreating was their pocket dimension, which was referred to by other creatures as an omni pocket, unlike common dimensional items. Once a mage had imprinted an omni pocket, they could access it without actually carrying it with them. It made them unpredictable and usually only ancient, powerful beings like Tesca had one. Aelia had recognized it because, due to Orion's ring shielding Solus's existence, Lith was apparently carrying no magical items while in his hybrid form. She had no idea that Solus's long slumber had destroyed all the treasures it contained. Aelia didn't felt like fighting an unknown enemy in possession of such a treasure while Deraniel was still shocked out of his mind. Lith experimented a few times by taking several objects of different sizes out of his pocket dimension, yet nothing happened. Lith sighed as something pulled at his shoulder, almost making him stumble. Point one of his wings had struck the wardrobe without him noticing. It took him several tries to fold them above his shoulders, and even more to make them disappear inside his shoulder blades before going back to his human form, damn. I'm sure I can take down a couple of awakened of that level with Freya's help, but three? Lith set aside all the questions he had to ponder about his predicament, three is another matter entirely. To make matters worse, there could be actually five of them. Solus pointed out, making Lith groan, you're right. The fucking church of the six. Six entitled idiots playing god with humans, more likely they are just helping behind the scene. Taking care of a religion requires time and effort, whereas Zansha's problems only started after the winter lockdown. I think you may be right. Lith thought, I still have no idea what their endgame is, but here is what I think it might be happening. For some reason, they have a beef with me. They know I'm a ranger, so they use the church to call me here, maybe the snowstorm is just a coincidence, or maybe they predicted its arrival before having me summoned here. With no warp gate, no one can help me. In theory, I'm on my own, the silver lining is that if they took so many precautions, it means that they can't afford being detected. That's one toy I can mess with, Lyft took his army amulet and called his handler, telling her all about the ambush, and the two mysterious individuals who he reported as capable of using an odd kind of magic like Nalia the Kinslayer did. When her army amulet had woken her up in the middle of the night, Camilla didn't care about how she was dressed. Lyft's room could only mean an emergency. She wrapped a bedsheet around her nightgown as fast as she could and answered the call. Gods. I checked the weather mag's forecast. The storm will last at least for a week. I'll make sure they send you a spellbreaker as soon as possible. In the meantime dash, Camilla clenched her teeth, for the first time since she had joined the army, she hated her job for what she was forced to say. Continue the mission. The high command agrees with us. Your duty is to uncover if there is any correlation between the church and this fake illness. You are hereby authorized to act as the ruler of Zantia until the crisis is resolved. As for those assassins, can you provide me a description? I can do much better. Lith had to repress both a sneer and a snort while he projected the holograms of the two awakened, the assassin was dead, but the man from the blood desert was about to enter a world of trouble. Hence the sneer, the snort was due to his inability to show the holograms of the other two awakened he had met earlier. They had faced a hybrid, not Ranger Verhen. 
By exposing them he would expose himself too, this way, if the assassin had a vengeful master, they would have a hard time tracking the culprit. Excellent. I'm forwarding our conversation right now. Over and out. She called him back on his civilian amulet, begging him to ignore the orders and stay safe. It took him a while to calm her down, yet after the call ended, Camilla didn't manage to fall asleep until dawn came. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk in the following hours, Lith's report moved through the official and unofficial chain of command. There was more than one middle ranked official handsomely paid to report keywords like Nalia and incredible magic. Once put together, it took barely an hour to reach all the right and wrong ears. The royals didn't like having awakened messing with their territory, and neither did Tyrus. Deraniel was an outsider, so he didn't fall under the free will umbrella she granted to the citizens of the Griffin Kingdom. Are you insane? Deraniel's master, Tasarquinus, was mad with rage. Chapter 567. Tasarquinus was an awakened almost 600 years old, yet he didn't appear to be one day past his 50s. He was 1.8 meters, 5 feet 11 inches, tall, with deep bronze skin, gray black hair, and a beard that emphasized his pearl white teeth. He was considered one of the best wardens, and sword masters of the blood desert. He was still inwardly debating if being angry for his heir's defiance, or for him having failed to kill a seemingly rogue awakened. The purple aura exuding from his body made his white robe flap like he was amid a windstorm. Do you have any idea how long did it take me to obtain my territory? To have overlord Salarak bestow upon me full authority over my tribe? Now I risk everything, and for what? The only reason why Tassar wasn't already in Zansha, to murder his successor with his own hands instead of talking to him with his communication amulet, was the distance between them. Have you forgotten what happened to Traeus? Are you eager to join him in death? Well, I'm not. Come back here immediately. But, father, there is a storm outside, don't call me father. I've had dozens of children, but you are the only one who managed to go from most talented to most idiotic in less than a day. I prefer you dead in a snowstorm than alive doing more damage. Bring Kieran with you. I hope he has a good explanation. You know that I'm not serious when I say that I will kill the two of you, whereas Lesalia might not be so kind. Tassar said. Master, I, I can't obey. Deraniel stuttered. Kid, if you make me come there, Lesalia will be the least of your problems. Tassar's eyes flared with mana. He could understand his young and hot-headed successor making a blunder, but defying his orders was unacceptable. I mean I'll depart immediately, but Kieran is dead. I can't even bring his corpse back because it exploded. Deraniel went pale. His father was a meek man, but once angered he could upturn his entire domain to find a single missing coin. What? How? Deraniel took his father's curiosity as the opportunity to get off the hook and told him all about the demonic beast they had faced. You moron. Are you telling me you asked the permission of neither the awakened human nor the beast who rules over the Keller region? I swear, if I have to offer them any compensation, it will come out of your pocket. Get home, now. Tessa hung the call without waiting for a reply. He had a lot of calls to make. Tiris, Ragu of the Human Council, the rulers of the Keller region, but more importantly his lifelong friend. Kieran was Lesalia's successor just like Deraniel was his own. They had hoped they would grow into good friends like their masters were, but life had decided otherwise. I don't want her to learn about her heir's death from a stranger. Kieran might have died an idiot, but she deserved better. Tassar sighed. He opened a warp gate leading directly inside her forge, not only Lesalia was one of the best assassins in the Blood Desert, but she was also one of its best forge masters. She trusted no one, so all the equipment she used, no matter if clothes or caltrops, she made them herself. Damn it! He heard her yell. I can't further purify adamant without origin flames and those damn beasts demand a lot of money for it. Do you have some left? She asked. No. The only dragon I know asks so much for a single flask that it's more convenient to call him when necessary rather than stockpiling it. Look, we need to talk. Lesalia took off the white mask covering her face revealing skin with the color and the wrinkles of hardened leather. Being almost 600 years old, she looked like a woman in her mid-sixties, with several gray streaks amid her raven black hair. She was wearing a scaly leather apron over a black tank top and leather work pants. Her gloves covered her arms up until her elbows and just like her apron, they were made from the golden skin of a wyvern. They protected her from the intense heat of the furnace which was strong enough to harm even an awakened enhanced body. Her figure was slender, but she was strong enough to crush stone with her bare hands. Her average height and build allowed her to go unnoticed. She had sharp eyes and a long nose, giving her the look of a demanding artisan, but Tassar knew better. Her forge resembled more a real blacksmith rather than a magical lab. Several furnaces and silvery tables occupied most of the stone cave she had built inside an active volcano, sometimes even using its heat for her most difficult pieces. She was currently working at a forge fueled by a mix of lava and magic which made even her enchanted tools white hot. Yet the silvery liquid inside the obsidian mold refused to boil. A snap of Lesalia's fingers made the purple flames, and the small tornado empowering them disappear. The liquid turned solid in an instant as she cursed her bad luck. Is this about Kieran? She asked making Tassar choke on his condolences. You already know? Of course, I do. I had a tracking device and a communication system embedded in his suit. I can show you how hard we failed teaching those youngsters. Another snap of her fingers, and the green crystal lighting the cave made the room go dark as its light focused on the nearest wall to project a hologram of both ambushes. The one the two awakened had performed and the one they had suffered. See? In the alley, Kieran had all the advantages, yet he lost. He wasted time talking, he didn't capitalize on the venom, and stuck too close to the opponent. As one of the greatest assassins alive, every tiny mistake Kieran made was a capital sin to her. Tassar couldn't see anything wrong in the assassin's moves. If he had been in Lith's shoes, he would have survived only thanks to his artifacts, this Lith is an interesting fellow. He turned the tables as soon as Kieran revealed to be an awakened. His technique is a bit rough around the edges, but he adapts fast and there's no wasted movement. He clearly practiced a lot. She sighed. At the warehouse, it was an outright massacre. Once Kieran triggered the trap, his fate was sealed. That's what I tried teaching to all of my disciples, yet even the best of them was beaten by a mere wormling at our own game. What are you going to do about it? 
Tassar asked. Nothing. Kieran failed twice, proving to be unworthy of inheriting my legacy. I told him many times that we are assassins, not warriors. Patience is of the utmost importance. Yet he mistook discipline for chains and my warnings for insults. I'm not going to cross two countries and as many guardians for a broken blade. Because that's what he was. I forged many before him, hoping they would receive my heritage. Some of them were too soft and were bent by my teachings. Others were too hard and couldn't endure them. When a smith fails, they don't blame the flames or the metal, they blame themselves. When a blade breaks, they don't collect its pieces, they learn from their mistakes and move to a new project. Chapter 568. City of Zantia, now. You heard my master. I can't stay here a second longer. Daraniel had packed everything so fast that when he was ready to depart, Pelion had yet to complete his warping array. With the strength of the four remaining awakened, it was powerful enough to at least warp him past the storm they had previously fueled and were now unable to control. I would leave in a hurry if I were you. If the wormling contacts his master, both Pelion and Aelia are in danger. He has seen your faces. The ranger must have powerful connections with magical beasts to summon the aid of the lord of the region. All of those present shuddered at the memory. If both master and disciple were capable of using origin flames, there was no telling what forge mastering marvels they had access to. I don't care about the church of Madman, nor about Zantia. As long as we are alive, there's always next year. He walked through the gate, leaving them to wonder if their plan of using the ranger as their main ingredient had actually been a mistake. Asterisk asterisk, asterisk a cave near the southern border of the Keller region. After receiving the apologies from the two awakened humans of the blood desert, Zedros the Wyvern, the emperor beast ruling over the region immediately called his dear friend, Falul the Hydra. I just heard the strangest thing. It seems a wormling is protecting my territory, yet all of my children have long since left and it's been decades since I've mated with a human. Is him one of yours? He asked. She was the only other draconic emperor beast, he knew in the Griffin Kingdom who could have spawned such a powerful creature. A wormling was the offspring of a dragon, or a lesser dragon with a member of another race. A hybrid who was forced to choose the race he would belong to before reaching the 20 years of age. Point one of the Hydra's seven scaly snake, head squinted her eyes, trying to remember when it was the last time she had copulated with a human while her other heads kept sleeping like logs. Among the various species of emperor beasts, hydras were considered part of the lesser dragons. They had a stocky lower body with four short legs and a heavy tail. Both were necessary to balance their long, serpentine necks ending with a snake-like head the size of a muscle car. Hydra's number of heads varied with their power and age. A newborn had two, whereas the most powerful of them could grow up to seven heads. Each head was capable of independent thought and casting its own spells. Ancient Hydras were almost unbeatable thanks to the explosive attack strength they could achieve by alternating physical and magical attacks from seven different sources. Their weakness and strength overlapped, though point seven heads also meant seven times the energy consumption. No matter how many heads they had, they all belonged to a single Hydra, after all. If not careful, they would exhaust their mana and stamina in just a few seconds. Unlike Wyverns, they weren't able to use origin flames nor to fly without a spell, so they were considered among the weakest of the lesser dragons. Falul was still half asleep, so it took her a while to understand what the Wyvern was saying. She hated cold in general and winter in particular. She lived in the Distar Marquisite, yet even its climate was too rigid for her tastes. She liked to spend the cold season asleep unless it was strictly necessary otherwise, her nest was located under the Black Scar, one of the rare mountains in the south of the Griffin Kingdom which took its name from the obsidian rocks covering most of its surface. Once it had been a volcano, whereas now the steaming hot springs heating Falul's lair were the only legacy left of the mountain's fiery core. The rest of the underground cave was decorated with enough riches to put the inner's household to shame. Piles of gold and precious gemstones were mixed with small mounds of magic crystals. The more precious a pile, the nearer to Falul it was. All the artifacts she had collected and forge mastered over the centuries were carefully stored inside a crystal case only she could open. One of mine? In the north? She said. It's possible. Most of my hatchlings hate me because I haven't awakened them. Can you describe him to me? Zedros, the first wyvern, and father of the late Gadorf was a master of light magic, so instead of speaking, he showed her a hard light construct of the recording Les Aelia had sent to him. His scoundrel son had inherited his talent, but none of his wisdom. By the great mother. All the seven heads hissed in unison. I knew he was one of yours. Don't worry about him, I told them he's my apprentice. I don't give a shit about humans, but if they so much touch one of us, I'll warp a whole mountain above their heads. He roared. Well, thanks for your concern, but actually no. He used origin flames and he has wings, so he's not a hydra. What a shame. I was hoping you had found the right partner, to further evolve your species. Why that reaction? All emperor beasts strive to overcome the bound separating them from the purest races, like griffins and phoenixes, unfortunately, none had ever succeeded, because even though he is still in the embryo stage he already has seven eyes. She thought. There was a reason if hydras had seven heads and more than one for not sharing its secret. Because I know him. She actually said. He's a friend of my latest disciple and he asked me to watch out for him. I might need to send him over to you. Emperor beasts had no warp gates, but by conjuring a warp array each, two of them could obtain the same effect. Zedros nodded and ended the call. He spent several minutes watching the construct between his claws, trying to figure out what Falul was hiding from him. If that old fox sends her disciple here, it might be a show worth watching. He thought. Asterisk 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 city of Zantia, the next morning. Lith had spent the night sleeping to reset the effects of invigoration. If he was right and there were still five awakened on his tail, he couldn't afford to be the first one to run out of gas, according to Solus. With her deep blue mana core, the woman was the magically strongest among those he had already met, while the two meters, six feet seven inches, guy was physically almost on par with him thanks to the gap in height and build. Unless they are geniuses on par with Manoha or much older than they look, I'm confident I can take them out one on one. With Freya or Solus I can take two of them out at once, but three or more would be potentially lethal. Not to mention that I should introduce Freya to Solus and things could get really awkward. He thought, I don't get it. You have no qualms asking her to risk her life for you yet you are afraid of introducing me to a friend. 
it wouldn't be the first secret she keeps for you. I think Freya is a woman wise enough that she can accept my existence. Solus said. Chapter 569. No, she can't. With her trust issues, she would stop believing in me. Put yourself in her shoes. Freya wouldn't know with who she has really interacted so far and she would be afraid that you are somehow manipulating me. She too is paranoid. Telling her is a liability. Lith said, Solus sighed and said nothing more. Freya's level of craziness was dangerously similar to Lith's. She had chosen to establish a guild, yet she treated her companions as a means to an end and changed them more often than her socks. Unless the opportunity presented itself, she would react badly to a revelation as big as Solus's existence was. While waiting for Freya, Lith and Solus tried to sketch together all she could remember about the Assassin's Guard's pseudo core. Orion said that a gold alloy can't hold more than one incantation at a time, yet that garb had three of them. Maybe it used adamant instead of silver. He thought, my thoughts exactly. Solus forgot about her sense of isolation the moment they started to consider how to replicate the lost artifact. Ever since Ratpack's words had triggered her memory, her passion for magical research had become even stronger, the more she learned, the more she could feel her lost memory scraping at a corner of her mind, like words she had never forgotten yet she was never able to express, a new armor would be the perfect recipient for all of our resources. Even if magically boosted, a cloth remains cloth. Adamant is one of Mogar's legendary metals. If we can combine the skinwalker's properties with those of the garb, the durability lost due to mixing it with gold would be plenty balanced by its stealth properties. No one would recognize you as an awakened anymore, and by switching clothes at will you would always remain just a face in the crowd, agreed. The problem is that while I know the skinwalker's pseudo core like the back of my hand, I've no idea how to infuse an object with full guard. I need to ask Orion if he's capable of doing it and if yes, I have to convince him to share the procedure with me. Something we can do as soon as the crisis is resolved, instead, is to take a second look at the fire I can produce while in my hybrid form. When it burned the layers of the assassin's garb, I realized that it can do much more than just destroy. Lith thought. I am eager to see what happens to an enchanted item if the flames aren't put out. What if they can drain a pseudo core completely? They could open doors, disrupt arrays, maybe even delete the imprint left by the item's owner. Lith thought, it's not so simple. I remember the abomination who possessed the wargs calling them, Origin Flames. I don't remember what they are, but something tells me they are very important. We must find out their real nature, Solus couldn't put her finger on it, but she felt that they shared a connection with the title, Ruler of the Flames her master Mina Dion mentioned in her memories. Lith and Solus spent the time before breakfast drawing and visualizing the assassin's garb's pseudo core. Solus hadn't seen it from many angles, and to make matters worse, the distance had made the mana pathways appear like a blur to her. They only had one forge of adamant, so their blueprint had to be perfect or everything would go to waste. Well, how did your hunt go? Freya was happy seeing him in one piece, yet she knew it didn't mean much. Floria wasn't the only one who back at the academy had noticed his ability to heal from deadly wounds like they were just scratches. One down, three more to go. Lith sighed while following her to the dining hall. Three? Oh, gods. We might need some of my men. Three versus two would already be bad against regular mags and it took four of you to take down Nalia. I don't like our odds. Don't worry. They are weaker than Nalia was and I'm much stronger compared to four years ago. Yet I agree with you, we need a contingency plan. Lith said, they stopped talking the moment they saw a member of the house staff. Neither of them trusted their discretion, so they moved to a less sensitive topic. The Viscount was ecstatic of my discovery about the Griever. Freya said with a smug grin. He has doubled my guild's pay and fired half of his staff. Her smile disappeared thinking about all those poor people jobless in the dead of winter. Why did he do that? Because he removed all those who had the magical talent to cause that kind of wounds and all those who have any affiliation with the church. Now my men have to sleep, eat, and drink with the members of Crane's family. Freya's explanation made sense, I have the authority of the king now. I could conscript the members of the Crystal Shield Guild to compensate for the lack of manpower, but how much can I trust a mage who follows me only because he's forced to? At the same time, all of the city guards can't put a dent in an awakened body. Only a mage can defeat an awakened mage. Lith thought. The dining room walls were painted of a pale blue, and the floor was entirely covered by a single red and blue carpet with floral figures depicted on it. The chair's lining had the same pattern as the carpet while the Viscount's coat of arms was engraved on their armrest. The walls were decorated with several paintings depicting Crane's ancestors, and the room's furniture was adorned with blue porcelain vases. The mercenaries sitting at the long rectangular table were all laughs and smiles due to the news of their pay being doubled, whereas the house staff was gloomy as if they were attending a funeral, not only their workload had just doubled, but they were also afraid to lose their job. The Viscount offered food and accommodation to them and their families. Getting fired meant becoming jobless and homeless in one fell swoop. The members of the noble family weren't much happier having lost any shred of privacy. Yet they turned their frown upside down the moment they saw Lith, they considered Freya the strongest noble in the city, but now that the existence of an enemy capable of violating the safety of their house had been uncovered, none of them was foolish enough to refuse the help of the most powerful being for miles, noble or not, Lith now appeared like a savior to their eyes, and they could only hope to not have compromised their relationship with the youngest spellbreaker of their generation. I am very sorry for how I treated you yesterday, Regent Verhen. The Viscount said, making all those sitting around the table choke on their food. Crane rarely apologized even to the city lord and even when he did it, his tone made it clear it was just a formality. This time it sounded like he really meant it. Chapter 570 the Viscount despised commoners, but he was a man smart enough to know when to swallow his pride and play nice. Just a few hours ago, he was angry at Lady Inners for bringing an unwanted guest inside his house. Crane didn't complain to her about it only because he was hoping to establish ties with the Inners household. The sudden turn of events had made Freya a goddess of victory to his eyes. Having the city regent under his roof would ensure that all of his plans would come to fruition once the crisis was resolved. The Viscount was so angry at himself for his lack of foresight that if he could have traveled back in time, he would kick his onus. Bad news travels fast. Lith thought. The High Command had bestowed upon him full control over Zantia in the middle of the night, yet the Viscount already knew about the shift in the balance of power. 
Between that incompetent fall of Sester, those lunatics hurting my business, and my family under siege, I must have lost my mind due to the stress. As a fellow noble and family man, I hope you can forgive my rudeness. If there's anything I can do to help, you just have to ask. Crane stood up, giving Lith a polite bow even though he was the lord of the house. His hypocrisy made Lith want to puke, but he had more important matters to attend to. The past is in the past. I'm sure Mage Freya has mentioned to you our need for a piece of sensitive information. Lith said, before he could even finish the phrase, the Viscount took a folder out of his pocket dimension and handed it to Lith. I hope this is enough. I took care of procuring it through safe channels. The nature of your inquiry is known only to the three of us. Lith quickly checked the folder's content. Not only there was a complete list of all the people affected by the griever, but also another one containing all the names of the known members of the Church of the Six along with their addresses. It's perfect, Viscount. You can rest assured that the Crown will hear from me about your cooperation. Lith's words were actually far from being benign. He meant that he would not forget to mention how the noble had put his own interest, before Zanchus and how Crane had treated him when he believed to have the upper hand, yet his warm smile and calm tone fooled the Viscount, who could already picture himself obtaining the city lord's seat thanks to Lith's recommendation. After they finished eating, Lith and Freya went to her room to plan their next move. The Viscount had gracefully relieved her of all her duties and had assigned her as Lith's aide until the crisis was resolved. This suck. I didn't get to give you a single order that our positions are already reversed. Freya said while opening the door, her room was actually a small apartment. It had a living room, a bedroom, and its own bathroom. Each one of them was bigger than Lith's room and was equipped with all comforts. It seems that I got the room reserved for the unwanted guests. Lith sat at the high table in the living room, and unfolded a big map of the city of Zancha from the folder the Viscount had given to him, then, he also took out the list of people affected by the griever and marked their addresses with red dots. Freya helped him, cross-referencing their names with the known affiliates of the Church of the Six. This doesn't make much sense. She pointed out once they were done. The number of people suffering from the griever are way less than I expected. There are barely more than 200 names on the list. Even a medium city like Zancha has thousands of citizens. Not even a hypochondriac would call something of this extent a plague. You are right. We are missing something. Lith said, after witnessing the anguish of the city guards, the fear in the eyes of Count Sester, and how the population of Zancha was split between believers and non-believers, he was expecting a much worse situation. The dots on the map were just a mess and he didn't recognize most of the names. He called his handler and asked her help. Camilla was a data analyst, if there was a pattern, she should have been able to find it. Well, it's a very short list. It will just take a few minutes. She said after Lith had scanned for her all the information he had at his disposal. He could see her hands dancing on the holographic interface with the speed and the grace of a piano player. I can already tell you that the number of people on the list is oddly convenient. It's just a few units below the threshold that makes mandatory to alert the authorities. Camilla's words made Lith realize another piece of the puzzle. Up to that moment, he had thought that the limited number of victims was due to the awakened behind the church lacking the manpower for a bigger scheme, now, instead, he was sure it had been an intentional move to prevent outsiders from messing with their plan. Picking an isolated city in the middle of winter lockdown, the timing of my summon and of the snowstorm. This cannot be just a coincidence. Whatever they are doing, they must be hiding from the council, not the army, otherwise they wouldn't risk involving me. Lith thought. I'm done. Camilla said as the list on Lith's hologram was now reduced to 84 names, each followed by their position in the city's administrative offices and their clearance levels. Aside from the obvious city lord, these people are all bureaucrats and officials of medium importance. None of them holds a special relevance to the city, but if you put them all together, they give you access to all key points of Zancha. Among them there are the guards tasked to check the city entrances, clerks that can hasten or slow down any paperwork you might need, and even those in charge for the maintenance of the emergency arrays, with their combined help, a smart person would have full control over Zancha's available resources. They could smuggle or hide anything inside the city and even take some of the relics stored there for emergencies without anyone noticing. I doubt it's anything that big. Lith shook his head. How long ago was the Church of the Six founded? Over nine months ago. Camilla replied. When did the griever first appeared? A month ago, right after the lockdown. I can't imagine Six awakened wasting a whole year in the middle of nowhere. According to Fergan, the church was on the verge of collapsing before the griever. They must be using the church as a cover and as a scapegoat in case something goes wrong. Lith thought. We need a second map. Maybe if we remove all the marks belonging to the officials, we can get a better picture of why they picked those people as victims. Freya said. It's a waste of time. Lith extended his arms and used light magic to create a holographic copy of the map right above the real one. Thanks to his training, he was now able to add a tinge of colors by using other elements, giving it a higher definition. Chapter 571. Good gods. Freya had seen Lith's creations during Journey's birthday, but back then they were all based on a single element. Something that more or less, she too could do, she waved her hand through the hologram, feeling its warmth and shattering it into stardust. Freya. Lith said. I'm sorry, I was just too curious. It almost looked solid. Was it solid? She didn't sound sorry at all. Her hazel eyes sparkled like during their academy days when she was about to learn one of the marvels magic was capable of. I wish. Do you have any idea how hard it is to create a map? There are hundreds of streets and buildings that I cannot possibly remember. I need to be able to look at the original to keep it stable. The moment your hand covered the map, I've lost both my focus and mana. Lith snarled while creating a second one. He was actually capable of creating a map from scratch, but only if the original was stored inside Solaspedia. Sorry, Lith. This time she was sincere. Freya felt stupid for both her action and her words, yet she didn't regret them. For the first time in years, she was having fun. Ever since the academy had ended, her life had been one of duty. First, she had to take care of Quilla. Freya had helped her to retake her fifth year at the White Griffin, and overcome the trauma Quilla had suffered after killing Uriel under the influence of Nalia's slave ring. Then, her sisters had left Freya alone to search for their own path in life. 
After all that had happened to her during the academy, Freya trusted no one and was unable to relax unless when in the safety of her own home. The Crystal Shield Guild was her creature and her cage at the same time. Leading arrogant and disgruntled mags was a full-time job that left her no time for a personal life. Lith was a safe oasis for her. Someone she could trust almost as much as Quilla, but who unlike her sister and guildmates didn't need her protection. Whenever they met, he always had something to teach her about magic, and that was the most precious gift anyone could give her. Don't worry. Lieutenant Yeval, please this time read me only the addresses of all those who have no role in the city's administration. Lith said while patting Freya's shoulder, that small gesture made Camilla hate her job for the second time in as many days. Hundreds of kilometers and a snowstorm separated them, yet it was being called by her last name that exacerbated the distance between them. For a moment, she envied Freya for her strength, her magic, and because Camilla imagined her free to do what she wanted rather than what she had to. Then, she started listing the addresses and a new pattern appeared on the map, what appeared in front of their eyes was still a mess, but at least it didn't look like a Pollock anymore. They spent a few minutes trying to make sense of the image, but to no avail. If you tilt your head and remove these dots you can almost see a magic circle. Lith said while tapping on several locations on the map. Right idea but wrong dots. If we ignore the dots you proposed, you can see that some of the remaining ones form this array. Freya's slender finger traced a circle above the map. The problem is that you can't ignore any of those points. If all of the locations are magically marked the same way, then they would disrupt the formation. Even if you are right, two overlapping arrays would cancel each other without proper insulation. Camilla's words left Freya flabbergasted. How come you are an array expert? She asked. I'm not. I just repeated what Lith and Manoha yelled at each other back in offer. They quarreled about runes and lines of power so much that I ended up learning a thing or two. Camilla chuckled, wait a minute. I think you're both right. Check the list more carefully. Solus thought. Sons of a bitch, Lith blurted out as he realized the meaning of her words. Cami, I mean, Lieutenant Yerval, please filter the names based on the floor they live on. Like most cities surrounded by walls, Zansha had no choice but to expand vertically rather than horizontally. Most buildings were at least three-story high, instead of ignoring the dots, Lith split the map into three different layers, each one with its own set of tokens and marked with a different color. Even a layman like Camilla could easily recognize the magic circles formed by connecting the dots. Okay, this is not good. Lith said. I recognize the array on top and the one at the ground level, but I have no idea what the middle one is. The upper circle is a containment array, similar to those I use when I practice forge mastering. Its purpose is to contain great masses of energy and prevent them from escaping. It maximizes the effects of a magical procedure. The bottom one is a grounding array, used to safely disperse mana in case a spell goes out of control. I've already taken a scan of the holographic map and of the three arrays. Camilla said. I'll contact immediately General Vorg, the Master Warden, and call you back as soon as I have some answers. Over and out. Lith pulled the curtain covering the window to check the weather. The wind carrying the snow was so strong that he wasn't able to see further than 10 meters even with his enhanced senses. I have no idea where the Awakened could be and even if I did, I can't risk making a move before I understand what their endgame is. Going to the Church of the Six now would be pointless, the clerics are likely to be unwitting puppets in their hands, so interrogating them would be a waste of time. The ones performing miracles are the Awakened ones, but they will not show up without a crowd, once the storm settles, I need to attend one of their ceremonies. If they made me come here, it means that they are almost done with their preparations. He thought. A bronze coin for your thoughts. Freya said. We're on the clock. The arrays are completed and they felt so confident that one of them attacked me in the open. I don't like that they lured and trapped me here. If I don't get rid of them now, they could find me again. Also, I hate them for using arrays to perform their crap. Whenever I use an array, I can still hear Uriel whining about wardens being useless. Lith replied. His voice went from calm to stone cold when he talked about his enemies and then it became sad while he remembered his lost friend. Me too. I miss him so much. Free aside. You know, right after Balkia's attack, when you and Floria started to be all lovey-dovey, he asked me if I was interested in being his friend with benefits. Sounds like Uriel. What did you answer him? Lith said with a light smile. I slapped him and said no, of course. I never regretted my choice, I'm only sad that he never got the opportunity to get the happiness he deserved. Chapter 572. Do you mind if I ask you a personal question? Freya said while pouring them some hot tea. No, but I can't guarantee you that I'll answer. Don't worry, I'm not going to pry your wall of secrets. She chuckled. We all knew you had a crush on Nalia and a soft spot for Wainmeyer. I was wondering why you never made a pass at me. Now that we are not young and stupid anymore, I'm not embarrassed to say that it hurt my pride for a bit. Well, it's simple. When we first met, you were just another pompous, stuck-up noble. After the second exam, when we started to become friends, you had already become too similar to me. Lith said. You have always been the most beautiful girl in our class, but I have a thing for cute girls and you have never been cute. You went from obnoxious to dark and gloomy. You and I are like moons. We may shine, but our light is cold and distant. We need a sun, someone willing to walk that distance and accept us for who we are instead that for how we look like. That's why I ended up with Floria first and with Camilla now. Freya had to admit that even if they were good friends, her crazy matched Lith's crazy in all the wrong possible ways. Just the thought of being together with someone more paranoid, grumpy, and aggressive than she was, gave her the creeps. Are you still practicing the impossible arrays Uriel found for us? Lith asked. Every single day. I'll always be grateful to you for teaching me the importance of first magic. There are so many things that I would have missed if I didn't follow your crazy training routine during the fifth year. I may not be able to create holograms yet, but I can assure you that once we find those rogue mags, they are in for more than one nasty surprise. She said with a ferocious grin, since the snowstorm continued unabated and Camilla had yet to call back, they started exchanging pointers about magic. Freya revealed to him that she had kept in touch with Professor Rudd, the dimensional magic expert of the White Griffin. 
They were reminiscing together all the cruel words the man had said to his students in general, and to them in particular when someone knocked on her door. I'm sorry to disturb you, Lady Inners. A butler in a white and dark blue livery said her with a deep bow. He was a middle-aged man with receding red hair and the face of someone who had just seen a ghost. There's a guest on the door who claims to be a friend of someone named Scourge. I tried to send him away, but he refused. Some of your men intervened, but I'm afraid they will only make things worse. Did he say his name? Freya and Lith exchanged a quick glance hearing the name magical beasts had bestowed upon him. No, I didn't even ask him about it, because he has clearly got the wrong address. Freya didn't let him finish the phrase and opened the warp steps leading to the mansion's hallway. The front door was wide open, letting the freezing wind in as snow started to pile up on the magnificent blue and gold carpet covering the floor. Several members of the Crystal Shield Guild lay on the ground unconscious. Only a few of them had managed to even draw their weapons, but none of them had the time to use them. Not a single drop of blood had been spilled, the man in front of them was a barbarian, at least 2.1 meters, 7 foot, tall. He wore a hunter set of heavy clothes made of warm animal fur and boots bigger than a bucket. His face was rough and savage, with a square jaw and a cleft chin, the hunter's long hair and his well-trimmed beard were flaming red, with not a single snowflake on them. Even though he was lifting one of Freya's men from the neck with a single hand, waiting for him to pass out, his emerald eyes were calm and wise. There was no way Lith wouldn't recognize him, even after all those years. Put Callum down. Freya said while unsheathing her sword. It's good to see you again, Freya. He said with a warm smile as he let the man's feet touch the ground again, allowing him to breathe. You may know me, but I don't know you. What do you want from Lith? She said while never lowering her weapon a sudden gust of wind swept her hair as a blurry figure moved past Freya, and struck the hunter on the side of his jaw with pinpoint accuracy, sending him tumbling outside. You bastard. How dare you to show your face like that? Lith's anger was so great that, without Solus's help, his blue aura would have already filled the manor's hallway. She would have liked to say something, but even though she was already restraining his mana flow, both the lights and the shadows were seconds away from coming to life. Solus couldn't afford to lose her focus, blood trickled from the hunter's mouth as he stood up. You've gotten stronger, Scourge. I hoped you would rather focus on becoming a better person. Power isn't everything. The man said as if Lith had offered him his hand instead of sending him flying with a punch. Five years. Five fucking years without a single word from you. Wind and snow slapped Lith's face. He ignored the former, whereas the heat emanating from his skin was so strong that the latter evaporated on contact. I almost died for you and what did I get in return? You deceived me. You turned the only friend I had ever had against me. You abandoned me. You took away Celia from me. Tell me why I shouldn't kill you on the spot. Lith said, the snow melted and boiled under his feet as the whole street was plunged into darkness, as if the sun had been blotted out of the sky. The hunter stood tall, uncaring of the ongoing unnatural phenomenons and Lith's accusations. You didn't do it for me, but for yourself. What I did, instead, I did it for you. To stop your madness. It was the only way I had to give you a better future and judging from what I've heard, I'd say I succeeded. I never abandoned you. I simply couldn't afford to return and waste our sacrifice. As for Celia, she was never yours to begin with. She followed me of her own will. You are only right about one thing. I owe you. Without your reckless, selfish act I would be dead. I live on borrowed time, your time. My life is yours to take if that's what you truly want. Protector opened his arms in a defenseless position, exposing both his neck and heart. Lith extended his clawed hands toward Protector's chest and hugged him as strong as he could, Solus, analysis. He thought, Protector is barely halfway blue and his physical strength hasn't improved much. She replied as Lith's fury faded. How can you be so weak after all this time? Lith said. Chapter 573. Raising two children while taking care of a pregnant wife doesn't leave much free time for training. Besides, it's not me being slow so much as you being relentless. Do you at least have a girlfriend? Ryman said while returning the embrace. Lith was happy to hear that his long-since lost friends were all right and that Protector's manners had significantly improved. In the past, he would have opened the conversation by asking Lith about his mating habits. I do have one. Is she the one in the ring? No. Is she the one waiting for you on the doorsteps? It's a long story. Lith said. Come inside. I doubt you are here just to see me. I would never leave Celia and the children in the middle of winter for a social call. I'm here because you need my help, Scourge. Is this your new house? Ryman said while pointing at the Viscount's manor. It is now. Remember to watch your mouth. I've yet to share any of my secrets with anyone. At those words, Ryman lost his cool and stopped in his tracks. No one knows about Solus, the Awakening, your other form, or Carl. He said with a whisper, when Lith had given Protector part of his life force to repair his damaged mana core, the Emperor Beast had access to all of his memories, even those from his life on Earth. Tista knows about Solus and Awakening, Floria knows about my other half, but that's it. Only you and Solus know everything about me. The tone Lith used made it clear he was still unwilling to open up. Who is this guy? How does he know my name? Freya had put away her sword when she had seen the two men hugging, but her confusion still remains. He is. Lit was searching for a plausible lie when Protector cut him short. We briefly met during Balkia's attack. You know me with the name of Protector, but I'd like you to call me Ryman Fast Arrow. Celia says I should always introduce myself with a real name rather than just a title. Freya racked her brain, trying to remember where she had heard that name before. Her mouth almost dropped onto the ground when she realized their guest's identity. No way. You are. Lit snapped his fingers, blinking all three of them back inside Freya's room before it was too late. An Emperor Beast. How can you possess a human body? A hush spell prevented her voice from being heard. I didn't steal anyone's body. Ryman said with a tinge of annoyance in his voice. Once we reach this stage of evolution, we can shapeshift. It's not a big deal, a lot of creatures can do it. Lith didn't like how Protector looked at him while saying that. Yet it's a big secret among beasts, like the fact that they can talk. Lith chimed in. 
He is putting a lot of trust in you. Most humans would go crazy if they knew that beasts and plants can shapeshift. Do you remember Gadorf the Wyvern? He was able to do the same. His words calmed her a bit, but not much. Suddenly she had no idea how to recognize who was human and who was just pretending to be one. I need to sit and something strong to drink. She shook her head, hoping the room would stop spinning soon. How is Celia doing? Lif asked. I had to propose to her to make her move away from Lucia on such short notice. Ryman's words made Freya choke on her drink. Isn't Celia a woman? I mean a human? Are you two really married? She blurted out, Lif had to repress laughter. The same protector who was always so patient and kind, the closest thing to a magical father figure Lith had, was now dilating his nostril in annoyance. Yes, yes, and yes. If you keep stating the obvious, I'll never get to the point, though. Freya became beet red and hid her face behind her glass, I need something stronger. She thought as she put the wine away and took a bottle of Griffin Fire out of her pocket dimension. A single malt whiskey with over 50% of alcohol content. Everything went fine until our first daughter was born. Thank the great mother, after almost getting killed I became proficient in healing magic, so Celia didn't need a midwife. It would have been a mess since Lilia had quite a fur. Freya had one shot at the word, daughter, and another at, fur, dot. Was she a hybrid? Lith asked, giving Freya plenty of reasons for a third shot. Yes. Useless to say, Celia didn't take it well. She yelled at me for lying to her, and kicked me out of our house. To be fair, I didn't lie. She never asked and I never thought of a reason for telling her about me being an emperor beast. How could you not tell her? That's a pretty big elephant, you know? Freya said. I came out of the woods naked, I told her I knew her for a long time and I had uncanny magic powers. I thought it was pretty obvious. She must have thought you were a friendly but nut job mage. What kind of logic is yours? Another shot bit the dust. Is my life a drinking game or what? Gods, now I understand why you never speak about yourself with anyone. Silly me thinking you and Celia were just paranoid. Protector took the bottle away. She had already started slurring her words. Are you saying that Lith is an emperor beast too? Freya was on the verge of a nervous breakdown. No, he's not. His body is on par with a veteran magical beast, but it's weak compared to an emperor. Shut your damn mouth. Lith couldn't believe how stupidly sincere Ryman was, he must have survived this far because Celia has him under her thumb. He thought. I need more alcohol. Small sparks of light appeared around the bottle, making part of its content fill her glass again. Master of space, remember? Freya was happy her ability with dimensional ability was able to shock the two monsters she was sharing the room with. After a few days, she calmed down and allowed me to return home. Celia was still pretty pissed off, but she had no idea how to raise a hybrid which made her desperate for help. She was afraid that if humans found out about Lilia, they would kill her. After I managed to make our daughter turn into her human form, things went smoothly and after a few months, she forgave me. Now everything is settled. We had a son, Leren, and now Celia is carrying our third one. Celia picked all of their names in your honor. She says that without you, we would have never met and that without your sacrifice she would have been forced to raise our child alone. You are their godfather, so you should visit them sometimes. On Mogar, it was custom to name a child with the same initial letter of the most esteemed member of the family as a good omen. Lith was moved by Celia's consideration towards him. After Lith told him the part of his story Freya was allowed to know and they were caught up, Protector explained to them the reason for his coming. Chapter 574 After almost dying by the hands of Balkius Vela, I understood I needed to study magic more seriously. Whenever I'm not providing for my family or raising my children, I study under a powerful emperor beast, Falyul the Hydra. I never forgot about my debt of gratitude towards you, so I asked Falyul to inform me if she ever heard something about you. That's how I learned about your predicament. Fighting 3A, amazing mags alone it's difficult to even for someone as experienced as you are. I still regret not learning about Nalia until it was too late. I couldn't be there for you then, but I'm not leaving you alone this time. Protector said. You know a Hydra? Freya had already reached the point where no amount of alcohol could calm her down anymore. Yes, she is my mentor. I'm sure she would gladly help you too, Lith. Except during winter. She hates the cold. Wait, how does she know about Xantia's situation? Lith asked. The Lord of the Keller region somehow spectated your fight. Emperor beasts don't care about humans but look after their own. He knew I was looking out for you and he alerted Faluel. You know the rest. Gods, I can't believe it. Magical beasts sent reinforcements to help you whereas the army is still sitting on its thumbs. Freya had no idea that Lith had reported about the existence of only two awakened ones to protect his cover. Magical beasts care only for themselves, whereas the army has to protect the entire country. Lith said while winking at Protector to make him shut up, Lith told Protector everything he knew about the Church of the Six, the group of awakened one he had fought, and showed him the arrays they had planted inside the city. Do you really know even about arrays? Protector was flabbergasted. Does this Camilla really exist or is she made up? He can't possibly take care of her, his job, their cubs, and be so good at magic. No cubs. Lith's voice was stone cold, while Freya giggled due to being tipsy and because of Lith's embarrassment. But you are together for, no cubs are not planning on making them. Lith's army amulet blinked signaling an incoming call and giving him an excuse to change the topic. Contrary to his expectations, it wasn't Camilla's hologram which materialized in the middle of the room, but General Vorgas. He was a short old man, barely 1.5 meters, 5 foot, tall wearing the light blue uniform of the army. Judging by the several wrinkles on his face and the spots on his skin, he had to be at least 70 years old. Yet his sky blue eyes had the wild vibe of a predator on the chase. His short white hair and finely trimmed beard shone like silver fur under the sun, reinforcing everyone's impression of being staring at a beast of the north, the man's sleeves bore a silver star. It identified him with the rank of Brigadier General. His right hand was wilding a staff made of white oak with six violet magic crystals engraved on it in a straight line point six more, floated above its top, forming a perfect circle that orbited around the staff and followed its every movement. Lith had already seen it in action. 
It allowed Vorg to use impossible arrays as if he was an awakened, the six engraved magic crystals were likely to be its power source, whereas the floating ones were responsible for creating the true arrays and harmonizing the world energy with Vorg's mana. Spellbreaker Verhen, I'm afraid you are facing madmen. The title Vorg addressed Lith with made those present aware of the gravity of the situation. Before we speak, you should send away these people. Civilians can't be involved in a military operation. He said while pointing at Freer and Ryman. General Vorg, allow me to introduce you Lady Freeraners and Ryman Fast Arrow. I conscripted them to help me. They have all the right to know since they are putting their lives on the line along with mine. Lith said. So be it. I agree with your assessment of the two arrays you identified, but you have failed to grasp how they interact with the third one. To be honest, I'm not sure either. Mine are just speculations, but it's all I have to offer you for now. Lith nodded Vorg to continue as Solus griped due to mana sense not working on holograms. She would have really liked to take a closer look at the staff's pseudo core. The array between the grounding and the containment ones was called Third Eye by its creator and Fool's Gold by everyone else. It channels the world energy inside a mage's body, making it possible for them to awaken their hidden talents. No one uses it, though, because not only are its effects just temporary, but also using it greatly shortens its user's lifespan. Horan Palinor became one of Mogar's most powerful mags for almost two days before dying for its side effects. No one uses Fool's Gold because it doesn't really give you any power, it simply condenses your life force, so you can achieve for a few months the power you would get in two years of practice by losing ten years in the process. The news stunned both Lith and Protector. Even awakened ones had to take care of their life force because it couldn't be replenished. Accumulation and invigoration slowed down its consumption, but they didn't affect the amount of life force one was born with. Lith's death vision was a consequence of his attempt to saving Protector's life at the expense of his own. The worst thing is that whoever modified Palinor's array turned it into forbidden magic. Vorg said making Lith even more confused. If a mage can get more power by simply sacrificing lives, I would expect it to be one of the most popular crimes. Why have I never heard of it before? He asked. Because it doesn't work that way. Your talent requires your life force, your memory, your experiences. Vorg explained. The upper containment array is used to store and amplify the world energy, fool's gold will temporarily enhance the talent of its user, and the grounding array will discharge the excess energy using the people affected by the griever as a medium. It's not an illness. Those two mags injected their own mana inside others to both form the arrays and use them as catalysts. That way, the whole city will take part in the process and all its inhabitants will lose a decade or two of life. What could they possibly gain from that? Lith asked. My hypothesis is that they plan to lessen Fool's Gold's side effects by using the least necessary amount of world energy, and discharging the rest on the population. This way, instead of losing 20 years, they could reduce it to 18. Vorg replied. It's a negligible amount, that's why I say they are madmen. The use of forbidden magic is a game changer. We are sending you spellbreakers as soon as possible. Normally it would take them a couple of hours to get there between preparations and traveling, but the snowstorm will slow things down. The only other piece of good news I can give you is where you can find those responsible. To benefit from Fool's Gold's effects, the mage must be exactly in the middle of it. When they activate the array, it will become visible. Good luck, Spellbreaker Verhen. Vorg ended the call. Chapter 575. What's our next move? Freya asked. Even though we now know their endgame, we can't just sit idly. Once the array is activated, there's no telling how long the process will take. I don't want to lose years of life. I agree. We must make our move before they get the upper hand. Ryman said. We must lure them out in the open and to do it, we need to break their toy. Without the people affected by the griever, their array will break. The only reason why they do not get themselves healed is that they have fallen for the church's deception. We need to get rid of the church and heal those Morans. Lith said, after learning about the presence of more than two awakened inside Zantia, Lith had been forced to give up on his original plan of storming the church in his hybrid form. It was something he had to do on his own since it would have been hard to explain to Freya about his shape-shifting abilities. Protector's arrival was truly a blessing. He was both an excellent fighter and a perfect cover for what was going to happen. Freya already knew about Lith's abnormal body, death vision, and about him sharing his life force with Ryman. Now all Lith needed was a better understanding of the Church of the Six Teachings, before giving those awakened a taste of their own medicine. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. Just a few kilometers away from Viscount Crane's mansion, the four remaining awakened were arguing about their plan and cursing Kieran's name. If not for his childish pride of being the next heir of the Blood Desert's best assassin, everything would still be on the right track. We have no choice. We must continue even without Daraniel. Aelia said. Like Pelion, she was native of the Gorgon Empire. Her blue mana core was as strong as Lith's, whereas her body was weaker than his. Her master had awakened her when she already had a green mana core. Her body needed a lot of time to adapt, and she still needed help to survive whenever it was the moment to expel the impurities for a breakthrough. She was 1.75 meters, 5 feet 9 inches, tall with light blonde hair and green eyes. Thanks to being an awakened, her figure would make most men break their necks while turning their heads at her passing. Yet among the awakened ones, she was just one of many. Agreed. Not all of us have an awakened daddy like Daraniel. There's always next year at my ass. Pelion said while imitating Daraniel's accent and spitting on the fireplace, turning it into a pillar of fire with a spark of mana. I'm not saying to give up on the plan. I need third eye as much as you do. I'm just saying that maybe we should delay it. If we leave Zantia now, the council will never find us. Benio nervously bit her nails, she was 1.77 meters, 5 feet 10 inches, with flaming red hair and hazel eyes. She possessed a bright cyan mana core, but thanks to her master awakening her when she was very young, her body refinement had been easy, at least compared to her companions, thanks to that, her body was stronger than Aelia, and her figure was even better. Delay it? We'll never get another opportunity like this. The city is isolated and the arrays are set in place. If you are so afraid, then I say that we start the ritual now and then we run away as fast as we can. During spring and summer, it would be impossible to keep so many people locked inside their homes, not to mention we will probably be already dead. 
Jaren said dot he was 1.8, 5 feet 11 inches, meters tall, with brown hair and eyes. He wasn't as tall nor bulky as Pelion was, but he had the build of a professional fighter. He had a bright cyan mana core and his body was on par with Benio, allowing him to go hand to hand with magical beasts. He and Benio were native of the Griffin Kingdom, but it didn't make them any less scared. The use of forbidden magic was a crime even in the awakened community, in case the council discovered their extracurricular activities, they were as good as dead, yet they weren't afraid of the council so much as of their own masters. An awakened mage was considered responsible for all of their disciples, so they would never bestow their gifts upon someone for nothing. Awakening was a rare phenomenon, and not all of those who managed to do it on their own would live long enough to become hard to kill. There were those who died of starvation, in battle, or simply due to their own stupidity. So, when an awakened mage needed an heir, they would pick up one or more talented youths as their apprentices. The one who succeeded would inherit their legacy, while the others had to find a new master or die. Daraniel was an exception since his master was also his own father. Even if he failed, Tassar would not kill him. Kieran was another exception. Lesalia only picked one apprentice at the time and disposed of them as soon as she found them wanting. Ever since Lith had destroyed the Black Star, Lesalia had used him as a benchmark to push her disciple to and beyond his limits. With his life on the line, Kieran had soon started to hate Lith's guts, fearing that the Rogue Awakens' feats would be the death of him. The remaining members of the group were the cream of the crop in their own territory, but only thanks to Third Eye. They were all brilliant, but not geniuses. With their talent alone they could see the top of the mountain, but never reach it. That was the reason why they had resorted to using such an elaborate scheme. They had met each other during council meetings, bonding thanks to their mutual age and problems, together, they had managed to alter Third Eye with forbidden magic, so that they would split his effects, both good and bad, equally between the six of them. They would still lose a consistent amount of their life force, but the ritual had brought them to the top. They had calculated that to beat their competition they would lose a total of 200 years of life each. It was a small price to pay to inherit their master's legacy and territory. Especially if the alternative was dying young after having spent their whole lives slaving away. Just like Vorg had said, the forbidden magic allowed them to slightly mitigate the cost of the ritual each time they performed it. Yet even one year of life force mattered, since thanks to accumulation, it would last 10 if not 20 times as much. The humans they harmed didn't matter. They would lose their own life force and die decades later, making their death seemingly unrelated. The Six Awakened had lured Lith for two reasons. The first was to use him as the seventh member and further reduce the strain on their life force. The second was because Kieran wanted to get rid of him and prove to be the best fighter in the three great countries. Yet the plan was to make them fight after the ritual, not before. They needed both of them alive, especially since as a rogue Lith had no connection with the council, so he couldn't report them even if he managed to escape, the Wormling arrival, though, had proven them to be dead wrong. Chapter 576. We haven't gotten this far just to quit with our tail between our legs. Aelia said. I need to continue being my master's favorite student at all costs. She has already killed all those who didn't pass her exams. There's so few of us left that she is bound to pick her heir soon, and it's going to be me. She exchanged a meaningful look with her companions, they were all in the same boat. If we take Verhen alive, the damage will be split among five instead of seven, but a shorter life is better than no life at all. If the Wormling exposed us, our masters would have already called me and Pelion back. Luckily, beasts do not care for humans. Kieran must have angered it and Daraniel got caught in the crossfire because they were always together. I agree with Jaren, we must wrap this up quickly and get out of here before something else happens. Since the other three agreed, Benio could only follow. The group decided to complete the ritual as soon as the snowstorm peaked again, forcing the human foci of the spell to remain in their place. Asterisk 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 Lith spent the rest of the morning shouting orders, and making preparations. He conscripted all of Zancha's mags for his plan. Most of them were unwilling to serve under a new master, especially one who didn't explain to them what they were about to do. They were either city healers or noble heirs. I may have not studied at one of the six great academies, but I took an oath as a healer and my family has loyally served the kingdom for generations. The most annoying of them was Baroness Turnars, a minor healer. First you had the guards kidnap us from our homes and now you want to order us around as if we are slaves. There's a reason I didn't join the army. I demand to know why we are trapped inside the city hall and what purpose this assembly has. There were too many whispers and nodding of approval to dismiss her request. Those are all excellent questions. Allow me to answer. Lith's eyes became two blue torches fueled by his mana, as he unleashed his killing intent against the over 100 mags in front of him, the weakest among them almost fainted. They fell onto the ground, gasping for air. The terror invading their bodies had almost made them forget how to breathe. The others were covered in cold sweat, unable to take their eyes off Lith, like deer in front of oncoming headlights. He grabbed Baroness Turnars by the neck, lifting her like she was just a rag doll. There is a crisis at hand and I need healers. He explained with a calm voice while a stream of lightning coursed through her body sending her in a seizure. You are here because quantity has a quality all its own. Lith healed her as the smell of ozone and burned flesh spread throughout the room. I didn't call you here for a debate. Opinions are like assholes, everyone got one. You are trapped here because you are untrustworthy. Another lightning, another seizure. Lith was careful not letting her faint nor tightening her throat so much that she couldn't scream. This assembly has a purpose you'll be made aware of when the time comes and not a second sooner. I need your obedience, not your trust. Lith healed her again, releasing a bit more of killing intent and making everyone fell to their knees, incapable even of looking him in the eyes. You are either part of the solution or part of the problem. Those of you who agree to help me will be compensated for their service. As for the others. More lightning bolts and screams completed the sentence for him. Any more questions? Some of them were crying, others had wet themselves due to the mental pressure Lith's mana and hostility exuded. All of them fell in line, and nodded like parrots even after Lith had left the room. He couldn't afford to reveal any detail of his plan without it leaking. There was no telling who was affiliated with the church among his recruits' families, friends, or neighbors. Freya helped Wyra, one of the few members of her guild who she actually trusted, with her investigation about the church. They promised the former staff of House Crane that they would be reinstated if they provided useful information. 
Protector couldn't help either Lith nor Freya, so he flew among the clouds and did all he could to mitigate the storm. He couldn't stop such a force of nature, but he could at least delay it to buy the others the time they needed, thanks to Protector's efforts, the snow had almost ceased to fall. The Church of the Six was full to the brim of loyal worshippers who were scared of the storm as much as they were of the sudden disappearance of the healers, Lith had spread the rumor that the griever had turned into a plague, forcing all the mags in the city to work together to contain the disease. He wanted them to be so scared that they would ignore the risk of a new snowstorm and assemble in the church. It was the only bait he had to lure the awakened in the open. Dear brothers and sisters, I'm very happy to see so many of you despite the harsh trials this winter has put us all through. Said the high cleric of the Church of the Six. He was an average man, 1.67 meters, 5 feet 6 inches, tall with brown hair and eyes. His voice was deep and confident. With his stocky build and round nose, he wasn't a good looking man, but his manners were calm and amiable, making people inclined to listen to his words. He was good at manipulating the crowd. First, he would make them feel close to each other by reminding them of all the common injustices they suffered from, and then he offered them a conveniently simple scapegoat to blame and an even simpler solution. All they had to do was to follow his words. I know the griever is getting worse, but rest assured. None of it is your fault. Thanks to your sacrifice, the six sovereigns are slowly recuperating. Giving up on magic for your daily activities makes everything harder, but it's for the greater good. By not contaminating the world energy with your mana, you will allow the gods to soon return among us. I know that they are pleased with us because several of you have been finally relieved from your tribulation. Glory to the sovereigns. The relatives of the victims of the griever who had recently been healed praised the high cleric's words. They were simply people not meant to contribute to the array who had been harmed only to keep the others in line. It's only due to the blind selfishness of the mags that we have to work and suffer every day. They continue to profit from their ancestors' betrayal using powers that don't belong to them for their own good. Each time they use a spell, the world energy gets depleted and our mogar gets closer to its end. The high cleric said. According to the church's beliefs, there was only a finite amount of world energy, with the sovereigns gone, it couldn't replenish itself. It was all bogus since energy couldn't be created nor destroyed, it could only be transferred or changed from one form to another. The day of reckoning is upon them. Soon the gods will return and punish them for, a sphere of light the size of a chariot appeared above the main altar. Those present fell to their knees, praying with all their might, with the only exception of the clerics who stared in horror, a space was torn apart by the monstrosity, they believed to have summoned with their ramblings. Chapter 577. The sphere of light turned into a gateway, which apparently led to another dimension full of stars and planets floating in the middle of space. A monstrous creature emerged from, the portal on top of a fiery beast, turning the joy of the worshippers into terror. The rider stood slightly over two meters tall and was covered in thick curved black scales. Both his hands and feet ended in razor-sharp claws enveloped in black flames. A set of upside-down membranous wing came out of his back, producing with each of their flaps a gust of wind strong enough to rival with the outside storm. His face was a black slate with no nose nor ears, but his seven eyes made everyone recognize him on the spot. Each one of the six eyes on his face burned with a different color of mana which emphasized his pitch-black vertical pupils. The seventh one on his forehead was deep blue and without a pupil. Isn't that the All-Father? Everyone asked while staring in horror as the scales over his mouth opened, revealing a mouthful of fangs and blue fire. The killing intent the rider and high mount emanated made them unable to move or even to avert their gaze. Shivers went down their spines and the warm air inside the church became so cold that they could see their own breath steaming. Silence. You have relinquished your gifts, your free will, and your life. You have no right to say my name. Food doesn't get to talk, it only gets digested. The portal behind the All-Father closed, and all the shadows in the room came to life, overwhelming their owners. The worshippers were soon pinned to the ground by a distorted version of themselves. The dark forms had their faces twisted by an insatiable hunger, bright yellow eyes, and a white moor instead of a mouth. Fenrir, devour them. He ordered to his steed, a huge beast resembling a divine wolf, its shoulder height reached two meters and a half, eight feet three inches, making its rider's head almost touch the ceiling. Its whole body was covered by a flaming red fur and enveloped in a deep blue flame. It erupted with greater intensity from its neck, making it look like a manette. The monster had two curved horns coming out of its forehead, right in front of its ears, eagle-like feathered wing coming out from its back, and its tail was made out of dancing blue flames. Fenrir's howl made the ground quake and cracked the church's walls like they were just made of sand. All those trapped by their own shadows felt their strength being sapped as small spheres of light came out of their bodies and moved towards the All-Father. Aelia and Pelion were watching at the show from a surveillance mirror. They recognized the spell as what Daraniel had called Demons of Darkness. It was a variation of spirit magic they had never seen before, they had yet to make a move because their minds were frozen in a stupor. Everything had happened too fast and at the worst possible moment. They had no spell at the ready, and facing one on one an emperor beast wasn't a nice perspective. Yet they had no choice, but to act dot if the church of the six collapsed, people would let themselves be healed, making it impossible for them to trigger the third eye array. He's not the all-father, but just a pretender. We know it well because we are the sovereigns. Aelia and Pelion appeared from a warp steps. They unleashed a blinding light that dispersed the shadows and freed all of those present. Really? Wasn't that just a spell? Didn't you just come from a common room? The Allith laughed unleashing a tier 5 spell while Protector did the same. The two awakened had nothing to counter such a sudden and powerful move, so they blinked to safety. Where the heck are you guys? We need help. Aelia yelled at her communication amulet, everyone was now free to look around. Nothing in her demeanor or looks was very godlike. She sounded afraid and she was using a pricey yet common tool. Pelion quickly cast a tier 3 stream of lightning bolts while emitting a powerful blue aura. Air magic? This is insulting. Protect aside. Even when he was still an evolved monster, air and fire were his natural elements. Manipulating them came as easy as breathing to him. He had over 30 years of experience with it, and five more since he had evolved into an emperor beast. By combining his will with Lith's, they didn't need to make a single move, the closer the lightning bolts came to them, the smaller they got, until they disappeared in a puff of smoke. Nice trick. Do you work at birthday parties too? I'll show you what a real god can do. Fenrir, attack. 
The all lift said making protector snarl. He hated corny speeches, and even more getting hit in the reins by lift's clawed feet like he really was a steed. Yet he didn't complain and directed his fury against the two awakened by unleashing the tear for spell flaming tornado. Using its light as a cover, Lift gave Protector the convened signal and breathed into it a burst of origin flames. Thanks to his elemental mastery, Protector made it so that the origin flames were stuck in the eye of his tornado without them damaging their surroundings. The air element amplified the power of Lift's flames whereas the fire element of flaming tornado was sacrificed to prevent them from spreading outwards. The resulting effect was akin to a fire pillar produced by a baler, but entirely made of origin flames. The blue pillar destroyed everything on its path, making stone evaporate and turning wood into ashes. Aelia and Pelion used their defensive amulets, conjuring a barrier made of pure mana to shield themselves from the attack. Yet no matter how much energy they poured into them, the boosted and focused origin flames were eating at it with a speed visible at the naked eye. The amulets became hot due to the stress their pseudo core was under, Lith and Protector were doing their best to make it look easy, but neither breathing origin flames non-stop nor keeping them under control was a simple feat, we need to get away. Pelion yelled as the flames started to get past the barrier and ate at his enchanted clothes. How do you propose to do that? If we lose our focus, we are dead. Aelia's prayers were answered by two warp steps opened by their companions, who pulled them back to the safety of their room. Damn. Lith said. According to his plan, the other two awakened were supposed to try and attack him from behind, where Freya was ready to ambush them. Unluckily, even the most perfect plan doesn't survive contact with the enemy. Cowards! Show yourself! He said while both he and Protector used invigoration to restore their strength, plan B it is. Freya walked outside and then walked through the main door, enveloped in a golden light like a hero from the legends. With each of her strides, the shadows which had just started to come to life again screamed and died. Chapter 578 Begone monster! You don't belong in this world! She said while pointing her rune-covered rapier against the Allith. The golden light pushed the shadows back and made the killing intent which had oppressed the worshippers until that moment disappear. It is not by my will that I was summoned here. I only answered the call of humans who want to pay me tribute. The Allith replied. Tribute? You steal their freedom and treat them as nothing but food. Freya couldn't believe that she was actually following Lith's script. Foolish girl. The same could be said of all religions. The Allith and his steed charged forward. Run away. I'll hold him as long as I can. Freya flew forward, slashing against the rider. Her rapier produced a silvery sound as it clashed against the Allith's arm. People stared in awe as the small figure managed to stop the two monsters alone. Many of them knew Freya and despised her for being Viscount Crane's henchman. Now their eyes were filled with tears of gratitude and their hearts with admiration. We should have never doubted our mags. Many said while helping those who were too weak to get up on their own due to the emotional roller coaster they had experienced. Suckers. Lith said with a wide grin as Protector continued to step back, pretending that the fight was balanced. Is there something you can't do with those holograms? Freya whispered while making sure that her back prevented the spectators from seeing Lith's human arm appearing where her blade made contact with it, I wish. I can't hold on for long. It was a lie. Only his eyes were covered by holograms, making them appear as if they were opened. Lith had simply reverted his arm to its human form upon contact, they kept fighting spell against spell, claws against blade. Every of their move was dramatic and heroic, to the point it looked like an epic battle straight out of the legends. It was all staged, of course. Their spells were flashy, made to appear powerful, but had no substance, they were weaker than first magic, barely a light show. As soon as everyone got outside, the three mortal enemies stopped to plan their next move. I'd say that the Church of the Six is done. Freya said as both Lith and Protector reverted to their human form. Ryman purposely produced a flash of light to blind her long enough for Lith to build and destroy a hologram that could cover his transformation. Indeed. I was expecting them to attack us during our little play, but they seemed to be otherwise occupied. Ryman pondered while using air magic to reproduce the sounds of a heated battle and witty one-liners. At this point, they have no choice left but to activate the arrays now. Even if some of the spells Foki are out of place, they had enough to spare in case something happened. Lith used his army amulet to make sure that Plan C was going smoothly. A yelp and a no. Accompanied an explosion big enough to make the whole building crumble. The alleged monsters had allegedly been defeated. The crowd still around the church exploded into cheers and applause as the three walked out of the debris, the mercenary, the ranger, and the hunter smiled at their audience. Lith even raised his hands while holding Ryman's and Freya's before giving those present a bow, just like they were actors. The cheers and applause is intensified. Good gods. How did you become a man who can see a whole city almost ripped to shreds and joke like that? Freya angrily whispered. For them, us saving their city might be the most important day of their life. But for me, it was just another day's work. Lith's reply earned him a nudge in his ribs from both of his partners. We have no time to waste. According to General Vorg, they must be at the center of the array. If even Plan C goes awry, we're screwed. Freya chanted her spells with astounding speed, urging Lith to do the same, this time, the Awakened would be prepared and have the home advantage. Lith chanted gibberish, giving Solus the task to provide for Plan F while he took care of Plan E. He had to keep them both a secret, or the others would never let him hear the end of it, I'm completely against Plan E and I wish you to reconsider. Solus thought, this time it will be three against four. For versus four at best, if we give away your existence. But what if they have prepared more arrays? I'm not going to risk the life of any of you. You mess with the scourge, you get buried. Period. Lith ended the argument before it even started. Ryman opened a warp steps leading to their destination as soon as the chanting ended. Dimensional magic was mana expensive and Freya was the only one among them who wasn't an awakened, she is the weak link. I have to make sure that nothing happens to her. Freya is a good person and I don't want to see Lith experience any more grief. The next time he snaps, it could be the last one. Ryman thought, the warp steps led them to a spot far enough from the array's epic enter to not make them visible with life vision, but close enough to check their surroundings for traps. All clear. Lith said after performing the array detecting spell and using both his own and Solus's mystical senses. Same. I can't sense any suspicious sound or smell. 
Ryman found the lack of enemy traps disturbing. He had checked for undead, explosives, and even hidden soldiers to no avail. They flew toward the center of the array and soon they were able to see four figures high in the sky. The four awakened moved rhythmically, using invigoration to conjure more and more world energy. It would ensure them the successful activation of third eye, even if they lacked a few focal points. Due to the temporary relief from the storm, people might have left their homes. The four were arranged back to back in a circle, covering all the possible directions their opponents could come from without leaving a blind spot. They are here. Benio said. Things couldn't have gotten any worse. With only four of them, third eye would take a big chunk of her life force. To add insult to injury, the makeshift addition to the ritual would ensure its activation, but they were likely to lose the grounding erase effect and even more life force in the process. I hope there is a special place in the afterlife for idiots like you, Kieran. She inwardly cursed. Let them come. Ready on my mark. Aelia said. Her face looked like it had been chiseled in stone. She had sacrificed too much to allow anyone to stop her. All of them knew the risks involved when they had accepted to become awakened, back then, however, death seemed something distant, whereas now it was waiting for them around the corner. Now. At her signal, a golden six-pointed star appeared in the space between them. It soon grew enough to cover all the space around them for over 100 meters, 328 feet. Silverwing's hexagram was one of the most common training routines for awakened ones. Point four of them could cast it quickly, and suppress any enemy thanks to invigoration providing them with endless mana. Lith's group suddenly lost their flight spell and gravity did the rest. Chapter 579. Nothing works. Freya said. None of the items Orion had prepared for her could project its energy outwards. Under the seal of the hexagram, only inner energies like fusion magic could be used, she wasn't worried about dying. The enchanted armor she wore still worked and it would prevent the fall from being lethal. Yet without magic, they had no way to stop the four criminals. I know. Protector's voice was peaceful. He took a deep breath and the world stopped moving. He was the first one to disappear, quickly followed by his two companions. What the heck? They blinked away. Jaren couldn't believe his own eyes. Stop spouting bullshit. They are still inside the array. Had they attempted any spell, we would have felt it and countered it in a jiffy. Pelion could still sense Lith's group presence thanks to the enhanced mana perception the hexagram provided to all four of them, yet he couldn't pinpoint them. At least not until one of Protector's horns rammed at him with the force of a freight train. After almost being killed by a single move of the two Emperor Beasts, this time Pelion had come to the fight prepared. The moment Benio had spotted the incoming enemies, he had activated his armor's pseudo core to boost its defensive abilities at the expense of duration. The enchanted protection his master had forge mastered for him was now five times stronger than usual. Such a powerful effect came at a price, though. It would take less than two minutes for the pseudo core to exhaust its mana, and when that happened, his armor would be no different from normal clothes for hours. Fights were supposed to not last for long and Pelion would return home as soon as they were done with the third eye ritual. It was a perfect plan, at least on paper, despite the armor's boosted effect, despite Earth Fusion making Pelion's body as durable and heavy as stone, he was sent flying out of the formation. All of his precautions had prevented him from being skewered by the horn, but he still took a lot of damage. His sternum cracked along with several ribs, making him spit a mouthful of blood as he fought to regain control over his own flight spell. Silverwing's hexagram disappeared, making it possible for Lith's group to use magic again. Lith and Freya jumped off Protector's back as he disappeared again. Where did he go? Aelia didn't panic and kept her focus on her ritual. She could feel the energy accumulated in the air closing to its critical mass. He did another invisible blink. Jaren said while turning his head in every direction, hoping to spot the Emperor Beast's exit point. It's you who blinked, not me. Protector struck Jaren with one of his horns, sending the awakened flying and following up with a tear for a spell, Shadow Edge. A darkness-infused air blade cut deeply into Jaren's defenses and sapped his strength. There's just the two of us left. Benio had several spells at the ready, but had no idea which one to use without exposing herself or her companions to the Emperor Beast's impossible attacks. Lith darted toward her, well aware of her eyes blazing with mana, they are all using life vision. Dimensional magic is useless, I can only employ fusion magic to move faster. He thought, Freya stayed behind, casting one spell after the other. A mage knight's role was to support and protect their companions. She would join the fight the moment the others required her help, not a second sooner, how the heck can these guys use Silverwing's hexagram? Even by combining their strength, it's supposed to be impossible. Speaking of impossible, how does Ryman warp space without opening a dimensional door? She wondered, the answer was pretty simple, he wasn't blinking, just flying with his wings. Ryman was so fast that from such a close distance not even the Awakens' enhanced senses could follow his movements. Now that he could use air magic again to support his wings, he had become even faster. In an aerial fight, anyone could fly, yet those born with wings had superior speed and maneuverability. Seeing that Jaren and Pelion had yet to recover, Benio clapped her hands and activated the tear for spell chasing lightning. Several golden magic circles appeared around her and from each circle erupted a bolt of lightning, which resembled a snake in both motions and appearance, the lightning bolts moved toward Lith in a zigzag pattern, slower than normal, but they were still very fast. Thanks to air fusion and his flight spell, Lith managed to dodge all of them, yet his efforts bought him less than a second of advantage. Being true to their name, the thunderbolts turned around and chased after him. Yet even a split second was more than enough for Lith. He took the gatekeeper out of his pocket dimension, infusing both himself and the sword with all elements. Benio could oldie unsheath her own blade, and Estoc, and use fusion magic too. None of the opposing teams could use tier 5 magic. The slightest mistake at handling spells with such a big area of effect would hurt their companions. Benio froze in place when she saw how fast Lith's blade moved, I can't dodge, I have to block it. She lunged at the gatekeeper's tip, to use it as a leverage point to deflect the much heavier blade with her own. Unfortunately, even though fusion magic boosted both of them, it made the gap in their physical abilities even wider. To make matters worse, the gatekeeper's ability to channel the elements made it faster, heavier, and sharper than most enchanted blades could be. 
When the two weapons clashed, Benio almost lost the grip on her rapier and remained defenseless from her waist to her chin. Lith slash blasted away her guard and opened a diagonal cut from her left shoulder to her left hip. Chasing lightning was almost upon him, he had no time to follow up with another attack. Thanks for falling into my trap, you moron. Aelia and Benio had a smug grin as the world energy that they had painstakingly accumulated up to that point was released. Aelia used blink on her two missing teammates to bring them back at the epicenter of third eye. The three arrays forming the magical formation became visible to the naked eye. The awakened ones used their own mana to channel the gathered mass of world energy through the magical focus points scattered along Xantia. The magic circles encompassed the entire city up to its tall walls, creating so much light that they would have been visible for kilometers if not for the ongoing storm. We managed to split the damage among five, yet it's just a partial victory. Activating the third eye during a moment of quiet means that there will be a lot of witnesses. Once we are done with those three, Xantia has to disappear. Aya thought, wiping out a whole city was dangerous, but doing otherwise implied an even greater risk. Lady Tiris was bound to know about Kieran's trespassing in Xantia, and if anyone recognized the use of forbidden magic, she would interrogate Derenil.at at that point, their lives would end and all of their efforts be squandered. A snowstorm wiping out a city was uncommon but not unthinkable of in the north. Chapter 580 The residual energy the awakened ones had planted inside the victims of the griever formed several dots in the sky, that stabilized the arrays. Lith could feel his entire body going on fire as the cracks present on his life force were about to be burst open once again. Yet the dots were too few to sustain any of the three arrays, which collapsed on themselves due to their inability to store so much world energy. That's actually my line. Lith unleashed the tier 5 spell Raging Sun he had kept at the ready for that precise moment. A burst of violet flames engulfed the space around him with the strength and the heat of a volcanic eruption. Freer and Protector were safe from the spell, whereas all of Lith's enemies were close enough to be caught in its area of effect. I love it when a plan comes together. Lith was smiling inside and outside, before going to the church, Lith had mobilized the city guards and the conscripted healers. Their role had been to forcefully heal the victims of the griever, eliminating the focus points that the arrays required to function properly, while he kept the awakened ones occupied, the healers had dismantled Third Eye in his stead, well, at least Plan C succeeded. Maybe third time really is the charm. Solus said. The enemies were still all alive, so she continued to focus in case the worst happened. Crazy bastard. He really pulled it off. Freya activated full guard and dimensional ruler. Her body was now surrounded by two auras, one blue and the other golden. She had already consumed a top-tier potion, making herself immune to spirit magic. The other two spells were meant to take away most of the advantages an awakened had against a fake mage. Freya had heard many times from her parents about Nalia's abilities, so she knew what to expect. Even with Raging Sun as the opening act, she didn't like their odds. They were still three against four, and no matter how fast he was, Protector couldn't deal with two enemies at a time. Yet she didn't hesitate and joined the fray the moment the purple flames dissipated. Asterisk 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 blood desert. Panea tribe. Tassar Quintus home, now. Tassar was thinking about how to punish his foolish heir, and what gift he could give Lady Tiris to apologize for Deranial's trespassing inside her territories when the answer presented itself to him. A delicate feminine figure walked out of a dimensional fissure right in front of him. Lady Tiris. To what do I owe this honor? His voice sounded like someone had put his genitals in a vice. For a second, Tassar's body couldn't decide whether to be aroused, or terrified from the apparition. Tiris's human appearance had a delicate oval face and perfect features. She was 1.76 meters, 5 feet 9 inches, tall and wore the uniform of a royal constable that fit her like a glove, emphasizing her figure, her shining golden hair was braided into a waist-long tress. There was no trace of her usual kindness within her silver eyes, so Tassar's common sense made him settle for terror. Do you really think I'm that stupid? Tiris' voice was calm, yet the mana it carried made Tassar fall to his knees and bleed from his eyes and ears. Your son and his friend trespass and a mysterious disease appears right in the city they were in. I could have overlooked their blatant violation of my laws if it was just a prank. Yet now it turns out that you sent him to practice forbidden magic on my turf. A wave of her hand made all of the arrays protecting Tassar's home collapse. The artifacts he wore turned into dust, even his prized blood scimitar. I swear I don't know what you are talking about. He said as his bones started to break one after the other in a symphony of snaps and agony. You don't know? Then it's even worse. You are so stupid that you didn't even question Deranial properly. Do you at least know what punishment awaits those who practice forbidden magic? Her delicate hand lifted Tassar by his head, threatening to squash it like grape. Death. Who is responsible for a disciple's faults? Tiris's voice was unable to hide her anger anymore. Her question was accompanied by a roar of thunder. Their master. But Deraniel wasn't alone, Kieran, I've already dealt with Lesalia. Unlike her, you were unaware of your disciple's plan, so I'll grant you a peaceful death. Her reply was the last nail in the coffin of Tassar's hopes. At least spare my children. He wept. All but Deraniel. She nodded. I'll leave them all of your riches and enough books to study magic, if that's what they want. Yet your legacy is mine. Tiris placed her hand above Tassar's chest and stopped his heart. She waited for his mana core to disappear before moving on the second to last item on her to-do list. Deraniel wasn't going to be as lucky as his father, her only regret was to have wasted too much time with Lesalia. Thanks to the surveillance device she had enchanted Kieran's clothes with, the assassin knew all along what the six youngsters were doing, she simply didn't care. To Lesalia, everything and everyone was just a means to an end. She never cared about the council, nor the guardians. Tiris had taken her time to show Lesalia how wrong she had been. Asterisk 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 Xantia's sky, now. The few seconds the forbidden formation lasted was enough for Zedros the Wyvern to recognize its nature. I knew it that following Falyul's disciple was a good move. With this recording, I can blackmail those pathetic humans and their masters to give me everything I want. It only takes a call to the council to kill them if they refuse. A wide grin appeared on his scaly face. Where is that wormling, though? How can a measly yellow cord human be so powerful? I smell human treachery here. Zedros wasn't aware of Orion's ring shielding both Lith and Solus, but he knew of the existence of such items. 
The more the fight progressed, the more he was certain that Lith was using a cloaking device. Meanwhile, several hundreds of meters below the Wyvern, the battle was still ongoing. To come out unscathed from Lith's raging sun, the four awakened had to sacrifice something. Pelion's armor was as good as dead, and he had consumed all the barriers he had at the ready. Aelia had sacrificed most of her spells and mana to carve a path for herself out of that blazing inferno. Jaren and Benio had managed to blink away in time, just to discover that Ryman was able to hit both of them almost at the same time, curse their magical protections. With just my body, I can't kill them with one hit. I need a weapon. Protect a thought. With tier 5 magic sealed by the proximity of his allies and dimensional magic sealed by life vision, Ryman's options were limited. Keeping two awakened busy by himself was the only way he had to give his companions the opportunity to take out their opponents. Otherwise, the enemy would exploit their superior numbers to buy themselves time and use invigoration when necessary. Chapter 581. Ryman assumed a hybrid form over two meters tall, which resembled a two-legged humanoid wolf with feathered wings on his back. He was wearing Lith's prototype of skinwalker armor and wielding an enchanted two-handed mace. It was another failed attempt at reproducing the gatekeeper, but it had to do. Protector had never learned how to use weapons. He had dedicated all of his free time to magic, Lith was eager to even the field. He charged at Aelia, who was currently the easiest target while unleashing a barrage of spells to prevent her from escaping. Pelion had the same idea. He blinked behind Freya, having care of remaining outside of full guard's area of effect. His hands were brimming with mana, ready to unleash a spell that she couldn't avoid from such close range, unfortunately for Pelion, he was well within dimensional ruler's area of effect. The golden sparkles of light which were filling the air distorted the space and made his dimensional door volatile, instead of closing, the exit point exploded. The resulting burst of flames burned Pelion's back and threw him off balance. Freya turned around, performing several lounges with her rapier aimed at his vitals. Pelion took his great sword out of his dimensional ring and a small explosion almost threw his weapon away. He managed to catch it by infusing himself with air fusion, but the desperate movement left him exposed. The rapier hit him several times, draining Pelion's armor of its last bits of energy before piercing his shoulder. Pelion grunted, using darkness fusion to cut off his pain receptors. Between his burned hand and his wounded shoulder, he wouldn't be able to keep his focus otherwise. A great sword? Are you overcompensating for something? Freya said with a sneer, Pelion was enraged at the idea of having been hurt by a fake mage twice, yet he managed to keep his cool and unleash the tear for spell Wendigo's Wail. It was an unblockable attack that produced a cone of freezing air mixed with a shockwave, the former would weaken and slow down the enemy, while the latter would stun them long enough for Pelion to deal her a finishing blow. The sparks of golden light coalesced in front of him, forming a warp steps which swallowed the spell, and released it right behind Freya's back before dissipating. It all happened so quickly that Pelion was still trying to understand how she could have deflected his spell when Freya resumed her attack. The potion she had taken made up for her lack of fusion magic while her swordsmanship outmatched the opponents. She never attempted to block the much bigger and clumsier great sword if not with her conjured tower shield. Her rapier danced like a snake against Pelion's guard and every one of her hits created a deep wound. Pelion cursed his bad luck realizing that even when his attacks landed, they did little to no damage. Now that his armor's pseudo-core had exhausted its energy, the difference in defensive abilities was overwhelming. Light fusion alone wasn't enough to heal his wounds fast enough. Thanks to darkness fusion shutting down his pain receptors he didn't feel pain, but every new cut was making his stamina deplete faster. He faked a lunge and the moment Freya retreated, Pelion flew back to buy enough time to use invigoration. Freya lunged too, but despite the distance, she hit her target. The golden lights had coalesced again, forming a small warp steps right in front of Freya's weapon and another at Pelion's back. She kept stabbing the air in front of her and her blade started to appear out of nowhere from impossible angles, forcing Pelion to use all of his focus just to remain alive. What kind of monster are you? He said, Freya didn't reply. She moved forward, making more and more golden lights surround her opponent. Dimensional Ruler was a tier 5 dimensional magic spell which used Freya's great mana perception, and her talent for space manipulation to open countless small warp steps all around her. It allowed her to perceive anyone warping near her, and to make space instable at will. It was the reason every time Pelion employed a dimensional ability something had exploded in his face. Freya could also use it as a means of attack or defense, but only within a short range. Like all dimensional spell, it was also very mana expensive, but she knew that time wasn't on their side. They had to get the upper hand quickly, or they would be defeated. Lith and Aelia were fighting in close quarters and things weren't going well for her. She had come to the fight prepared. Too bad that according to her predictions it was supposed to be a long-range battle where her group would outnumber and outgun their opponents. After activating Third Eye, Aelia and her companions were supposed to become even stronger, whereas their enemies would be like fish in a barrel after suffering from a damage to their life force they weren't used to. Even the worst-case scenario she had prepared for didn't involve fighting one-on-one -on -one at close range. Lith was faster, stronger, and more devious than any opponent she had ever sparred with. If she tried to buy some time to cast a spell, he would exploit her lack of focus to aim straight for her vitals, whereas whenever she focused solely on dodging his attacks, Lith would cast a spell toward her escape route and disrupt her rhythm. We've been fighting for just a few seconds and I'm already covered in wounds. Where the fuck are the others? Aelia released all of the attack spells stored inside her rings, the gatekeeper was seconds away from chopping off her head and she knew it. The sudden barrage of spells forced Lith to step back and dodge, giving Aelia a full breath worth of energy from invigoration. Most of her wounds healed, yet the most important thing was that she had regained part of her stamina, damn it. I was so close to finishing her off. The silver lining is that her rings should be out of energy now. I could use origin flames, but aside from giving away my identity, I would gain no advantage, back at the church, her barrier withstood protectors and mine combined attack. A simple blast of flames would just surprise her. She's physically weak, I need to exploit it. Lith thought while he blinked away, the moment Aelia saw the dimensional door opening, she spun on herself like a top to find its exit point and counterattack, yet she found nothing. She then watched above and finally below, where Lith had just appeared at dozens of meters of distance. I expected him to stick at close range, but maybe he too is running out of strength. Aelia was about to use invigoration again, to not waste a single moment of that unexpected break, when Lith released the tier 5 spell, Stornado, the air around him became thick and heavy. 
strong gales spread upwards the noxious fumes generated by his hands. Stornado was a mix of air and darkness magic that conjured a thunderstorm of poisonous gas. Lith had switched his position to make sure that even with its huge area of effect, only Aelia would get caught by the ascending toxic tornado he had unleashed. Chapter 582. Please, no. Aelia said even though she knew that the ranger couldn't hear her, she was a smart girl. Aelia could easily guess what was going to happen. The moment the spell hit her, Lith would be free to cut her down with his swords while she was too busy defending herself from the storm. A mage couldn't be hurt by their own spell, so the ranger could disregard Stornado's effects and focus solely on attacking. Jaren too understood that her friend had a few seconds left to live. He had no idea how a fake mage could hold her ground against Pelion, but he knew that the moment one of them fell, the rest would soon follow, the Emperor Beast had no skill with his weapon, but each of his strikes had the weight of a mountain. The only time Jaren had blocked with his broadsword, not only did the blade almost break, but the impact also numbed his hands. Benio, keep him busy. Aelia needs help. He yelled as he dived below to the rescue, Benio released a strong cyan aura and went all out. Up until that moment, Protector's strikes had been shallow because he had to shift his attention from one awaken to the other, but now he could focus solely on her, there's a silver lining in being alone. Here goes nothing. She unleashed a tier 5 spell, Shattering Star. The space around her was now filled by ice shards as big as a man, each one infused with several lightning bolts worth of electricity. Protector dodged the magical hail like it was moving in slow motion, but then Benio snapped her fingers and the ice constructs exploded into a heavy rain of smaller crystals. The damage each one dealt was negligible, but they were almost impossible to dodge and sharp enough to cut through Protector's thick fur. They would also release a jolt of electricity so strong that they would cause a seizure even to someone using Earth Fusion. Protector cursed his naivety and conjured a small tornado around himself to escape from the jaws of death. Shattering Star ended up inflicting him only scratch wounds, but it had never been meant to win the battle, only to stall for time. Benio smirked at her turtled up opponent and cast more spells while using Invigoration. She considered Emperor Beasts dangerous only because of their physical abilities. Due to their primitive brains, their magic lacked finesse. Or so Benio thought until she noticed that the tornado didn't deflect the ice crystals, so much as capturing them. She could feel the Emperor Beast's mana flooding her spell and make it his own. The shards grew in size by the second and so did the electrical current they held. When Protector released half of them, they had become ice lances which moved as fast as bullets. Benio had no defense that could stop that kind of firepower and was forced to blink away. The moment Protector spotted her exit point, he released the other half while he called the first volley back. Benio was ready to blink again, but the ice lances hit her barriers like a truck, making her lose her focus. By the time the second volley arrived, all of her protections were exhausted, the first spear pierced through her lung, the second through her stomach, and the third through her shoulder. Each one opened a gaping hole into her flesh, so big that Protector could see through them the events unfolding at Benio's back. The number of holes in her body increased until it was turned into a burst of blood, skin, and guts. I'm sorry, but you left me no choice. Protector said as Benio's remains were scattered to the wind. I was willing to spare you if you surrendered, yet you kept fighting despite everything was lost. I can't afford mercy when you willingly threaten the members of my pack. Then, he had the wind blow under his wings and turned into a blur. Aelia, blink behind me. Jaren said the moment he was sure that the Emperor Beast wasn't following him, Aelia did as instructed, but unfortunately, so did Lith. The two warps opened almost at the same time, making it impossible for Jaren to distinguish friend from foe. Me and my big mouth. Since he couldn't attack, Jaren weaved several barriers in front of himself, just to be safe, Lith had run out of tier 5 spells, so he had to resort to the tier 4 spell death call. For long arms made of shadow came out of his body, ignoring both of his enemy's defenses, from such a close distance, neither of them could use magic without the risk of harming their partner rather than their enemy. To make matters worse, they soon discovered that, even two against one, they were physically no match for Lith both the ranger and his blade were infused with the power of the elements, doubling the effects of fusion magic. After exchanging a quick glance, Aelia and Jaren blinked away at the same time, hoping that whoever Lith ended up chasing would buy the other enough time to turn the tables, Pelion wasn't faring any better. Dozens of deep cuts covered his body and the blood loss was draining his stamina by the second. Dimensional ruler prevented him from using dimensional magic to escape, and all of his means of attack had been neutralized by Freya's combination of spells. Full guard allowed her to move her conjured tower shield wherever it was needed, and the golden light surrounding them made her rapier appear from his every side, as if he was surrounded by several opponents. Trying to get at least a second of respite, he unleashed all of the spells he had at the ready and those stored inside of his magical rings. Freya did the same, but whereas she had several means to defend herself, Pelion only had earth fusion and his enhanced body. He infused the amulet at his neck with what mana he had left, generating a barrier made of pure energy that saved his life. Freya used her tower shield to block as many attacks as she could before it crumbled, and then she blinked behind her opponent while Pelion was blinded by the light generated by the spells exploding on his barrier. Pelion wasn't naive and was expecting something like that. His enhanced senses alerted him in time. He managed to turn around in the nick of time and block Freya's sword with the hook-shaped hilt of his own. He ripped it off from her hand and used his free arm to grab at her neck. He was now out of mana, making it necessary for him to finish her quickly. Unfortunately, while he so skillfully overpowered her arms, her leg found her way to his gonads. Freya kicked them hard and fast enough to send them keeping company to Pelion's tonsils. With his pain receptors functioning again, he doubled over in agony and Freya's knee welcomed his face as her elbows struck at the back of his head. Meanwhile, in the sky above Xantia, Zedros was considering the idea of going down and save the three awakened youths remaining. If those weaklings die, I will never learn their master's identities. Dead men tell no tales and can't be blackmailed. He thought. Chapter 583. A small rift opened in the space near Zedros. It was so thin and delicate to be almost invisible. What are you doing here instead of stopping the ritual? A feminine voice holding the fury of a storm asked. According to the rules of the council, every lord is responsible for protecting their territory from trespassers and from awakened who employ forbidden magic. Yet you are here not doing anything. Any last words? Lady Tiris, I. 
Zedros attempted to say before her punch crushed every single bone in his body and sent him crashing against the nearest mountain. A couple of dozens of kilometers away, it seems I'm late. Yet the air is still pure. The forbidden ritual didn't succeed. She thought while she descended to the ground, Jeren had gotten the short end of the stick. He had just walked through his dimensional door when Lith's blade lunged at his neck. He managed to dodge it only to be caught by the four shadow arms conjured by Death Call. The darkness magic flooded his body draining Jeren of his vitality. The combined action of the four limbs made him lose his focus along with all the spells he kept active or had at the ready. With no more barriers protecting his enemy, Lith's blade had no problems to sever Jeren's head from his neck. Aelia was quickly recovering her strength while she cast her strongest tier 5 spell, she was so focused on haste the completion of the spell, that she almost didn't notice Protector approaching to her position at breakneck speed. This time they were far enough to allow her enhanced senses to spot him thanks to air fusion and life vision. Aelia was about to unleash her collapsing moon spell against the Emperor Beast when two golden rays of light descended from the sky, piercing Aelia's and Pelion's heart. At the same time, Lith's group noticed to be inside an impossible array, which generated a spherical barrier around all of those present, corpses included, this is General Vorga's energy signature, but I don't recognize. The one behind the golden rays. Lith thought, it seems the reinforcements have finally arrived, but I don't understand why they put us inside, never mind. Solus's thoughts didn't make any sense to Lith until a huge explosion destroyed the awakened one's corpses and cracked the barrier sealing them. You are lucky, son. General Vorg said. A lot of mags don't want their treasures to be stolen. Sometimes a dead enemy is more dangerous than when they were alive. Lith actually had no such problem. Solus would always warn him if a pseudo core was going awry, but he had no reason to tell that to Vorg. Thanks for your help. He said while giving him a small bow. Solus preferred to keep her eyes on the magical staff Vorg was wielding and try to understand its secrets. No, Ranger. Thank you. I'm sorry we arrived so late, but casting such a long-range warping array requires time and skill. I suppose you already know Spellbreaker Tiris Griffin. Tiris waved her hand at Lith's group while she kept open the dimensional corridor from which Vorg and other spellbreakers were rushing out. Where are the rest of the enemies? Vorg asked. Dead or still inside their homes? Lith handed him the list containing the names of all the officials and nobles who were likely to have helped the Church of the Six to spread its influence. Well, cleaning up this kind of mess is way beyond your pay grade. We'll take it from here. There's anything else I need to know? Yes. I stopped those rogue mags with the help of my friends and I'd like for them to be compensated. They are free runners and... Lith turned around just in time to bit his own tongue. Don't worry. The Griffin Kingdom doesn't discriminate against his loyal citizens just because of their race. Both Lady Inners and the Emperor Beast will be rewarded for their efforts. Tiris said, Lith had almost noticed too late that Protector was still in his hybrid form, fuck me sideways. Protector doesn't know them, nor must he like being caged like an animal. Lucky for us, the army seems to know about shape-shifting abilities. Otherwise things could have gotten awkward. Lith thought, Vorg dispelled his array, making the barrier trapping Lith's group disappear. Who are these guys, Scourge? Friends or enemies? His voice sounded like a snarl. Protector's lips were curled, revealing his snow-white fangs and showing he was ready to resume fighting. Protector was too young to know about the Council or the Guardians. Since Tiris wanted to appear as a cyan court human, even his senses perceived her as such. Friends. Lith said stepping in front of him and shielding Ryman with his own body. Just to be safe, Freya was still confused about the quick development of the events. At first, she had been annoyed by someone stealing her prey, but when Pelion's corpse had exploded, making even her bones tremble, her rage had been replaced by gratitude, the emotional roller coaster resumed when she saw Tiris. She had no idea who that constable was, but seeing another Tista was a big blow to her pride. Thank you very much, Lady Inners. Your family truly is a pillar of the kingdom. Tiris said while shaking her hand. Thank you for your kind words. Was all that Freya managed to think of that didn't sound like a pickup line. It's never easy to reward an emperor beast. Your needs are often very different from humans. I didn't come here for a reward. Just leave me alone and I'll consider us even. Protector said. There was something off in the woman in front of him, and he didn't like how the other spellbreakers were looking at him. He chose to remain in his hybrid form to not give away his human appearance. If that's your wish, I can promise you that no one will disturb you. I hope you will at least accept some gold as a token of my appreciation. Tiris handed him a bag containing a few hundred gold coins, Protector was tempted to refuse it, but with another kid incoming that money would make a huge difference. He wouldn't need to work for a long time, allowing him to focus only on his family and magic, also, Celia could use a bigger home, and both of them some help with the kids. He nodded at Tiris and made the bag disappear inside his dimensional amulet after checking that none of the coins was enchanted. What can the Griffin Kingdom do for you, Ranger Verhen? Tiris shook his hand too, coming a little too close for Lith's comfort. Her beauty was stunning, her hair smelled like spring had finally arrived, and her smile had melted countless frozen hearts in the past. I would like to apply for leave again. Two missions completed in as many days and an entire city saved from forbidden magic should grant me at least that much. He replied without hesitation. Tiris's smile reminded him of Camilla, making him yearn for his girlfriend's company. That's a given. She chuckled. You'll be awarded 10 days leave for your meritorious acts and another 10 days for being the top ranker in the Ranger Corps. I was asking if there's something specific you might desire. Chapter 584. Please, refrain from asking more titles or annuities, because those who rise too fast draw on themselves the wrong kind of attention. Tiris said. Then I'd like to keep the Baylor's body for myself. Also, I think I'll spend my leave practicing forge mastering. Can you provide me with these metals? Lith handed her a very short list, but each material was accompanied by a big number. I can assure you that all of your requests will be fulfilled, except for the adamant. It's too rare and precious to waste it for the experiments of a novice forage master. No offense. She replied. None taken. What's the next best thing I could receive? Money and oricalcum. Gold is a mage's best friend. Whatever your project is, you'll need it. As for the oricalcum, it's a natural alloy of silver containing traces of adamant. 
It's the perfect material for most artifacts and with the proper treatment, it can become harder than steel. Is it good enough for you? Tiris asked. Yes, thank you very much. I would also like to learn the metalworking techniques you mentioned earlier. I can't depend on Zekel forever. Especially for the items I need to create with true forge mastering. Lith thought. Everything will be delivered to your door. But I have to order you to remain here until the situation settles. Tiris made him snap out of his reverie. Removing so many nobles at once will make the city chaotic. Once Count Sester's treachery gets exposed, the citizens of Zancha will lose much of their trust in the nobles who have failed them and they will shift it on the heroes who saved them. Your presence will help to make the transition as quick and painless as possible. Lith was happy at the idea of spending some more time with Freya. Leaving right after completing his mission would mean treating her as if she was just a means to an end, whereas she was his friend. I can't believe I'm thinking about this in a non-sarcastic way. Lith thought, one step at a time. Progress, not perfection. Solas said. In her eyes, Lith had many important people in his life, yet he appreciated only a few of them. Solas too was afraid of the possibility that he could die and reincarnate somewhere else. However, what really terrified her was the idea that to achieve his goal, Lith would lose everything and everyone else in the process, making it a hollow victory. I'll take my leave. Scourge, Anna's. Protector opened a warp steps and disappeared. The arrival of the army and all the magic employed during the battle had lured quite a crowd of onlookers, Lith approved the Protector's choice. He had left before more humans could see him and had pretended to not know Freya. I guess that during the past five years he has learned some common sense. Lith thought Freya and Lith had to provide a full report of all the events before returning to Viscount Crane's mansion. They were both starving and craving for some rest. Shouldn't you call Camilla? I bet she's jealous of you spending so much time alone with a gorgeous woman. Freya said during dinner while sweeping her hair behind her ear. Don't worry. Tiris and I are barely acquaintances. Also, I never remained alone with her, so my reputation is safe. He replied with a sneer. Son of a. Freya didn't like her joke being turned against her and punched him on the shoulder. Pain radiated from her wrist the moment her fist struck him. She had hit softer brick walls. I noticed that you didn't bring any member of your guild with you at the Church of the Six. We could have used some help. Lith said. I know, that's why I had them waiting outside in case things got out of our hands. Yet I couldn't risk them meddling with your play. They would see Protector's Beast form and your holograms. As much as it pains me to admit it, I don't trust them with my own secrets, let alone with yours or those of your friends. She sighed. They could have panicked or tried to blackmail the two of you. If there's something I learned during the last year, is that it's better to hire mags from minor academies rather than those from the great ones. The former never got the opportunity to learn a specialization, so they are full of hope and ambition. People like Wyra are loyal and grateful for the opportunity to gather merits. Once she gets enough, she can join the Mage Association and search for a teacher. The latter, instead, are bitter because of their failure at learning any specialization, dimensional magic, or even crystal smith. Very few of them have the confidence to study again on their own and their wounded pride prevents them from asking for help. By the way, what was that golden light you used? That guy was huge and used that strange magic, yet you handed his ass to him. Lith asked. How the heck did you have the time to pay attention to my fight? Do you have eyes even behind your head? I was just looking out for you. Lith lied. Solus could see all around them and then share her memories once a crisis was resolved. That was one of the dimensional spells I created. Even during our time at the academy, I knew I could never be a healer as good as you or Quilla, nor a mage knight as good as Floria. I'm very good at my specializations, but I'm aware I'll always be the master of our group. Instead of moping, I realized that I wasn't called master of space for nothing. I had my own thing and did all I could to get good at it. Now. I'm a full-fledged dimensional mage, like Professor Rudd. Freya was brimming with pride. To her, dimensional magic was just like her guild, Freya was tired of being second in everything she did. She wanted to carve her own path thanks to her talents. Even though the jury was still out on the guild, Freya was certain that dimensional magic would become her true field of expertise. She was explaining to him the effects of dimensional ruler, leaving Lith wondering if he would be able to handle such a spell, when the butler entered the dining room. Regent Verhen. Lady Inners. Please forgive my intrusion. Your friend is back and he is asking for you. He said while giving them a deep bow. Most of the house staff were so grateful to both of them for saving the city and their jobs that they treated them better than their own master. Let him in and bring another serving. Lith had yet to finish to speak that Ryman walked through the door with an embarrassed look on his face. The butler did as instructed and left them alone. Did Celia kick you out again or did you just miss me too much? Lith asked. Neither. I forgot to give you your enchanted items back. Ryman took out both the mace and the pseudo skinwalker. You can keep them. You already have imprinted them, plus they are just failures. Lith dismissed the issue with a wave of his hand. Also, I need a favor. Lith nodded for him to continue while Ryman sat at the table with them. Ryman looked at the great number of silverwares near his plate with wonder. He took a fork and a knife at random, making Freya giggle. Chapter 585. I need a ride back home. Zedros, the lord of the Keller region, must have gone away for some important reason. He isn't home and he doesn't reply to his amulet. Can you help me, Scourge? Ryman asked, Zedros the wyvern was actually laying on the side of a mountain with most of his bones broken. Tyrus had decided to spare his life, but that didn't mean she was willing to let his act of defiance go unpunished. Not only did her fist crush Zedros's body, but it also had tampered with his life force, making it impossible for him to heal with invigoration. It would take him days to fix the damage his life force had suffered and months to get back to his peak condition. Yes, don't worry. I was going to visit you and Celia anyway. Lith said, the army didn't need their help often, so the three of them spent most of their time relaxing and sharing pointers about magic. Freya had many things to teach them about dimensional magic, whereas Lith had a lot to teach them about everything. How the heck did you learn the basics of all the specializations? Freya had shed blood and sweat to train her three specializations. You have your guild, whereas I have no life. 
Lith shrugged point three days later, Lith and Protector left Zancha. Freya was sad to see them go. Protector's kindness reminded her of her father, Orion. It didn't take her long to grow fond of the wise yet socially awkward Emperor Beast. The two of them walked until they reached the nearest Mana Giza. Why are we here? I thought we would take a walk gate. Protector asked, Lyft didn't reply as Solus changed to her tower form, allowing them to get inside. It's bigger than I remembered it. Protector looked around the familiar yet unknown place. What do you mean? It's your first time in here. I expected you to at least be surprised. Lyft asked. Your memories, remember? Protector tapped the side of his head with a forefinger. Well, I bet you don't know this. Lyft snapped his fingers and a slight tremor spread throughout the tower. The space around them stretched and deformed as they crossed thousands of kilometers in a heartbeat. By the Great Mother. Protector recognized the all too familiar Tron Woods. I can't let the army clerks register all of my movements. If I had to vouch for you to let you use a warp gate, the Griffin Kingdom would easily guess your true identity. I don't have many friends and most of them have free access to gates. Lyft said. Thank you, Solus. Protector gave her a deep bow, making her blush. I hope you get a body soon. Fire and stone are not enough to express who you truly are. Whoever did this to you either loved you so deeply that they couldn't stand the idea of losing you or was a heartless monster. You're welcome, Protector. Solus regretted not being able to show him her physical appearance. She considered Ryman as one of her oldest friends, just like Lyth did, I only have one secret and I'm already sick of it. I don't know how Lyth manages to keep so many of them and honestly, I don't care. I want to come clean with him, she thought. Ryman's home was just a few hundred kilometers from Lucia. It took them just a few minutes to walk to destination. When Lyth saw Celia, her physical appearance shocked him, she was supposed to be in her late thirties, yet she looked even younger than the last time he had seen her. She seemed to be barely past her twenties. She was still 1.7, 5 feet 7 inches, meters tall and her skin was tanned from the years-long exposure to the sun her black hair was now longer, reaching her shoulders and giving her more gentle looks. She wore a leather hunting jacket over a green shirt, green cargo pants, and brown hunting shoes with a soft outer sole, to limit the noise made while she moved, Lyth could tell by her round belly that she was past the six months of pregnancy. Her sharp eyes and rough attitude hadn't changed though. It's about time. She snarled while giving the children in her arms to protect her. Do you have any idea how hard is it to chase around those two pests while I'm bloated like this? Make yourself useful and fix us something to eat while we entertain our guest. Her eyes became much kinder when she looked at Lyth. Oh, gods. I would have never expected that the famished runt that once came begging at my door for help would get so tall. Give Aunt Celia a hug, Scourge. She extended her arms and embraced him before he could even answer. Scourge? Lyth asked. Ryman never calls you Lyth and I think that Scourge is a fitting name for a great hunter. She replied while not letting him go, the house was a mess. Toys were left around on the carpets and furniture. Most of the walls had been scribbled on, and Lyth could see the traces of Celia's efforts to scrub them off. Yet it wasn't the chaos reigning in the hallway which gave him the second shock in less than ten seconds from his arrival. Their home was almost identical to his own. It even possessed most of the enchanted home appliances he had made over the years. Celia, I missed you so much. Especially at Nana's funeral. He returned the embrace the moment he snapped out of his reverie. I missed you too. She sobbed due to the joy of their reunion and the hormonal roller coaster she was experiencing. It's all that wolf's fault. I wanted to come at your graduation, but he said no. That the time wasn't right and all that cheese. Celia wanted to swear, but she had learned the hard way how fast children were at copying their parents' bad habits. I don't want to sound rude, but how can you look like this? Why does the house look like this? He asked when she released him from her embrace. It's all thanks to your memories. She gave him a big kiss on the cheek. Not only did you save that wolfhead's life, but you also taught him more about the world and magic than he could ever achieve on his own. I asked him to do for me what you did for Alina and to make all the cool stuff you do. Balkius' attack had happened during the third trimester of his fourth year at the White Griffin, giving Protector most of his knowledge about regrowing limbs, forge mastering, dimensional magic, and even magic crystals. I can't do all the things you can, but at least I know the basics. Protector squinted his eyes and used a small blast of darkness magic to clean the walls the moment Ryman let them down, Lilia and Leren ran towards Lith. They were respectively four and two years old. With Ryman's red hair and Celia's sharp eyes, they were the spitting image of their parents, they seemed to be curious about him, but instead of asking questions, they sniffed him for a while before shape-shifting their hands and bare feet into claws to better climb his legs. No claws with the guests. Get down immediately. Celia's pants were riddled with holes. Now Lyth could understand why she was so edgy. If Aaron had magical powers, Alina would have gone insane without his help. Chapter 586 I can believe my memories gave him an edge, but knowing and doing are two different things. Where did you find the mana crystals to make those things? They seem to be made with true magic. Lyth projected one of his little brother's favorite fairy tales to keep the children busy. As I already told you, after almost dying by the Veilous Hands and receiving your memories, I understood how lacking my magical knowledge was. As soon as Celia and I settled down in our new home, I searched for a teacher. Protector said. Just like humans, beasts too don't spread the secret of awakening unless it's strictly necessary to keep the balance among the races. The law is very strict, you can't even awaken your own children if you aren't willing to put your life on the line for them. What do you mean? Lyth had no notion of the social rules among the awakened ones. You are responsible for those you share our secret with. If your disciple breaks any law, you pay the consequences along with them. Since awakened ones have a long life, only after a century the bond between master and apprentice is considered broken. It's never hard to know who gifted who with awakening, since no one gives such a gift freely. Also, when the council captures a criminal, they can be very persuasive. Ryman's words made Lith think that Journey would feel at home in the council. Don't you want to be awakened, Celia? Lith asked. Honestly, I don't know. I prefer a good life to a long one. Not to mention that I should start to study magic and I never had a good relationship with books. I don't know how long Ryman has left to live. 
To me, outliving both my husband and children is a fate worse than death. She ruffled the kid's hair. They were two little angels now that they had stopped destroying the house and she wasn't forced to chase them around. Unlike humans, however, we don't hide our identity. I found my master, Faliel the Hydra, simply by asking the magical beasts of the Distar Marquisite for directions. Convincing her to teach me wasn't easy. A disciple takes a lot of time and effort. Being an awakened isn't enough to be accepted by a master. You have to prove to be reliable, talented, and to have an affinity with your future teacher. Because of your influence, I was interested in learning about healing and forge mastering. I had to prove my worth by doing all kinds of jobs for her for almost a year before she took me in. A year? I wouldn't have lasted that long. During that time, I completed half of my studies and I've made a lot of connections within human society. Lith said. An emperor beast wouldn't have taken you anyway. Back then, you were just a human. Even Scarlet considered you a dangerous anomaly. Faliol would have probably chased you away, if not worse. Ryman shook his head, Celia was more interested in Lith's light show than in all that talk about Awakened and Lith's nature, which made him wonder. To Celia, Lith asked, what did he tell you about me, exactly? After the scare he gave me with Lilia, I gave him only one condition if he wanted us to get back together. I demanded that there wouldn't be any more secrets between us. He told me all about himself, but he only told me about you what he needed for his story to make sense. I'm fine with it and I never pried further. He never shared with me your secrets aside from you being an Awakened, how the two of you met, and what you did together. Your parents are almost of my same age. We grew together in Lucia, so there's no chance one of them is an Emperor Beast. They would have never let one of their children suffer from hunger or illness as Tista did. I'm really curious, but if you don't want to tell, it's fine. Just consider that you are unlikely to find someone as open-minded as me. Celia said pointing at Ryman, Lith hesitated, not knowing to which one of his two hearts he should listen to. On one hand, he was certain that Celia wouldn't be too shocked if he decided to show her his hybrid form. With an emperor beast for a husband and two little shape-shifting wrecking balls born from their love, she had proven to have an inhuman tolerance for weirdness. Yet they hadn't seen each other in a long time, she had helped him a lot before he entered the White Griffin, but they had never got that close. He had never willingly revealed his hybrid nature elf to anyone except for Floria. Showing it to Celia before than to his family or Camilla, made him feel bad about himself. Thanks for the offer, but I'll pass. For now. Lith said, Celia dismissed the issue with a shrug and fell asleep shortly after. Her body was aptly trained to rest as soon as the kids allowed her to. What kind of jobs did Faluel ask you to do? Many things. I had to kill rogue magical beasts, human hunters that kept harming her forest, and sometimes even deal with abominations. It sounds like she was making you do her job for her. Lith said. Mostly, yes. Each task was actually a test to see if I could be trusted with more power. Not all of those she pointed me at deserved to die. Humans are more complex than beasts. They are so grey that most of the time is really hard to tell if they are bad or just desperate. Lith had the impression that Protector was now talking about him. After winter has passed, come find me. I'll introduce Faliol to you. She seemed to be very interested in your wormling form and she is an invaluable teacher. Even with your memories, I wouldn't have been able to do any of this without her help. She provided me both the materials and the mana crystals. Protector pointed at all the Forge Mastered Marvels furnishing his house. What's a wormling? Lith asked. It wasn't the first time he heard that term. A hybrid between one of the draconic species and something else. She thinks you are one of them because of your scales and because you can use dragon fire. Protector replied. I can use what now? Maybe you know them as origin flames. You know, the fire you breathe from your mouth? Not everyone can use them, which makes them special. Do you know why? Lith couldn't believe his luck. He might have found a proper awakened teacher and learn about origin flames, all in one day. Sorry, no. Not even Faluel can use them, so the first time she mentioned them to me was before sending me to Zantia. Lith spent the night at Ryman's home. He studied the pseudo cause of Ryman's creations to appreciate the difference between his own results as self taught with those of someone who had a master, it seems I'm really talented for forge mastering. My work is in no way inferior to Protector's. He thought, before leaving, he exchanged communication rooms with Protector and Celia. He also gifted some of his toys to the kids. He had prepared a new set of fairy tales projectors and miniature models. They were shaped like mags and magical beasts and could emit light of different colors as if they cast different spells. Lith could always make more and Celia needed a way to keep them busy when Ryman was away. Chapter 587 Will you get back to Lucia now? Lith asked, hoping for a positive answer. I don't know. Celia bit her lower lip. I'd love to get some help and company. Living in the middle of nowhere is really tiring, but I have to endure it for the kids. I'll think about it as soon as they understand that they can't shapeshift in front of strangers. She sighed, Celia and Lith exchanged a long hug. She made him promise to come back before the end of winter. Remember that we are your friends, not just a deadline. If you come back only for the lizard, I'll never forgive you. After saying their goodbyes, Lith used the tower walk to get back in the north and reach Belius with the army's gate. He needed to leave enough traces of his passage to never make people wonder where he disappeared from time to time. I would love to work on my forge mastering, but my talk with Camilla is long overdue. I can't delay it any longer without giving her a good reason. I can't just fit her in my spare time, I need to make time for her. He thought while knocking on her door. It was early enough in the morning for her to still be at home, but not so late that she had to rush to work. Lith had the keys to her apartment, but he wanted to make her a surprise. He rang the bell several times before he could hear an angry voice coming from behind the door. Look, pal, whatever you sell, I'm not buying. I was in the middle of breakfast and. Camilla choked on her words after watching through the peephole. I swear, this is the last time I make you a surprise. This is not how I pictured our reunion. The door opened abruptly and Camilla hugged him tightly for a few seconds, making sure he wasn't hurt. How did you get here so fast? I wasn't expecting you here before noon. She asked, Lyft didn't reply. He silently stood there, returning her embrace. He had missed her warmth, the scent of her hair, and even the sound of her voice. 
the difference between speaking with her and her hologram was like heaven and earth. Is it too much to ask for a welcome home and a kiss? Lif's words made Camilla blush. He had just referred to her house as his own, as if to ask if he could live with her. Welcome home. She said before making him bend down to reach his lips. Come in. I want to hear all about Freya and Ryman. Camilla had no need to ask him about the events in Zantia because she already knew them from his daily reports. She was more interested in learning about his never mentioned before friend, they had breakfast together, while Lyft told her how he and Protector had met and how he had become his magical father figure. He always referred to him as a vagrant mage, exposing his identity as an emperor beast could endanger his family. Ryman had not betrayed Lyft's secret and he was willing to do the same for him. Did you really fight together against your first abomination when you were just twelve? She asked. Yes. My parents learned about it only a year later. That man is crazy, bringing a child to fight that kind of monster. No matter how much enthusiasm Lyft used when reminiscing all the times he had fought or hunt alongside Protector. To her, he was just a nut job who had endangered Lyft's life multiple times. Without me, the Trawn Woods would have been destroyed and maybe Lucia raised to the ground. He's not crazy. If we had never met, I would have probably died fighting the abomination alone. Lyft said. You can keep trying to make it appear heroic later. I'm almost late for work. Camilla put her jacket on, giving him a last kiss before going to the door. I would love to have lunch together, but I have barely ten minutes at random due to overwork. I'll be back for dinner. I want you to promise me that when I arrive home, I'll find you here and that you will not risk your life today. She grabbed the handle without turning it, waiting for his reply. I promise. Are you ready for our big talk? Lith asked. I was born ready. She blew him a kiss and left the apartment, not risking your life is a big promise. What are we going to do all day? Sitting on a couch, Solas chuckled, I'm not tired. I had plenty of time to rest during the last few days. The materials I have requested should have already arrived home. Time to forge master us a few new toys, Lith used Belius' gate to get to Derios, the capital of Distar's Marquisite, and then Solus's tower walk to arrive directly in the Trawn Woods, his parents were overjoyed to have him back home. They showered him with affection and rebukes. This is becoming disturbing, son. Ra said. Why are you only getting missions where you risk your life at least once per day? I'm the ranger in charge of one of the most dangerous regions in the north, dad. Not the captain of the sewing club. High risks mean high rewards. Speaking of rewards, I was expecting a few crates. Have they arrived already? Yes, dear. I've stored them for safekeeping, Alina handed him several dimensional rings. Are you eating properly? It seems that stress has made you lose weight. Maybe you should change your career plans. Please, mom, Camilla is already bugging me. She says that I endanger my life like she changes her clothes. I don't need to hear the same song from you and dad. You should listen to her. Camilla is a judicious woman. Will you have lunch with us? Lith nodded in reply and then he and Alina came out of their home to pass the crates from her dimensional rings to his pocket dimension. After that, he went to the village of Lucia to meet with Zekel Proudhammer. He was the village blacksmith and Rena's father-in-law. He had insisted for both Rena and his granddaughter, Lyria, to keep the Verhen last name, making them Verhen Proudhammer. Lith's name was the best sword and shield any sane man could ask for. What can I do for you, dear Lith? Zekel loved all the privileges he had acquired through his son's marriage and was always eager to help Lith however he could. I need to make me a few items out of Oricalcum. Do you know how to process it? Lith asked. No. I never heard about it outside of legends. Lith took out the first crate and a booklet about Oricalcum. I gave it a read. It doesn't seem much different from silver. Is it as easy as it seems? Lith was so used to learn things with Solaspedia that every second that Zekel spent reading the booklet seemed to last an hour to him. We can give it a try. We'll need a few ingredients for, Lith opened the crate, revealing that the ore had been delivered with all the necessary for its treatments. Okay, then we just have to wait for the furnace to reach the right temperature. I'll reread everything again while we wait. Wait. Lith hated that word. It usually implied wasting time he could use to do something else. It took him less than a minute to pulverize the ore with magic, another few minutes to prepare the rest of the ingredient, and then he could only stare at the flames. Chapter 588. Lith already had a copy of the booklet inside Solaspedia, so he had no need to review the procedure again. Zekel had put a dirty silver ore inside the crucible to check the temperature of the furnace. Is it a problem if I use magic to speed things up? Lith asked. Be my guest, but remember that metals can evaporate. Finding the right temperature could require even more time since I know nothing about magic and you know nothing about metals. Zekel shrugged without taking his eyes off the booklet, Lith sighed, even fire vision could be useless without proper knowledge. I need to start practicing now, or I'll need months to create even a single item. Here goes nothing. He thought after checking that no one was looking. Lith's throat became covered in black scales as he breathed origin flams inside the furnace. The blue magic flames overpowered the normal yellow ones, spreading an eerie light. What the heck have you done? Zekel jumped off his chair, trying to save the situation, the crucible, the coal, the silver ore, everything, but the stones was engulfed in blue flames. Zekel took out the crucible using metal tongs, but even those caught fire. He kept his cool and took the crucible out of the furnace before splashing the tongs in a bucket of water. Is this normal? Lith asked pointing at the flaming crucible. No, it's not. You should have. Oh, gods. Zekel couldn't believe his own eyes, his old, trustworthy tongs seemed now to be made of two different parts. One was blackened with dirt, time, and use, whereas the extremity that had been eaten by the flames was slightly smaller than he remembered it. He touched it with his fingers, he even hit the anvil with them to make sure of his findings. This doesn't make sense. I get that your flames destroyed the dirt, but this? The metal seems to have been purified several times. What about this? Lith used spirit magic to have the crucible float in front of Zekel. The crucible was shiny as if someone had spent hours polishing it and the silver ore was reduced to a small clump of metal. By the great hammer. I've never seen such pure silver. This is bad. Zekel said. Why bad? 
Isn't the purer the better? Lith asked. If you want to make an ornament, yes. If you need it for something that has a practical use, impurities aren't all bad. Pure metals are a myth. Sometimes, you have to add impurities to obtain the right balance between hardness and softness. Too much of the former, and the final result will be brittle, too much of the latter, and it bends just by watching at it. Lith had his doubts, but he couldn't experiment with origin flames in the presence of witnesses. He spent the rest of the morning with Zekel, learning how to smell the orichalcum and how to turn it from as ductile as silver to harder than Damascus steel. The procedure was relatively simple. First, they picked a crucible big enough to contain quite some ore, but not so heavy that Lith couldn't easily lift it even when full. Zekel covered the bottom of the crucible with a special sand to prevent the ore from sticking, then he prepared a mixture of ore, wheat flour, lard, and ashes. The flour would provide the carbon for the oxidation of impurities and heat the metal from the inside. The ashes served for both the oxidation and to make the impurities clump together. Much to Lith's surprise, the lard was used to help the ore form an ore bar and to help build up the heat. Once the crucible was filled with the mixture, Zekel covered its surface with more ash, sand, and cesium. The sand would prevent the metals from volatilizing, whereas the cesium was a substance necessary to keep the silver and the adamant in the ore together. They put the crucible inside the furnace, and Lith used magic and fire vision under Zekel's supervision to spread the heat evenly until the ore looked like honey with no lumps of unmolten material. After pouring the liquid into a dry mortar, the ore quickly solidified into an upper part made of slag that looked like colored glass and a lower part made of metal. They separated the metal from the slag and repeated the process until it was pure, only then did they add the last ingredient, darkest khan. It would make the adamant saturate the silver, giving to the metal ingot the properties of both metals. After they had treated a few batches of ore, Lith noticed that it was almost lunchtime. Can we stop here? I need you to make me a few things for me. Lith asked. Isn't it a bit late for that? You should have told me way earlier. Without a mold, there's not much I can do and you didn't give me enough notice to prepare anything. Do you still have the mold for the silver hammers you made me some time ago? Sure. Do you need a hammer? Zekel was surprised by his request. It couldn't be a weapon since Lith only used swords, nor something merely decorative. It would have been a waste of orichalcum and Lith was as thrifty as he was. More than one. I need to enchant them and failure is likely. I also need a chain mail and chain pants of orichalcum. The shape doesn't matter. I'm going to make a better skinwalker armor. Lith said, Zekel had enough time to prepare him a couple of hammers, everything else had to wait. Zekel would first finish to purify the rest of the orichalcum and then work on the items Lith had requested. Orichalcum is definitely different from other metals. Solus thought, indeed. It's much lighter and durable of all the hammers we used to far. Lith had struck Zekel's anvil with it several times, yet the metal didn't bend nor did it get scratched, not that. I mean that it has a very thin mana flow of its own. Solus's words shocked Lith he activated life vision, noticing that Solus was actually wrong, it's not really a mana flow. Orichalcum seems to be able to draw the world energy and channel it. There's no life force, nor mana core. Lith used invigoration to put his hypothesis to test. He discovered that he could now see inside the metal like it was a living being, and even spot the residual impurities within, I wonder why we didn't notice that with Zolrish's forge. Orichalcum is just silver and adamant, whereas the forge he gave us is made of pure adamant. It makes no sense that Orichalcum has better properties than adamant. Lith thought, probably because we were both blinded by all the magic stuff stored inside his lab. The place was about to blow up, we didn't have the time to use invigoration on the forge. Plus, after we escaped, we never took it out from our pocket dimension, right after leaving Jambel, we came to Zansha. We simply had no chance to give it a second look. Solus replied, it seems we have so much work to do and only 20 frigging days at our disposal. Lith thought. Chapter 589. Lith swung the orichalcum hammer in his hands to check its balance, making Solus green with envy. She yearned to put her hands on it, but as long as she kept her ability to take physical form a secret, Solus could only watch. Aside from being entirely made of orichalcum, the hammer wasn't much different from the carpenter tools with a nail slot Zekel sold in his shop. It consisted of two parts, a straight shaft to hold it and the head. The head featured the actual hammer and the claw. The design is really poor. Lith sighed. In none of the stories he had read as a kid an enchanted item seemed out of a wellmet. He was solely interested in its properties, but the mundane look of the hammer made it underwhelming even for him. With no mold at his disposal, there wasn't much Zekel could do. Since we just have to perform experiments, we'll worry about the shape for last. Solus, can you make me a blacksmith lab? Give me a moment. She replied, making the tower rumble for a few seconds. A new door appeared in the basement. Behind it, there was a perfect replica of Zekel's workshop. Lith nodded in approval and looked at his pocket watch. He had six hours before he had to be at Camilla's place. Okay, no time to lose. First things first. Let's check out our forge. Solus took the adamant forge out of her pocket dimension, allowing both of them to appreciate the vigorous flow of world energy it induced in its surroundings. The adamant was like a magnet for world energy. No matter how good a mana conductor the adamant was, it couldn't contain an indefinite amount of energy. Once it was saturated, the constant stream of new world energy would force the old one stored inside the metal to come out, generating an artificial mana flow. It was a phenomenon very similar to invigoration, when Lith made the world energy course through his body without absorbing it. That way the world energy wouldn't nurture his mana core, but it would replenish his mana and bring his body back to its peak condition. This is interesting. What if adamant is just one of the many metals that don't exist on Earth? What if it's a metal capable of using some kind of accumulation to refine itself over the centuries until it becomes adamant? Lith wondered. He placed his hand over the forge and used invigoration on it. Just like for the orichalcum, he could see inside the block of metal as if it was a living being. To him, the forge appeared as if it was made of light, with very few impurities inside of it, the impurities were thin black veins, tainting the otherwise pristine element. He attempted to take control of the adamant's mana flow to expel the impurities, but they refused to budge even of a single millimeter, not even Solus's power, boosted by her tower form managed to do any better. They couldn't risk damaging it, so they put it back inside their pocket dimension and took out a new crate of orichalcum ore. 
I'm really curious to see if Zekel is right. Maybe with Origin Flames, we can skip the smelting phase and obtain Orichalcum faster. Solus proposed, Lith put the ore inside a crucible and made his throat turn into his hybrid form. Wait a minute. He choked on his flames and burned his own mouth. Everything in the tower is part of you. Did you make the crucible or crafted a real one? I made it. Solus's wisp shuddered. With the Origin Flames power, she had been seconds away from a world of pain. After Lith made a makeshift crucible from clay with earth magic, he put it inside the furnace and breathed a small jet of Origin Flames. The crucible held, but Lith could see it getting thinner, forcing him to add new clay that would immediately ignite as well. Solus had to use a few arrays to keep the flames in check and prevent them from attacking the furnace too. Origin flames are hungry little critters. If I'm not careful, they would spread everywhere. She said, when the fire went out, the results were appalling. The clay had turned into high-quality ceramic, which was useless to them, whereas the over 10 kilograms of ore had disappeared, leaving only a few droplets of silvery metal. The good news is that's pure adamant. The bad news is that there is so little that I can't even make a ring out of it. Sure, if I sacrifice a few crates I could get an adamant ring, but to what end? I have no blueprint for powerful rings, it would only be a waste of precious material. I don't know how much Orichalcum will need to make the improved version of the Skinwalker armor. 10 kilos is already a huge hit. Lith sighed. Let's work on the hammer, then. Solus said, their aim was to forgemaster a tool that would improve all of their future works. The idea was based on their studies on true forgemastering when they were still at the White Griffin Academy. Back then, Lith had been forced to use a hybrid technique using both fake and true magic to forgemaster his creations, but now he could rely solely on the latter to step up his game. During his research, he had devised two possible ways to create superior magical items with true forgemastering. The first required for him to shape the pseudo core outside its future recipient, and then merge them together before creating the necessary mana pathways to make it permanent. The second one, instead, would have him create both a small pseudo core and thin mana pathways at once. Lith had to infuse both of them with more energy until they reached the desired size. Each method had its pros and cons. At least on paper. By creating a complete pseudo core, Lith had all the time he wanted to shape it with surgical precision and charge it with enough energy to fuel the effects he wanted to achieve. The downside of such a method was that injecting such a big energy mass inside inanimate matter would encounter a lot of resistance and put a huge amount of stress on its recipient. If he wasn't careful, most materials would shatter due to a mana flow too strong and sudden for them to handle. To make matters worse, the pseudo core was likely to be deformed in the process, and fixing it would require to inject even more mana, adding even more stress on the material. Only then could Lith try to create the mana pathways necessary to stabilize the pseudo core. Too few and the mana would be dispersed, too many and the item would crumble. Creating a small pseudo core and mana pathways at the same time, instead, would allow Lith to pile up the mana inside its recipient one bit at a time. It would give him the opportunity to not exceed the limits of the chosen material and fix any errors he might make in the early steps. During the later stages, the main problem of this method was that any late mistake couldn't be fixed. Also, developing all of the mana pathways along with the pseudo core at the same time was very demanding in terms of mana and focus. Chapter 590 Lith had dubbed the two methods as Necroforge and Bloom Forge, respectively. The former followed the same pattern Lith used to create his lesser undead. Back in Xantia, his plan involved keeping a perfect blood core at the ready along with Trouble's corpse. An undead bailer was the perfect way to beat numbers with raw power, unfortunately, powerful corpses craved for the necromantic energies of a blood core and had no need for mana pathways, whereas inanimate objects rejected magic. The latter method was derived by Lith's studies on the growth of the pseudo cores of mana crystals and of the mana core of plants. Once again, the main difference was that inanimate objects had no core nor room for growth to begin with. Let's start with Necroforge. Lith said, with a bleeding wallet, Lith took two cyan mana crystals out of his pocket dimension. He couldn't use blue crystals for a mere test run, nor he could risk using weak green crystals and fail just because he was a cheapskate. He used invigoration to fill his body with mana, then he drew several runes in the air to perform the true magic version of bonding. It was a tier 5 forge master spell that was used to fuse together mana crystals and items before enchanting the latter. Once fused with inanimate objects, mana crystals would grant them a mana circulatory system, of which they were the literal beating heart, and an innate mana flow akin to a living being. Each rune produced a mana filament as thin as a hair that would go through both the hammer and the mana crystals, bringing them closer and closer at each passage until they became one. The three objects started to float in mid-air, orbiting around each other like triplet stars, Lith had performed this process countless times. Each one of the magical home appliances or toys he made was fueled by mana crystals. He would consume low-quality materials, make his family happy, and gain a lot of experience point three birds with one stone. Then, it was time to create the pseudo-core with Necro Forge. Even though Lith was a master at energy manipulation, shaping a complete core was something that only an Awakened could do. Cores looked like spheres of energy, but they were so much more. Thanks to necromancy, Lith had learned that a blood core defined how strongly undead would be, if it would retain any memory or conscience, and even the abilities they would be born with, creating a core, no matter if a pseudo or blood one, was akin to create a whole living being. The purpose of the hammer is to act as a temporary vessel for my mana. The problem of forge mastering is that the stronger the spell you want to infuse an item with is, the greater the amount of mana that you need to succeed, if the maximum amount of mana a forge master can handle is 100, their limit is a spell with a mana cost of 99. With this hammer, my limit might expand up to 150 while forge mastering enchanted items. It needs a simple but powerful pseudo core with the sole purpose of storing mana. Lith thought dot he shaped the pseudo core to resemble his own, but without all the complex patterns that linked it to his body. Thanks to invigoration, Lith could look at his own mana core anytime, whenever he spotted a mistake or an imperfection, he needed but a thought to correct it. Next came the hard part, even though Orichalcum seemed to accept the pseudo core as a thirsty man yearns for spring water, even with the mana vessels creating a complex system capable of evenly distributing the incoming energy mass, Lith felt the core distorting the moment it made contact with the hammer, the Orichalcum allowed magic to circulate almost freely, but the energy signature of the crystals rejected the foreign mana the pseudo core was made of. It was like transplanting an organ from a random donor and then beat the patient's body into submission to prevent graft rejection. Lith took things slow and easy. 
he made the pseudo core slowly enter the hammer to have the time to spot and correct any deformation as soon as they formed. At the same time, he flooded the hammer's mana vessels with his own mana. It reduced the resistance the core encountered by both weakening the opposing flow and improving the affinity the Oricalcum had for Lith's mana. The process required an enormous amount of energy that only an awakened using invigoration could afford. Once the core was at the center of the mana circulatory system, Lith created the mana pathways. With each pathway he completed, the two different kinds of mana started to freely flow into each other until they merged into a single entity. When the process was over, Lith was covered in sweat. I just want to take a bath and sleep. I used invigoration so much that my entire body aches. The silver lining is that the procedure succeeded. Lith said. Well, imagine how hard it would have been without me fueling the magic circle in your stead. This is just a prototype, so I wouldn't count my chickens before they hatch. Solus said. Why so negative? Everything went smoothly and now all we have to do is to use the Oricalcum hammer to forge master something to check its performances. I suppose we could do that. You always have a lot more time when you are single. Solus said while making the pocket watch float in front of Lith. 6.30 already? Why didn't you tell me earlier? Lith blurted out. We were in the middle of a six hours and a half experiment. I don't think you would have gracefully thanked me if I made you lose your focus. Lith had barely the time to imprint the hammer to check if it worked, take a quick bath to wash away the stench of sweat, sulfur, and all the smelly stuff he had used at the smithy before warping for his life to get at Camilla's home. Thank my paranoia for cleaning her apartment before leaving, and for storing all the dishes from our favorite restaurant in my pocket dimension before starting my experiments. Lith said to himself while he set the table and made all he could to not make it evident that he had just arrived. Even though he had used invigoration after the bath, he needed to use it again to stop panting. He was at his second breath worth of energy when he heard the key turning and the door opened, seven sharp. Camilla really is a military woman. I never thought the day would come where I would wish for my girlfriend not to be on time. Lith thought, Camilla looked at the dim lights and the steaming food on the table with a radiant smile. She put her military cap on the coat hanger in the hallway before asking to Lith, you are here, so you kept at least half of your promise. Did you risk your life today? He thought about it for a couple of seconds before answering. No. Worst case scenario I would have wasted a lot of money and materials. Then you kept your promise and made my day. Camilla put her arms around his neck before giving him a passionate kiss. Chapter 591. You're really sweet, but you didn't have to prepare so much stuff. We are going to have a big talk, not a romantic date. Camilla said she would have liked to take a shower and change her clothes, but Belius's arrays made it impossible to use dimensional magic. Once outside the pocket dimension, the food would get cold. Even if Lith could reheat the delicacies with magic, they would still lose part of their flavor. We haven't seen each other for so long that we could as well take it as a date. My past is ugly, a bit complicated, and with a sprinkle of mortal danger, but it's all in the past. You aren't going to break up with me, are you? Lith's paranoia got knocked into twelfth gear, making her laugh. Gods no. I would be a monster to do something like that after how I welcomed you back home this morning. It's just that I know a lot of bad things happened when you were at the academy. To be honest, I have a gloomy story to tell as well. Camilla sighed. Do you want to go first? Lith asked while pouring her one of Makosha's finest beers. No way. I've waited too long for this. You first. Lith told her about his early days at the White Griffin Academy and how he had unpleasantly met those who he now called friends. He was surprised to discover that once he removed the magical jargon, there wasn't much to tell. At least until he talked about Caduria's plague first and then Balkia's attack. Camilla wept when she learned about Protector's struggle against death to entrust his last words and love to Lith. She had to stop eating to hug Lith when he explained to her at what cost he had saved the life of his friend. Camilla still didn't like the idea that Ryman had endangered Lith's life so often, but after realizing how deep their bond was, she started to like him simply because of his love for Lith. Okay, that's enough for now. Camilla said after Lith finished to tell her about the fourth year. I've consumed a lot of tissues for Balkia already. If we get to Nalia, I don't think I would have the strength to continue our conversation. They had finished eating from a while, switching from beer to red wine. I really need to wash my face, but at this point, I might as well take a shower. I'll slip into something more comfortable while I'm at it. Go easy with the wine. I don't want to find you asleep when I get back. Camilla said. As she closed the bathroom door, Lith moved the dirty dishes in the kitchen, dimmed the lights, and shapeshifted the skinwalker from the uniform into the black suit they often used for their romantic roleplay. Then, he took the dessert out of the fridge. Gods, I really didn't miss this part. See you later. Solus grumbled while she cut their mind link and hid in a corner of her own mind. Unfortunately for Lith, Camilla did slip into something more comfortable. A loose shirt and pants she used when she was home alone. Even her hair was fixed in a makeshift bun. Pervert. I told you I had a sad story to tell. How could your mind go straight to sex? She wanted to sound angry, but she failed to repress her silvery laughter. Shower plus, something comfortable, equals sex. Math never failed me before. Lith said without even trying to hide his disappointment and making Camilla laugh harder. You're incorrigible. She sat on his lap, embracing him and giving him a short kiss before going back to her seat. Is it better now? Camilla asked. Can you at least keep your hair down? Lith turned up the lights. No. I want to make sure that you listen to my words instead of staring at my face. She chuckled. She actually needed quite a bit of willpower to prevent herself to skip the conversation and go straight to bed. Talking about Zinya was sad, painful, and somewhat embarrassing for Camilla. Not because of her sister's handicap, but because what she had to ask for him made her feel vulnerable. Also, Camilla knew how the request would sound to Lith's ears. Like an attempt to exploit him. No matter his answer, she knew that by simply speaking those words their relationship would change. She was afraid, because when things changed in her life, usually it was for the worse. It would be so easy to avoid the topic and pretend that nothing's wrong. These last weeks have been so hard, always thinking about how I can help Zinya in case she decides to divorce. Being overworked and lonely only made things worse. I missed him a lot and now that Lith is back, I only wish to cling to him and lose myself in his embrace. 
Yet it would mean running away from a problem I don't want to face, Xenia has already suffered for too long. If I keep not doing anything for her, now it wouldn't be because I'm helpless, but because I'm an egotistical coward. She thought, Camilla told Lith about Xenia, this time in detail. She explained to him her sister's current predicament as a prisoner in her own house, the cheating, the domestic abuse on her and the children, everything. Lith's eyes turned into fiery slits brimming with mana as Xenia's story resembled more and more his own. His earth father, Ezio McCoy, among his many flaws was also a cheater, back when Lith's name was still Derek, he had once found an email his father had sent to his lover, where he professed her love to her and her children. Lith had no idea why they had later broken up, but he never stopped resenting his father for giving his affection to someone else's kids while he treated so badly his own. His inner turmoil drew Solus's attention, who quickly returned fearing something really bad had happened, damn it, that was unexpected. She thought after checking Lith's most recent memories. There's no need to get angry. Camilla had no way to understand the rage in Lith's eyes. She misunderstood it as aimed at her for trying to exploit his magic with a sob story. Lith's reaction hurt Camilla deeply, and made her think that, if he believed her capable of such a thing, he must have had a low opinion of her. I'm not asking you to do it for free. I have enough money to cover even Manoha's fares. Her voice was calm but cold, like when she spoke to Lith as his handler instead of his girlfriend. Wait, what? I'm not angry at you. I'm angry at that F. Lith then demonstrated to have an extensive vocabulary and a venomous tongue. The streak of insults lasted for several seconds, the teaspoon in his hand was now reduced to a small ball of metal. The twisted metal was both a source of shock and relief for Camilla. Relief because it proved her the sincerity of his words and indignation, shock because she knew Lith was strong, but she had never witnessed how strong he actually was. As for the treatment, I can't make you any promises. Body sculpting is a very complex discipline and I didn't practice it ever since I quit my job as assistant professor. Worst case scenario, I'll find you an expert. Lith said. Chapter 592. Don't worry, both Xenia and I know a lot about it. Camilla held Lith's hand, moved by his words. Usually, healers had God complex. Hearing him admitting his own limits was proof of how seriously Lith was considering the matter. The real problem will be convincing her to get treated and how to deal with her husband. I can assure you the latter will not be an issue. Lith had a psycho killer smile that gave Camilla the creeps and forced Solus to step in, you are Lith Verhen now, not Derek McCoy. You have no known reason for a personal vendetta against that kind of man. You are scaring Camilla out of her wits. She thought, Lith snapped out of his bloody daydreams and noticed his girlfriend's distress. He took a deep breath and wore his best mask for the occasion. Sorry, I got carried away. Still, dealing with a dirtbag is easy, but if the patient doesn't want to be treated, there's nothing I can do. He said. Camilla sighed in relief. He was back to be the person she knew and loved. She even felt flattered for him taking her sister's situation personally. I know. That's why I want you two to meet. Maybe Xenia will change her mind if she knows that her healer doesn't think of her as just a number on his personal record. Are you free tomorrow morning? She asked. For you, I'm free the whole day. I wish. I'm in the middle of a bad case, I had to beg my supervisor just to get a few hours leave. Once we are done with Xenia, I have to rush back to work and we will not see each other before dinner. Camilla's shoulders slouched, she had long since dreamed of becoming a royal constable, yet between the training and the fieldwork, she was already missing her job as an army handler. The pay was average and the work repetitive, but at least it usually left her quite a bit of free time. Then go to bed, you need some rest. I'll join you as soon as I'm done with the kitchen and a long, cold shower. Lith said while plates and cutlery floated in midair to be cleaned by a mix of soap, water, and darkness magic. Thank you very much. You have no idea how much freeing my sister from that monster's clutches means to me. She said while hugging him tightly from behind, I know it all too well. Lith could feel his rage trying to manifest outside his mind, but he kept it at bay and said, there's no jury in the world that would convict me if I pounced on you now. It would be a clear case of self-defense. Pervert. Camilla chuckled as she gave him a goodnight kiss before disappearing in the bedroom. She really did feel very tired, but the worst thing was that things had already changed, whatever I do, I'm afraid that Lith might think that I'm bribing him with sex or sweet talk. Gods, I'm so happy he agreed to help us, yet I'm so scared about how things will turn out. Camilla's stomach was churning out of stress, meanwhile, Lith took a very cold shower to calm his nerves. The idea of facing a man who resembled his first father made his blood turn into magma. You did well not suggesting her to kill this full mug guy. I think it would have scared her to death. Remember that a lot of people have a problem with your switch personality. Solus thought before asking, why are you taking so long with the shower? To give Camilla the time to think and me an excuse to think she is already asleep. This is not how I pictured my first date with her after my return. This is damn awkward. Lith thought, Lith was regretting both his earlier attempt at seducing her and his stupid sex jokes, but back then he had no idea Xenia's situation was that bad. He thought it was just an unhappy marriage, tomorrow I'll need your help to not level the neighborhood, don't worry, we'll deal with this problem like we always do. Together. Solus thought. Asterisk, 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 the following day, city of Xylitalith and Camilla reached the Sata household in a matter of minutes after walking through the city warp gate. His flight spell brought them quickly to their destination. Xylita wasn't located in the Keller region nor the Distar Marquisit, so Lith had no authority as a ranger nor as a baron there. It was the reason he was wearing the deep green robe that identified him as a great mage. Power was something that even the most stupid people respected. You have no idea how much I'd like you to go full offer on them, but I can't afford to play hero. Whatever we do, it will be Xenia to pay the consequences. Camilla said after looking at Lith's stern face. He was wearing the same expression he had while fighting Thrud's meat puppets, and even though it was addressed against her, his bloodlust was almost tangible. Don't worry. I came here to visit a patient and kick ass. And I'm all out of patience. Lith replied, making her laugh. Camilla stepped forward and knocked on the door. It was her problem, so it was up to her to face it. Vilna, the housemaid and current mistress of the master of the house, was surprised seeing Camilla come back so soon. Her expression turned into a smug grin as she prepared to repeat to Camilla her master's words, then, she went pale and chopped on her rehearsed speech, leaving Camilla flabbergasted. I'm back to see Lady Sata. 
Camilla said while wondering why the housemaid stood there with both her eyes and mouth wide open. She had no way to know that a huge mass of spirit magic was slithering around the housemaid, making it hard for her even to breathe. The pure and unbridled killing intent it was imbued with made the experience utterly terrifying. Lith's eyes returned to normal when Camilla turned around to check on him. During that short moment of respite, Vilna's survival instinct took the wheel. Please, come in. Lady Sata is in the tea room, like always. She handed to Camilla her master key. Thanks. You don't need to accompany us. I know the way. Camilla walked double time, eager to check on her sister. Yet Lith remained behind, never averting his eyes from the maids even when the door suddenly closed behind him by itself. I usually don't prey on the weak. It's cruel and pointless since you have nothing I want. Yet if you stand in my path, if you do anything to harm those close to me, I will end you. Lith raised his hand slowly as if he was about to grab her throat, Vilna was paralyzed by fear, almost suffocating due to the mana that pressed on her from every side. Feel free to eavesdrop or call your master. Becoming a great mage means receiving a royal pardon. All I need is a good reason to use mine. Those words sent a hot liquid trickling along Vilna's legs. It wet her shoes before forming a stain on the carpet. Chapter 593. A royal pardon was a get out of jail free card for any crime non punishable by the death penalty. The crown granted a few of them every year to their most loyal servants for their outstanding results, and becoming a great mage was one of them. As Vilna realized the mortal danger she was in, tears filled her eyes, forcing her to blink. When she opened them again, Lith had disappeared as if she had been talking to a shadow the whole time. Please, be nice to her. Zinya went through a lot, and I think that bastard of Fulmug might have taken it out on her after my last visit. Let me do the talking. Camilla said, too worried to notice that she was alone. Don't worry. You lead and I'll follow. Lith blinked behind her. Thanks to his enhanced senses, he had no problems hearing her words from a distance. Camilla unlocked the door, hating that house more with each passing second. The tea room was exactly as she remembered it. A mix of order and hypocrisy, the white sofas and armchairs looked like they had never been used. The center of the hardwood table in the middle of the room had been carved out and replaced by a crystal slab. The vases decorating the room along with white cotton doilies were still there, yet all the flowers had disappeared. Zinia was sitting on the same chair she had used during Camilla's last visit. Her face was turned toward the sunlight coming from the glass-paneled east wall, as if she was looking at the sky. Zin, I'm back. Camilla said. Cammy, you shouldn't be here. The last time Fulmug was so enraged by how you strong-armed Vilna to enter the house that now he doesn't buy me flowers anymore. Why do you insist on making my life miserable? Zinia said, her voice was filled with sorrow and it cracked before she could finish her phrase. Don't say that, Zin. You have always been a terrible liar. What did he do to you? Camilla ran to her sister, hugging her. They both wept, bringing to Lith's mind the memories of when he and Carl did the same after one of them had suffered a heavy beating. Forgive me, Cammy. I didn't mean those things. I just want to hear my children again. Memory and reality overlapped as the ground trembled, for a moment, I hated her because she reminded me of my mother. Always whining about how giving birth ruined her life and blaming us for Ezio's behavior. When she accused Camilla, I thought she meant it, but she had just been instructed about what to say. He thought. He beats her leg so that even if they have guests, they can't notice the bruises. That's why she didn't stand up during your last visit. Lith said with a stone-cold voice as he turned around, Camilla noticed his gesture and lifted Zinia's gown up, revealing many black and blue spots shaped like a horsewhip. How did you know? She asked, her voice full of shock and fury. My brother, Orpal, would do the same thing to me when I was a child. Camilla lowered Zinia's gown, allowing Lith to get close to her. Zinia, this is Lith Verhen, my boyfriend. Lith this is Zinia, my sister. Nice to meet you. Do you mind if I heal you? Lith needed all the help Solus could give him to take the edge off his voice and not raise the house to the ground. The pleasure is all mine. As for the healing, please help me. Lith chanted a quick gibberish before placing his hand on Zinia's shoulder and using invigoration on her. All of her bruises and injuries disappeared. He found some poorly healed fractures and fixed them too while he checked her condition. You really are as good as Cami says. It's been ages since I had no difficulties breathing. The naive happiness she expressed while blurting out the gravity of the damages her ribcage had suffered, made Camilla go pale and Lith grit his teeth, this is wrong. No one should be happy just because they stopped suffering. That's not life. Lith thought. I have bad news, Camilla. Zinia's problem doesn't lie in her eyes. She completely lacks the optic nerve. The what? Both sisters asked. Most healers knew nothing about anatomy, let alone layman. It links the eyes to the brain. Without, it one cannot see. It's a big problem, like missing a whole arm. I hoped your sister's case would be simple, but for something like that, I need to consult an expert. I won't mess with Zinia's brain until I'm 100% sure I know what I'm doing. I never said I want to be treated. Zinia's voice was full of fear. Really? Do you want to stay here? With that man? Lith was angry, but Zinia wasn't afraid of him. His outrage wasn't cruel like that of her husband. It sounded more like a fellow victim who had yet to give up on hope. He took your children away from you, your legs, and your sister. How long will you allow him to feast on your soul? Nonetheless, his words hurt. Tears streamed down Zinia's face again and Camilla put herself between them. Zin, I know I'm asking a lot of you, but please, reconsider your decision. Lith went a little overboard, but he isn't completely wrong. Before you had no choice, whereas now I'm offering you one. We have waited for a long time, but things only got worse. Fulmug got worse, his violence always escalating. I've lived the past few years afraid to receive a call telling me that you died at his hand. If you can't find the strength to do it for yourself, do it for the kids and for me. Camilla said. I know you're right, Cami, but I'm too scared. What if Lith fails? Even worse, what if he succeeds? Zinia asked. We'll think about it when the time comes. Right now, all I need is your consent. I need to know that you are willing to fight this battle with us. Be honest with me, Cami. Is this world really worth fighting for? 
Or is Mogar just full of misery? I never understood how people like me can be born just to suffer whereas people like Fulmug are free to destroy everything they touch without, suffering any consequence. I'm too old and too tired to fight, Kami. It's not worth it. Xenia shook her head. Yes, Mogar is unfair. Every world is unfair. Lith said with a stone-cold voice. The only way to survive is to make life unfair to your advantage. If you don't fight for yourself, no one will. He placed his hands to the sides of Xenia's head, activating two tier 5 light magic spells, scanner and chisel. He used the tendrils of mana chisel created to connect the life force of her brain with that of her eyes, using mana as a temporary conduit. Xenia's pupils moved around the room as light and colors flooded her vision. Xin? said a beautiful woman in front of her. Xenia couldn't believe her own ears, the woman sounded like her sister. She raised her hands, touching the woman's face and recognizing her on the spot. Is that really you Kami? Xenia asked. Yes, Xin. It's me. I brought you your favorite flowers. Camilla took a bouquet of fresh silver wattles out of her dimensional amulet. Their vibrant scent filled her nose and their color was a marvel to her eyes. Chapter 594 Xenia started to cry again, but this time out of joy. She appreciated even her newfound vision turning blurry because of tears. Anything was better than the eternal night she had been trapped in. Xin, only you can decide if Mogar is worth fighting for. Even at your age, there are so many things you can still experience. There are so many things that I want to share with you. I won't force you to do anything, just know that no matter your choice, I'll always be by your side. Camilla said, Xenia turned her head to look at Lith's face. She didn't know much about magic, but she had guessed that the moment he would remove his hands from her head, she would lose her sight again. Your trick is quite a low blow. How can I say no after you showed me all this? After seeing the pain and anguish in Kami's face? Yet I'm grateful you did it. I've been stuck in this cage for so long that it had trapped even my mind. If you think you are likely to succeed, I'd be grateful to have you as my healer. You are the first man I've ever seen, so I have no idea if you are handsome or not. Yet the way Camilla describes you fits like a glove. You're terrifying and kind at the same time. Xenia said. I'll take that as a compliment. If there's one thing you have to learn is that in life there's no such thing as a low blow. Only victory and defeat. Prepare for my next trick. Lith conjured an ice mirror in front of Xenia, to allow her to watch at her reflection. Is this my face? She said. I'm so pale and thin. I must look terrible. Xenia moved her eyes from the mirror to Camilla, trying to make a comparison. Believe me, for someone in your situation, you look gorgeous. Camilla. Said. I just wish the children were here. I give everything to see them, even just once. Xenia sighed. First things first. Lith took a piece of paper out of his pocket dimension. This is the legal form that grants me the status of your personal healer. I'm aware you are illiterate, so you can just draw an X where Camilla points you to. Then, we'll need three witnesses. Cammy? Camilla ran out of the room with a huge smile on her face, I can't believe Zin accepted to get treated so fast, nor that Lith would bring a legal document that grants him the authority to protect her. This is all too good to be true. She thought while knocking to the neighbor's doors. It took her less than a minute to come back with two men and one woman. They all signed the document and then Camilla showed Zinia how an X was shaped. Just a few words before you leave. Lith said while never leaving Zinia's side. If you think even for one second to go back on your word and deny to have signed the document, remember this. The moment you do that, you'll become my enemies and I'll treat you as such. If anything happens to Lady Sata, I'll hold you responsible for it in front of the law and the mage association. His voice was calm, yet the three started to shake uncontrollably. Lith wasn't using killing intent to not scare Camilla, but his gaze was more than enough to scare normal humans to death. There was no warmth in them, just a silent promise of pain. They nodded and gave him a deep bow, their heads almost touching the floor before rushing out of the door. I'm sorry, but I can't keep the spell up any longer without the risk of hurting you. Your body can't handle so much mana at once. Lith said, waiting for Xenia to nod before he interrupted his spells, since everything had been settled in a matter of minutes, they had the time to enjoy tea with some pastries together. Camilla loved seeing her sister's real smile, instead of the fake one she had worn during her last visit. Seeing Zin eat and talk so much filled her heart with happiness. All of her questions about their personal life, especially as a couple, not so much, oh, gods. I've never introduced one of my boyfriends to her before. This is so embarrassing. She thought while Lith dodged a question about having children. When they left, Camilla was still on cloud nine. There were so many things that she wanted to tell Lith, but there was no time. He had to walk them to the city's warp gate to not make her arrive late at work. I'll see you tonight. She said with a radiant smile before leaving, Lith called the greatest expert of body sculpting he knew, Professor Zogar Vasta. What a pleasant surprise, Lith. What can I do for you? Vasta replied immediately, as always. Unlike Manoha, he often did freelance jobs and unlike Manoha, he was reliable. Lith has learned everything he knew about body sculpting from him and he had seen Vasta perform miracles with that spell. Lith explained to him the situation and requested his help. I would be glad to help, but you caught me in a bad moment. The academy is about to open and I'm swamped preparing my lessons and filling old paperwork. Can you wait for a couple of days? I should be free by then. Vasta said. Yes, of course. Thanks for your help, Professor. I'd like to show you the patient status. I think it might help you understand her problem. Lith placed his amulet on a table and started to focus. He conjured a real size hologram of Xenia's head, peeling off one layer at a time until only the eyes, the brain, and the skull remained. Good gods. That's almost as good as visiting the patient in person. Almost. Vasta said while recording everything to look at it later in detail. It's a difficult case indeed, but it's treatable. I'll send you all the reading material my assistants can find. The rest I'll explain to you in person. Vasta hung the call, Lith informed Camilla, and then went back to Lucia, I've done all I could for Zinya. I've even alerted the local authorities of her situation and added her to my patient list at the Mage Association. 
I have a lot of free time until evening, time to try Bloom Forge out. He thought, Zekel was still smelting the first batch of orichalcum, so there wasn't much else Lith could do. He wanted to put to the test both the forge mastering techniques he had created before working on the new skinwalker armor. One of them is bound to be better than the other. Another thing I could do is a replica of Orion's cloaking ring. That way Solus and I could move separate ways when necessary without anyone noticing her, excellent idea. Yet isn't an orichalcum ring wasted for a single spell? She asked, no, if it allows us to make a better and more powerful ring that completely hides your life force. Safety is priceless, once they got back inside the tower, Lyft took out the second hammer and performed the bonding spell to fuse it with two cyan magic crystals. Only when the mana circulatory systems of the hammer had stabilized did the real forge mastering begin. Chapter 595. Bloom Forge was the polar opposite of Necro Forge, instead of creating a perfect pseudo-core from the start and merge it with its host, Lyft would create a small pseudo-core, and the mana pathways necessary to prevent it from dissipating at the same time directly inside the hammer. It was supposed to require less focus and mana compared to Necro Forge. The mana pathways would allow Lyft's energy to mix with that of the mana crystals during the forge mastering process. It would reduce the resistance that the pseudo core experienced when interacting with the mana vessels, and by starting small, all mistakes Lyft might make could be tweaked as he shaped the core. Bloom Forge was far from perfect, even in theory, Lyft had already predicted that the more the forge mastering process progressed, the more difficult things would become. Neither the pseudo core nor the mana pathways could exceed their ideal form. Bloom Forge had a threshold past which any mistake would mean an unredeemable failure. Necro Forge difficulty peaked at the very beginning of the forge mastering process, when Lyft was at his prime, and decreased as the pseudo core merged with the item. Bloom Forge, instead, would start easy and become harder with every next step. The second issue was that taking care of the pseudo core and the mana pathways at the same time would require a lot of focus from Lyft. Since he would only grow more tired with time, he would face the most delicate steps while he was at his weakest. Are you ready, Solus? Lyft asked. Ready. Commencing to power up the mana circle. The space around their forge was surrounded by a blue pillar of light. It was made of the world energy Solus extracted from the mana geyser below them. Lyft positioned the orichalcum Welmut hammer on the center of the obsidian table that was his mana forge, and then placed his open hands at the sides of the hammer's shaft, so that his palms touched a mana crystal each. He used true forge mastering to create a pseudo core the size of a pinhole, and several mana pathways as thin as hair. At the same time, he activated invigoration to check the development of his experiment and be able to look at his own mana core, using it as a blueprint, so far it's much easier than I expected and better than Necro Forge. Lyft thought, I just need to take things nice and easy. The core has already started to exchange mana with the crystals, making it easy to expand, by simply taking his time, Lyft discovered that developing the core was the easy part. As its energy grew, so did its affinity toward the hammer. The process required a steady flow of mana, but it would not encounter any resistance, giving the core the right shape was quite difficult, instead. The lack of resistance made so that the slightest slip of the mana would create a bump or a cavity, making the pseudo-core defective. To make matters worse, if he developed the mana pathways too slowly, the core energy would disperse. If he developed them too fast, the mana coming from the crystals would flood the core and deform it. Lith used his knowledge of mana cores to find a workaround. He would treat the pseudo-core as a developing mana core and the mana pathways as its host body. He would first grow the core until it gave signs of instability, then, he would strengthen and enlarge the pathways until the pressure they exerted almost compressed the pseudo-core. At that point, he would focus again on the pseudo-core again, rinse and repeat, Bloom Forge is even slower than Necro Forge, but it allows me to enhance the power of single enchantments better. Necro Forge, instead, is limited by the massive resistance it encounters during the early steps, but by shaping a complete pseudo-core from outside, it allows me to harmonize multiple enchantments. Lith thought, it seems is quality versus quantity. Solus pondered, for now, yes. Consider that so far, we only created one of the simplest pseudo-cores for the hammers. We have yet to see how the hammer itself changes the rules of the game, when even the second hammer was ready, Lith was once again covered in sweat and tired for the repeated use of invigoration. The only reason he was still able to stand was thanks to his bond with Solus. The mana geyser empowering her would also send energy coursing through his body and grant him uncanny recovery abilities. He was still hungry, though. Damn, I skipped lunch. It's a good thing that yesterday I had a full night's sleep, otherwise my experiment would have failed. Lith said he took a quick shower before consuming a full course meal and napping for an hour. Before using either of the hammers, he needed to rest enough to let invigoration bring him back to his peak condition. Ever since Lith had refined the blue core, he would absorb world energy through his nose and skin with every breath, like a much slower version of invigoration that didn't lower his max energy cap. Also, as long as he was inside the tower, the effects of the mana geyser would make him both physically and magically stronger. The two combined effect made so that even a single hour of sleep would greatly rejuvenate his body. Solus spent that hour weighing and caressing the hammers. They were quite ugly, yet everything about them was oddly familiar to her. Lith had already imprinted them with his mana, but she could use them because their bond made their energy signatures almost identical. By my maker, I wish there was something, anything, I could forge master. She sighed. Unfortunately, with a deep green mana core I'm too weak. I can manipulate the energies of the tower and those from the geyser, but they are not my own. I want to infuse my essence, using anything else would be pointless. She took the adamant forge out of her pocket dimension, hitting it with the orichalcum hammer in frustration. The silvery sound they emitted scratched at the wall in the back of her head, the source of her recently found memories, she froze, staring blankly into space. Then, she hit the forge again as the echoes of the impact caused her body to shiver and purple flames to fill her mind. Another hit made her remember something dot a delicate hand inside a black glove, holding a much better looking silvery hammer with its surface covered in runes of power. There was something she was working on, but it was blurred behind recognition. Something silvery as well laid between the hammer and the blurred object. Purple flames danced inside a furnace, but Solus couldn't distinguish any of its features. 
The furnace was too far, and it became more distant by the second until she snapped out of her reverie. Solus hit the forger multiple times, but the memory was lost once again, and no matter how many tears she shed or how much effort she put into hammering, nothing could bring it back. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. When Lith woke up, he was still very tired, but now invigoration had recovered part of its effectiveness. He found Solus to be quite dispirited despite their earlier success. Is everything all right, Solus? He asked. No. Do you want to talk about it? Not now, thanks. Lith decided to not pry further. After reassuring Alina he had missed lunch only because he had been engrossed with his work, he went to Zekel's blacksmith. Chapter 596. How nice of you. It's your second day leave and I haven't seen you except for collecting your packages and eating. Will it kill you to spend a few hours with us? Do I have to invite Camilla to have you grace us with your presence? Alina wasn't happy with his timetable and had no qualms rebuking him, now I understand why some mags become leeches. How am I supposed to spend time with my family, practice magic, help my girlfriend, and continue my research all at the same time? Lith thought, it's impossible. To achieve something, you have to sacrifice something else in return. Solus said, you can always ditch your duty as a ranger and your loved ones. You just have to content yourself in becoming like Zolgrish, who has nothing but his work and a demented assistant. Just the thought of it made Lith shiver. He was still fighting to keep his sanity and he knew that Solus's had been slipping for years. If he forced her to stay away from any form of human interaction, Lith knew that sooner or later she would snap. He walked to Lucia instead of warping, to take a minute for themselves and appreciate the scenery. Winter in Lucia was about to end, but snow still covered fields and trees. There was no one around, giving Mogar a peaceful appearance. When he reached Zekel's workshop, the blacksmith looked really tired. I'm sorry, Lith, but even with sentence help this work is huge. Smelting the orichalcum is the easy part, same for the hammers since I can directly pour the molten metal into the mold. The problem is the chainmail set. I've never worked on something so tough and I need time to get used to it. I can either work on the chainmail or on the smelting, not both. Zekel had bags under his eyes and a raggedy breath. Can Sentun take care of the smelting while you create the chainmails? Lith asked. Yes, of course. I thought you wanted me to do it. Zekel knew that Lith only wanted perfection. Sentun had worked with him for over a decade, but the skill gap between them was still huge. It's fine. Even I can do it, so I doubt someone like him will make any mistake. How many chainmails are ready? Lith asked. Four, but their design is terrible. I'm ashamed of how bad they look, but I couldn't do better with so little time. Zekel lowered his eyes in embarrassment. You are dead tired and four are plenty. Take the day off, I have 18 days leave left. I have all that I need for my experiments and I prefer perfect materials for my real crafts. I want you at your best. Have Sentun keep smelting, I have no idea how many times I will fail. Lith gave Zekel another crate and a few silver coins for his troubles. The blacksmith's eyes shined like stars, his body was full of energy again. No seriously. Take a rest. Lith placed his hand over Zekel's shoulder to check on his condition with invigoration. The blacksmith was on the verge of collapsing, Zekel nodded with a big yawn. A sprinkle of light magic had relaxed his muscles and burned the last shreds of stamina he had. Zekel was in for a long power nap. Lith took four horrible chainmail that looked like they had been made by a child assembling spare keychains, and stored them inside his pocket dimension, you. He thought, enough is enough. We have to think about the design too. Solus was outraged. Her pride as a craftsman was horrified at the idea to work on something like that. Lith was about to reply when his communication amulet drew his attention. What is it now? This is the busiest leave ever. He groaned noticing that it was Quilla's room. Lith how could you do that to me? Her hologram looked quite pissed off. Do what? It seems I'm pissing off a lot of people these days so I need you to be more specific. Don't get smart ass with me. Vasta told me everything since I'm his assistant. Why didn't you call me for help? You know I majored in body sculpting and I'm working my ass in the field. Quilla said. You are really cute when you're angry. Lith's reply managed to make her turn beet red from a mix of embarrassment and rage. Jokes aside, the case is complicated. I believe in your skills, Quilla. You know I always considered you a genius, but I need the help of an expert. No matter how good you are, you have graduated a year later than me. You have less than two years of practice. Even if you healed one person per day until now, you would be nowhere near vastest level of skill and experience. Messing with a person's brain is a serious matter and you know it. Quilla took a deep breath. As a friend, she felt insulted, but as a healer, she could only agree with him. Point taken, but after spending a week with Freya, how could you not even give me a call for a consult? I've seen you for just one day for almost two years. I miss my best friend. Her last words struck at Lith's conscience, making him feel guilty. He also considered once again becoming a lick. I'm sorry. Do you want to join the team? With your talent, you could spot any issue vaster, or I could miss. Maybe even find an easier way to treat Zinya. I'd be honored to. Her anger disappeared like a snowball thrown into the sun. By the way, you absolutely have to teach me how to create holograms. The level of detail in the patient's model was astounding. There was a bit too much enthusiasm in her voice, making even Solus wonder if she missed more Lith or his teachings. How is it going with Anathor? Lith promptly changed the topic. Oh gods, you remembered. Very well. He finally mustered the courage to meet my parents. I was starting to think he was just playing with my feelings, but it turns out he was just scared. He almost fainted facing dad's gaze. She chuckled. Glad to hear that, but don't lower your guard. He might still be a jerk. You deserve someone who treats you right, otherwise you'll end up with a jerk like my current patient. Lith walked back to Tron before telling her about Zinnia's background. Poor woman. Her situation couldn't be any worse. Between her husband and her condition, it's hard to tell which one is worse. She said. Any ideas? Well, I read a lot of papers and I agree with your evaluation. Her case is as bad as she was missing part of her spine. 
What makes this case difficult is that the problem doesn't lie in a malfunctioning part of her body, but in a complete lack of it. Creating an optic nerve is very dangerous. Things can go wrong when you create it and also when you link it to her life force. Both times you have to manipulate her brain. The slightest mistake could affect her personality, her memories, everything. Asking Vasta for help was the best thing you could do. I'm forwarding you all the papers on similar procedures I found. Watching at the double digits appearing on his communication amulet, Lith was glad to have such a dear friend. Quilla had done a thorough job, giving him everything he needed. He also was once again glad of having Solaspedia. He only needed to write all that stuff down with water magic to save himself two days worth of reading. Chapter 597. Lith and Solas needed only a few minutes to put on paper all the information Quilla had sent them. After that, Solaspedia did the rest. Once something was stored inside of it, they knew its content by heart, as if they had an eidetic memory. Lith and Solas discussed together all the possible approaches to give Xenia sight, taking into account the degree of risk, success rate each procedure involved, even though none of those who have the fewest failures have shared their spells, they all described in detail how they work. Thanks to true magic, we can follow their lead and even combine their techniques together. Lith thought, they spent a few hours using holograms to simulate the procedure. Lith created a replica of his own optic nerve while Solas would tweak and twist the hologram at random, to cause complications he had to deal with on the spot. All the while he actually used scanner on both himself and Solas while using chisel on the hologram. Triple casting tier 5 spells while keeping the hologram active proved to be quite tiring. Damn it, this is hard. I made over 30 attempts, succeed 12 times, partially succeeded 5 times, failed 11 times, and killed Xenia at least 4 times. Lith said. Calm down. This is the first time we deal with such a complex case. You got too used to true magic making healing the impossible possible. Don't forget that you are working non-stop since you returned home. Follow your own advice and take the day off. Tomorrow we'll practice the procedure until we are satisfied with the results. Now it's too late and you are too tired. There are less than two hours before you have to be at Camilla's place. Solace's wisp rubbed against his shoulder, spreading her mana around him in a warm embrace. I think you are right. Lith replied. I'll take the day off as soon as I'm done with the skinwalker. He walked inside his forge mastering lab, taking the Wellmet hammer and the keychain mail out of his pocket dimension. He placed them over his obsidian forge, while Solace demonstrated an outstanding creativity in mixing English and common language insults to express her feelings about Lith's stubbornness. First, he used invigoration to go back to what was now his peak condition. With just an hour nap and after practicing the medical procedure many times, invigoration wouldn't last for long. Necro or Bloom Forge? Lith asked. Neither. Go to sleep, damn it. Necro it is. Lith said, making her emit a loud and unladylike groan. Lith had acquired the blueprints for the Skinwalker armor when the crown had elevated him to the status of Great Mage. They had even provided him with all the ingredients needed to make a new one. Yet only now that he also had the Oracalcum, at hand he had the opportunity to improve its properties. Tista had already received her own as a reward for her services in offer, whereas the rest of the family had no need for it. Not after Lith had given them all of his Skinwalker prototypes and Forge Mastered for the magical protections in the form of rings, bracelets, or necklaces. Whenever people ask me why I joined the army, I always have to spew a bunch of lies about how much I love the kingdom. The truth is that it's much better than the alternative. I get to rake merits, rewards and get paid for it. To obtain ingredients, I would be forced to travel Mogar with my own money and risk my life. Not to mention the necessity of doing missions for the association to obtain the blueprints. This way, all expenses are covered and I get everything I need delivered to my door. Every time I solve a mission, the army rewards me with ingredients according to its difficulty. Sure, usually they are not as precious as Oracalcum, but it would still be hard and expensive to get them on my own. Lith said while taking the ingredients for the Skinwalker out. It required the skin of a polymorphic monster species known as Skinwalker, hence its name. It also needed a bit of slime goop as a stabilizer, powdered petals of magma flower as a power core, and a Thunderbird's plume to boost the base material's defensive properties. Thunderbirds had sturdy feathers as hard as iron, and their affinity to lightning granted them a natural electromagnetic field capable of weakening most attacks. The last ingredient to Forge Master a Skinwalker armor was the pseudo core of a dimensional storage item that would be merged with those generated by the rest of. The ingredients, first, Lith used the bonding spell to fuse a blue mana crystal with the keychain mail, then, Solas powered up the forge mastering circle as Lith refined the ingredients one by one. The skin, the powder, and the feather were all flooded by his mana. It revived and amplified their magical nature while destroying their physical vessels, they produced a rainbow-colored, a red, and a yellow pseudo-core respectively. After Lith was certain that all the residual magical energy had been extracted from the ingredients, and assimilated by the pseudo-cores, he generated the last one. A skinwalker armor required a dimensional subspace to store the clothes that it would reproduce. Lith had forge mastered countless dimensional items over the years, so he threw the dimensional core just a glance to make sure it was perfect. Lith raised his arms, bringing the four pseudo cores close to each other, until they started to emit sparks. At that point, he refined the slime goop. Slimes were incredible creatures, with amazing vitality and capable of adapting to any environment. The goop didn't produce another core, but a fine mist that filled the forge mastering circle. The mist harmonized the different energies of the pseudo cores, allowing Lith to merge them into one. Then, keychain mail and the pseudo core started to orbit around each other, the oracalcum started to resonate with the mystical energy, making the pseudo core grow in size and power, fuck me sideways. That never happened before. It must be due to the interaction between the Oricalcum's artificial mana flow and the Thunderbird's amplification field. Lith thought that he stimulated his own mana core, boosting its energies until his body started to ache from mana overloading. Solus called upon the energies of the mana geezer, filling the necro hammer with mana to allow Lith to exceed his limits. The armor rejected the pseudo core until Lith struck the forge mastering circle with the hammer, producing a silvery sound. It released a deep blue burst of light that was captured by the circle and channeled into the ongoing spell. Lith's mana and willpower pushed the pseudo core inside the keychain mail, allowing it to overcome the resistance the mana coming from the blue produced. 
As soon as Lif was overcharged again, he hit the circle a second time, generating another burst of light. With each strike, the merging process became easier and faster. Damn it, I think we messed up. We created a pseudo core just as strong as the one in the hammer, but this time it's much more complex. I cannot regenerate it and continue the merging at the same time. Lith thought Solus stepped in to help him, but between keeping the hammer charged and powering the circle, her focus was already spent. They fought against the odds for half an hour before the pseudo core collapsed and the blue mana crystal shattered. Chapter 598. I can't believe it. I've worked on the armor for less than an hour and I'm way more tired than after we crafted the hammer. Lith said while checking his pocket watch. It's perfectly normal. The hammer required a single core, whereas this time you fused four cores of the same power together. Solus said. Handling that kind of energy for an hour while repairing any deformation the clash between five different kinds of mana induced is much more difficult than working six hours and a half on a single core. By the way, I'm beat too. I need time to recuperate. Solus wheezed, Lith had never heard of a tower being out of breath, but he could feel the energy in the tower being somewhat diminished. We'll continue tomorrow. Lith said. What about Xenia's procedure? Fine. The day after tomorrow. You have an appointment with Vasta scheduled for that day. Solus said, making Lith erupt in a streak of swear words, Lith went inside the bathroom for a long bath. He had over an hour of time and planned to make it count. He arrived at Camilla's early, using the time before she returned home to run simulations with Solus to understand how to compensate for the unexpected. Complication, the boost the final pseudo core receives from the Oracalcum makes it impossible for us to succeed. What if we lower the output of 30%? Lith thought, it would be enough if we were using a single core. There's four of them, so you have to take into account the energy necessary to keep them both merged and in the correct shape. I'd start with 50%. It leaves you enough mana in case another unexpected complication arises, 50%. It's a waste of blue crystals, Oracalcum, and ingredients. Lith rebuked, yeah, but so is another failure. 50% is a reasonable amount and allows us to test the waters. If we succeed, at least we'll have a starting point, whereas another failure would teach us nothing. Lith was pondering Solus's words so hard that he completely missed Camilla's arrival. Seeing him brooding with a dejected look threw her into a panic. Lith are you alright? It's everything okay with your family? Knowing his talent at risking his life at least once a day, she was worried he could be hurt. She touched his shoulder, chest, and arm searching for injuries. I'm fine and so is my family, don't worry. His answer only made her worry more since he kept staring blankly. Light magic could heal any kind of wound, but not those to his wallet. Lith was almost grieving for his most recent failure. Is it for Zinya? Is her situation so bad? Did Formug beat her or something? She shook him, to force Lith looking her in the eyes while answering. No, no, and no. He checked his communication amulet, just to be safe. Then what's the matter? Speak to me, please, she asked, seeing how worried she was for him, almost on the verge of tears, made Lith feel like a jerk. I can't tell her I'm grieving for a failed experiment. She would think I'm a self-centered, stingy, idiot. Solus, analysis. He thought, if you ever plan to reveal to her at least as much as you did with Floria, you can't hide your flaws. Just be honest with her. Besides, she already knows about the stinginess and you're not very self-centered. She giggled, Lyft told her the truth. She waited patiently until he finished expressing his gripes before saying, idiot. You made me worry for nothing. All according to Kakaku. Solus thought. I'm really sorry about your materials, but the important thing is that nothing happened to you. She sat on Lyft's lap, putting her arms around his neck before giving him a soft kiss. Lyft returned her embrace and his arms ran along Camilla's hair and hips, making her arch her back in pleasure. They started to kiss with growing passion, forgetting all about their daily worries as electricity seemed to course through their skin every time they touched. Is it better now? She said. Her voice was a soft moan, making his morale raise among other things. Very much. I'm too tired to cook and I assumed it would be the same for you, so I reserved a table for us at the Valorian. We need to hurry, otherwise we'll get late. She said while standing up, she noticed his disappointed expression and quickly added, it's barely 7pm, silly. We have all evening and night. We didn't have a date in weeks and I really miss your company. Would you have dinner with me? My treat, so you'll forget about your financial losses. She chuckled. I'm okay going out for dinner, but not with you paying the bill. Lith replied and his stomach grumbled in approval. Even if it had been a failure, the forge mastering experiment had drained his energy. It's my treat, to apologize for giving you a scare. Also, it's not like saving a few copper coins can hurt after having already lost around 20 gold coins. That without taking the oracalcum into account, since it has no market price. His words made Camilla choke on her laugh. 20 gold coins was more than Manoha would ask to treat Xenia's blindness. A single gold coin was worth a hundred silver coins. Even a constable was paid in silver, the amount Lith described was enough to buy a house. That much? Suddenly his gloomy disposition was much more relatable. Yes, but I'm likely to waste more. One has to fail a lot before succeeding. He sighed, the food was nice and the wine excellent. Lyft told Camilla about Alina's gripes on his work schedule and her intentions of kidnapping her if he didn't spend more time with his family. Tell her that I'm a-okay with that. She just has to knock out my boss and I'm all hers. Camilla said, between the cheery mood and Camilla's soothing presence, Lyft was finally able to relax after weeks of unrelenting work, fight, or training. His body felt light and the anxiety that had been clouding his mind during the last two days disappeared. Man, I'm so glad we got out for dinner. I really needed a break. Lyft thought, yeah, I wonder where I heard those same exact words before. Oh yeah, it was me. You just didn't listen, like usual. Solus was pissed off, yet she took note of all the ideas that were popping in Lyft's now clear mind. I'm sorry to ruin the mood, but I have to tell you. Camilla said. What you did today for Zinya was amazing. I brought you with me because I wanted you to reassure her, but you did so much more. You gave my sister hope and even allowed her to see me for the first time. I can't thank you enough for that. I've never thought I'd see Zinya so happy, it meant the world for me. 
you're not ruining anything. When my sister was ill, I felt the same as you do. Liv said, giving her the strength to ask the question that had tormented her since yesterday. Is it everything all right between us? Camilla asked. What do you mean? Liv had no idea what she was talking about. Chapter 599. I know how things must seem to you. That I dated you only to get a freebie for my sister. I never meant to hide how bad her situation is from you, it's just that it's not something I like to talk about. I wouldn't have even bothered you with it if you weren't the best healer I know and now that I'm a field assistant constable, I can afford the treatment. I can pay you, so nothing has to change between us. I'm not trying to exploit you. Camilla said. Gods, my paranoia is really rubbing off on you. I never thought anything like that. I too hid a lot of things from you. I know all too well how difficult it is to speak about a painful past. Only those who want to garner pity from others would speak of such things on a first date. I'm glad that you asked for my help, because it means you trust me enough to share your burden with me. I'm even more glad to hear about all the silly thoughts running through your head, because it means you are not taking me for granted. Liv gently caressed her hand, I wish I was that strong. I have yet to tell her about my hybrid nature. I can't tell her about awakening and true magic, but if things get really serious, I can't make the same mistakes Protector did. He thought. Thanks. Camilla sighed in relief, feeling her worries fading. The thought that you might be doubting about my feelings was eating at me since yesterday. To be honest, it's the reason I avoided to, you know. She said while the waitress brought them desserts, the conversation moved again to their respective day's work and silly anecdotes about their lives. When they went to Camilla's apartment, Lith was happy, relaxed, and most of all, sleepy. I had too much wine. I'll go take a quick shower to clear my head and I'll join you as soon as I slip into something more comfortable. Camilla said, tomorrow I have a full day and today I've used invigoration so much that all my body aches. With a full stomach and considering how tired I am, I'd better avoid making advances, besides, things with Camilla will be awkward for a while, at least until we solve Xenia's problem. Heck, I'm too tired even for theory crafting magic. He thought as the skinwalker shapeshifted into his pajama. Lith checked with life vision that nothing was out of order and that there was no unknown magical item before being able to relax. He fell asleep the moment his head touched the pillow. It didn't last long, though. A sudden flash of light and a mildly amused voice woke him up after what seemed a second. What are you doing? There was a tinge of annoyance in Camilla's voice. Isn't it obvious? I was sleeping. Lith shielded his eyes from the cruel light with a hand. After how you kissed me when I returned home. After what I said earlier. What happened to your math skills? She was tapping her foot, her hands on her hips. What do you, good gods? Lith's mind recalled her earlier words as his vision returned to normal. Camilla was standing in front of the door wearing only red lace lingerie. It made wonders emphasizing her pale skin and soft curves, during his time as assistant professor at the academy, Lith had used the white griffin network to patent the underwear he had plagiarized from Earth. It hadn't been the success he had hoped for, except for the women underwear, of course. Lith had gifted Camilla a few for their amorous plays and she was now wearing his favorite one. But yesterday you said, yesterday we had to talk, silly. She crawled on the bed on all four with deliberately slow, sensual movements, showing miles of cleavage. Didn't you miss me? Even one bit? She said before giving him a peck that tasted like heaven. Lith turned off the lights with a snap of his fingers before taking her into his arms. They started to kiss while feeling each other's body. Lith took his time to appreciate the feeling of the lace covering her skin before removing it slowly, one bit at a time, thanks, math. I knew you wouldn't relinquish me. Asterisk 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 the next morning, after they had breakfast together and Camilla left home, Lith went back to Lucia. He took Belius's warp gate to leave a trace of his movements and then used Solus's tower warp to reach his destination and sleep. Camilla was fine because he had shared with her a bit of his life force, but they had slept too little and Invigoration's effects had yet to reset. For hours later, Lith was back at his full force and practiced Xenia's procedure until it was lunchtime. His parents were very happy to have him with them for a while, even more when he chose to stay a bit longer after lunch. Lith told them about his latest mission everything that wasn't a state secret. I'm glad to hear that Freya is doing well. Alina said. Yeah, too bad that girl is a workaholic just like you. You didn't see each other since Journey's birthday and yet you spend the entire time practicing magic. You need to relax, son. Ra said. It's what I'm doing now, right? Lith used spirit magic to play with Aaron, moving some of his toy soldiers and engaging him in a fierce battle. Why did you pick the beanpole instead of Aunt Freya? She's a babe. Aaron said with a pensive tone. Some words made little sense to him, so he had a hard time remembering them, Raz. Dad. Alina and Lith said in unison. The only way Aaron could say such things was by hearing those words from someone else and often at that. Guilty as charged. Raz showed his hands, surrendering. I'm sorry, but I never understood how you pick your girlfriends. Even when you two just met, Floria was already very tall. Taller than me and even than you. Also, she's two. Raz was almost too embarrassed to finish the sentence. Strong? Lith asked. He knew that his father was still shocked after losing to her in many strength contests. As far as Raz knew, Floria was stronger than Lith as well. Yes. A woman shouldn't be so intimidating. Now you have Camilla, she's lovely sure, but she's, old. Alina's voice was so cold that it made the temperature in the room plummet, if Camilla is old, then what am I? She thought. Uh. Older than Lith, dear. Whereas Freya is about the right age, height, and is a wonderful woman. A father has all the right to worry about his eldest son. Ra said, his voice became low and sour. Eldest son? What about Tryon? Lith didn't miss either Ra's tone nor Alina turning pale. Dear, I told you it had to wait. She said. Sorry, honey. I didn't mean to. He sighed. Your brother came here a few days before Journey's birthday, when only your mother, Aaron, and I were at home. Things didn't go well. Our reunion started badly and things escalated quickly. Long story short, he disowned us and is no longer a member of our family. Chapter 600 
Tryon had never forgotten his promise to Lith, mostly because he was afraid that his brother would barge in his base and humiliate him again. It still took him months to find the strength to go back home. He loved his parents with all his heart, and that was the reason seeing them was much harder than continue to avoid the unresolved issues he had with his family. Tryon had thought for a long time about Orpal's fate before realizing that by endangering their baby brother's life he had crossed the line. Thanks to the life in the army and the camaraderie with his peers, Tryon had realized that what he had with his older brother was a sick relationship. Orpal always ordered him around and they rarely argued simply, because Tryon obeyed to him. He didn't resent his parents anymore for disowning his beloved older brother, yet the more he thought about it, the less home felt like a home. His parents had never loved him any less than Lith, but he was tired of being always compared to his little brother. Tired of being painfully often referred to as Lith's brother rather than with his name, the army gave him a place where he could be himself, where the shadow of his brother couldn't reach him anymore. That was the reason he had never returned home. Even if Lith was always at the academy, his presence had tainted the whole LUTIA.I in her letters. After asking Tryon to reply to her and let her know he was all right, Alina would always mention how the village had expanded, how their house was being renovated. Until the house he remembered was no more, things became even worse for Tryon each time Lith made a name for himself. The plague in Candria, single handedly facing a Vela, becoming a top ranker, they were all events that reached every corner of the Griffin Kingdom, barracks included. Every time Tryon heard people praising Lith for his achievements, despite him being a nameless commoner, he couldn't help but be jealous. If there's one thing Orpal was right about is how unfair it is that no one cares about our hard work. No one praises me for my efforts, nor anyone cares for how well I'm doing in the army. Lith only has to move his hands while spouting bullshit and everyone blows smoke up his ass. He would often think. When Lith received a family name from the king himself, Tryon learned about it the worst possible way. A lieutenant asked him if he wanted to take the Verhen name in front of the whole mess hall, suddenly Tryon was no more, and in the blink of an eye his name became Lith's brother, Verhen. Tryon had to ask to be relocated and by a family name, Proudstar, to avoid being associated with the Verhen again. He regretted what he did to Floria, but no matter how deep he buried his hatred, it was always there, smouldering. Any mention of his brother's name, no matter the reason, was enough to rekindle it into a blazing fire again. When Tryon returned home, it was exactly as he feared. The house was unrecognizable and so was the village. Most of the farmhands had no idea who he was and those who did spit on the ground at his passage. If you were my son and you made my Lisa cry as much as Alina did for you, I'd kick your ass back to where you came from. Broman said, eager to tell about Tryon past to whoever asked him who that sergeant was. Tryon had yet to set foot inside his home and he was already full of venom. He was thinking about throwing the thousands of miles he had crossed into the gutter when the door opened. Raz immediately recognized him and held his long-lost son into an embrace. Welcome home, son. Was all he managed to say while fighting his tears back, hearing those words, Alina too rushed to the door, joining the embrace as tears of joy streamed down her face. In that moment, Tryon remembered how much he loved his parents and all the wonderful things they had shared. I missed you so much, Tryon. Alina said between sobs. I missed you too, mom. Sorry for not visiting for so long. He said letting go of his past grievances, unluckily, they all flooded back the moment his eyes looked at his right, where once there was his old room. It had been replaced by a pantry years ago. He ignored his parents' question about his friends and career, asking in anger, what the heck happened here? Where is my room? Don't worry, sweetie. We haven't thrown away anything. Your room is on the second floor, like everyone else's. Alina said. What has become of Lith's study? Is it now a laundry room or what? He asked with way more emphasis than necessary. Lith's study is still there, just like Rena's. Lith sometimes brings his girlfriend home and Rena is married now. They deserve a bit of privacy. Raz explained. It made perfect sense, especially considering that Lith had paid for all the renovations with his own money, yet Tryon lived it as an unfair treatment. Come in, dear. Have a seat. We have so much catch up to do. Alina took hot tea and freshly baked pastries out of her dimensional ring, leaving Tryon flabbergasted. Now the kitchen and the dining room were two separate rooms. Every piece of furniture was of good quality. The house was warm and without a single draft, with more magical tools than the apartments Tryon lived in, with every step he took, he felt alien to that place. Only his parents gave him the strength to sit down and fight the rage that was consuming him. Who is this man, mom? A small voice asked, Tryon had heard about Aaron from both Floria and Lith, yet he still couldn't believe his own eyes. He had always thought that giving birth to a demon like Lith had made her barren, secretly, he found solace at that thought, like it was some kind of divine justice balancing the scale. Sweetie, come meet your brother Tryon. Alina held him in her arms. I've only one brother. Aaron stubbornly said. Forgive him, Tryon. Aaron is barely four years old and has never met you before. You know how kids are. Her tone was apologetic, but Alina never stopped smiling nor her eyes sparkling while looking at the little miracle in her arms. Don't worry mom, it's fine. He blatantly lied, making it clear that he resented the small child. Tell me everything about you, son. How are things in the army? Do you have someone special? Raz asked. Sorry, dad. I'm not as good as Lith. I'm not married nor do I have a girlfriend. After all, even after working my ass off for years I'm just a staff sergeant, whereas he is a mighty mage who became a lieutenant right off the bat. Why would anyone be interested in a nobody like me? He said while slamming his hand on the table. Try on I'm not making comparisons. I just want to know how you are. Raz said while Alina tried to calm down Aaron. He didn't like strangers, even more those who yelled. Chapter 601. How do you think I can possibly be? Tryon stood up abruptly, flipping his chair. This isn't my house anymore. You got rid of my room as if it was trash yet you kept Lith's intact. Everything here stinks of him. Your rings, your clothes, even him. He said while pointing at Aaron, making him cry. We didn't get rid of anything. Our room and tisters are on the second floor, just like yours. What's wrong with this house? With your brother Aaron? This is a good place where we have a good life. Alina said, her heart hurt by Tryon's words. 
Of course the trash goes on the second floor, where it can't offend his majesty's eyes. I'll tell you what's wrong. You cut me out of your lives to the point that I had to learn from a stranger that I had a brother. I never stopped writing to you, but my letters were always returned. According to the army, there was no Tryon nor Tryon Verhen, and there never will be. Tryon yelled, cutting Alina short. I'm Tryon Proudstar now. It's clear that as long as you have your precious lith, you have no need for a failure of a son like me. I'd better be off before I waste more of your time. He walked towards the door, but Raz grabbed him by the shoulder. Son, what's this madness? Why do you always talk about lith? What did he ever do to you? We don't love Rena any less just because she's not a mage. If you are trash, then what about her? What about us? Easy. You're worse than trash and I don't need you anymore. Don't bother teaching the runt my name. If I'm not a member of this family, I might as well be disowned too. Even better, I'll disown you, so at least I'll spare you the inconvenience to kick me out. He said before storming out of the house asterisk 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 Lyft's house. Present day, after Raz finished telling him the whole story, Lyft took a deep breath before saying, I'm sorry it ended up that way. Yet he was sorry for his parents, not for Tryon. He had always considered his older brother a lost cause. Me too, dear. Alina sighed. Do you want me to go talk to him? Lyft asked. No, it would only make things worse. Thanks, though. Raz said. I think it's partly our fault. After what happened with Orpal, we have been so overprotective towards Tista that we failed to notice the hole that losing his big brother opened in Tryon's heart. Maybe if instead of just trying to forget about our lost son we spent more time with him, trying to explain Tryon why Orpal had to go, things would have gone differently. No offense, Dad, but I call bullshit. After Orpal was disowned, you did the best you could and so did everyone else, even me. Lyft said. Why do you say that, dear? You've always been a perfect brother. Alina said. No, I wasn't. I never liked my brothers and you know it. They couldn't miss how everyone in the family improved their looks after receiving my treatments and they knew I wouldn't do the same for them. By forcing you to keep such an open secret, I created a divide between you and them that further fueled their jealousy. Yet their actions are still inexcusable. Neither Orpal nor Tryon ever apologized. Tryon has been loved, well fed, and dressed his whole life. I didn't love them, but you and Rena did. They had everything they needed, yet it was never enough. I never bullied nor humiliated them by showing off my powers. I always minded my own business asking the same from them. Their problem has always been that their abilities didn't match their expectations. Even after all these years, the only person Tryon worries about is Tryon. He didn't ask about Rena or Tista, right? Both of his parents shook their heads. Always a self centered Apple. Lyft corrected himself while looking at Aaron. Mom, Dad, you've been two wonderful parents and whoever says otherwise is a liar, stupid, or both. He stood up and hugged them both, hoping to better convey his feelings. Maybe you're right, son, but it's a parent's job to take care of their children, even when they are lost. Ra said. Lyft went back to Solus's tower to use its empowering effects to learn more about the methods his most successful colleagues had used in the past. Creating the optic nerve from scratch was simple. Lyft only had to use Camilla as a blueprint and Zinnia's flesh and blood as materials. Them being sisters made their physiology similar enough that what worked for Camilla was supposed to work for Zinnia too. The problem was that the new tissues and nerve endings would occupy an already taken place, so the problem was twofold. Connecting the optic nerve to both eyes and brain without harming either and make space for them without mutilating the patient. Lyft tried different approaches, working on his holograms while keeping active both scanner and chisel for hours. His success rate improved dramatically with practice and observation, but in the end, they were just simulations. Lyft had never manipulated life force to that extent. He kept revising all the material Quilla had sent to him and spent the rest of the time studying the life force of his own optic nerve. Damn it! Even if I kidnapped Fallmug and experiment on him, it would be pointless. He's a healthy subject, whereas I'd need one with Xenia's condition. He thought, we can only hope that Vasta has an ace in the hole. Otherwise it might be better to let him operate while we watch. Solus proposed, it's a good idea, but I'd feel more comfortable with him making space for the optic nerve and then connecting it to the rest, while I do everything else. Vasta is an outstanding mage, but a fake mage nonetheless, if something goes wrong, I can fix it faster and better than. Lyft's thoughts were interrupted by his communication amulet. A single, long beat warned him that shit had just hit the fan. Asterisk, 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 city of Xylita. A few minutes ago, Fulmuxata was fuming with rage like he hadn't been in months. The day before he had noticed that something was wrong, but he had paid it no heed. His stupid servants were always jumpy around him for no reason and that stupid wench of Vilna was just an attention whore. Only after noticing that even his neighbors threw odd glances at him had Fulmug decided it was time to get some answers. It didn't take him long to learn about Camilla's second visit. The house staff was much more terrified of losing their job than of a random mage. Lith was gone, whereas they had to live there. Their families depended on their job and getting fired without receiving good references would have meant having no future. Why you didn't send her away? Have you forgotten what I have instructed you to tell that cunt? Fulmug's face was centimeters away from Vilna's, his lips curled in outrage. I wanted to, but there was a great mage with her. Who cares about a mage? That was an abuse of authority, you should have called the guards. Fulmug hated Camilla's guts, not only did the little wench always reject him, but also now that she had her new boyfriend, she was the only thing his family would talk about. Chapter 602. PND no one oh, I couldn't, he was too scary. Even after he left, it took me hours to recover. Vilna said. At those words, Fulmug slapped her so hard that she was sent slamming against the nearest wall. Her head started to spin due to the slap and the impact. Enough of your excuses. With all the money I waste on you, is it too much to ask for a bit of loyalty? He lifted her by the collar of her shirt and slapped her again. Vilna's cheek turned purple and her lips started to bleed. Was he scarier than me? Another slap followed, making her cry. What about now? Are you still scared of him? Fulmug threw her on the ground before kicking her over and over, until her whining stopped. I work my ass to give to all you parasites a good life, and that's how you repay me. 
with lies and betrayal? Do you have any idea how difficult it is to be a successful businessman with all those foreigners using the gate to sell their merchandise, even during winter? Fall Muxata hadn't always been the man he was now. Back before the warp gate had been opened, he was the young master of a powerful and rich household of merchants. He had inherited the family business, and made it thrive thanks to his charismatic personality and the network of connections that his predecessors had established. With time, his pride turned into arrogance and his self-confidence into conceit. After the gate, though, his life had become a daily battle to the death with his competition. He had never been a very kind man, so being forced to be nice and patient during work always caused a great deal of stress on him. He had managed to hold his rage in until the money flowed into his pockets and the community respected him for it. Now, though, each victory came at a price. Also, every single time he was defeated despite putting so much effort into the negotiations, despite the many personal sacrifices he endured, his pride was wounded and something inside him became more twisted. He had started by beating his servants, but only with an occasional slap and only after a really bad day. Then, he had started to do it just to relieve his stress. Seeing them suffer made Fallmug feel better about himself. It made him feel powerful. He wasn't proud of it, but the business was better for it and he cleared his conscience by giving them gifts every time he closed a good deal. Yet the more he gave into his darkest impulses, the more things got worse. Soon, he started to beat his wife whenever she pestered him with her whining about him being too hard with the house staff or the kids schooling. Then it was the turn of those little runts, who disrespected his hard work and never let him have a single moment of peace. No matter how much he scolded them, they seemed to remain oblivious of the sacrifices he made for them every day. They would always drive him crazy with their squeaky voices, and stupid laughs whenever they played. He couldn't stand them being so happy at his expenses, even less to spend his hard-earned money just for being subject to their terrified expression whenever they met. He was their father, yet they treated him like he was a monster, now Camilla, that stupid woman, had dared to violate the sanctity of his house twice, defying his orders and will. Someone has to pay. Fallmug said while walking towards the tea room. He slammed the door open, his voice a low rumble like a thunder announcing a storm. Didn't I tell you not to see your sister without my permission again? Have you gone deaf as well or are you just too stupid to understand a simple order? Zinya gulped in fear. She was waiting for Fallmug to continue his ranting, but the prolonged silence meant his questions weren't rhetorical for once. I didn't invite Cammy. She came here on her own and Vilna let her in. She clenched a small, red stick in her hands, trying not to stutter. It would only make Fallmug angrier. Did you tell her that whatever happens now it's on her? He asked. I did, but she stayed. Good. Your sister should have followed your example. A married woman learns about obedience and discipline, whereas a spinster doesn't realize that each action has consequences. I'm sorry, dear, but you'll have to pay the price for your sister's defiance. Fallmug took out the horsewhip from his jacket's pocket, making it snap against his palm. Please, don't. She did nothing wrong, she was just worried for me. Zinya now clenched the stick with both hands. She had no reason to. Didn't I always take good care of you? He stepped forward as the whip cracked on his palm again. Stay away. There's a reason I never stepped out of this room. What might it be? His tone went from cold to angry. He hated it when people ordered him around. Zinya broke the red stick, which was actually a red mana crystal. Six more were hidden from sight under a couch and arranged to form a small array that became visible to the naked eye. He's coming. Lith promised me. Zinya said. Really? Fallmug laughed as he grabbed Zinya by the collar of her dress, forcing her to stand up. Even if he lived in Zylita, it would take him minutes to get here and he doesn't. He lives in Distar. By the time he gets here, there will be nothing to find. A healer friend of mine will make sure of it. He may be a mage, but in this house I'm your god. Zinya sobbed as two strong hands grabbed Fallmug's arms with enough strength to shatter them, forcing him to let her go. Yet she heard nothing because of the hush zone enveloping her husband. Get over here. Lith dragged him inside the dimensional fissure leading to the mirror's hall on the tower's first floor, the moment the array had been activated, Solus had warped the tower to the nearest mana geezer while Lith focused on Zinya's room coordinates through the warping mirror, which amplified his warp step's range. Hello, Ezio. Long time no see. Lith said while giving him a backhand slap. It broke Fallmug's jaw and spread his nose all over his face, sending him crashing against the nearest wall. Please, stop. My name is not Ezio. Fallmug whined. Tears of pain were streaming down his eyes. I know, and that's the only reason you'll get out of here alive. Lith's fist struck Fallmug's chest, making his ribcage and lungs collapse, Fallmug fell to the floor, coughing out blood. For a few terrible moments, he thought he was about to die, but the pain slowly faded and he could breathe again. What the? Fallmug could lift his arms, now perfectly healed. His nose and jaw were back to their original state, and so was his chest. Magic. Lith explained with a laugh as the mirrors disappeared and an array became visible to the naked eye. I gifted you an immortal body. The dream of countless kings and emperors, all for you. Lith grabbed Fallmug by the neck, slamming him against the stone pavement. His skull shattered, his spine was severed, leaving him limp like a stringless marionette. Immortal doesn't mean invulnerable, though. You can still feel pain. You just cannot die while we are having fun. Chapter 603 The array enveloping the first floor of Solus's tower was something they had developed in case Lith managed to find a mana geezer. While being on the brink of death, it allowed Solus to harness the energy of the mana geezer to heal all kinds of wounds almost, instantly and to share part of her life force with invigoration. The final result was a powerful healing field capable of beating death as long as the subject's mana core was intact. In Fallmug's case, however, Solus wasn't giving him any life force. Lith refused to have her tainting her noble spirit with such a human-faced monster. Fallmug's spine recovered, and so did his limbs. He was seconds away from fainting due to exhaustion when Lith used invigoration to restore his life force. Lith wouldn't let him get any respite. Even healing was an excruciating process since Solus was performing it without any kind of anesthesia. The bone fragments would dig through the flesh and blood vessels to return to their original position, opening new wounds at their passage. Fallmug could feel his body constantly get torn apart and reconstructed. How does it feel, Ezio? 
Lith waited for him to have completely recovered before crushing his windpipe with a fist to the throat. How does it feel to be helpless against someone much bigger and stronger than you are? Formug couldn't even breathe, let alone reply. His vision blurred before the array allowed him to breathe in fresh air again. How does it feel walking a mile in your children's shoes? A flick of Lith's finger and one of Formug's nails flew off, spraying blood through the room as he screamed in agony. Your voice is definitely high-pitched for a god. The nail was still regrowing, biting the flesh on its way when another flew off, Formug kept screaming, holding his right hand to defend it, just to have the fingernails on the left hand be ripped off all at once. The pain almost sent him into shock, but Solus's healing and Lith's life force saved his life again. Any last words? You will not get away with this. If I disappear, then what? Who would even care? Your wife? Your children? Your family? Lith stomped on Formug's kneecap with enough strength to almost cut the leg into two. The kingdom will never. Formug attempted to say as soon as the pain allowed him to. Wrong. Lith stomped on the other leg, cutting him short and making Formug grateful to the gods for giving him only two legs. The kingdom wouldn't give a damn, but death is too good for the likes of you. I will turn you into your wife. Lith's fingers shape shifted into claws, piercing Formug's eyes all the way to the brain. Just like she is your plaything, you shall be mine. I will beat you an inch from death every single day and then send you home unscathed. No one will hear your screams. Lith slammed his open palms against Formug's ears, destroying his eardrums. Formug lost control of his bladder as his world was now pitch black and devoid of sound. Solus only healed his ears, to make him feel like Xenia did every day of her life. No one will witness what I'll do to you. Lith's knee struck Formug's nether regions, turning his genitals into toothpaste. No matter who you ask for help, they'll just think you're crazy. No one will believe you. A jet of origin flame set Formug ablaze, as Solus kept the healing speed fast enough to keep him alive despite the flames eating his ever-regenerating flesh, Lith went outside, using his army amulet to create himself an alibi. The amulet pinpointed his position while he asked for updates from Commander Berrien. The army would be his witness, stating that he was at his own house if anyone asked, when Lith returned to the tower, the flames were gone and Formug was unconscious. His body couldn't take any more punishment without eating. Solus said. Well done. Lith's voice was joyless. He hated the idea of letting him live, but his disappearance would make Camilla ask questions he didn't want to lie about. They brought Formug back in the tea room and prepared a new alarm array, this time above a cupboard. I always keep my promises. Lith said while embracing Zinya and giving her another stick to replace the one she had consumed. What about Formug? She asked. He is alright, but I doubt he'll touch you again for a long, long time. Between his studies at the academy and the time spent with Journey, Lith was an expert about the human body and mind. It would take Formug days to recover from the physical exhaustion, but the mental trauma would last much longer, whereas he would return the following day to bring Zinya to the academy's hospital to prepare her for the procedure. If anything happens, you know what to do. Remember, if anyone asks, I've not been here. Thank you so much. Zinya buried her face into his chest. He might be a monster, but he's still the father of my children. Believe me, they are better off with their mother. Giving guys like him a second chance will bite back at you sooner or later. I'll pick you up tomorrow, so rest easy but keep the trigger always with you. Once you stop hearing my voice, count up to ten, and then use the handbell to summon the house staff. Formug just had a stroke. Lith let her go and disappeared inside the warping mirror, when Xenia started to scream for help, no one came. The house staff thought Formug was beating her in a particularly vicious manner since she usually never yelled. Like anyone else in the house, Xenia knew that it only made things worse, oh, right. They must think that if they get in here, Formug will pick on them too. Xenia thought. Help, Formug doesn't respond. When the servants arrived, they had to help Vilna first. She was still bleeding from her injuries and required a healer whereas aside from being unconscious, Formug was fit as a fiddle. The beating had taken less than half an hour and before returning him to his home, Lith had erased all proof of what had happened with darkness magic and even ironed the man's pants and shirt. Formug would be unconscious for days before his body and mind could overcome the trauma. Lith had made sure of it. Once he was back to Lucia, Lith kept researching the procedure to heal Zinya until it was time to go back to Camilla's home. When she arrived, Camilla instantly noticed he was once again in a gloomy disposition, but after what had happened yesterday, her heart was at ease. What's the matter, babe? Another failed experiment? She sat on his lap, trying to kiss him, but Lith stopped her. She was shocked, it had never happened before. I wish. It's about Zinya. Her dirtbag of a husband found out about our visit and tried to get even with her. Lith couldn't stand the thought, that a man of the caliber of his earth's father was still breathing even though he had all the opportunities to kill him. It made his, face dark and his voice sour. Oh, gods. Why didn't you contact me immediately? Is she alright? We need to go. Camilla tried to stand up, but Lith grabbed her hand, with a firm but gentle touch. Chapter 604. There's no need. Do you remember the mana crystals I left in the tea room and the promise I made to your sister? Lith asked, Camilla nodded, yet she wasn't reassured by his words. Lith was too serious, he was clearly hiding something from her. I kept my word. I used the array to know when she was in danger and unleash a spell that reflected on Formug all he did to Zinya. He didn't harm a single hair of hers. That's great news. If everything is fine, then why the long face? She asked. Cammy, what I did is a crime. A blatant abuse of power made it worse by the fact that I left him alive. Now, I'm confessing my crime to you and entrusting you with the knowledge about a secret spell of mine at the same time. Do you understand how serious this is? His words wiped the smile from her face. I understand. She said after a moment of hesitation. You committed a crime to protect my sister and you're asking me if I can live with it, right? You're asking me if you can entrust your secrets to Camilla the girlfriend without Yeval the handler revealing them out of duty. Lith nodded, putting their relationship to the test for the first time. Just like he did with his academy's mates when he revealed to them his inhuman physical prowess. 
To him, it was a critical moment. He had not told her all the truth so that if Camilla proved to be unworthy, he would risk nothing. A spell like the one he had described was out of a fairy tale, even a first year student would laugh at such a story. Zinnia had heard nothing while Fallmug's story would be completely different from Camilla's and even less believable. Not even Manoha could cover the distance from Lucia to Zylita in a matter of seconds. Thank you. Camilla's voice was happy but broken. Small tears streamed down her face. Even though I have plenty of friends, I spent all my life alone because when push comes to shove, my burden was my own. When people heard about my problems, they would pity me and say a lot of nice words, but no one would do anything. Thank you for saving Zinnia at all costs. Thank you for taking to heart a problem that's not even yours and putting your career at risk for me. She sobbed, but she never stopped looking in his eyes. Most of all, thank you for trusting me so much. I don't care about my career. I'll do anything to protect your secret just like you did for me. She hugged him, hiding her face on his shoulder, trembling like a puppy scared by a clap of thunder. You're welcome. Lith replied, holding her tight. As I already told you before, being in a relationship means solving together problems that you wouldn't have alone. This means that sooner or later you'll get dragged into the mess that my life is. Are you up for that? He asked. Yes, I am. She said with all her heart. Yet Lith didn't shapeshift nor told her anything else. He just wiped the tears and the snot from her face before giving her a short, soft kiss, now she's too clouded by her emotions. I have to wait until she is cool-headed again. Only then I will see her true reaction. Lith thought. Words were meaningless to him, only actions mattered. Tomorrow I'm going to speak with Professor Vaster about your sister and probably I'll have her admitted at the White Griffin Hospital for the procedure. Do you want to come with me? He held her face between his hands, gently caressing it. I wish I could, but I have to work. I shouldn't even be here. She sniffed. I'll try to be there for the intervention. Please, keep me posted. Lith nodded in reply. Do you want to get out for dinner or do you want to stay at home? He asked. I want to stay with you. Was her reply. She refused to both release him from her embrace or stand up from his legs. Camilla felt like his arms were her castle and his heart was her sky. She wanted that moment to last forever. Are you sure that nothing happened to Zinya? She asked. Absolutely. Not only did the spell protect her, but it also gave me a full checkup of her condition. No harm came to her after our visit. Lith's voice was so confident that it made Camilla's worries disappear, Lith had a hard time preparing dinner while never letting her go, managing to do it solely thanks to spirit magic and fire vision. When he attempted to spoonfeed her, she couldn't repress her chuckle anymore. You're the least romantic man I've ever known. Couldn't this wait a few hours? Maybe you are right, but I'm hungry and so are you. I can't feel the romance in the air with all this noise. Both of their stomachs had grumbled for a while before Lith started to cook. I know. Stupid stomach. Always ruins everything. It grumbled harder since she had refused the spoon and the smell of the food was delicious. You're too good a cook. It's all your fault if I get fat. The first bite was enough to make Camilla realize that between her long day at work and all those emotions, she had worked quite an appetite. Hands off my plate, woman. Lith rebuked her merrily as she exploited being on his legs to eat from both plates. Make me. She said while feeding him. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. The next morning, Lith hadn't slept much, again, but he was definitely happy about his past night. Camilla had refused to let him go even during the morning shower, giving to his day a really pleasant start, one thing is for sure. If you two keep up like this, Camilla will lose weight fast, Solus, that's dirty. Lith rebuked her, hello, pot. My name is Kettle and I'm black. She sneered. He left Belius for the White Griffin Academy, where Professor Zogar Vasta and Quilla were waiting for him. Lith, my boy. It's so good to see you again. It would be much better if you didn't visit or call only when you need something, though. I know we are both busy men, but it's kind of rude anyway. That's exactly what I told him, Professor. Quilla nodded. I apologize to both of you. Lith said, having a hard time to repress a sigh of annoyance. I've consulted all the material Quilla sent me and I'd like to hear your opinion about the different approaches I devised. Hold your horses, Lith. No competent healer would give their opinion based on a hologram, no matter how good it is. We need to see the patient. I've taken the liberty of setting the gate's coordinates to Xylita already. Vasta stood up abruptly, how he managed to do it without wobbling despite his egg-shaped body was still a mystery to Lith. When they reached the Sata household, the servants quaked in their boots, not daring to say anything. Point one mage was terrifying, but three at once were the stuff nightmares were made of. Chapter 605. Zinya, allow me to introduce to you Professor Zogar Vasta and Hila Quillerinas. He is the leading light in the field of body sculpting and the expert I told you about. Quilla is a genius healer and a dear friend of mine. They are both here to help me with your procedure. Lith said. It is my honor that such an important person bothered himself for a nobody like me, Professor Vasta. Zinya stood up and gave a deep bow in the direction of Lith's voice, her head almost touched the floor. It's nothing, my lady. There's no need to thank me, at least not before we've succeeded healing you. Despite his humble words, Vasta puffed out his chest in pride. It had been a long time since a beautiful woman had praised him with such sincerity. Nice to meet you, healer inners. Please, take good care of me. Zinya gave a curtsy, this time following Vasta's voice. The pleasure is all mine. Quilla said. There was something wrong with both the house and its inhabitants, something that gave her the creeps. We need to perform a few diagnostic spells that require physical contact. Do you mind if we touch your head? Vasta asked. Not at all. The moment Vasta cast his best diagnostic spells Lith could see him turn pale before his usually calm visage was twisted into a red mask of anger. He was clenching his teeth so hard that Lith wouldn't be surprised to hear them crack. Quilla, I need a second opinion. Vasta said while making her way. Lith, I would like to take Lady Sata to the White Griffin Hospital immediately. We can't perform any procedure until her body doesn't recover and she doesn't put a bit of meat on those bones. His voice was calm, but Vasta had a murderous look in his eyes that could rival with Lith's. 
I agree with your assessment, Professor. Lady Sarta needs immediate assistance. Unlike Vasta, Quilla's poker face was perfect, so far so good. I healed everything but left behind everything a competent healer would need to diagnose the repeated domestic abuse over the years. Lith inwardly smiled. In the case of divorce, Vasta's testimony would mean a great deal. Now? I've not prepared any luggage. Zinya said. There's no need for luggage. The White Griffin will provide you all that you might need. Vasta opened a warp steps leading them back to the city's warp gate and from there they could reach the hospital ward directly. Once Zinya was settled in her bed, Lith called Camilla with his civilian communication amulet, and left the two sisters talking before meeting the professor again in his study. Camilla's supervisor wasn't very happy about her. Social call during working hours, but Journey had a family as well, so she let it slide. Scum of the earth. Vasta snarled as Lith entered the room. These are the moments when I regret having left the Queen's core. Back then, I would have killed people like Mr. Sata without a second thought, just adding their name in the collateral damage list. Professor. We're healers, not cold-blooded killers. We took an oath. Quilla rebuked him. It's easy to say when you are so young and naive. When you reach my age, after you'll see things so bad that make that poor woman look lucky in comparison, you'll change your mind. I'm tired of seeing good people die while the bad guys thrive. I agree with Professor Vasta. Lith said. Now, if we can please discuss the treatment, I would love to have your input about how to proceed. I won't sugarcoat this, Lith. It's hard. The optic nerve is part of the central nervous system, one slight mistake can turn her into a vegetable. Even if you succeed in restoring her sight, it's likely that she'll suffer from side effects for the rest of her life. Her other senses might be altered and her personality might change. If you want my help, you'd better have a good plan. Vasta said, Lith explained to them how he had already managed to temporarily give Zinya sight using mana as a conduit. I plan on using Camilla, Zinya's sister, as a blueprint. There may be many differences between them, so my idea is to use mana as a probe. To test where to connect the nerves before actually doing it. This way I can simply slow down the process and use a trial and error approach to avoid affecting her brain in any permanent way. This is genius. Vasta blurted out. Kid, you make me feel useless. How long did it take you to manipulate mana to this extent? It must have taken months just to create a spell so complicated, let alone master it. Lith felt embarrassed. He had devised the spell on the spot by simply altering his true magic version of Chisel. Back then, Xenia's desperation had driven him into an outrage. He had done it simply to give her something to fight for, only later, while he had performed body sculpting simulations, did Lith realize that it could actually be employed as a diagnostic tool to solve most of the unknown factors when harnessing Xenia's brain. Don't be so harsh on yourself, Professor. I worked on that spell ever since you taught me Chisel, so it's not such a big deal. Also, I can assure you that with your experience in manipulating mana, you would master it in just a few days, if not hours. Lith's words were only a half-truth, as usual. Thanks, but rather than me reinventing the wheel, it would be better if you shared such a spell. The kingdom would reward you handsomely. Vasta said. Sure. Lith shrugged, as soon as I make a fake magic version of it. He thought, the three of them spent the following hours discussing the details of the procedure. Vasta gave Lith plenty of advice thanks to his rich medical experience. The more Lith explained to him how his probe spell worked, the more Vasta understood what its strong points and limitations were. Quilla took note of everything, using water magic to manipulate the ink and writing faster than a stenographer. She didn't have Vasta's experience, but her ingenuity allowed her to find a solution whenever they got stumped. Zinia needs plenty of food and rest before undergoing any procedure. Quilla said. I recommend to wait for at least a week. Agreed. Lith and Vasta said in unison. Professor, here is the paper that qualifies me as Lady Sata's personal healer. If her husband tries anything funny, please alert me immediately. Lith handed him the document so that Vasta could register it into the Academy's archives. I hope he does, dear Lith. This time of the year the magical beasts are particularly voracious. Not to mention how many diseases he could accidentally catch while visiting a dangerous place like our labs. The two men exchanged a murderous look that gave Quilla the creeps. Before leaving the White Griffin, Lith went back to the hospital ward to say Zinia goodbye and give her a present. Thank you so much. She said while handing Lith back his communication amulet. Too bad Kami is so swamped with work, we could barely talk. You know, I didn't step outside for years. Even the air is different from how I remember it. I already feel much better. Chapter 606. Well, it is different. The academy is surrounded by a luscious forest, so the air is bound to be much fresher and fragrant than the cities. I'm sure that Camilla will gladly take you out for a walk, both before and after the procedure. Lith said. If she finds the time, I suppose she could. Zinia sighed. She had rarely been in a park, let alone a forest. She would give anything just to sniff a few of its flowers. In the meantime, you can talk to her with this. Lith gave Zinia a communication amulet with only two runes, his own and Camilla's. He explained both how to imprint and use it before he left. Lith invited Quilla and Anathor for a double date so that they had the opportunity to meet outside their medical practice. Camilla is a lucky woman. Quilla sighed. First the Camellia, then the procedure, and now even a free communication amulet. I wish I had someone who spoiled me like that. You have two wonderful parents that do nothing but spoil you. Lith said. I meant as a significant other, my father doesn't count. No offense, Quilla, but what can a boyfriend do that your parents can't? When I was with Floria, finding a present for her was a nightmare. You have to set the bar a little lower, or any sane man will run away in desperation. His words make her half laugh and half worry. Not only were her parents scary, but also being the inn as one of the most powerful families of the kingdom, there wasn't much that she couldn't acquire with just a snap of her fingers. Quilla walked Lith to the academy's gate and from there he went back to Lucia. Lith spent the time before lunch with his parents, returning to the tower only after they consumed the meal together. He had used no mana in the morning, and the time with Quilla and his parents had relaxed his mind, allowing Lith to be at the top of his game. Solus, we are going to take a second attempt at the Oricalcum skinwalker. 
If I have enough energy left, I'd like to work on your personal cloaking ring. Lith said. Necro forge again? Solus asked while preparing everything they needed on the mana forge. Yes. If it fails again, I'll use the remaining two chainmail sets to experiment with Bloom Forge. If even lowering the output to 50% doesn't work, I'll have no other choice left. Lith went to the forge mastering lab, taking out the chainmail set, the ingredients, and the blue mana crystals. First, he performed a bonding spell, to give the Orichalcum armor a mana circulatory system capable of harnessing the power of the powerful magic, he would imbue it with, then, he refined the thunderbird's feather, the magma flower's petals, and the skinwalker's skin into as many pseudo cores. This, time Lith refined them one by one dot since he was forced to use a low energy output, he also had the opportunity to focus on the core's smallest details rather than on raw power. The four pseudo cores were so puny that Lith sighed, considering the experiment worthless already. He merged them with the help of the slime goop and only then did the real forge mastering begin. Solus used the energy from the mana geezer to empower both the magic circle surrounding the Lith's obsidian forge and the necro hammer. The forge mastering energies made the armor and the merged cores orbit around each other. They kept getting closer until their auras clashed so strongly that they bounced back to their initial position. Lith kept the charged hammer still while he studied the unknown interaction between the Orichalcum and the Thunderbird's feather. Soon the merged cores started to pulse and grow, the Orichalcum's artificial mana flow was drawn by the feather's energy field. Somehow, the feather was able to amplify the incoming mana, using part of it to feed the merged cores before returning the rest to the Orichalcum, making its mana flow also grow stronger. The exchange of energies lasted a while until some kind of symbiotic equilibrium was established. At that point, the merged cores were almost as big as those Lith had prepared during the last experiment. Incredible! No wonder our first attempt was an utter fiasco. Not only did I have to keep the pseudo cores merged and fix any imperfection that appeared, but also due to the amplification effect on both magical items, I had to fight against an increasingly strong rejection between five different kinds of mana. No duh, Sherlock. I told you that 50% was an excellent starting point. Solus gloated. All right, stop. Hammer time. He said making her laugh so hard that she almost lost her focus, the necro hammer struck the condensed mana circle, channeling Lith's mana and willpower through it so that when the two items collided, they started to merge. Lith rhythmically struck at the circle, releasing each time a blue blast of energy. He would switch between using the accumulated mana to continue the merging process, and fixing the deformities that arose due to the clashing forces at work. I'm so glad that I put the lab in the basement, otherwise the light this new type of forge mastering produces would be seen for miles. Solus thought, after more than an hour of unrelenting focus that pushed Lith's blue core and mine to their limits, the first prototype of Orichalcum skinwalker armor was complete. That was intense. Lith said while wheezing. I wouldn't have managed to succeed without your help and the hammer. I wonder if fake mags can use Orichalcum like I just did. Journey's armor wasn't much different from my old one, whereas the Awakened Assassins was a masterpiece with a lot of powerful enchantments. Oh, yeah. I almost forgot. Why didn't you try to add to the new armor full guard as well? Solus asked. She knew how power-hungry Lith was. Because without the cloaking field it would turn me into a neon lamp. That means adding not one, but two new pseudo cores to the mix plus using an alloy of gold and Orichalcum. Too many variables for someone that had yet to succeed once. Lith imprinted the new armor with his mana and gave it a test run. In its chainmail form it was ugly and uncomfortable to wear. The rough edges of the Orichalcum ring scratched and prickled even his enhanced skin. The moment he stored one of his suits inside the armor's dimensional space, the metal turned into a silvery liquid resembling quicksilver, which spread all over Lith's body until the mimicking process was complete. It shapeshifted faster than the old armor. The fabric of the clothes feels identical to the original as well. Let's test its defensive properties. Lith took an enchanted dagger out of his pocket dimension and handed it to Solus. She struck at Lith's chest who blocked the dagger with his open palm. Thanks to an invisible energy field enveloping Lith's body, not a single drop of blood was spilled. Solus drew the dagger back and struck again, but this time Lith stood still, when the clothes and the blade collided, neither Lith nor the armor sustained any damage. Chapter 607 It's a success. The old skinwalker armor would have been pierced, and its barrier wasn't strong enough to protect my exposed limbs from the dagger's enchanted edge. If only both the armor and hammer weren't just a prototype. Lith moaned he had used cyan mana crystals to make both hammers instead of blue ones, which meant that not only was the skinwalker ugly to look at, but it also wasn't as powerful as it could have been. Yeah, right. Quit moaning and rejoice. Or at least take a break before working on blood forging another skinwalker. There's a reason they are called experiments. We don't know if the blue crystal hammer will add new complications. Solus said. Also, I refuse to keep using Welmut hammers as their design. Lith checked at his pocket watch. They still had a lot of time before going back to Belius. He took a quick shower and ate a ham sandwich to recover the lost strength. After half an hour, he was almost back to his peak condition, but used invigoration nonetheless. It's the first time I use Bloom Forge, so everything must be perfect. I can't predict what will happen, but at least by being both mentally and physically at the top of my game, I can rule out tiredness as possible source of mistakes. Lith said, the initial phase of the experiment was identical to Necro Forge. Bonding the chainmail to the mana crystal was easy, whereas what followed quickly turned into a nightmare. Lith had to refine the ingredients one by one, creating from each one a small pseudo core. Condensing so much energy in such a small form required a lot of his focus, but he easily succeeded. The first real problem arose when merging the first two pseudo cores. The mana pathways weren't strong enough to contain them both, so Lith had to expand the pathways while keeping the cores fused and fighting against the rejection effect. With each core he added, the situation became more complicated. He had to strengthen the mana pathways, fix the deformities that appeared when the armor and the cores collided, plus those which occurred during the pseudo cores merging process. To merge all four cores, it took him over an hour and much more slime goop than he had predicted since he had to consume some for each new pseudo core. Then, he was forced to stop, focusing only on stabilizing the mana pathways while the resonance between the Orichalcum and the cores made the latter grow, damn it. If I miss their rhythm by a beat, everything will go down the gutter. 
To make things worse, I also have to be careful that the cores don't get deformed beyond recognition. Bloom forging a skinwalker is a mammoth task straight from the beginning. Lith thought, since they had no need for the hammer yet, Solus was free to help him to give the cores the right shape. Then, the forge mastering turned from a nightmare into a Lovecraft novel, despair, helplessness, and madness seemed its only possible ending, growing and fixing four pseudo cores at once, all the while adapting the mana pathways made Lith almost puke blood. Unlike what it happened when he crafted the Bloom Hammer, a small increase in the pseudo cores size meant a fourfold increase in the pressure they exerted on the mana pathways. The process was even slower than Lith had predicted, taking a further toll on his mind and mana. On top of that, every time the merged cores grew bigger, the Thunderbirds Bloom and the Oracalcum would interact again. Soon Lith was forced to stop the forge mastering, making it a failure and a success at the same time. A success because the Bloom Skinwalker was complete. A failure because Lith had been forced to halt the process before the pseudo core could become as big as the one of the Necro Skinwalker. What time is it? Lith asked. Almost late. How do you feel? Terrible. I never used invigoration so many times in a row. It has almost no effect anymore. Lith said. I need some rest as well. Do you mind if I stay in Lucia? The Mana Giza will help me recover quickly and I don't want to be your fifth wheel again. Solus asked. Are you sure? You know that I'm not planning for any lovey-dovey stuff, right? Even if I wanted to, I'm too tired. Lith had got used to being separated from Solus, but he still hated the void that her absence left inside of his soul. Right. Just like yesterday and the day before. Solus's voice oozed sarcasm. I'm a healthy young man in a healthy relationship and it's been weeks since I spent a bit of time with Camilla. How could I turn her down? You couldn't and you shouldn't, but that doesn't make it any easier on the fifth wheel. Me. I'll see if I get the girls to come visiting me, otherwise I'd rather spend some alone time working on Bloom Forge. We have one last chainmail suit. If we fail again, it means that our first estimate is correct and that at our level Bloom Forge isn't suitable for crafting so many pseudo cores at once, Lith reluctantly accepted her decision. Solus was her own person and just like him, she deserved her own space. When Camilla arrived home, Lith had just finished showering. He looked like someone who had just ended a double shift in a mine. His breath was short and his shoulders slouching from the fatigue. Hello, handsome. How was your day? Camilla pretended not to notice, throwing her arms around his neck. She brimmed with joy. Safe but tiring. Are you ready to get out for dinner? Won't you prefer to stay at home for some cuddles? You seem a bit tired. She said. That's a nice way of saying that I look like crap, and yes, I would rather stay at home, but I can't afford to lose the reservation. I'll bring you to a family restaurant, so there's no need for fancy clothes. Camilla wore a light blue shirt over a knee-length black pencil skirt. Her long black hair was down. That together with her black eyeliner and light red lipstick emphasized her pale skin. Aren't those the same clothes you wore during our first date? It's not our anniversary, yet. Lith asked. I know, but now I consider them my lucky clothes, and I'm feeling pretty lucky recently. She said before giving him a passionate kiss. She was flattered that Lith remembered both the clothes and the date they had met. Camilla was surprised when he brought her to Belius's warp gate. Lith wasn't the type to get too far for a meal. Her surprise became even bigger when the gate led them to a private office in what looked like an ancient castle. Headmaster Moth, this is Camilla, my girlfriend. Camilla, this is Headmaster Moth, a man that I have the honor to call a friend. Duke Moth had more gray hair than the last time Lith had seen him and seemed even more tired than Lith was. Nice to meet you, Miss Camilla. Follow my advice and never get too high in life, or the paperwork will burn your wings and bury you alive. A wave of his hand opened a warp steps that Lith forced her to cross before she could even understand where they were. Chapter 608. Surprise. He said to both Camilla and Zinnia. Zinnia had been accommodated in a single room as big as a small apartment. The furniture was simple but tasteful, giving her all that she needed to make herself at home and even have guests. There were big windows from which entered plenty of sunlight and lots of different flowers decorated the room. Zin? Between the tonics, Vastus treatments, and the safe environment, Camilla almost couldn't recognize her sister. Her knees buckled, forcing Lith to sweep her off her feet to prevent her from falling. Cammy? How did you get here? Visiting hours are over. Her knees buckled too, but she was in bed, so no one noticed. Hey, I may not work here anymore, but I still got friends. Visiting hours is whenever you want for you too. Lith said bringing Camilla near the bed before putting her down on a chair. The two sisters started chatting and crying out of joy while Lith used his old professor ring to order dinner for the three of them. He was feeling better by the minute. His blue core was thriving by being so near to the abundant mana source that the academy was, the two women talked a lot, giving Lith a taste of an evening in Solus's shoes, but to him it didn't feel so bad. He was satisfied with seeing Camilla being so happy. She never stopped smiling, like it hadn't happened ever since her first visit at the Sata household, if Solus feels like this the whole time, she's a saint. Lith thought. He was already getting bored not having any part in the conversation. Can I show her your gift now? Zinya asked, finally remembering about Lith. Yes, of course. Camilla remained flabbergasted seeing the communication amulet. Thanks, but we cannot accept it. It's too expensive. She said. I knew you would say that, and that's why I had her imprint it already, Lith laughed. You can only suck it up and accept that your sister can now call you whenever she wants and vice versa. Camilla was lost for words, incapable of expressing the feelings that were taking her by storm. Thanks. Was all she managed to say. She spent the rest of the evening chatting with Zinya, reminiscing together the happy moments of their shared past and planning the future ones. Once the procedure was over, Lith half listened and half slept, making the two women giggle when his snoring reached new heights. Lith is indeed a bit scary, but he's a keeper. Don't let him get away. Zinya said. I know, but how can I possibly repay him for all of this? We're so different that sometimes it feels like our relationship is one way only, and I'm always on the receiving end. What do I have to offer to him? Your love and trust. Those are two rare commodities, especially for someone who's coveted for their power. 
Just be honest with him and don't overthink. You are a wonderful person and he knows it. Zinia took Camilla's hands between hers. Has he ever asked you for something? No. Camilla replied. Then it's you he's interested in, not in what you have. As long as you feel the same, then you've nothing to worry about. Later, when they were returning home, Camilla pondered all the way back on Zinia's words, even asking Lith for a walk to have more time to think. With winter close to its end, there was no snow covering Belias, the chilly air of the night and the late hour made the city silent, very few people were still walking around. Camilla looked at the big black buildings that comprised every single city block, thinking for the first time in years if that was the place that she wanted to call home for the rest of her life, her mind started to wonder, reminiscing the party at the inner's house. It was so big and flashy that it almost scared her. Then, Lith's house in Lucia came to her mind, with the entire family around the fire, with the kids playing together or watching a movie with the rest of the family, that image warmed her heart. When they arrived at her apartment, Camilla felt the need to let Lith know how important he was for her and how deep her affection was. Just like Solus had predicted, tired or not, Lith was more than happy to spend the third night in a row doing anything but sleeping. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk earlier that night, inside Solus's tower, thanks to the tower warp coupled with the warping mirror on the first floor, which greatly enhanced the range of her warp steps, it didn't take Solus much time to pick up her friends. I still can't believe how easily we just crossed hundreds of kilometers at once. Lith is really lucky to have you. Tista said. She had been moving around the Distar Marquisite, collecting all the information she needed for her travels once spring finally arrived. Yeah. It makes our sleepovers so easy to arrange. To what do we owe the pleasure this time? Nika asked. Kala's daughter was no normal girl, but a vampire, so she could only move after sunset. Nika looked like a young woman in her mid-twenties, around 1.7 meters, 5 feet 7 inches, tall with raven black hair and emerald green eyes both emphasized by her rosy skin. A vampire was pale only when unable to properly feed and that wasn't her case, she wasn't a stunning beauty, but undeath gave her smooth, delicate features and kept her body toned without a shred of body fat. Every one of her movements was graceful and sensual, even when she wasn't attempting to flirt. I need help. Solus said. She was wearing a work shirt and pants. Leather gloves covered her hands, leaving the natural glow of her humanoid form radiate only from her head. Do you need another pep talk or advice about Lil Bro? Tista asked. Neither. I mean help with a forge mastering experiment. Solus told her about the last memory she had recovered and what had triggered it. This is huge, sister. Nika was adamant considering Solus a fellow vampire due to her bond with Lith's life force. Why you didn't tell your spouse? One secret is okay, but two. The more secrets you keep, the more you'll grow apart. For the last time, he isn't my spouse. Lith isn't even my boyfriend. He's with Camilla now. Sometimes Nika's single-minded approach on life exasperated Solus. You share one body, one mind, and one life. If that's not a spouse, what is it? Nika said, always striking the iron no matter if it was hot or not. I'm with Nika, for once. Tista stepped in before the two could start bickering. What if something happens and you two fuse again? If Lyft discovers how many things you've kept from him, it will hurt him. I could understand if this was just about not wanting to mess with his relationship, but now it has become about your life. Maybe he could help you recover your memories. Like you always say, just give him a chance. She said. Chapter 609. You are right and I know it. Solus said. That's the reason I brought you here. Every time we forge master a magical item, I can feel something scratching at the back of my head. Lyft's the only one who performs magic, though. I want to forge master something myself, but with a weakest core like mine, I can't do it alone. I need your help to keep the mana circle filled with energy and I'll do the rest. If I'm right, I'll regain another chunk of my memories. If that happens, I'll have no choice but to come clean with Lyth. If I'm wrong, nothing will happen and we would have just wasted an hour of our time. Are you with me or not? I'm with you, sister. No matter what. Solus was special for Nika. She was an immortal vampire, just like her, and was also the first friend she had ever had. Let's do this. I always wanted to learn true forge mastery. Tista said. What are we going to make? A cloaking ring. Without it, Lith and I can't ever go separate ways, without risking that someone spots my life force. If that happens, our lives would be in constant danger. To make one, I need only basic ingredients. An alloy of gold and silver would suffice, but I'll go with orichalcum instead of silver to achieve a stronger pseudo-core than Orion's. It's a very simple pseudo-core, so even with a deep green mana core like mine I should be able to make it. Even if I fail, it's no big deal. The materials for one ring are negligible. Except for the mana crystal. Solus whispered that last part, but everyone heard it distinctly. Tista knew how stingy her brother was and she doubted he would miss the disappearance. As for Nika, she couldn't care less. Her mother provided her for everything, so she had no concept of expensive or cheap. Solus took the Bloom Hammer out of her pocket dimension. Both hammers had the same properties, but since she was going to use Bloom Forge for the ring, it seemed the proper choice to her. Solus melted in a crucible a nugget of gold together with one of purified orichalcum and then she poured the liquid into a mold, giving the ring its shape. She cooled it with water magic, taking the still white hot metal with thongs and placing it on the adamant forge instead of the usual obsidian one. In all of my memories I work with a silvery hammer, using a silvery forge to enchant something. My guess is that it was all made of adamant, but since I don't have any, Orichalcum will have to do. Solus thought, another thing that bothered her was the runes of power engraved on all the enchanted items that appeared in her memories. Fake Forge Mastery used them to create and stabilize the mana pathways, but they would disappear forever once the process was over. The true Forge Mastery Lith and Solus employee didn't use runes at all, only pure mana. She was certain that Master Mina Dion wouldn't have all of her creations engraved with runes just to make them look cool. The problem was that even if Solus was right and runes could help to step up their creations, she had no idea what they did nor how to engrave it, carving random runes is bound to make a big boom. Let's hope to regain some memories of them. It would be a wonderful anniversary present for Lith soon would it be the anniversary of Solus's awakening from her slumber. 
Lith considered it like her birthday, but for Solus its significance went beyond that. It was the day when she had gained her family, her best friend, and maybe even more. It was the day when their bond had evolved from the pact between an artifact and its master into a partnership. She wanted both the secret of the runes and the ring to be her fist gift to Lith. To return something after only having taken from him for so long. Also, it would give her the courage she needed to reveal him her humanoid form, unlike Orion, she had no purple crystal. Solus could only bond the ring with a small blue mana stone. Then, she created the magic circle and let the girls fill it. Solus had to take care of both the hammer and the pseudo core, there was a limit to what her focus could do on her own. Gold proved to be incredibly resistant to mana, both during the bonding spell and the forge mastering process. Solus had chosen to use Bloom Forge because she lacked the raw power necessary to overcome the combined rejection effect of the gold, and the mana circulatory system, finesse, was her only route to success and Bloom Forge was the perfect means to her end. First, she created a small pseudo core and mana pathways, only using the hammer to increase their size once she was certain that she had shaped them to perfection. Each strike produced a deep green burst of light, yet no memory emerged, this is odd. In my memories I was striking directly at the item, not at the magic circle. What significance could it possibly have? Solus thought.it took the girls almost two hours to complete the ring and by the time they were done, they were completely exhausted. You and my brother are two peas in a pod, Solus. If this is your concept of fun, remind me to take a rain check the next time you invite me. Tista was covered in sweat, her body aching like it was going to break. To keep the circle powered up, she had been forced to use invigoration non-stop. I'm starving. Nika said while trying to not look at Tista like she was a giant cheeseburger. She had no sweat but no invigoration either. To do her part, she had gone dangerously close to a feeding frenzy. I'm sorry, girls. I never realized how hard it is to do what I do with the mana giza. Solus gave Nika a jug filled with Lith's blood that she kept in her pocket dimension for her undead friend, Nika smelled the delicacy, drinking it in small sips, using the refined meditation technique in between gulps. Vampires would get stronger over time by feeding. The stronger the source of blood, the more nutrients they would obtain. Normal vampires would just drink blood that would be partially processed by their blood core, making it slowly grow in power each time they fed. Even though they were not awakened ones, some vampires had discovered a technique to refine all the blood they ingested instead of just a small part. They had shared their knowledge with Kala, and she in turn had passed it on to his daughter. Thanks to Refine, Nika was able to assimilate most of the mana and light energy inside Lith's blood, allowing her core to grow at a faster rate than normal, unlike mana cores, the power of a blood core was determined by how much black energy they still held. The more powerful a blood core was, the less black streaks it had, according to legends, a perfectly red blood core granted a vampire the ability to turn back into a red core human at will, overcoming all the limitations of their undead status at the price of all their magic powers as long as they maintain such form. Chapter 610 Since you have no troubles with other women sleeping with your spouse, can I borrow him from time to time? His beyond delicious and mom has taught me how I can feed on a man while we both experience the same amount of pleasure. Nika asked, blood was the most abundant source of life force, but it was not the only one a vampire could draw sustenance from. He is not my spouse and like heck I'm fine with it. Solus blurted out. I'm jealous, okay? I admit it. Are you happy now? Actually, yes. Nika said while giving the flabbergasted Solus a big hug. I would never touch your man, I just wanted you to express your feelings out loud. Nika was usually tactless and so direct when she wanted something that she bordered on being rude. Solus had completely fallen for her act and so did Tista, who had become beat red at the image the Nika's words had painted in her head. What about your memory? Tista asked, eager to change the topic. I did everything I could like it happens in my visions, but nothing. The cloaking ring is a masterpiece, but the attempt to retrieve my memories was a failure. It seems I can afford to keep my secret for a bit longer before, Solus choked on her words as she noticed that Tista was deadly pale. The prolonged effort had triggered the body refinement process. Tista was soon in spasms as her body expelled the accumulated impurities by turning her inside out like a sock. Tista's bones cracked and reformed, causing her such an intense pain that Solus had to use her immortal body array to ensure her survival. Worst girl's night ever. Tista said once the process was over, right before losing consciousness. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk in the days before the procedure, Camilla used all of her free time to stay with her sister while Lith alternated between experimenting on forge mastering and on origin flames. Even his second attempt at crafting a bloom skinwalker armor ended up in failure. Its pseudo core was too complex and the amount of mana it required too big for Lith's current abilities, even with Solus's help. In the meantime, Zekel had finished smelting the first two batches of orichalcum into metal ingots. He was working on a way to make shows, hauberks, and coifs with a decent shape since Lith had yet to send him the blueprint for the hammers. After thinking about it for a while, Lith gave him two different images for two different hammers. Point one was shaped like a proper blacksmith tool, consisting of a shaft and a head with two hammers. The second was more similar to an ice axe, featuring on its head a hammer and a small pick. Why two hammers? No matter the forge mastering technique we use, they'll have the exact same properties. It's a waste of orichalcum and mana crystals. Solus couldn't understand Lith's decision, for someone as stingy as he was, such a thing was like throwing money in the gutter. I have my reasons. Was the only reply he would give her. Lith and Solus forge mastered both hammers, and then practiced with the amount of extra mana the forge mastering tools could hold before attempting to craft a skinwalker armor again. Also, they learned a few new things about origin flames. Even though there was a huge difference between how they interacted with physical materials and magical energy, they could burn them both. Things like stone or metal would seemingly be destroyed and reformed several times. It would cause them to change their shape and physical properties. Both the quality and the quantity of origin flames employed influenced the outcome. A little amount would act almost as if it was a common flame, too much would destroy anything. During our first attempt, we didn't really purify the adamant. More like we incinerated everything else. Adamant is incredibly resistant, even to origin flames. It's the only reason it survived the blast, Lith pondered, magic, instead, would be simply consumed by the flames, but the process had a limit. 
Origin flames could only destroy an amount of mana equivalent to the world energy they held. It meant that a delicate structure like an ongoing spell or a temporary array could be easily affected, whereas a permanent array or a magical artifact required much more effort. Lyft tried using them on some of his oldest works, who had now become too weak to be useful, to put to the test his theory about origin flames being capable of breaking the imprint of the owner on a magical item. He obtained conflicting results. The flames would eat at the magical aura, forcing the item's pseudo core to consume its energy to survive. After a certain point, however, the pseudo core would rather break than bend. Lith even tried using the clean slate spell on a weakened pseudo core, but the only result was making the item crumble. So far origin flames act more like some kind of antimatter for magic rather than a fine controlled tool. They can attack the structure of a spell, but not its energy signature. Lith said while one of his old daggers turned into a puff of smoke. I'm not so sure of it. Maybe the problem lies in your hybrid form. Solus said. After all, if we compare it with the complete one you assumed in the past, you still have a long way to go. Another possibility is that just like true magic, they might be affected by your will. I don't use mana to create her, only a tiny spark of life force. Lith objected. I have no idea how to imbue my will inside my own life force. Even if I did, how the heck can I command it to burn something and ignore the rest? Solus had no answers as well, so their days passed quickly. Between family, friends, and experiments, Lith resumed sleeping only when strictly necessary. Like the day before Xenia's procedure, Camilla had managed to obtain a sick leave for medical reasons. She was Xenia's closest of kin, making her optic nerve the closest thing to a compatible blueprint. Without her Lith couldn't operate, after a whole week of proper feeding, safety, and constant care, Xenia had flourished to the point of being almost unrecognizable. Yet that day she was pale again, twitching at the smallest noise. How do you feel today? Lith asked. Scared to death. Both sisters replied. Are you sure you want to proceed with the treatment? It was an obligatory question before a body sculpting procedure, Xenia held Camilla's hand tightly before replying, yes, please. I can't wait for this to be over. Unlike normal magical treatments, for tier 5 healing spells, the patient's head and limbs had to be strapped to their bed. Is this really necessary? Xenia asked. Yes. It could be painful, or it could affect your personality. You might even become violent. If that happens while I'm growing the optic nerve inside your head and you move abruptly, it could result in a fatal hemorrhage. Lith replied. Now I really wish I didn't ask you any explanation. She was now even more nervous. Lith, Quilla, and Vasta all double cast their scanner spell on both sisters to check their conditions. Lith and Vasta also activated the chisel spell. Lith needed it to perform the procedure, whereas Vasta would keep it at the ready in case his intervention was required. Chapter 611. The first part of the operation required to make space for the new nervous tissue without harming the patient. Lith had no experience in the field and the brain was too sensitive an organ for a rookie. Vasta took the lead, removing what he could and using body sculpting to slightly alter Zinya's skull to create more room whenever he had no other choice. The changes were so subtle that only a detailed diagnostic spell like Scanner could detect them. When he was done, he stepped out and made space for Lith. Remember, the best approach is always to go from easy to hard. Start by creating the optic nerve from the eye end and leave the connection with the thalamus for last. That way, we can immediately check if the brain receives the right stimuli. If we work the other way around and make even just a few mistakes, the sudden massive flow of wrong inputs might cause permanent damage. Plus, we would need to destroy all the connections and redo everything from scratch, since we would have no idea what went wrong. Vasta said, Lith did as instructed and created the optic nerve, the chiasma, and the optic trait. Then, he used his probe spell to create small tendrils of semi-solid mana that stimulated Xenia's visual cortex following Camilla's optic nerve pattern. The tendrils would carry the electrical impulses that light generated by hitting Xenia's eyes, and allow Lyft to check how the brain processed the acquired information. That way Lyft could make sure that the impulses would travel through the right pathway before making a physical connection. Xenia, I need you to keep talking during the entire procedure. I don't care what you say, I just need to check your cognitive functions and your mood. If you feel anything weird, just tell me. Don't hold anything. Lyft said, Xenia nodded and started to recount whatever she remembered from her youth. As long as everything was okay after testing with probe, Lith would grow the optic nerve, yet more than once he was forced to stop and backtrack, sometimes the electrical impulses would cause her small spasms. Other times fits of pain or uncontrollable mood changes. Every time that happened, Lith had to quickly disconnect the tendrils and search for another point of access to her brain, luckily, the more the procedure progressed on the right track, the more Xenia regained her sight. It gave Lith a clear indicator of his progress, and gave Xenia something useful to talk about. At the beginning she could only see a white light, but every time Lith found a proper pathway she would start to see small dots of colors appear. Damn it, Lith. Your probe spell is amazing. It saved us a lot of mana and the patient a lot of pain. Vasta said. Even with his expertise, he would have missed the right connection more than once. Yet his help proved to be invaluable for Lith whenever he had no idea how to proceed. It would take the professor just a couple of tries to find the right pathway among hundreds of seemingly identical alternatives. You are doing great, son. I'm really proud of you. Lith nodded, not having the luxury of wasting his focus to reply. What Vasta had no idea of was that to be able to carry a physical stimulus, probe required a great expenditure of mana. It was one of the reasons Lith couldn't hold it for long back when he had used probe for the first time on Zinya. Such a huge amount of energy would have burned her brain and left him weakened in a matter of minutes. Now, however, he was only creating the extremities of the optical nerve with probe, lessening the burden on both Xenia and himself. The procedure took a few hours, forcing Lith to take some rest. Vasta or Quilla stepped in to check on the progress, keeping the patient's condition stable while Lith consumed a tonic and used invigoration to regain his mental focus. Mana wasn't an issue, but he could feel his concentration declining. For a normal healer, it would have taken several minutes for a tonic to give them back their focus, but invigoration had no such problem. By the time everything was over, Xenia could see better than most. Is it over? She asked when she felt the straps being removed. Yes. Can you touch my hand? Lith offered her his right hand, keeping it low and on the right. Xenia had no problem with depth nor distance perception. 
she managed to grab Lith's hand easily no matter where he placed it within her field of view. Thank you so much. I know it isn't worth much coming from a blind person, but you all are the most gorgeous people I have ever met. Xenia embraced and kissed the entire medical staff and the nurses that had taken care of her until that day. Camilla and Xenia hugged in joy while Lith and Vasta planned together her physiotherapy. Xenia still needed to learn how to move normally, read, write, and even to associate a name to common objects. One more thing. Vasta cleared his throat to get everyone's attention. We can keep Xenia here for a couple more days to make sure that there are no post-op complications, but then she has to leave. We need the room for the next patient. How much do I owe you? Camilla asked. I'm sorry your sister isn't part of your family register, otherwise the army would cover part of the expenses. Vasta handed her the invoice, Camilla owed the white griffin much less than she had feared. Two gold coins for Vasta's consultation and body sculpting, 30 silver coins for Quilla's research job, and 70 silver coins for Xenia's stay at the White Griffin, for a total of three gold coins. It was still a huge amount of money considering that Camilla was paid two silvers per week. Body sculpting was the most difficult technique, after all. Most people would more easily afford a magical item to compensate for their handicap rather than having it treated. That's it? I expected at least 10 gold coins. It was how much the cheapest and less competent healer would have asked, the same price of two communication amulets. Camilla wouldn't have been able to afford her own if the army hadn't gifted it to her when she had been promoted to first lieutenant. You would be right if the lead healer had charged you with something, but he didn't. Vasta pointed at Lith. He knew how Camilla hated to feel indebted, so he didn't ask for favors to Vasta, nor the academy. Otherwise the whole procedure would have been free of charge, I respect Camilla's desire to save her sister and I can't take it away from her. If I stepped in and solved everything by myself, she would feel useless. All of her struggles and fears would be for nothing, this way, she can still feel like she has done her part because she did. Even without me, Xenia would still have got her sight, it would have just been more expensive. Lith thought. How much do I owe you? Camilla turned to Lith repeating her question. I'll cut the workmanship and charge you only at cost price. So, it's 50 silver coins for the amulet and dinner for the procedure. Chapter 612. What? Camilla was flabbergasted. The mana crystal is small but powerful and I bought the silver ingot at market price. The healing only took me some mana, so dinner will suffice. Lith explained. It's too little money. I can't accept that. She said. Sorry, miss. Healers make their own fares. Vasta and Quilla nodded at those words. Besides, you should worry more about Xenia's accommodation. Your apartment is good for two people but cramped for three. Also, we're both often away for work and your sister needs guidance. Lith said, Camilla bit her lower lip in stress. Xenia could indeed move into her home, but there was only one bedroom, so either she had to take a break from their relationship or they would be forced to go to a hotel every time. Changing the apartment wasn't possible. With a debt on her shoulders, Camilla couldn't afford a new one with just her savings. The one she lived in was provided by the army for a reduced fee, but they wouldn't help her pay for a bigger house since she was officially single and without any family member. To make matters worse, Belius was a horrible city for someone as inexperienced as Xenia was. Public transportation required to be able to read, there was almost no green area, and people were paranoid of newcomers. To not leave Xenia alone all day, Camilla would need to hire a caregiver to keep her company and teach her everything she might need. Don't worry, Cami. You've already done too much. I can't let you give up on your life for my sake. I'm still Fallmug's wife, I have a home and duties to attend to. Maybe now that I'm not blind anymore, he might change his ways. He hasn't always been a bad man. Xenia's smile trembled just as her whole body did. Despite all of her efforts, she was terrified at the idea of seeing her husband or even hearing his voice again. No way. It's too dangerous. Camilla, Lith, and Vasta said at once. Lady Sata, according to my experience, things can only get worse now that you aren't helpless anymore. Vasta said. On top of that, in your condition, a single blow to the head could ruin everything we did today. Your body needs time to heal and adapt. I have an idea. Lith said. Xenia could stay in Lucia with my parents until the end of my leave. They have plenty of free space and could use a hand with the kids. I can warp you there whenever you want and when I have to go back to work, she can move into your apartment. Camilla couldn't decide what to do. Lucia was much better than Belius for her sister's recovery, but she felt like she was once again relying too much on Lyth. Xenia has only experienced an abusive relationship. Maybe seeing how the marriage of my parents and sister work could help her to make up her mind about the divorce. Lyth whispered in her ear. Lucia it's a perfect solution. She sighed. Her pride was a bit wounded, but Xenia's well-being came first. Asterisk asterisk asterisk, asterisk Fallmug had just recently started to walk again, after being unconscious for several days. Lyth had been true to his word. Ever since Fallmug had woken up, Lyth would kidnap him, blind him, and beat the crap out of him until his body collapsed. Fallmug Sata had been living in terror the whole time. There was no place he could hide where the demon wouldn't be able to find him. He used the unexpected respite Xenia's intervention had given him to run to the authorities and expose the evil mage. The desk clerk of the mage association listened to all he had to say, before dismissing everything for the ramblings of a madman. I'm sorry, Sir Sata, but your story is really hard to believe. If you did make an enemy of the strongest young mage of the kingdom, how can you possibly be still alive? Also, you failed to mention why he would have a beef with you. Even the clerk of a medium-sized city like Xylita was sick and tired of all the lunatics blaming Ranger Verhen for everything. Pregnant girls claimed he was the father and demanded compensation, Nut Jobs said to have been cursed by him or that he had taken credit for their achievements, like restoring Kaduria. Fulmug realized to be in a pinch. He had been so anxious to get rid of his torturer to forget about making up a believable lie. He thought far and wide how to explain why someone like Lith was tormenting him, but unless Fulmug confessed the abuse on his wife, his story wouldn't make any sense, yet if he did, Lith would become the last of his problems. Despite his constant pain and suffering, Fulmug was still a respectable man with consistent income. If the truth about his home were to be exposed, he would go to jail, and Xenia would be entitled to everything just by asking for a divorce. He is after my wife. 
His words made the clerk chuckle. Sorry, sir. I don't mean to disrespect you, but if I ask your wife, will she confirm your story? Of course not. She's on his side. Enough wasting my time. The clerk had run out of patience. If your wife wanted to be with him, she would just ask for a divorce. A great maid has plenty of money, she wouldn't need anything from you. What proof do you have of your claims? Fulmug was taken aback. Now he understood what Lith meant when he said that he would turn Fulmug into his wife. He was now alone and with no one who could help him. There was no witness of the aggressions nor proof of his injuries aside from his words, just like his wife until a few days ago, he was trapped in an inescapable cage. None? Well, then I hope you'll forgive me if I don't believe a word coming from a man accused by three healers of repeatedly beating his wife. As the clerk was filing Fulmug's statement for the record, his name had triggered a flag. Not to mention that according to the army records, at the time of the alleged assaults, Ranger Verhen was still at his home. I don't know what your problem is, sir, but maybe a night in jail will help you clear your mind. What about Verhen? Fulmug asked while the guards dragged him towards the dungeon. None of your business. In your place, I'd worry more about being charged with slander of a state mage and wasting the association time, because those are two crimes I can testify about. Asterisk 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 Lith's parents knew all about Xenia's situation, so they were glad to offer their help. In their eyes, she was the embodiment of what could have happened to Tista if Lith had never been born, Xenia fell in love with Lucia, with the Tron Woods, and with the closest thing to a real family she had ever had. Learning how to read, write, and count together with Lyria and Aaron was embarrassing, but after a while she stopped worrying about it. Alina also taught her how to cook and sew, so that once she moved back with Camilla, she could at least help her managing her home. The days passed, and soon Lith's leave was about to end. Chapter 613 A few days before Lith had to once again leave to resume his duty as Ranger of the Keller region, Xenia finally mustered enough courage to tell Camilla about her final decision. Cammy, I could never thank you and Lith enough for what you did for me. The last week has been the happiest time of my life. She said. This is just the beginning, Zin. There are still so many things that we have yet to do together. I'll not be often home, but I'll try my best to not make you feel lonely. I've already found a caregiver for you. Camilla replied with a smile, the daily expenses for the caregiver and Zinya would make it even harder for her to repay her debt, but she didn't mind at all. Camilla had planned everything and was ready to bear the consequences of her decision. Thank you, but I'd like to remain here. Zinya blurted it out. What? Why? You have your personal life and your career to worry about, Cammy. I'm not a child and you can't take care of me forever. I'd rather live here as a housemaid than burden you more than I already did. I already spoke with Alina about it. The Verhen are nice people. They accepted to give me food and accommodation in exchange for my job while they teach me everything I need to stand up for myself. They are even willing to pay me once I'm done learning. I've also decided to file for divorce. If I stay at your house, Fulmug might look for me there. He will never come looking for me here, instead. I don't know if I have the strength to face him yet, so this is the perfect solution. Camilla tried to convince Zinia to reconsider, but she was adamant about it. Camilla was sad at the idea that meeting her sister without Lith's help would take her quite some time. The closest gate was in Derio's, and to reach Lucia from there it would take her over one and a half hours. Yet seeing her so happy and determined, filled her heart with joy, I did all I could to give Zin her freedom, if I force her to come with me, she would just exchange one cage for another. Here she'll be surrounded by people who don't take care of her because it's their job, but because they want to, also, she will be safe from Fulmug, since attacking a maid's family is plain suicide. She thought, Zinia and I have tried visiting her children, but Zinia's in-law didn't even let us in. According to the law, she is just a disabled, incompetent mother who has run away from her home. To be able to claim any right over her children, she first needs to get a divorce and have the means to take care of them. I don't want to burden Lith with this matter as well. Camilla thought while preparing to say her goodbyes. I'm really sorry, I knew nothing about this. It wasn't an elaborate scheme I devised from the very beginning to keep you in your home all to myself. Lith said as a joke, yet for second Camilla almost fell for it. When will you be back? She asked. I don't know. It could take weeks, maybe months. The silver lining is that now that you have exchanged your communication room with Tista, she can help you reach Lucia whenever she is at home. Lith said. That's not what I asked you, you silly. I miss you already. She hugged him tightly. During those twenty days they had lived together and the idea of waking up alone hurt her more than she expected. Will you wait for me? He asked returning her embrace. I promise. Lith took her back home, where they kissed one last time before he had to resume his duty. Asterisk 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 ever since Scarlet the Scorpicore had visited Legain, asking for his help to solve the issue of her inability to obtain a purple core and achieve new tribulations, she had remained within the Gorgon Empire. Point hundred of years had passed since the last time she had left the Griffin Kingdom, back when she was still a young Emperor Beast. Taking the mantle of the Lord of the Forest had given her great powers, but also a great burden. Traveling allows me to learn about different magical philosophies, understand what the heck Mogar wants from me with its stupid tribulations, and to check about abominations. Many birds with one stone. She said out loud, drawing attention on herself, damn it, I'm not used to be disguised as a human. I keep making stupid mistakes that force me to move from a town to another as if I'm a wanted criminal. I keep forgetting that fake mags need to chant gibberish to use magic and that they can't break stone with their bare hands. She thought while calling a waiter to get seconds, another thing she had a hard time with was the small portions of food humans consumed. Even if her appearance was that a woman, her body was still that of a scorpicore and so was her stomach. She looked like an adventurer in her thirties, about 1.67 meters, 5 feet 7 inches, tall. Her shoulder length ashen gold hair had red shades and she wore a gold rimmed pince on her nose. The body Scarlet had shape-shifted into was pretty, but not gorgeous. She preferred to go unnoticed in human settlements rather than being forced to constantly deal with flocks of admirers. Centuries ago, when she had taken a walk with Salarak, they had been forced to knock down the entire male population of a village just to be able to order a beer without someone hitting on them. She was currently in the city of Tyanar, to investigate the rumors about a mysterious monster that was slaughtering men and beasts alike for no apparent reason, if I'm right, I might. 
have found one of those new eldritch abominations. Right after the monster outbreaks ended, the council reported the appearance of several creatures of unparalleled power. According to my sources, they should still be within my league. If I managed to track one of them and defeat it, I could finally learn something more about this master. I could even find out his location. Scarlet thought as she took her communication amulet out of her pocket dimension for the first time in almost a year. Oh crap. She blurted out, this time intentionally. She had so many missed calls that it took her quite some time just to take note of who she wanted to call back and who she would just ignore. Call me if you need anything else. The young waiter gave Scarlet a kind smile that she returned while wondering why the heck a Trentling was working in a restaurant. Trentlings were trees that after living for centuries in a zone rich with world energy had become awakened. They were the plant equivalent of a magical beast. His disguise was flawless, but Scarlet's enchanted pince allowed her to not only see the mana core of her opponents, but also their life force. The eyes of Mina Dion were one of her most prized artifacts, which had allowed her to increase her knowledge about light magic by leaps and bounds ever since she had liberated it from the paws of a mad griffin, just like for any living creature. Being born from a good-natured parent didn't guarantee that they would inherit their heart or wisdom. Some of Ligain's children were so infamous that the council had put a bounty on their head even though they weren't even awakened. Chapter 614. The same had happened for the offspring of Salark and Tiris. Since the Guardian's children were born capable of using all kinds of true magic and were gifted with a life that could span for almost a millennium, the council considered them to be a threat of the highest level, well, the silver lining is that plants are the chattiest among living beings. The disguised Trentling might be able to point me in the right direction. Scarlet thought, she handed several copper coins to pay for her meal to the waiter, enough to feed a small platoon, and almost as many as a tip. I'm flattered by your attentions, miss, but I'm strictly a waiter. You're not even my type, sorry. The young man said, yet he still pocketed all the money. Neither you're mine, smart ass of a Trentling. Scarlet's voice was a low growl, her teeth shapeshifting for a second into fangs. She wanted to make sure the greenhorn would get her point. You're lucky I'm a carnivore, otherwise I would be glad to make a salad out of you as a token of my appreciation. How do you know who I am? The waiter looked around, worried that someone might have noticed their exchange. You can call me Scarlet, little salad. Now if we are done playing, I'd like you to tell me everything you know about the creature that plagues this land. Scarlet said. I'm sorry, but I only know what everyone does. A few months ago, right after the monster outbreak, a creature started to raid the Galuan forest. At first, it only attacked the magical beasts, so we didn't care. Then it killed even the lord of the forest and after that, everything went downhill. There's nothing alive there anymore, most wildlife and flora have been wiped out. The trendling sighed. The lord of the forest is dead. Are you saying that thing killed Maisha the unicorn too? How is it possible? She was young but quite powerful. Why do you think I'm here? Every sane creature is running away from death. I've no idea what it is because no one who has seen it has survived the encounter. Allow me to give you a fair warning in exchange for the generous tip. Now that the Galuan forest is nothing but an empty shell, the monster has started to attack nearby human settlements. It's only a matter of time before it arrives here too, so don't make yourself too comfortable. The waiter went back to serving the tavern clients, keeping an ear out for rumors about the monster. The idea of an emperor beast dying so easily at the hands of an unknown creature made the ancient Scorpicor worry. She returned to her hotel room and called Legain, hoping that the guardian of the Gorgon Empire could help her. Even though he had almost relinquished those lands, they were still his turf. What it is now? I'm kind of busy. Legain sounded annoyed, but him responding immediately eased Scarlet's fears. Why has no one taken care of the Galuan forest yet? She asked. The empire takes one good third of the Garlen continent, it's not something as puny as your old forest was. I'm hunting down one of those insanely strong eldritch abominations, so I've no time to waste. Malaya is busy dealing with a lick who got bored with his research and wants to conquer her lands. She can't leave until she has destroyed him, but she has dispatched her troops already to take care of your problem. Unfortunately, the Galuan forest is in the middle of nowhere. Do you have any idea how many crises Malaya has to face on a daily basis? Cut her some slack. Over and out. Ligain is having trouble tracking an eldritch? Either it's a master at hiding their presence or the situation is even worse than I thought. I need to achieve a frigging purple core or soon my power will not be enough to survive against the new breeds of abominations. Solving the Galuan forest's problem might trigger the breakthrough I've been looking up until now. To further evolve, I need a real challenge. Plus, if I do him a favor, Lee Gain will owe me. I can't pass on the opportunity to ask him for a reward. Scarlet thought dot a wide grin appeared on her face. At her level and age, the real challenge to further her magical research was the lack of very powerful and rare ingredients. Adamant and Davros were the only metals she looked for, and Guardians usually had quite a stockpile of them. Even if the threat turned out to be a minor one, she could always ask Ligain for a bit of his blood or one of his scales. The power of such powerful ingredients would allow her to finally upgrade her equipment. Scarlet left the hotel and spread her membranous wings. Air magic filled them with wind, boosting her flight speed to subsonic levels. She had been to the Galuan forest in the past, but her memory of the place was foggy. She didn't remember enough to perform consecutive warps and even if she did, the place was quite far. Dimensional magic would make her travel shorter, yet at the same time, it would drain a lot of her mana, forcing Scarlet to use invigoration more than once. If this monster is so strong, I need all of my trump cards to beat it. I can't risk being defeated just because I'm too tired to put out a decent fight. She thought, flying would take longer, but it would consume an insignificant amount of her energy. Only humans with their short lifespan would warp even to go to the bathroom. Half an hour later, Scarlet had almost reached her destination. A small caravan moving from Galuan drew her attention. It was composed of humans, plants, and beasts. The caravan was too an odd mix to be normal, despite it was still at several kilometers of distance from her. Scarlet could distinguish them clearly as if she was standing right beside them, thanks to the eyes of Mina Dion, with just a flap of her wings, she reached their position and gracefully landed on the ground. 
The group was as heterogeneous as it was powerful. There were dryads, fauns, who were creatures born from the awakening of bushes, whereas dryads were born from flowers and trentlings from trees, magical beasts of various species, and several human mags. The weakest mana core among them was Cyan, yet they were all on edge and armed to the teeth. As soon as they noticed Scarlet, they assumed a defensive formation. What the heck is going on here? Scarlet retracted her wings, uncaring of their threat. They were too weak and their equipment was poor. She was quite surprised noticing that the humans weren't impressed seeing a winged woman. Don't worry, she's one of us. Said a big awai, a wolf-type magical beast, after sniffing the air for a second. A magical beast giving away so easily their ability to talk was also a bad sign. How can you be so sure this isn't just another trick? I lost my wife by trusting a stranger. Said a burly wizard who was holding a metal staff brimming with mana. Just as I lost my pack. Stop whining and keep moving, human. The awai growled and resumed his advance. Chapter 615 The magical beast started moving at a speed the humans could follow while keeping their spells at the ready. Scarlet could feel that each one of them was grieving and was filled with hatred. Yet there was no bickering nor disrespect between the different races. It was enough to give her the creeps. We can't afford to stop. If you want answers, you'd better follow us. The Awai said. We are all that's left of the entire Galuan forest. The others have either already escaped or died. To answer your earlier question, Mogar has turned against its children and none can escape its fury. His words made Scarlet sneer. Very dramatic. I never heard of Awai with so much talent with words. Do you mind being a bit more specific? It's hard to explain. One day the natural order was simply turned upside down. You could see a plant eater deer, the deer hunter wolf, and the wolf attack his own pack. Humans too were affected by the phenomenon, but them attacking their own or killing for sport is hardly a novelty. No offense. The Awai said. None taken. Replied a middle-aged magician who was sitting on top of a singy, a boar-type magical beast, to be able to cast the life-sensing array from time to time. It had allowed them to identify the enemy hidden among the grass and escape from several ambushes. Whatever it is, it's capable of taking any form it wants. A flower, a Awai, a human, anything. Even its smell is almost identical to the original. I had to almost die twice to learn how to distinguish the anomaly it holds. What anomaly? That word reminded Scarlet of Lith, making her fear that her decision to spare him all those years ago had finally backfired. It's a hybrid smell. Part beast, part abomination, part undead. With each word the Awai spoke Scarlet's stomach churned stronger, at least until she heard the last part. Undead? Don't you mean human? She asked. No, I'm sure of it. For once humans are innocent. The Awai shook his head. Ambush. The warden yelled one second before black sprouts emerged from the ground. They grew at an unbelievable speed, draining all life from their surroundings to sustain their existence and turning the grasslands into barren earth, like the group they were chasing. The creatures mimicked the appearance of members of different races. Their age and gender appeared to be random. There were even children and elderly among them, the creatures were a pulsing mass made out of bones, of the chaos energy typical of abominations, and of black vines instead of flesh. The red light of undeath burning inside their eyes revealed a desperate hunger, yet as fast as they had appeared, their forms became indistinguishable from the living. Vines turned into flesh, and the red light was replaced by normal pupils as their skin or fur turned from pitch black to what it was supposed to be. Why did you abandon us, mom? We miss you. We promise to behave if you return. Said two little kids to the warden. They had big watery eyes, like those of a child too naive to understand what they have done to anger their beloved parents. You're not my real children. I've seen you die. Rage and grief boosted the power of her darkness magic spells. Two black bolts erupted from her hands turning the two kids into rotten mush among high-pitched screams of agony. Don't run away, my love. Said a female awai to the leader of the group. I'm not dead and I mean you no harm. I just want to be reunited with you. If you pledge your alliance to the great mother, we could both happily live forever. The male awai hesitated. He had fought many of those creatures, but never before one of them had taken the semblance of his beloved Nia. Nice try, scum. Scarlet raised her pince-nez above her head, making it emit a pulse of light that brushed off the illusion and revealed the cruel reality underneath. No matter their gender, age, or race, all the creatures had a single life force, a single smell, and were made of mud. The vines that covered their bodies allowed them to move, while the chaos energy covering them replaced their true semblance with a familiar face. Once their secret was exposed, the creatures dropped the act like it was a live grenade and turned toward Scarlet. Long time no see, Scorpicor. They said in unison with a neutral voice. You might just be what I need for my final breakthrough. Scarlet ignored the ramblings and focused on the voice. She was certain to have heard it in the past. With the pince-nez back on her face, she studied the creature's cause, whoever is behind this it's not Lith. That is not his voice, nor his rings, and these creatures have three cores each, whereas Lith had a single hybrid core with multiple properties. She thought, the hybrids extended their arms to attack, but the group of survivors wasn't willing to chat, so they attacked the moment the eyes of Mina Dion stripped the creatures of their disguise. Killing a pile of random stuff was much easier than murdering your loved ones over and over again. The undead nature of the creatures made them incredibly sturdy so that most spells had little to no effect on them. Darkness magic was their bane, but it was also slow, and very few creatures could use it aside from humans. That was why the group had formed and how they had survived for so long, the magical beasts would pin the enemies down to the ground, the humans would kill them with darkness magic, and the awakened plants would keep their allies alive without fail. Plants were the most gifted creatures in the rejuvenating arts. There was no injury they couldn't treat in a matter of seconds. By by harnessing Mogar's life force, they could almost regrow an entire body with no burden on their patient's stamina. Yet that was before Scarlet's arrival. Now that she was the creature's target, the mastermind was no longer interested in capturing the others alive. Scarlet could see the chaos magic assembling on the creature's fingertips a second before they unleashed a barrage of black rays as fast as bullets, a wave of her hand enveloped the group of survivors in a dome of light that stopped the chaos spells. Chaos magic could destroy matter almost to the atomic level, but light magic was its fatal weakness. 
Chaos magic was nothing but darkness magic that had been forcefully stripped of its light counterpart. It was the imbalance that made chaos magic so powerful. The raw darkness magic was drawn by the light element residing inside its target, making it fast. Also, the darkness magic would drain the light element to return whole, amplifying darkness magic's destructive force several times. A light magic energy construct would restore the balance, turning chaos magic back into common darkness magic. Your version of Hollow Void is truly amateurish. It didn't put a dent in my source wall. Scarlet said. Her aim was to taunt her opponent into revealing their identity. No matter how hard she racked her brain, she had met too many people to remember them all. Chapter 616. You've grown stupid with age. The creature said with a stern tone while charging at the source wall. Your barrier just traps my prey preventing them from both escaping and retaliating. On top of that, only abominations need to feed on life force. For the undead, light magic it's nothing but a full course meal. Scarlet could see the creature's blood cores going into overdrive, lured by the spell's energy mass. If you say so. Scarlet snapped her fingers, turning the source wall into night wall. The creatures slammed into the mass of darkness energy which destroyed their blood cores and made their bodies crumble. Without the blood cores energy keeping the other two apart, the black core was free to feast on the mana core first and on the mud puppet holding it in later, what a moron. Darkness and light are two faces of the same coin. Converting one in the other is a child's play if you know what you're doing. I can rule out my most brilliant acquaintances from my suspect list. She thought. Okay, it's time you get out of here. Scarlet opened a warp steps leading a dozen of kilometers away. Those things were all linked to the forest, so the further you go, the weaker they'll become. Keep walking straight past the steps and you should reach a village by nightfall. The magical beasts took the others on their backs and ran through the dimensional door while giving the Scorpicor a nod of their heads as a thank you. They were grateful to Scarlet, but also aware that they were nothing but a liability to her ants caught in the middle of a fight between titans who could stomp them without even noticing. Now that Scarlet had the enemy's energy signature stored by the eyes of Mina Dion, she had no more need to guess the identity of her opponent, she just needed to reach them. Her pansnay had allowed her to track Balkia, despite he was hiding in the blood desert and she was in the Griffin Kingdom, whereas the new hybrid behind the mud puppets was just a few kilometers away, their life force shone like a sun to her eyes, allowing her to fly in a straight line at subsonic speed until she reached her destination. It was a cave, located at the base of a hill, once it had been covered in grass and flowers, but now the whole area was a wasteland full of dead trees. Her pansnay could only pick up three different energy signatures and they were all hybrids. This smell. Zaka, is it really you? Now that most of the smells were gone and with the hybrid so close, Scarlet's nose could easily perceive the familiar scent which in turn jogged her memory. Zaka was an emperor beast even older than Scarlet was. In a sense, Scarlet considered her almost as a relative. Zaka was the mother of all news, a feline species of emperor beasts, she had the head of a monkey, the body of a tiger, the wings of an eagle, and the front half of a snake for a tail. Both the new and the Scorpicor were Chimras, sharing light magic as one of two innate elements. The other one was fire for the Scorpicor and air for the new. How could you do something so cruel to your own home? To yourself? Have you gone insane? Scarlet asked. She remembered the new being a gentle and kind soul. To the point that she had refused to take the mantle of Lord of the Forest because of her hate for violence. I have no idea how you could find me so quickly, but it doesn't matter. Zaka's voice wasn't feminine anymore. It was the flat and cold tone of an undead who didn't care for their past anymore. As for your question, what kind of mother would let her children starve? The creature that came out of the cave barely resembled the Emperor Beast that Scarlet remembered, Zaka had now a horned skull for a head, her body had turned white snow, and she was capable of standing on her hind legs 3 meters, 9 feet 10 inches, tall, having become more humanoid than before. Zaka's empty eye sockets were lighted by red undead energy. I don't know what you are talking about, but nothing justifies such a blatant abuse of forbidden magic. Scarlet's eyes became stone cold as she guessed what kind of changes had Zaka put herself through. It's not forbidden magic if it's done for the greater good. All kinds of creatures will be able to benefit from my discovery. Normally, a mana and a black core cannot coexist, but what happens if you add blood core? Being made of darkness magic, a blood core can withstand the chaos of the black core, while its red part made of pure life force can nurture a weakened mana core, prolonging its existence. What I found it's the cure for all illnesses. Something so great that it can defeat death itself. This is my legacy for all of our children, who will be able to thrive as perfect life forms. The only problem is that both the black and blood core need a lot of energy, but I'm certain that with enough time I will be able to solve this issue as well. Zaka said. Are you out of your mind? Your current form is far from perfect. To survive just for a few months, you have killed thousands and completely destroyed the balance of the forest. Mogar will not allow this. Foolish cat. Mogar doesn't care about any of it. Otherwise how could it let so many bad things happen? Why abominations and undead are the only ones allowed to live forever while all the other creatures live a life of pain before dying? Zaka asked. I could tell you that pain is a constant of life and that the immortality you envy so much has a heavy price, but I'm tired of listening to your nonsense. Have at you. Scarlet had hoped to appeal to whatever good there might be left in the new, but after seeing the monstrosities Zaka had turned herself into, she had given up, she used that time to cast her light sovereign array. It projected a white six-pointed star inscribed in a white circle that filled its area of effect with the light element, so that using chaos magic was impossible. On top of that, it created a natural source of light energy that allowed Scarlet to skip conjuring energy and go straight to manipulate it, making her casting speed much faster. Unfortunately, the new was on her same page and had used that time to cast more than just an array. To turn herself into a hybrid, Zaka had used forbidden magic and sacrificed countless lives. It had allowed her to merge her body with part of an abomination and a grave lord she had raised with necromancy. She now had three different minds capable of parallel thought, resulting in triple casting. The new unleashed the life suppression array while her abomination side cast the tier 3 chaos magic void rain. Void rain produced a volley of chaos arrows as fast as bullets, but because of light sovereign's effect, they immediately turned back into slow darkness projectiles. Only thanks to her array did Scarlet have the time to block them by conjuring stone shields with a wave of her hand. Chapter 617. Life suppression, however, was a tougher client. 
It conjured a black five-pointed star inscribed in a red circle, which allowed the person at its center to feed on the energy the array drained from everything inside its area of effect. Scarlet inwardly cursed as she realized that both her array and her life force were being turned against her, making the new even more powerful. Yes. I knew it. You are the key to my research. Zaka said as the flood of nutrients made the hunger that had tormented her ever since her metamorphosis disappear. Black flames erupted from her neck, enveloping her skull as her body started to mutate once again. What goes around comes around, pal. Scarlet reacted quickly, turning her light sovereign into its darkness magic counterpart. Normally she would have suffered from its deadly effects as well, but thanks to life suppression, all of its energy was redirected to the new, the black flames disappeared as the hybrid started to wither. Life suppression injected the poisonous darkness energy directly into Zaka's cores, making it spread like wildfire. No. All the life force I have collected. Lost. Darkness magic was the bane of both undead and abominations. Zaka could feel her blood and black core weakening as the darkness magic seeped through them until it almost reached her mana core. Her tail fell onto the ground, turning into specks of darkness before fading into nothingness. Look at yourself and at what you have become. Do you understand now? Abominations and undead leave no corpse behind because they are simply shadows of their former self. If there's anything left in you of the kind you I knew, let me give you a painless death. Scarlet said, dispelling shadow sovereign a second after Zaka did the same for life suppression. Shut up. What good is a mother who can't protect her own children? I refuse to die. The sky blackened and the earth trembled. A black pillar descended from the thunderclouds that were blotting the sun and enveloped the new. Do you see it? Mogar agrees with me. This is my world tribulation. The planet still considers me one of its guardian candidates. Dark clouds gathered and spun around the two emperor beasts as Zaka's form became covered in black scales. You're only half right. Scarlet said. The black pillar is just a sign that Mogar has relinquished any hope for you. You're turning into an eldritch and there's no way back from that. You're right about the tribulation part, though. Only it's not yours. Scarlet was forced back into her bestial form and then her body started to change, doubling its size. Her fur morphed into red scales as thick as a shield, and a new set of feathered wings appeared on the scorpicor's back right beside her membranous ones, her muzzle turned into a mask of fire, only her eyes remained visible. Scarlet's red mana erupted into a raging purple flame, hot enough to blacken the ground below her. The Emperor Beast roared as she attacked the Eldritch with her claws. The two creatures rolled on the ground, spraying red or black blood whenever one of them managed to wound her opponent. Soon Scarlet realized her mistake. Her fangs and claws were as sharp as those of the Eldritch, but she lacked the deadly touch such creatures possessed. Each wound Zaka's new body inflicted to Scarlet would also drain her life force, mending the Eldritch's wounds. The scorpion sting at the end of Scarlet's tail stung Zaka multiple times. At such close range, neither of them could cast spells and the Eldritch was quickly getting the upper hand since she could heal and attack at the same time. What good is venom against someone who has no blood? You took everything from me, so I will slowly savor your death. In her eldritch form, Zaka's heart was quickly being replaced by the hunger that plagued all abominations. She was aware that after killing Scarlet, her own cubs would be her next prey. She was too hungry to care anymore for such a dead weight. Her mind was becoming colder and more calculative by the second, it's all Scarlet's fault. If not for her meddling I would still be anew. All of my hard work is ruined. Zaka's train of thought was interrupted by a sudden burst of pain coming from her back. A scorpicor's tail didn't inject venom. Plants, undead, abominations, there were too many creatures that would be immune to such a weapon. Acid, on the other hand, worked the same way on all kinds of enemies. The surprise made the Eldritch falter long enough for Scarlet to escape from her deadly embrace and take flight. She was bleeding from multiple deep wounds and her red scales had been blackened by the Eldritch's parasitic touch, that does it. Mogar is truly a scumbag. How can it give Zakara a power-up, turning her into an Eldritch in the middle of our fight while giving a tribulation to me? Not only does it not give me a single advantage, but also if I fail it, I'll die, no matter the result of the fight. Scarlet thought, using light fusion to treat her wounds, Zaka was still getting used to her new body, but since air was one of her innate elements, she was able to fly better than Scarlet. The Scorpicor only had the time to wave a single spell before the enemy caught up with her, damn if I miss my pants nay. It would help me to understand how much power Zaka has left. Too bad that chaos magic is too dangerous. If I take any artifact out of my pocket dimension, I risk it getting destroyed. I only have one trick left at this point. Scarlet kept dodging and stinging with her tail at her opponent, trying to stall for time as long as she could. Eldritch were indeed powerful, but because of their hunger, they consumed mana even while standing still. They needed a constant supply of energy to survive, so during such a heated battle, a newborn Eldritch like Zaka couldn't last long. She had yet to learn how to use her new abilities to their fullest, Zaka was well aware that the tables had been turned. Each sting of Scarlet's tail opened a new wound, making her hunger worse. In the few seconds they had played airborne tag, she had consumed a lot of vitality just to keep up with her opponent's speed. Zaka was eager to finish the duel and find something to eat. She focused her remaining energies into a full-powered tier for chaos magic spell, Hollow Void. The black spear erupted the moment Scarlet was forced to slow down to avoid a patch of tall trees. At such a close range, the spell was unavoidable, finally. Here's my chance. Scarlet thought as she unleashed a powerful tier for spell, Light Pillar. For a split second, the two spells clashed and Howling Void easily pierced through Construct, but Scarlet was expecting that. She reversed the light into darkness, so that the opponent's chaos magic stripped her own spell of its light element turning the Howling Void into normal darkness magic and vice versa. Thanks to her ruse, Zaka had unwillingly turned Scarlet's Dark Pillar into a chaos spell. The huge energy mass was too big and too fast to dodge. The Eldritch took the full force of the chaos pillar, dying on the spot. Chapter 618 Scarlet didn't fare much better. Darkness magic was slow, but she was still close to its source and she was wounded. She managed to only partially dodge the incoming attack and crashed to the ground with half of her side destroyed by Zaka's spell. She gritted her teeth to not lose consciousness and used invigoration to escape from the jaws of death. After she recovered from her wounds, Scarlet was surprised to notice that she was still in her pseudo-guardian form. 
She waited to be back to her peak condition before taking the eyes of Mina Dion out of her pocket dimension, much to her surprise, the artifact could still perceive Zaka's life force running under the Galuan forest in the form of an intricate network of hybrid tentacles. They were all converging into the cave from which the Mad New had emerged, Scarlet stepped inside the cave, finally able to make sense of Zaka's ramblings about her offspring. In the middle of the cave, inside two gelatinous pods, there were the remains of two smalls news. The tendrils that Scarlet had seen and fought up to that point were coming out of the pods, providing the cubs with a constant flow of nutrients, they were the size of ten years old child, but they were skeletal and on the verge of death. Up until Zaka's death, the tendrils had harvested life force just to keep them alive, thanks to her pants nay, Scarlet could see a black core inside their bodies. Somehow it had taken a deep root, to the point that without it the small news wouldn't be able to survive. They must have been infected during the monster outbreak. Scarlet pondered. Judging from what I see, the abomination must have been killed before its seeds could properly develop. Once the creature died, Zaka's children must have started to slowly die due to the black core fading. Emperor beasts have an amazing vitality, but in this case, it would be a curse. It must have taken them weeks to get to this point. Weeks during which Zaka could only watch them suffer. It must have driven her mad. Scarlet was really close to the truth. The creatures involved in the so-called monster outbreak weren't actually monsters, just abominations hidden behind a meat mask. One of them managed to spread its disease to some of the creatures of the forest before being captured. When Zaka had realized her cubs were among the victims, she had begged the lord of the forest, Maisha the unicorn, to spare the abomination. To keep it alive long enough for her to safely extract the black cause or at least find a cure for her cubs' condition, yet Maisha refused. She knew that any attempt would have been pointless. That a corrupted core was beyond saving and that leaving the abomination alive would only mean giving it more chances of escape. Zaka wasn't the only one struck by that tragedy, but unlike the other parents, she couldn't find the strength to put her down her small, innocent pups. She had used all the ingredients she had, all the artifacts she possessed just to buy them one more week, then one more day until she struggled to prolong their lives of even one second. It was then that her mind had snapped, making her turn to forbidden magic to solve her problem. The other beasts called it madness, but to Zaka it was an epiphany. If they needed the black core to survive, then she only needed to find a way to make it thrive. The answer was so simple that she almost couldn't believe it. Her research needed test subjects, but luckily the forest was full of life. When Maisha had realized what was happening, it was too late. Zaka's hybrid form fueled by her madness and countless sacrifices proved to be too strong for her. Scarlet watched at the pods and at their content. Her heart ached at the idea of killing such helpless creatures, but she had no choice. Even if she managed to somehow stabilize their condition, those hybrids were cursed to experience the worst of their three worlds. Like an undead, they would never physically grow, like an abomination, they would live in perpetual hunger. Last, but not least, it was only a matter of time before they regained some form of consciousness and either committed suicide, or fell into desperation once they understood how cruel their destiny was, through the gel of the pods, Scarlet could hear their small voices moaning in pain, their bodies squirming now that Zaka's death had stopped the tendrils from working. She had no idea what kind of magic the new had used, and the young creatures were in agony. A wave of her pawn released enough darkness magic to shut down their pain receptors before giving them a peaceful death. They didn't even notice it, Scarlet made sure to make them fall asleep before putting them out of their misery only after the last hybrid was dead did the sky clear, and the earth cease its trembling, wait, what? Wasn't the tribulation about killing Zaka, but releasing the cubs? Then why did nothing happen when I met Lith? He's a hybrid too, but Moga didn't want me to put him down. Isn't he supposed the potential guardian of death or something? Then what am I? Her streak of unanswered questions was interrupted by an all too familiar feeling. It was like a stomach ache, but worse. As if instead of bile, she had to puke molten lava. No. Please, not now. I've waited for over a hundred years for my core to evolve and it happens now? I'm never coming back to the Gorgon Empire. This place is bad luck. Scarlet thought as the impurities accumulated inside her body over the years were expelled. The pain she was experiencing made the fight with Zaka look like a pleasant experience. Asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. A few weeks had passed since Lith had resumed his duty as a ranger. Lucia was already free from snow and bad weather, where a spring had yet to reach the Keller region. After the events of Zantia, everything became quiet. Despite the chilly winds and black clouds on the horizon, the Northmen could see all the signs that announced the end of winter. Days would pass now between snowstorms and the bad weather would last hours instead of days. Soon the roads would be open again and supplies wouldn't be an issue anymore. Rich and poor alike could plan their tomorrow without fear, so there wasn't much for Lyft to do. He had often the time to visit Camilla and his parents, but most importantly, he had received full access to some of the most important libraries of the kingdom. It allowed him to gain a complete understanding of the basics of higher necromancy and to learn all about the known undead species. Fuck! Lyft said with a dejected voice, drawing on himself several looks of reproach. He had searched for years for that knowledge, working day and night for the Griffin Kingdom to get his hands on everything known to mankind about UN death. It was a vital step in his research to escape from the cycle of death of rebirth that had worried him since his reincarnation on Mogar. Like if often happens, the answers he got weren't the ones he had hoped for. Chapter 619 Thanks to all the merits he had racked during the past year, Lith had been granted access to the Royal Library. It was the biggest and most complete library in the Griffin Kingdom, covering all the subjects known to mags, including the forbidden ones, the library was comprised of many floors, one for each element. Normal books could be checked out freely, whereas to consult forbidden books it was necessary to spend merits, and receive a recommendation letter from someone with a high clearance level. I in Lith's case, both Professor Moth and Vasta had vouched for him along with his commanding officer. Lith was now sitting behind at a hardwood table, surrounded by fellow mags in search of knowledge, the city of Valron, the capital of the Griffin Kingdom, was surrounded by all kinds of protective arrays and because of them, Lith couldn't put the valuable tomes inside Solaspedia to read them all in a single moment. Dimensional magic would allow spies and thieves to freely warp, so it had been sealed. Lith and Solas had spent the last few hours reading tomes about necromancy, to see if among the undead species there was one suitable for Lith's tastes, unfortunately, despite having even checked the legendary creatures section, their quest had ended up in failure, sigh, why real vampires suck so bad. They have so many limitations, that now I can understand why despite becoming a vampire is relatively safe and easy no mage wants to be turned into one. 
Lif thought, please, if there was such a thing as an immortal and eternally young species that had no weakness at all, outside becoming a disco ball under the sunlight, they would have ruled Mogar for millennia. Solar said, yet despite her mockery, she was dejected as well. As long as Lif was human and with a cracked life force at that, he was bound to die sooner or later. Solus had no intention of letting that happen, but just like Lif, she was now clutching at straws. According to the tomes of the royal library, there was a way for Lif to safely become an undead and retain all of his memories. Unlike necromancy, that worked on corpses that no longer had a working brain and mana core, many species of undead could slowly turn a living being into one of their own. In such a case, the subject would never really die. A blood core would take form inside their bodies and grow over time, replacing their mana core the moment their heart ceased to beat. The problem was that there was no undead species without absurd or crippling limitations. Most of them were unable to even move during the day, trapped in a forced slumber no matter the danger they were in or how deep below the earth they hid, others, like the banshees, couldn't cross water and would die if they fell into a river or a lake. Yet their biggest weakness was their inability to use light magic. For someone like Lith, who had spent countless hours to become a healer, it was an unacceptable trade. To make matters worse, light magic wasn't just needed to heal others. Without it, Lith would also be unable to forge master truly powerful artifacts, and even to use dimensional magic as freely as he had always done, Blink, one of his bread and butter spells during fights, required light magic and so did Switch. Undead weren't completely unable to use light magic, but since their blood core was unable to assimilate it from its surroundings, they had to consume their own life force in order to produce light energy. It meant that if Lyft decided to turn into an undead, just to forge master a single item he would need to consume the equivalent of a pigpen of food. Some undead were picky about who they could feed upon and of course, their victim had to be alive. Lyft couldn't store living humans inside his pocket dimension and he couldn't bear the thought of traveling with a caravan of slaves. He would have to feed and care for them every day just to murder them later, I can be morally flexible, sure, but where the heck do I keep so many people at all times without being found out and hunted down? Lyches have no such problems, but after reading a lot about them, I don't think it's something I'd like to become, first, there is no surefire way to become one. I would need to spend years to find a way suitable for my unique mana core and life force, just for a measly 10% success rate, with no do-overs. My luck always sucked, so I don't feel like playing with dice, also, the phylactery is a huge weak point. It cannot be stored in a dimensional item and it can't be too far. On top of that, after meeting Zolgrish, I discovered another weak point Lyches have. If I conceal space with an array and I cut them off from the link with their phylactery, both their physical and magical strength will be halved, plus they would become unable to recover their mana. Lith thought, not knowing he had just discovered the principle underlying Lee Gain's anti-lick spell, unless they bring it with them. Solus pointed out, that's too risky. Life vision, your mana sense, Scarlet's pants nay. There are countless ways to spot such a powerful object and even if the lick might somehow cloak it, the constant stream of mana and life force would betray its position, Lith was right, yet most ancient leeches would rather bring their phylactery around with them while fighting a truly dangerous opponent than being one-shotted. I can definitely discard becoming an undead as an option, unless I'm either desperate if I discover a new species with acceptable limits. Creating a new race all by myself might as well take all the lifespan I've left and I would have no certainty of success. He thought, I don't like the idea of turning into an abomination either. They may be immortal, but so far all the ones I met seem to be mad, miserable, or both. My best shot is to research ways to improve my life force to prolong my existence while I search for the blueprints of a soul-binding artifact. After copying everything he might need to improve his true necromancy, Lith left the royal library. Both of his communication amulets were silent, but in his experience, no news were good news. If the army kept not bothering him Lith could keep exploring the lost cities of the Keller region for clues, whereas not hearing from both his family and Camilla meant that Fallmug had yet to try anything funny. Lith would have loved to stop torturing him and take him out of the picture once and for all, but he had to play it smart so that no one would suspect him. Thanks to the tower warp, he had never left his prey alone for long. Lith let those morbid thoughts slide and used the capital's gate to return to the north. Despite all of its flaws, the army was still the perfect cover to spend a long time away, performing his research night and day. Among his most recent pet projects, there was crafting with the eyes of the Baylor a magical staff that could mimic General Vorgas, improving the power of the lesser undead he was able to create at will and raid the lost city of Huriol. Unlike the other ruins he had visited, Huriol was almost perfectly preserved. Gold, jewels, magic books, there were countless things up for the taking. Unluckily, the creatures inhabiting the city made every raid extremely difficult. Chapter 620 Lith's predecessors hadn't left all the goodies out of the goodness of their hearts. Finding something valuable inside Huriol required luck, plus one had to fight not only against powerful monsters, but also against time, the lost city was a living labyrinth that would periodically rearrange itself, making any old map useless. To make matters worse, its walls couldn't be affected by earth magic, dimensional magic was sealed, and destroying the walls to make haste only made the cursed item that ruled Huriol angry, normally. The problem with the inhabitants of a lost city was that they would grow in power and numbers over time. It was a ranger's duty to cull them and reset their power before they became too strong. I in Huriol's case, however, the number of creatures that spawned and their power was fixed. Even the monsters had a hard time finding their way out of the city and Lith, only had to kill those who managed to reach the external barrier before they could breach it, from the outside, the lost city looked like a giant stone dome. The only entrances were located at the ground level and breaking the dome would make the cursed object who, protected, the city turned the whole Huriol into a rampaging golem, flight was useless as well, making many wonder what lay at the center of the city and for what purpose it had been built. Lith couldn't stop thinking how odd it was that rangers were allowed to take for themselves whatever they recovered from it. Huriol was also nicknamed, the cursed training ground. Lith used his badge to bypass the magical barrier isolating the city and check the reset counter. The labyrinth would randomize itself at fixed intervals, so he had to make sure that it wouldn't happen any soon, otherwise, if a combat lasted for too long or if he managed to get deep into Huriol, Lith would risk becoming trapped inside the city. According to the counter, the next reset was in half a day, so Lith went directly inside, I swear, this place is oddly familiar. The rooms are always different, but the vibe here is something I already experienced somewhere else. Lith thought while crossing a small courtyard, where several training dummies and weapons were orderly lined up. A quick check with life vision confirmed to him that there was nothing valuable, the only magical aura in the room belonged to the walls encasing the courtyard. 
Solus used her spirit magic to pick up the weapons and use them to strike down the dummies. Why did you do that? Lith asked as the last straw man was cut into half, cursed training ground, training dummies, I thought maybe there was a reward for clearing the task. She replied. Yeah, if this was a video game, you might be right. Real life is a bit different, though. No one rewards you for completing menial tasks. Lith's voice oozed with sarcasm, the following room looked like a warehouse of some kind. Wooden cupboards and shelves were lined against the wall, while multiple vases filled with food lay around, enchanted with an unknown spell that prevented it from rotting, jackpot. Lith thought. I've never seen this kind of pseudo core before. I wonder if I'm the first to. A quick use of invigoration made him lose interest, damn, the pseudo core it's too complex compared to a dimensional item. This thing is worthless to me. Lith still copied it down to the smallest detail, just to be safe. Fake mags couldn't scan magical items as he had just done and even if such a spell was of no use to Lith, the kingdom might have been interested in buying it from him. The shelves in the room had several books, but after a quick glance, they turned out to be either inventory or account books. Lith opened the door leading to the next room, surprised that he had yet to find a crossroad or a monster. Up to that point, his path had only one way in and one way out, making a map pointless, the outer layers have always been easy, but never this simple. If it keeps like this, I could get really deep into Huriel. Why is my paranoia sense tingling, though? Lith thought, well, maybe because if it's easy to get in then it's also easy to get out? It's not like this place is in habit, thanks, Solus. Way to jinx it. Lith said as he stepped inside what looked like a dorm, running into a mage slayer and a white lady. They were two kinds of undead who were able to stay awake during the day, as long as they avoided direct sunlight, unfortunately for Lith, all the light inside Huriel was artificial, so that his enemies could move without problems. A mage slayer was usually born from the dying body of a powerful swordsman. I in their new form, they would be unable to use fake magic, but their undead nature combined with their skills allowed them to channel the elemental energy into their swordplay, they weren't true mags, but they were able to cast spells without any chant or hand signs. They just needed to perform a series of attacks to unleash all kinds of elemental attacks up to tier 3. On top of that, magic was their source of nourishment, making all kinds of direct spells useless against them, no matter their tier. Both fake and true mags had a hard time facing someone with infinite stamina, that could use magic by simply swinging their blades in close combat. The mage slayer in front of Lith looked like a featureless humanoid mass of orange gas wielding a longsword covered in runes of power. Its red eyes were fixated on him, seething with hunger, inside the borders of Huriol, all the creatures the labyrinth spawned couldn't die, but that didn't mean that they would be freed from their needs. Why is its sword covered in runes? Aren't they supposed to disappear after the forge mastering process ends? Solus thought, glad to have the opportunity to share part of her memories without giving out her secret. Why is your sword covered in runes? Lith asked with a sarcastic voice, talking to Solus more than to the mage slayer. The creature rushed at Lith, its blade slashing the air in front of itself to unleash a fireball, sorry, Solus. It says it doesn't feel ready to share on a first date. Lith thought, while clapping his hands. It conjured a spinning air dome that sucked the fireball and deflected it against the white lady. Born from the corpse of a woman who had killed her own children, white ladies were capable of using only two elements, water and darkness. They needed to feed on the life force of children and they extracted it by drowning them, the undead was wearing a tattered wedding gown. The pristine white of the dress emphasized her grey necrotic flesh. Due to the prolonged lack of food, the white lady was unable to retain her humanoid physical appearance and was reduced to a zombie-like creature. Yet her hunger didn't diminish her magical powers one bit. She hurled a powerful stream of water that enveloped the fireball and snuffed it out like it was a candle. The white lady shrieked in anger while looking at her companion with so much anger that Lith hoped she would attack the mage slayer. Chapter 621 White ladies are weak to fire. According to the gazillion books I consulted recently, they burn like gasoline. I don't know what kind of relationship these two have, but if they coordinate their attacks I'll be in a pinch. I must even the field. Lith thought, the mage slayer ignored the white lady's grievances and jumped at Lith's spell, incapable to see past the meal served in front of itself. Lith dispelled his air dome and struck with the gatekeeper sword infused by darkness magic, the only element mage slayers couldn't feed upon, the creature was unable to scream, but its eyes went wide open as the enchanted metal pierced through the orange gas, creating a gaping hole the size of a soccer ball on its chest for a split second, Solus, wasn't his heart supposed to be there? Lith asked. Their vengeful heart was the source of all the powers a mage slayer had and also their weak point. Only a physical weapon could destroy it, but finding it wasn't easy, the undead could move it freely inside their gaseous body, even while they were fighting, yes, it was. Now it's in the nether regions. She replied. Lith's life vision was blinded by the magical gas that made up the mage slayer's body, but her mana sense was keen enough to follow the heart's movements, the white lady had never stopped hurling new water. She was using it to shape a water cage to drown Lith. He was an adult, so he was bound to taste like horse shit, but beggars couldn't be choosers, Lith blocked the lunge of the mage slayer, interrupting both its attack and its spell while unleashing a stream of lightning from his hand. The electricity traveled through the water and entered the white lady's mouth, setting her ablaze from the inside. It wouldn't have been so easy in normal circumstances. The starvation had turned her flesh into dried meat, making it even more inflammable than a white lady already was. The undead turned into a pyre while screaming in agony. It took her less than a second to be reduced to a wet pile of ashes, now that Lith could focus on a single opponent, he conjured a thick layer of spirit magic around himself. It would be useless against a gaseous opponent, but the enchanted blade the mage slayer was using was physical. Lith used spirit magic to envelope the sword more each time it clashed with his gatekeeper, making it slower as his grip over the blade of the enemy became stronger. The mage slayer wasn't able to use fusion magic and with its sword being constantly pulled in random directions, it was unable to complete a single spell soon the second undead was at Lith's mercy. Spirit magic kept its blade locked in Lith's left hand while the gatekeeper in his right hand cut through its body so fast that its heart was perfectly visible, no matter where the mage slayer moved it. Lith cut the heart into small pieces and kept cutting it until the smoke stopped regenerating. Unfortunately, the sword disappeared as soon as the undead was vanquished. A mage slayer's physical body actually consisted of two parts, the heart and the blade, it's very odd, soulless. According to the books, the sword should be an exact replica of the blade master's weapon. Yet in the pictures we found, their enchanted weapons had nothing special. 
I'd remember so many runes. Lith thought, yeah. It's likely due to Huriel being very ancient. If the Mage Slayer was centuries old, maybe so it was the forge mastering process they used when it was still alive. It's too bad that Conjured Blades have no pseudo core. We might have learned a lot. She sighed, look at the bright side. If the path in front of us continues to be straightforward, those creatures would have reached the exit in no time and then we would have been forced to come here to slay them. Not only did we save ourselves a trip, but also we might get deeper inside the city than anyone else ever managed to. Lith replied, regretting his words the moment he thought them, way to jinx it, Lith Solus chuckled, hoping that for once they would be lucky, before moving on, Lith searched the room. The dormitory was a long rectangular room, at least 100 meters, 330 feet, long with four poster beds lined up against the wall. In front of each bed there was a dimensional chest, ready to be imprinted, this is even odder. According to Professor Wainmeyer, a magical item that's not imprinted can't last long. Then how can these dimensional chests be in perfect condition? Lith thought, maybe they are also full. Solar said, I told you to look at the bright side, not to start daydreaming. This is barely the third room. We might as well be like the hundredth visitor or something. Lith still imprinted one of the chests to probe its contents. It contained a chamber pot, some kind of odd looking pajamas, and a set of items for personal hygiene. This place must be very old if they expected the residents to use chamber pots. It means they had yet to discover how to use mana crystals to obtain tap water. Lith thought, their path kept being straightforward only for a few more rooms. Lith found a training weapons warehouse, an office filled with paperwork written in an unknown language, and a canteen bigger than the village of Lucia before they met a crossroads. At that point, Lith checked his pocket watch and started to draw a map. During his past visits, he had never managed to get very far due to his busy schedule and the abundance of monsters. According to the army's information, every time a monster was killed, it was sent back to square one, near Huriel's core. Also, the city was built on multiple levels and all the rooms would be shuffled every time the labyrinth rearranged itself. Lith had no idea what floor the city core was on, nor where the good stuff could be stored. Yet the prospect of finding ancient artifacts, and study the pseudo core of a being capable of resurrecting its minions without taking away their free will drove him to continue, his search. After several more offices, pantries, and even an inner garden bigger than a football stadium, Lith was about to run out of time. He started to run and avoided searching the rooms hoping to find something useful, when he stumbled into a forge mastering lab, Lith knew that it would be his last stop. There were so many enchanted items to almost blind their magical senses. The forge in the middle of the room was made of an unknown metal point one second it was white with black veins all over it and the next second, it was black with white veins. The forge was solid, but its surface constantly changed, as if there were two colliding forces battling for dominion over it Lith struck it with the hilt of the gatekeeper, making it emit a crystal clear sound he had never heard before, Solus, this thing isn't made of adamant, right? He asked while placing his hand on the forge and using invigoration, nope. I have no idea what it is, but its mana flow is magnificent, Lith couldn't agree more. Unlike his adamant forge, the one in front of him was able to draw in the world energy and compress it to the point it almost had a pseudo core, even though it wasn't enchanted. Chapter 622. Lith tried to lift the forge, but it weighed too much, even for his inhuman strength, damn. Without dimensional magic, we cannot store it nor warp it away. Lith inwardly cursed non-stop, you could make it float with a spell, but this thing is too big to get it out of here by crushing through the walls. The cursed object that oversees this place would kill us before we manage to escape. Solus said, Lith tried to lift it with a spell anyway. Much to his surprise, an external source of mana blocked his spell and the room started to rumble as an earthquake was about to bring down the roof. The quake stopped the moment Lith let the forge go, let's run away. There's enough mana surrounding us to kill you in the blink of an eye. Solus warned him. Lith waited a few minutes and resumed searching the room only when Solus confirmed to him that the hostile mana was fading. Even if it was very old, it was still a forge mastering lab. After working for two years at the White Griffin, Lith knew how such places were built. He ignored the open cabinets and went straight for the test room, where any competent forge master kept his prototypes. A weapon rack full with all kinds of swords covered in blue runes was waiting for him, yes. Lith started picking them up, but after the first blade the rumbling resumed, forcing him to put them back in their place except for one. A second attempt to collect more than one sword confirmed his intuition. Okay, fine. They all have the same spell on them after all. Lith's sour grapes claim was followed by a quick read of the textbook stored in the libraries. Once again, he could only pick one or pay the consequences, the problem was that they were all written in gibberish and he was dangerously running out of time. The only silver lining in Lith's situation was that even if he was unable to understand the words, and all the magic circles depicted were unknown, the basics of forge mastering were still the same. Lith and Solus were instantly able to tell the tier of an enchantment just by looking at the complexities of the drawings, and the number of pseudo cores each spell was devised to handle. They picked a small book that was filled with only complex tier 5 forge mastering spells. Let's just hope they actually have a practical use. With my luck, they might as well be just teaching spells. Lith choked on those words, finally realizing why the Huriel seemed so familiar to him. The furniture's design was outdated and he had met the rooms in a random order, but too many things inside the lost city reminded him of the White Griffin Academy. Lith would have liked to put his intuition to the test, but there was no time. He used his flight spell to backtrack, moving as fast as he could while checking the map to not get lost. Solus couldn't help him this time, she was too focused keeping watch against possible threats, watch out. Something big and powerful is coming our way. She warned him. Lith turned to his right just in time to see an incredibly handsome man with emerald hair and purple eyes came from around the corner. Powerful I can believe, but big? Also, what's wrong with his hair? Did he come out of an anime or what? Lith didn't slow down and set up several barriers, just in case the newcomer was hungry like all the creatures Lith had met during his explorations, wait. If you help me to get out of here, I'll reward you handsomely. Said the green-haired man in a forgotten language. Seeing that Lith wasn't even listening, he charged forward with inhuman speed, shape-shifting into his real form. An emerald-scale dragon the size of three-story noble house started to give Lith chase, using air magic to support its gigantic wings and gain more speed, I said wait. The creature roared while desperately trying to catch up, Lith had never seen a real dragon before. 
His first reaction was surprise, immediately followed by his survival instincts kicking in, how bad is our situation? He asked, bright blue core inside the stronger body I have ever seen. Shape shift? Lit was losing ground, so he had his hybrid form's wings emerge from his back point one of the perks of the Oricalcum Skinwalker was that it was able to, revert to its liquid form at will, so even if dimensional magic was sealed inside Huriol, Lith had no need to take it off to be able of shapeshifting. The wings allowed him to go as fast as the dragon since his much smaller figure had an easier time maneuvering along the corridors. Lith only needed to fold his wings to go through a door whereas his alleged enemy had to revert back to human form. The emerald dragon was flabbergasted and overjoyed seeing a fellow dragon, so he attempted to speak in draconic, wait, I mean no harm, little brother. We can get out of here together. Too bad that Draconic was a guttural tongue so filled with power that it would hurt the ears of a normal human, making them bleed. Lith took it as some kind of sonic attack and moved even faster, I said stop. Outraged by the blatant lack of respect from the lesser dragon in front of him, the Emerald Dragon breathed bright blue origin flames against Lith. Thanks, sucker. Lith replied hurling a jet stream of origin flames of his own which countered the enemy attack and produced a conflagration that further enhanced his speed whereas it forced his enemy to stop. The Emerald Dragon couldn't cross the raging firestorm in front of himself without risking to die. How can a lesser dragon produce such a powerful flame? I only fired a warning shot, but he still managed to block it. Father Ligain must have become even stronger if even such a hatchling can reach that kind of skill. He thought, Lith was back to the straight path, so he could put away the map and focus only on his speed, how much until the reset? He asked, less than five minutes. Solus's reply made Lith curse, that's too much time. I don't want to fight a dragon. I don't even know what they are capable of, Lith moved outside the barrier, using his army amulet to call for reinforcements. General Vorg went pale hearing about the Emerald Dragon. Good gods, him again? The strike team will be there as fast as they can. Do not engage him unless the barrier is at risk. Fighting alone would be a suicide. Lith nodded while preparing for the worse. Little did he know that the conflagration caused by the origin flames had damaged Huriol's walls, making the cursed object overseeing the city react with extreme prejudice. The Emerald Dragon was currently fighting for his life against an endless barrage of spells, which prevented him from moving even one inch forward. Vorg and a full platoon of spellbreakers arrived less than a minute after Lith's call. They patiently waited for the enemy's arrival, casting several arrays one on top of another and using the barrier's power source to boost their spells. When the reset time arrived, the whole stone dome surrounding Huriol trembled and the Emerald Dragon was sent in a remote corner of the city. Chapter 623 it seems we were lucky, son. Said General Vorg while dispelling the arrays he was keeping at the ready. Usually when Jakra manages to get out, things go downhill fast. Is Jakra the dragon's name? Lith asked. No, that's how we call him. Her. Huh. Whatever that is. We've tried multiple times to communicate with him, but it never works. A dragon would be a powerful asset, so we've tried bringing language experts and giving him food. Yet the only thing he is interested in is getting out, so we are forced to kill him every time. We still have no idea why so many powerful creatures have been locked inside Huriol, but we cannot allow any of them to escape unless we are sure they can be trusted. In my book, whoever spews fire first and talks later, is unworthy of trust. Vorg waved his staff, creating a warping array leading to the closest gate. Ranger Verhen, you'll remain here until the next reset. If by then Jakra is still trapped, then you'll resume your regular duty. Don't hesitate to call for help. After Solus confirmed Lith that they were alone, he walked to the nearest Mana Giza and had her assume her tower form. He had no need to camp in the middle of nowhere, when he could use the surveillance mirror on the tower's first floor to keep an eye on Huriol from a distance. I know it may sound hypocritical coming from me, but I think Vorg is too paranoid. That dragon can only escape out of pure luck. Huriel has several flaws and we never managed to fully explore even one of them in the short time between resets. Lith said, taking their most recent prizes out of his pocket dimension. Agreed, but if you look at the bright side, it's like you got a few hours leave. Solus welcomed him in her wisp form. Yeah. There are far worse ways to spend your birthday, Solus. Happy birthday. Lith confirmed on his clock that it was more or less the same hour when 13 years ago he had spoken with Solus for the first time, and given her a name. Thanks. She said brimming with joy. She only needed a shred of consciousness to stand watch with the mirror. The rest was focused on the task at hand. It was one of the most difficult things Solus had ever done, but she wanted to do it anyway. Lith, can I ask you something as a birthday present? She asked. Anything you want. Within reason, of course. Can you promise me not to get angry? The wisp rested on his shoulder, wobbling in anxiety. I can try. That much I can promise. Are you sure that's all you want for your birthday? You're making me feel like I set the bar so low for you that. The wisp left his shoulder and stopped in front of his eyes before starting to grow in size, cutting Lith short in surprise. Soon Solus was in her humanoid form, wearing a simple dress with a flower design that left her shoulders and arms exposed. Well? What do you think? She searched his neck for the vein that she knew would throb whenever he was really angry, no matter how good his poker face was. That it was about time you told me. I was really starting to feel left out. Lith said, his neck vein calm and composed. Plus, if you waited more, it would have made my birthday present kind of awkward. He handed to her one of the Oricalcum hammers they had forge mastered. Its shaft was slimmer and more delicate compared to the other one. The words, maker of wonders, had been magically engraved at both sides of the shaft. The hammer's head featured an actual hammer on one side and a pick on the other. You knew all along. Solus felt embarrassed and frustrated at the idea of having spent so much time worrying for nothing. It wasn't that hard to guess. First, you refused to keep me company when I bathed, that happened way before I got my body. She thought. Then, you started to press me to go to sleep or left me to spend time with Tista. Plus, there was the increase in the food expenses and the bills for clothes Tista bought but never wore. If you consider that I knew that once the first floor of the tower would be restored you were meant to acquire your body made of light, it was almost obvious. Lith shrugged. So, you're not angry? She asked. No. 
I know all too well the difference between sharing your secrets because you want to and because you have to. I honestly don't understand the reason why you kept it a secret from me, but I was willing to give you the benefit of the doubt. You look gorgeous in that dress, by the way. Solus brimmed with joy at those words, and so did the tower, she hugged him, feeling for the first time Lith returning the embrace. Solus then told him that the reason she hadn't told him about her new form was that she didn't want to mess up his relationship with Camilla, I just wanted you to be happy. I realize that now it's like you are living together with two women at once and I didn't want to force you to lie to Camilla. I decided to come clean with you because I think my past could help us with your problem. Solus started to share with him all of her memories, about the forge mastering method she had witnessed during her visions and how different the enchanted items she remembered of were from those they currently used, they watched the memory of her adamant hammer over and over, comparing it with the sword they had recently acquired. There was a striking resemblance between them. Maybe this master Mina Dion of yours was also a teacher in an ancient academy. If I'm right and Huriel really is some kind of twisted version of the six great academies, maybe this sword was one of her works. Lith handed Solus both the book and the enchanted item, hoping they would trigger one of her flashbacks. Solus ran her fingers over the runes engraved in the blade. Each time she did it, they turned from blue to gold for a split second, emitting each one a different musical note. This hasn't been crafted by Master Mina Dion. Don't ask me why, but I'm sure of it. I think it might have been forge mastered using one of the techniques she shared, though. It feels so familiar to me that it can't be just a coincidence. She said. What about the gibberish? Can you read it? No. What's worse I don't recognize any of these spells. I don't think I have ever seen them before. She replied. Maybe it's because Mina Dion was an awakened too. If like Master Silverwing she decided to pass her knowledge onto fake mags, this is not what she would have taught you. According to your memories, you were likely to be her awakened disciple. Lith pondered. If you are right, why did she do this to me? Solus pointed at the tower and then to herself. Most powerful mags are bats hit crazy. Lith didn't know what to tell her. Chapter 624. Or maybe it was just the result of a failed experiment. The really important question is, do you really want to spend your birthday working or do you have anything in mind? Lith asked. I actually do. Solus took a small package from a secret compartment in the walls. Happy anniversary, Lith. He destroyed the gift paper, revealing a cylindrical ring made of an alloy of gold and orichalcum, with a blue mana gem set in the middle of it. The cloaking ring. That's why you didn't rush me making one. Does it have any special abilities? Lith's orichalcum armors had proven to be better than he had planned. The adamant was able to enhance a pseudo core in unexpected ways. Not that I'm aware of. Solus said, Lith imprinted the ring before slipping it on his right forefinger. How does my mana core look like now? Red, and your life force appears to be at human levels. Interesting. Normal cloaking items do not affect the life force. Maybe it depends on the fact that I'm wearing two at once. Let's see if it works the same for you too. Lith put the ring on Solus's right hand, but she felt her heart pounding anyway. Her light body disappeared with a pop and her dress fell to the ground. Foo-woo. Solus's voice made the tower's wall tremble for several seconds until she managed to make her body reappear. CK. That cost me a lot of stamina. We can't check the effects on me until I return in my gauntlet form. To add insult to injury, I don't have much time left before I need to rest. Taking human form drains a lot of energy. She said, her mood was getting worse by the second. Then revert to your wisp form. I don't want you to disappear in the middle of dinner. We've waited for too long for the moment when we could share a meal together. Lith said with a sigh, they spent the time before supper studying the unknown blade. The metal it was made of was nothing special, the mana crystals it was fused with were just cyan, and its pseudo core was rather simple. If not for the runes, Lith wouldn't have given it a second look. I don't get what purpose can engraving runes have. There's nothing special in this blade. Its mana pathways, its mana circulatory system, and even its pseudo core is insignificant. Maybe they have a special effect. We should try it out. Solus was out of options. She couldn't find any reason to waste time engraving runes as well, Lith reluctantly imprinted the blade with his mana. He would have preferred not doing it, because the weapon would have no market value until the moment he died. Solus created a test room, using earth magic to shape several dummies of different durability. The sword made short work of those as hard as wood, but was unable to put a dent on rocks. Lith channeled his mana through the pseudo-core and activated its effect. The pseudo-core suddenly grew in size and power, yet the mana pathways remained stable. The excess energy was drawn to the runes and spread across the entire weapon. A split second later, several air blades cut down all the remaining dummies, even the ones made of stone, before hitting the tower walls. Damn, that was unexpected. Are you alright, Solus? Yeah, don't worry. That thing is too weak to hurt me. Do you think what I think? Yes. The runes somehow compress and stabilize the pseudo-core, allowing even common iron to withstand such a powerful magical energy. Also, despite the cyan mana crystals, the spell had the same firepower that normally would require blue gemstones. Lith had determined the strength of the spell with life vision. The problem is that we have no idea how to carve them, nor if their number, kind, or position holds a special significance. Solus said. Nor we know when they have to be applied. Before or after the bonding spell? Before or after the forge mastering process, he asked, Lith opened the booklet, but he couldn't decipher a single word. We need a library, an archaeologist, or both. I doubt there are many dead language experts. Most of them are likely to work for the crown. Solus said. Sharing our discovery will be the last resort. If this kind of knowledge spreads, awakened ones will be able to convert it into true magic, just like us. I don't want to lose our edge on the competition. Lith put away both the sword and the booklet, searching his memory for someone trustworthy they could ask for help. Maybe and maybe not. Remember that awakened ones have a long life. This knowledge might be lost to fake mags, but it could be common among the council or whatever it's called. The crown might actually be aware of it as well. Do you remember the insanely powerful weapons Thrud had? Or Vorga's staff? They are impossible to make, even at our current level, at least without the runes. 
Solus pointed out. Are you saying that I'm the only idiot who doesn't know about it? No, more like you are part of the 99% population who doesn't have access to it. Also, the book is damn old. Magic makes progress over time, so the method described might be good for you who are starting from scratch, but it's likely to be old news. Unless we evolve it into something unique by combining it with your talent for forge mastering and my abilities as a tower, of course. Solus was intrigued by the idea, mana geysers gave them an edge that no other mage, even awakened ones, had. Lith took it less gracefully. Having spent hours exploring Huriol, risking his life, and almost facing a dragon for almost nothing made him want to scream. Almost. Fine. It's dinner time. Let's eat something, and then I'd like for us to do something I always dreamed about ever since I've seen your light body form. Lith said. Solus needed sheer willpower to not blush. Lith's dirty mind plus seeing him with his girlfriends too many times had rubbed off on her over the years, when they moved to the dining room, Solus discovered that Lith had stored a small banquet inside his pocket dimension. He had no idea what Solus liked or disliked, so he had bought a lot of stuff from his favorite restaurants. Most of them were meat dishes, but there were also vegetable soups and grilled fish Solus ate to her heart content, brimming with joy. Usually she could only consume food already stored in the tower, but aside from pastries and meat, Lith didn't carry much along with himself, at least not already cooked. Solus had no idea how to prepare a meal and neither did Tista, so her eating habits until that point had been pretty repetitive. Solus lived it more like a date rather than as a birthday, having all of Lyft's attention for herself. He asked her all about her new body. How it worked, how much she could feel, and experience. It doesn't feel like skin, but it's soft, warm, and pleasant to the touch. He said while touching her naked arm while using invigoration on her. Lyft wanted to check if there was any way to speed up her recovery process. No. I mean, yes. I mean, thank you. The situation was getting more awkward by the second. Solus was swallowing non-stop out of stress. Chapter 625 when Lith started to talk about forge mastering, things went back to normal, so that's what he was he was talking about. Solus thought, half relieved and half disappointed when they went back to the forge lab. We are, hopefully, the only two people in the whole Mogar who have the same mana signature. Now that you have a body, we can forge master together. Imagine what kind of items we can craft by combining our efforts. Not only do we always live, breathe, and work together, but our minds are also linked. I doubt there are many artisans who can match our mutual understanding. Lith said, being overly optimistic. It turned out that their mana was indeed compatible, but they had two completely different ways of forge mastering and they had to learn how to adapt to each other. The problem was that Solus had to keep the magic circle, empower both hammers, and forge master, whereas Lith could focus only on shaping the pseudo cores. On top of that, Solus could only hold her body for a few hours if she did nothing, but forge mastering exhausted her strength much more quickly. Time was an enemy she couldn't beat. With the little time we got, the best we can do is some basic stuff I have no need for anymore. Either we must make you stronger or find a way to speed up the crafting process. We could try again, but this time you step in only during the pseudo core injection phase. Lith proposed after a few test runs. Seems like a great idea. Do you mind if we continue another day? I'm so tired that even my wisp is about to collapse. Solus was back in her wisp form, wheezing and panting. Sorry, I didn't mean to make you work even on the date of your birthday. If you didn't, I would have thought that you had been replaced by an alien shapeshifter. She chuckled. Besides, I had a lot of fun. I never feel alive like when we work together, especially on forge mastering. Next time, I keep the circle and you do the crafting. That way I can observe your method and learn how to better coordinate with you. Lith proposed after they had discovered that they couldn't use mind fusion to speed things up. Fusing their minds caused Solus's body to get assimilated as well, making it impossible for her to wield her hammer. The fusion would allow them to feel what the other felt, but also would flood their minds with each other's thoughts. Shaping a pseudo-core required surgical precision, and their conflicting approaches at crafting ended up being a distraction. As soon as the next labyrinth reset happened, and there was no trace of Jarek, Lith received a call on his army amulet. He returned back to Huriel via the warping mirror before answering. Ranger Verhen, this is Ranger Morikiri. I supervise the Hessar region, and I'm calling you to schedule your yearly evaluation. Are you done with urgent business in Keller? Lith had never heard of other rangers, but he knew about Hessar. It was the region neighboring his own, and according to his books, it wasn't much better. Ranger Eerie was a man in mid-twenties, about 1.8 meters, 5 feet 11 inches, tall, so he was quite tall according to Mogar's standards. He had black hair and dark eyes. Like most rangers, he had a stubble a few days old and unkempt hair. There was no reason to keep appearances if you were alone most of the time. Yes, I've already taken care of most lost cities and I've nothing to do except for patrolling. What do you mean, evaluation? I do regular reports and so do those who request my help. I never heard about a further test. Lith asked. It's no standard procedure. A normal ranger has no need for a yearly evaluation, but so far you have proven to be anything but. The army is interested in putting your abilities to test since you have only one more year left of service. If you pass, the top brass might make you a good offer to tempt you to prolong your military career. I'll be in charge during the mission you and I will undertake together. Morik said. What kind of mission requires two rangers at once? Lith hated teamwork. Tower warping would become impossible with a partner and he wasn't a fan of camping in the open. The worst kind. Morik sighed. Babysitting. I beg your pardon? Some poor bastards have discovered ancient ruins inside an underground network of tunnels inside a dungeon, and a group of idiotic mags with more money than brain have organized an expedition. What does it have to do with us? Can't they pay for their private guards? Lith was getting annoyed just at the thought of such a job. In theory, yes. Ruins, however, are all considered royal properties unless a team of experts decides otherwise. The crown cannot allow for lost artifacts or knowledge to fall into the wrong hands. To make matter worse, one of those noble mags has a powerful daddy who demanded the best, and that's where we come into play. The ruins are located at the border between our turfs and we were both graded as monsters from the army. He was graded as me. Turf? This man speaks more like a beast than a human. 
Solus, analysis. Lith thought, yeah, right. Since when he can evaluate someone from his hologram? I need to see him in person. Solus replied. When and where? Lith asked, eager to finish the mission quickly. Let's meet in Letraz. It has a warp gate, it's close to our destination, and their roasted pork shank is to die for. I'll wait for you at the Wild Boar Tavern. We have a few things to do before picking up the kids, so come prepared. Over and out. Lyft took into account how much time it would take a normal mage to reach his destination and used all the extra time to use accumulation. One of the problems of conducting experiments was that it left him little time to refine his mana core. Luckily, a mana geezer combined with his tower allowed him to absorb world energy at a faster rate than normal. Lyft's blue mana core needed enormous amounts of world energy for a single cycle of expansion and compression. Usually, I'd rush there, but I don't want to raise suspicions by moving too fast. Behind Morik's kind words, there could actually be a trap. General Morn never liked me. He is likely the reason for this evaluation, he must be doubting my achievements. I bet that Pompasus is envious of how Constable Tyrus rewarded me after Xanche's events. Either it's him, or one of the enemies of Commander Berrien is trying to pull a fast one. Lith thought. Lith's had no intention of serving in the military more than it was needed. He hated politics and all the struggles that taking a side would result in, but at the same time, he wouldn't allow anyone to take away his merits. The following day, Lith reached Letraz. Solus was back in her ring form, wrapped around the cloaking ring she had crafted. She now appeared as nothing but a fancy stone decoration, if this Morakiri is an awakened or an emperor beast in disguise, at least Solus is safe as long as I give him no chance of using invigoration on me. Lith thought. Chapter 626. Letraz was a trading city and due to the winter lockdown, dimensional magic was still banned inside its walls to prevent illegal food trades to alter the price markets. Like most of the cities of the Griffin Kingdom, it was divided into three areas. The outer rim was the biggest and the most populated one. It was where the commoners lived, the granaries were located, and the resting place for tired travelers like stingy rangers who wanted to save a few coins but still enjoy a decent meal and bed. During winter, moving huge loads of merchandise required wagons and draft animals, so the roads were large enough to accommodate three of them at once. One lane was usually reserved for civil servants tasked with removing the brown and yellow snow, that would otherwise turn entire city blocks into open outhouses, the houses were one or two story high, made of stone or wood based on the owner's income. They were usually tightly packed with little to no space between them. Entire blocks consisted solely of warehouses, most of which were located near the city gates or bordered on the middle rim to facilitate the transportation of goods. The middle rim was occupied by merchants shops, craftsmen and artists workshops. Only the middle class could afford a house there. They were all made of stone and at least two story high. There was enough space between them to have a garden or a small stable. According to the desk sergeant who welcomed Lith when he stepped out of the warp gate, the Wild Boar Tavern was located in the middle rim. The ground level consisted of a wooden floor and walls, with several hardwood tables where groups of clients could sit to order their meal. Those who came in alone would rather sit in front of the counter to enjoy the company of the barkeep, of the other customers, and be served more. Quickly. The room had a cozy feeling and was lighted by several chandeliers, and a big popping fireplace that occupied a good quarter of the east wall. A whole pig was being roasted over the fire, spreading in the air a delicious smell that made people open up their stomach and loosen their wallet. Lith was no exception, so he ordered a plate of roasted pork and a beer to go with it even before sitting down at Morik's table. The ranger was eating one of the tavern's famous pork shank with the appetite of a man who had been stranded for a long time, and had forgotten his manners, bright cyan core, excellent physical conditions. According to my mana sense he shouldn't be an awakened and based on my life sense he is human. Solus said, the man had a lean but muscular physique. From the last time Lith had seen him, Morik had cut his hair, but the beard was still there. Except it was now dirty with gravy and the fat dripping from the meat. Please, have a seat. Morik said with a full mouth and spitting over most of the table. A powerful burp later, he cleaned his right hand over his shirt before offering it to Lith, who reluctantly shook it. If all rangers are like this guy, I now understand why we have a bad name. Lith thought. It's great to eat warm food without worrying about it getting cold or luring hungry beasts, right? Lith nodded, his appetite waning by the second. Morik noticed Lith's eyes staring at the grease stain above his heart, which had yet to completely fade. Gods, sorry. I almost forgot how a civilized human behaves. I've become too reliant on the self-cleaning properties of our uniform to fix my mess. I'll never be grateful enough for it. Without such a marvel, after a few weeks in the open, we'd stink so bad that the stench would kill us faster than any enemy. He laughed, making Lith glad for Solus's company and the safe haven she represented. Any question about the mission? Many. How dangerous is it supposed to be? Lith asked. Wish I know. It can go from boring as heck, where the worst thing we have to face is the whining of pampered smarty pants, to a nightmare where we have to pave our road in blood, steel, and bacon. Bacon? Lith asked regretting the question the moment he heard himself saying it out loud. Well, yes. When push comes to shove, we might run out of supplies, and monsters are meat, after all. A man needs to eat. His words sent a shiver down Lith's spine and made him check his food supply stored inside his pocket dimension. How are you supposed to evaluate me if nothing happens? I wish I was still such an optimist. Shit always hit the fan, kid. It's only a matter of when. If it's of any consolation, I'm not enjoying this any more than you do. As soon as winter ends, I'm going to retire. Morik replied. Retire? You're what, 25? Being a ranger it's not an easy job. Most people quit after two years, for tops. I've been a ranger for six years now. I've done my part and now I'm eager to convert my merits in a noble title, get me some lands, a missus, and dedicate my life to magical research. As for you, I heard you are a bounty hunter and now even a spellbreaker. This mission is the perfect task to put your abilities to the test. When exploring ruins, the real danger doesn't come from monsters or magical beasts. The real threat usually comes from the human sitting right beside you. Suddenly, Morik's jovial mood disappeared. 
He took a dramatic pause, looking at some point past Lith he had the expression of a man who had experienced one betrayal too much, and was now lost in unpleasant memories, Lith felt an odd sense of kinship toward the fellow ranger. At least until Morik stood up and said. Man, the food here is great, but it runs through your stomach as if it warps. See you in a jiffy. Lith sighed, wondering what kind of a moron he had been paired with while pondering Morik's words, interesting. So the army suspects that someone inside the group might be a foreign spy interested in our ruins. Lith thought, or maybe they want to prevent an internal strife. In case of a big discovery, a lot of people might be tempted to cause an accident to take credit for it. It's not just a matter of fame or glory, but also of the reward that the crown would bestow upon the one who contributes the most. Sola suggested, after Morik returned, they went stockpiling for food and everything they could need during the following days. Once they were done with the preparations, the two rangers left Letraz by flight. Our destination is the crystal mines in the Duchy of Laroxia. The rest of the expedition should arrive shortly. Noticing Lith's surprised look, Morik quickly added. Do you remember the monster outbreak? Well, some crazy-ass goblins raided the permanent guard post that protects the mines. Normal monsters would have been easily killed, but the little bastards could fire some black rays from their hands that pierced through our defenses like they were made of paper. Lith had no idea how to call it, but he had seen chaos magic enough times to recognize it from its effects. Chapter 627 Our defenses? You were there? Lith asked. Of course, I was. That's my turf and the kingdom spends big money to protect something like a crystal mine. They are more valuable than even platinum. Their production can't stop even during winter because even magical research would be affected. Thanks to their weapons and arrays, the guards managed to hold on until my arrival, but there wasn't much even I could do. You know goblins, right? Well, they were a frigging army, each one capable of using normal magic and those black rays as well. Once I realized we had no chance against such an assault, I detonated the arrays to buy us some time and lead the survivors inside the crystal mines. We went to its deepest tunnels and then I used earth magic to bring us even deeper. Usually doing such a thing is idiotic, raw crystals are unstable and earth magic could make them detonate. That's why you need specialized personnel and crystal smiths to work in the mines. Yet between a likely death and certain death, the choice was obvious. We walked for days, with only my rations to feed dozens of people, constantly on the run. Somehow, the goblins would always find us, and to make matters worse, they seemed to become better at magic over time. Long story short, we found the ruins by sheer luck. While escaping, we crossed an underground network of tunnels we weren't even aware of. At that point, our luck turned. The goblins stopped following us and I finally had the time to wait for reinforcements. You can easily guess the rest. Morik said, fuck me sideways. This means that the abomination inside the goblins had enough time to completely reform and is waiting in the area, or that even such a powerful creature is scared of those ruins. Either way, this is bad. Lith thought, Solus opened all of her senses at once. Lith's dirty mind wasn't the only thing that had rubbed off on her over time. Her paranoia was now fully developed too. Is that the moment when you consumed monster flesh? Lith asked. Yeah, but not the goblins. There was something off with them. Their smell, how they moved, heck, they could even talk. When they landed, Lith casually sniffed his partner. He trusted Solus, but after the experience with the awakened assassin, he had started to consider that her senses could be fooled. Morik kept talking like a magical beast. A normal human wouldn't have the time to perceive the goblin smell in the middle of a crisis. Yet all of his enhanced senses told him the odd ranger was human, the entrance to the mines resembled a military fort. A tall, round wall made of stone 1 meter, 3.3 feet, thick surrounded an area the size of a village. For guard towers stood 10 meters, 33 feet, tall, allowing the guards to notice incoming enemies from afar. Life vision showed Lith a series of arrays surrounding the fort. All the buildings within the walls were made of stone and in mint condition. At the fort's very center, there was an arch made by stone and huge wooden beams that lead to an underground passage. Are you sure this is the place? It's in perfect condition. I don't see any traces of the attack. Lith said, told you. The kingdom spares no expenses for a crystal mine. Winter or not, they rebuilt it in less than a month. Then why not put a warp gate? It would allow moving reinforcements and crystals way faster than any other common means of transportation. Lith asked. Crystals are unstable. Even the number of arrays in place here is fine-tuned to not trigger a chain reaction. A warp gate would be a liability since bending space for such long distances creates ripples that might make the crystals explode. That even if there was no array, and defense takes precedence. Morik took several rectangular wooden rods out of one of his dimensional amulets. The rods were about 2 meters, 6.5 feet, long and 3 centimeters, 1.8 inches, thick. Each of their four sides was covered with bright red runes, pulsing with power. Lith immediately recognized those rods. They were the same the late Captain Velagros used to build a temporary waypoint near Candria. Back then Lith knew nothing about runes and advanced forge mastery, so neither Solus nor him paid the enchanted item any attention. Now that they had discovered about the importance of the runes, it took them quite an effort to not stare dumbly at them. By my maker, each of these things holds only part of the pseudo-core. The runes are even more amazing than we thought. They can even allow a magical item to be disassembled and assembled at will. Solus thought, also, why red runes? Are they different from the blue ones or what? Lith wondered. First time seeing one of these? Morik asked after noticing Lith's surprise. Second time, actually. Do you have any idea why these things have runes on them? Aside from communication amulets, I've never seen them on an enchanted item and I'm a forge master. Lucky you. I spend a fortune every time I need to upgrade my equipment. Honestly, I have no clue. Maybe just like the runes on an amulet mark their owner, these runes are related to the coordinates they are locked on. Morik shrugged and started to move away from the mines. I wish these things weren't so delicate. It's hard to assemble them when you are under siege, but the worst part is that they can be used only once and are linked to a specific location. Even if I had one back then, I couldn't have used it to escape because without a proper structure, the dimensional ripples a gate generates would have blown up the mines and killed us all. 
He sighed, Lith helped Morik to assemble the beams, forming with them a circle on the ground. Solus could see that each time a beam was correctly positioned, the pseudo-core fragments would assemble. The slightest mistake would make them clash, and the beams would disconnect releasing sparks. When they were done, the rangers had to inject mana into it. It took them time and effort, but after several minutes a warp gate materialized above the circle. What did I tell you? Spoiled rich kids are the worst. We had to fly here and do all the hard work so that they don't break a sweat. Lazy bastards. Morik said. Lith was more interested in sharing Solus's mana sense, and studying how the runes interacted with the gate rather than listening to Morik's ramblings. Normal enchanted items couldn't hold spells like flight, healing, or warp steps because they required their caster's will to work properly. A mage could only infuse such spells inside his own magical rings, which was one of the reasons that made even tier 3 rings expensive and tier 4 ones prohibitive for most mags. The pathway, instead, was able to overcome such limitations thanks to the runes. They enveloped the pseudo core, bearing the will of its creator and channeling all the accumulated energy in the beams to connect to a warp gate. The dimensional corridor was big enough to allow several people to cross it together. Those walking through the gate were all members of research teams from all the six great academies, each one wearing their distinctive uniform. The clearing was quickly filled with a rainbow-colored mass of people. Chapter 628 What the heck? Are we really supposed to take care of so many people with just the two of us? Lith couldn't believe his own eyes. There were already ten people and more kept stepping out of the dimensional gate. Of course not. Morik replied. Each one of these bastards would gladly cut their best friend's throat if it meant getting more funds and recognition. I'm here to guide them to destination and you are here as a contingency measure. For everything else, there's the army. Morik's words garnered him a lot of attention, mostly of the bad kind. What he had said was true yet incredibly rude. He was speaking of esteemed mage professors and researchers as they were just common thugs, Lith recognized the uniforms from the black, white, lightning, and fire griffin, whereas it was his first time seeing people from the crystal and earth griffin. Ranger Verhen. A young woman greeted Lith by giving him a big hug. Dad really has done it. He made you come here with the excuse of the evaluation. What the heck do you mean with that, Quilla? Lith's paranoia had made him see countless shadows and conspiracies on his path, yet the truth had turned out to be beyond his wildest expectation. I told you that there's no one I trust enough to watch my back while on the field. Since you never got the time to accompany me, I had no qualms exploiting my family's influence to get you assigned here. Don't worry, miss. Us rangers are always glad to help hot women. Morik said with his arms open, expecting to receive the same treatment. I'm sorry, I don't hug unknown creeps. Quilla replied with a straight face, before letting Lith go. The scene was drawing too many gazes. Lith went to greet the white griffin professor who had brought Quilla along as her assistant when the real bodyguard stepped through the gate. It was a five-men unit, donning deep green uniforms that identified them as members of an elite troop. Their clothes granted them protection on par with that of a ranger, but they also wore enchanted arm, legs, and shoulder guards that increased their defense to the level of a professor's uniform. Each one of them had at least a cyan core and excellent physical condition. Their weapons were nothing much, though. They all held the same pseudo cores, giving them several versatile abilities rather than few but powerful ones. The only exception was their captain. All of her equipment was custom made and on par with Lith's gatekeeper, if not even better. Lith, what are you doing in the Hessar region? Floria asked. She now had very short hair that resembled a pixie cut. It made her look even more tomboyish than usual. It's nice to meet you too, Floria. How are you doing? Lith was happy not being the rude one for once. Pretty well, thanks. I volunteered for this mission to make sure that nothing bad happens to her. I was expecting to meet another ranger, so you'll excuse my surprise. She said while pointing at Quilla. I'm your man, man. Morik offered his hand to her. Ranger Eerie, at your service. Now that we are all here, let's not waste any more time. We need to fly to the mines and then it takes a long walk to reach our destination. Since we're babysitting academics, it might take us days to get to the ruins. Floria's soldiers repressed a chuckle, while the professors and their assistants threw at the ranger more gazes filled with contempt. Morik collected the wooden bars forming the temporary gate before leading the group to the mines. Is it really necessary to have a guide? We could have found the ruins on our own. A middle-aged professor from the Crystal Griffin asked to Floria after they landed. He had blue eyes, white hair, and a beard. Good luck with that. Morik chimed in. I closed the passages as fast as I created them to make it harder for the goblins to follow us. The only traces left are those of the tunnels opened by the goblins, but most of them have collapsed during the chase or shortly after. The little bastards only cared about catching us and they made quite a few crystals explode in the process. I'm the only one who can find the way, so shut up and follow me. After checking their identities, the guards residing inside the fort let the expedition team in. Despite the incident with the monsters, the mines were already fully operational. Carts full of crystals were being unloaded near the entrance before being sent back. Lith's group was comprised of 12 experts, one professor and one assistant from each academy, Floria's five men unit, and Morik. The mines had ample corridors, but not big enough to accommodate 19 people while workers and crystal smiths did their job. Even though they moved slowly, by the time the group reached the lowest levels, the people from the academy were exhausted. The professors were all experts in their fields with decades of experience, which meant they were quite old and more used to sit behind a desk rather than walk on rough terrain, their assistants were younger than them, but equally out of shape. None of them was warrior material. Girl, you may be pretty, but if you start getting a fat ass at your age, it will be hard keeping your boyfriend. You need to exercise a little. Morik said to Quilla. He had yet to break a sweat and had only compassion for a young woman who wheezed like one of the old fossils. Lith is not my boyfriend. She angrily replied. I know. I'm talking about the captain guy. He clearly fancies you if he's risking his ass for your safety, you could at least, Floria is my sister. Her voice became stone cold, her eyes brimming with rage and fatigue. Oh. Sorry, I just heard a noise coming from that way. Morik said pointing his finger in a random direction. We'll resume this conversation never. 
Morak moved quickly and silently like the wind, reaching the position of the make-believe threat under the baffled gazes of the soldiers he met along the way. Did you hear that too? Lith emerged from a shadow, pointing at the only tunnel that despite the many mana crystals coming out of its walls and the artificial lights was poorly lit. I sure did. I mean, that thing is a woman. Morik's voice was still shaken by the revelation. Not that. That. A small clunk made the hair on both rangers' necks stand up. They waited in silence, ignoring the noises coming from the distant miners and the nearby academics. A clunk, followed by another. Lith used life vision, but the mana crystals inside and outside the walls messed up his perception. He could have sworn there were life signatures among the crystals. Solacy's mana sense didn't fare much better, so she stopped focusing on the details and looked at the corridor's bigger picture. There's a distortion in the mana along the right wall. She said, the moment Lith's gaze followed her directions, he could notice that the distortion had a humanoid form. It seems that hiding any further is pointless. A raspy, feminine voice said. A snap of her fingers made the tunnel they had come from be sealed by a stone wall while the entire zone was silenced. Not even the guards near the collapsing tunnel noticed that something was wrong until a volley of chaos arrows came flying their way. Chapter 629. Korg, the eldritch abomination whose fragments had been implanted inside the goblin tribe, still believed to have drawn the short end of the stick by being bonded to such useless and ugly creatures. On the contrary, she had been quite lucky. The goblins' only strong point was their reproductive ability, so she had an easy time manipulating them at first and then overpowering their feeble minds once she had grown stronger. Assaulting the crystal mine had given her plenty of time and energy to refine a body similar to the original eldritch she had been spawned from. Unlike the other hybrids, she didn't give chase to her mother due to her vessel's weakness. She had preferred to remain hidden inside the mines all along to build her strength and regain her knowledge. Korg had no trouble avoiding the miners. There were too many unused corridors she could use as havens and as long as she didn't suck the crystals dry, they would always recover their energy, she was one of the few hybrids still alive in the entire Garlin continent. Most of the others had been killed by humans or emperor beasts before reaching their maturity or assimilated by their originals. After challenging them, the noise that Lith had heard and Morik pretended to, was her slowly digging out a particularly juicy mana crystal to feed upon without being noticed. She had no idea how the humans had found her. Her light manipulation abilities rendered Korg almost invisible and with all the noise echoing through the tunnels, she was as silent as a mouse, Korg wasn't worried, though. Those guys weren't miners, their disappearance was likely to go unnoticed for days if not ever. Lith cursed his bad luck as several darts from a tier 1 chaos spell threatened his life. There wasn't enough space to dodge them and he knew from experience that most barriers would be useless against chaos magic. Lith and Morak blinked in opposite directions in the nick of time. Holes several centimeters deep opened in the wall behind where their vitals had been just a second ago. Korg couldn't use powerful spells without risking to trigger a chain reaction that would make the mine collapse, killing both herself and the humans in the process. Luckily, the rangers had the same problem plus they had to take care of the dead weight. Many professors were caught by surprise and remained severely injured. The same happened to their assistants and the soldiers tasked to protect them. The only silver lining was that their enchanted armors had prevented any deadly wound and that Korg was focused on the rangers. How bad it is? Lith asked while taking the gatekeeper out of his pocket dimension and shrinking it to the size of a short sword. She's magically stronger than you, but her physical strength sucks. Half of her body is still that of a goblin. Solus replied. Korg's appearance was that of a humanoid creature, about 1.6 meters, 5 feet 3 inches, tall, with thin limbs and a head too big for her body. Half of her skin was a yellow so pale to almost be translucent, allowing to see what little of her organs still remained. The other half was a pitch black gelatinous substance that seemed to constantly move and change its shape like it was a flowing liquid. One second it resembled the slimy skin of a toad, the next one it was full of hair like that of a beast, let me guess, the black half is a tough client. Lith thought, Solus telepathically nodded while turning into her glove form. The last hybrid they had fought was capable of accessing to strong equipment. In presence of so many witnesses, Lith needed a decent excuse for his awakened skills. Her glove form with its two mana crystals shining on the back of the hand fit the bill. She had even changed its design, to give it a more complex look that resembled the artifacts they had seen in the past. Korg sneered when she saw Lith charging forward. The two rangers were the only one unscathed from her sneak attack, so she had been afraid that they might blink away and call for help yet at least one of them was saving her the time of a boring chase. She welcomed Lith's arrival with another volley of chaos arrows. The distance was now too short even for blinking and the magic missiles were so fast to be almost invisible. Lith had gambled on his enhanced speed further boosted by air fusion, hoping it would allow him to reach his opponent before she could cast even more powerful spells and lost the bet. Korg had started to weave her spells from the moment the two rangers had stared in her direction, also, she held numerous advantages. By being near a wall filled with protruding crystals, she prevented her enemies from using magic against her, since the slightest mistake would make the mines collapse and kill hundreds, plus, her position blocked blink, leaving physical attacks as the only mean to harm her. Korg expected to see Lith fall, his body riddled with more holes than Swiss cheese, so she was quite shocked when the impact didn't even slow him down, instead of open wounds, his chest was filled with what looked like a molten silvery liquid deformed from the impact that was quickly fixing the damage it had received. Another one of the unexpected abilities derived from using Orichalcum to forge master a skinwalker armor was that, by injecting it with mana, it was possible to amplify both its hardness and its repulsive energy field, before charging, Lith had covered himself with mana from head to toes, just in case. The mana expenditure to withstand chaos magic had been enormous, but it still beat instant death. Lith performed an upward diagonal slash from right to left, forcing Korg to move from her safe spot to not be cut in half. She ducked while sidestepping on Lith's left, her eyes fixated on the blade infused with darkness magic that passed millimeters away from her face, and cut off the extremity of her pointed ears, she had yet to perceive the pain from the injury when Lith's left fist struck her side, one of the parts of her body which still belonged to the goblins, with enough strength to lift her from the ground and made her spit out a mouthful of blood, she ignored the pain, grabbing his wrist to cut it open with her claws, only to discover his whole arm was covered by the silvery liquid, turning it into an orichalcum living hammer. Cunning bastard. The sword was just a distraction to hit my weak spot. If he thinks an armor can protect him from my touch, he's in for a surprise. 
She thought as her grip turned into a vice, sucking his vitality through the enchanted protection, unfortunately for Korg, she wasn't Lyft's first abomination. Under the silver, there wasn't the pink, frail skin of a human, but the black scaly body of a hybrid. Both of them had the ability to prey on the vitality of their opponent and even if Korg was more skilled, Lyft's counterflow made hers a hollow victory, the stolen vitality was so scarce that it was barely noticeable. Lyft was unable to free his left hand, so he lunged with the gatekeeper at Korg's shoulder which was still made of goblin flesh. Chapter 630 she intercepted the blade with her open palm, letting it pierce through her hand until her fingers closed onto its hilt. Beating an eldritch in a contest of strength it's a foolish quest. The only question is which one of you will break first. If you or your blade. Korg sneered. Lith inwardly cursed as her black blood corroded the gatekeeper's surface and dripped onto the mana crystals embedded in its hilt. Of all the creatures he had faced, Lith had never met one with acid for blood, Lith tried to pull the blade away, but Korg was too strong. At the same time, she tried to break his arm, but between his mana boosting the skinwalker armor and earth fusion boosting his enhanced physique, it felt to her like moving a mountain. What do you think I'm here for? Morik said from behind her a split second after one of his short swords pierced her chest and another her head. Korg had forgotten about the other ranger and that by not having her back against the wall anymore, Blink was a significant threat. By the gods! Morik was shocked seeing that the creature wasn't dying whereas his blades were melting. No vitals. Go for the yellow parts. Lith said while exploiting Korg's indecision to let go of the gatekeeper and struck with Solus's gauntlet at Korg's goblin sternum. Solus had infused herself with all the elements and released a few spells she kept at the ready at the moment of the impact. The resulting effect of the combined attack of Lith, Skinwalker, and Solus was akin to a jackhammer on the snow. The fist pierced through her chest and came out of her back, spraying red, harmless blood all over Morik. Copy that. He replied starting to stab at the exposed goblin part so fast that before a wound had enough time to bleed, for more had been opened. Korg inwardly cursed, trying to find a way out. Hitting her goblin body couldn't kill her since she had no vitals, but the wounds were making her strength plummet. Lith kept hammering her body with his free hand and when she tried to move him aside with both her hands to escape from Morik's onslaught, Lith grabbed the gatekeeper's hilt. He flooded it with all the mana he could spare, infusing it with darkness magic as he twisted and pulled the blade away. Black blood hit the spot Lith had been until a split second before, making the rock sizzle while they melted, feeling her life slipping, Korg didn't hesitate to blinking to one of the upper levels of the mines. She kept blinking until she reached the surface, choosing a crystal deposit as her hiding spot. The crystals will help me recover my strength and shield me from an awakened life vision. I can only hope no one enters the deposit before I'm able to fight back, otherwise I'm screwed. She thought while feeding off the nearby crates. Where did she go? Lith asked Solus while looking around. The crystals surrounding them were jamming his life vision, making it hard for him to even see Morik's energy signature. She might have gone anywhere. The mines are a maze and there are too many interferences. She replied. That thing was a woman too. Weirdest day ever. Morik replied while using quick flicks of his wrists to clean his blades from the black blood. I don't think she will be back anytime soon. By combining our attacks we have given her ugly as a solid kicking. How's your weapon? Lith stuck his back against the wall to prevent being stabbed in the back while using invigoration on the gatekeeper. The massive flow of darkness magic had already destroyed any trace of the abomination's acid, it was only a matter of assessing the damage. No, no, no. Was all Lith said. The corroded metal wasn't an issue, but the damaged mana crystals were another story. Too much black blood had soaked them for too long. The pseudo core had already spent most of its energy to regenerate the damages as fast as it could, but Lith's last darkness burst had been the final straw that broke the camel's back, the gatekeeper was already in critical condition. If he didn't retrieve it, it would have been destroyed, but to do it Lith had been forced to push it beyond its limits. Lith drew a forge master repairing circle so fast that even the professors watching at the process couldn't believe their own eyes. He fought, with all of his skill, using his mana as a life support system, but the gatekeeper's pseudo core slowly faded as the corruption caused by the black blood destroyed its mana circulatory system. It's dead. Lith said after a while. The magic was gone and the crystals had turned dull. The piece of metal in his hands was nothing but scrap. The memories of the enemies they had vanquished together, of all the times it had saved his life flooded Lith's mind, for a moment, he grieved the gatekeeper like it was a lifelong friend. Then he started to worry about his immediate future. Sorry to hear that, man. Hope you have another to spare. Losing your main weapon before even starting a mission is the worst that could happen. Morak was honestly sad. He knew all too well how expensive good equipment was. Floria. Quilla. Are you all right? Lith blurted out as soon as the word dead escaped from his lips. In his battle frenzy, he had completely forgotten about his two real friends, replacing the gatekeeper would be hard but feasible. Lith knew that sooner or later he had to upgrade his weapon. A living being, however, couldn't be replaced. The image of Uriel appeared in his mind as life vision was focused to spot the only two life forces that held any significance to him in that tunnel. I'm okay. Quilla said, her voice was feeble from fatigue. I was staring at the rude ranger, so I had all the time to drop down the moment I heard the voice. Floria wasn't so lucky, though. More than half of the expedition team was laying on the ground in a puddle of their own blood. The chaos arrows couldn't pierce through the magical protections, but they could still smash bones and rupture organs. Following her duty as a mage knight, Floria had pushed those who were near to her to safety while conjuring a protective shield for herself. Unfortunately, she had never met an abomination capable of using chaos magic. Her spell had been ripped to shreds and she had taken the full force of many arrows at once. If not for all the enchantments Orion had imbued her equipment with, she would have died on the spot. How is she? Lith asked while placing a hand on Floria's shoulder to check her condition with invigoration. Aren't you a healer? The captain is already being treated. You should take care of the wounded said a woman in her late fifties donning the colors of the black griffin. She had been hit on a shoulder, but her assistant was in critical condition. Chapter 631. It's none of my business. Lith replied. Floria's recovery was slow because she had suffered extensive damage and because of her fatigue, Quilla hadn't much life force to spare. 
Floria had several broken bones, punctured organs, and was bleeding out of her head, mouth, and nostrils. She was deadly pale, gurgling more blood with each breath she took. I already risked my life to protect you guys from that thing at great personal cost. I will not waste my mana on a stranger when the life of another of my friends is on the line. He started to support Quilla's spell, stopping Floria's internal bleeding before it was too late. He could have fixed her in the blink of an eye, but with Quilla monitoring Floria's condition he had to pretend to be a normal mage, incapable of recovering his full strength with just a few deep breaths. Great Mage Verhen. The duty of all the members of the army is to protect life without giving preferential treatments. The woman from the Black Griffin was seething with anger. Her shoulder-length grey hair was dancing in the air due to the mana exuding from her body and her eyes were reduced to two fiery slits. Yet she was holding her left arm in pain. The healing spell from her magic ring would take a while to heal her completely and until that happened, she was unable to cast spells. Fake mags needed both arms and magic words to use magic. The captain performed her duty honorably and with your actions, you are wasting her sacrifice. You should. Talking about Floria as if she was already dead made Lith snap, his right forefinger whipped as a scorpion's tail, releasing a small air bullet that struck the injured shoulder right where it would hurt the most. With his innate skill for death blows and extensive knowledge of the human body, Lith didn't even need to use life vision to find the right spot, the bullet was weak, barely as strong as a push, yet enough to rattle the bone fragments inside the professor's body like it was a flesh maraca. It caused her a pain so intense that the woman fainted without emitting a sound. That's why I hate academics. Morik said while treating the assistant from the Black Griffin. Healing wasn't a specialization he had learned back when he was a student at the Crystal Griffin, but after becoming a ranger, he had quickly understood how dangerous it was not being able to treat all kinds of wounds. It had taken him some time, but the army had provided him with all he needed to become an excellent healer. You think you are so much better than us because of your knowledge, yet when shit happens, you're as useful as a third nostril. Just because we chose to wear a uniform, it doesn't make us expendable. Instead of running your mouths for whining, help yourselves. Our lives aren't any less important than yours. Quilla felt the sting of those words as well. After leaving the academy, she had neglected physical training, thinking that always being either at her home or at the White Griffin made it unnecessary. What good is a healer that gets exhausted after a long walk? Lith has walked as much as I did, fought for his life, and yet he still has enough energy to help Floria. I'm no different from that old hag. I'm too dependent on others in times of crisis. She thought, once Floria's condition was stabilized, Lith helped the others. Every one of those present was able to use tier 3 healing magic and had plenty of potions, so only a handful of people were still injured, when the healers were done, the group in the tunnel looked like war survivors. Their clothes were damaged, their bodies weakened from either performing or receiving the healing, making their breath ragged and irregular. Except for Lith, who thanks to invigoration was still at his peak condition. What kind of monster are you? How the heck did you survive? Those black rays? Morak was proud of his stamina, yet after sharing his life force with the wounded, he wasn't faring any better than one of the old fossils. He would gladly take a few hours long nap, if given the chance. Orichalcum. Lith replied. I recently forge mastered a skinwalker armor out of it. The results are way better than I expected. What? That's impossible. Morik said, quickly followed by a few experts. I'm no forge master, but when I commissioned one, I was told that the spell reacts erratically with metals, that's why skinwalkers are always made out of clothes. Believe what you want. The important thing now is getting out of here. The abomination might return and with the crystals surrounding us, we can't set a proper defensive perimeter nor use spells for self-defense. Must I remind you that I've lost my weapon? Lith was eager to change the topic. Back when he didn't find a metal skinwalker on the army's catalogue, nor on the association's one, he had simply thought that just like many items of his interest, they were hidden to the public and reserved for the elites. His objective had always been to copy and improve the best artifacts money could buy, so he had never stopped considering that there could be a different explanation. Opening the collapsed corridor is too dangerous. We must walk to the outside. A panicked youth from the Lightning Griffin tried to cast the dimensional spell, but his master slapped him, interrupting his cast. Don't panic, you idiot. The rangers could blink because the dimensional rift it creates is weak and lasts for a split second. If you open a dimensional corridor, we might all die. Even if the warp steps had never been completed, some of the crystals protruding from the walls started to tremble madly, resonating with a huge amount of released mana. Everyone stopped what they were doing, even breathing, after a few seconds, everything went back to normal. I agree with Ranger Verhen on the matter. Morik said out loud, for everyone to listen. I would like to rest too, but this position is a defensive nightmare. Those who can walk will walk, the others should use a float spell and let themselves be dragged. If any of you wants to back down, I've already alerted the mine supervisor. Wait here and someone will open the passage in a few hours. A lot of moans and groans could be heard. Almost all the mags chose to float and it was up to the soldiers to bring them along like balloons filled with helium. Morik took point, while Lith covered their back, walking alongside Floria and Quilla. Thanks, Lith. They were both able to walk after he had given them a bit of his life force. I'm really sorry about your sword. I know how much you loved it. Do you have a replacement? Floria asked. I have a lot of weapons with me, but they all suck. All my attempts to craft a better gatekeeper failed. I guess I'd have to ask Orion for something better once we get out of here. He sighed. Did you really try to improve my father's work without even knowing the manufacturing process? That's bold. If dad learns about it, he would be royally pissed by your attempts at stealing his secrets. She chuckled. Chapter 632 I think he will be more pissed off by you almost dying due to your bravado. There's no defense against those black rays, your shields are no safer than wet paper against them. What the heck were you thinking? Seeing Floria almost die had triggered his memories about Carl, both Quilla and Floria were surprised by his aggressive remarks, but only because neither of them had ever faced a fully formed abomination. Only after Lith explained to them what they were capable of, did the girls realize how big of a bullet they had just dodged. Even if I knew all this, I wouldn't have acted any differently. Floria said. My aim is to become a member of the Knights Guard, the elite of the elite for mage knights. 
If we don't protect our assigned marks, we're useless. What just happened is an occupational hazard. Lith would have liked to scold Floria for her nonsensical behavior, but in the end, he decided against it. He too had risked dying many times to follow his own agenda, criticizing her for doing the same would have been plain hypocritical. Soon Morik started to open new tunnels with earth magic. Seeing how fast and confident he was while taking several apparently random turns, made Lith curious. How can you be so sure this is the right way? Do you have a map or something? He asked via the army amulet. No, I just marked the walls on my passage to react to my mana, in case I got lost or I needed to backtrack. That's why only I can lead the expedition. Don't you do the same in dungeons or underground places when there is no time to draw a map? Morik replied. No. I have a great memory. To be exact, Solus did dot I in emergency situations, Lith would rely on her abilities to access to his memories and find the right path. Otherwise, he would always take his time to draw a map and store it inside Solaspedia to gain tactical awareness in the case an ambush occurred. Like he was doing at that moment. Morik had tasked him to close the tunnels as soon as possible so that no one could follow them without being noticed. Earth magic produced a lot of noise and with the echo in the tunnels, its use could be heard from hundreds of meters of distance. The expedition team managed to move forward for two more hours before even Morik was on the verge of collapsing due to exhaustion. Their advance had slowed down even further due to the lack of lighting since they had left the mines. The natural tunnels were bumpy and uneven. Their footing was also very precarious because the humidity would condense on the ground, making it slippery. Luckily for them, during his first passage, Morik had marked safe rest spots. You take the first watch. Morik said while pointing at Lith. Then have someone relieve you after one hour, I don't care who. I'll take the last watch. We're not moving from here before four hours minimum. Before any of the soldiers could complain that he wasn't their commanding officer, Morik was already asleep. His behavior caused many grumbles, but they didn't last long. Everyone was so tired that they fell asleep the moment they sat down, Lith checked his surroundings with life vision. The light coming from the crystal mines was far enough to allow him to scout far and wide, making sure that there was no imminent threat. He even performed a life detection array to cover more ground. Forgemaster, healer, fighter, and even warden? A voice asked, Lith recognized the woman from the Black Griffin. He was expecting some snarky remarks or even that she would attempt to report to his commanding officer the assault, she had suffered by Lith's hand, not that Lith was afraid of either possibility. He was used to being insulted ever since he had stepped inside the White Griffin Academy. Powerful people hated the idea of witnessing the growth of someone that could become more powerful than them. Their natural response was to nip people like Lith in the bud, at any cost. As for the latter possibility, Lith would have loved to see Journey discuss with someone that had dared to suggest letting her daughter die. I'm sure it would be something so slow and gruesome that I could learn a lot. I'd like to think of myself as a master of coercion, but compared to Journey I'm just a learner. He thought. Everything that's needed for survival has to be learned. Lith replied. Wise words for someone so prone to violence. Her voice was calm. She wasn't trying to insult him, only stating a fact. Without strength, wisdom is nothing but hot air. Without wisdom, strength is just violence. I was only protecting someone who I hold dear. If you expect an apology from me, don't hold your breath. Lith replied. Quite the contrary. I've come to apologize for my earlier behavior. My assistant is like a son to me. I couldn't stand watching him die while I was helpless because of my wound. I was angry at myself and I took it out on you. She gave Lith a small bow. Take these as a sign of my goodwill. She handed Lith several mana cyan crystals, each one with a flat bottom and as big as a beer bottle. Thanks, but what am I supposed to do with them professor? Lith was very confused. He had a lot on his mind, from the loss of the gatekeeper to almost watching Floria die. His brain was about to pop. Yondra Mephal. Black Griffin's professor of history of magic and forge mastering. You can use them to set a barrier. I'm too weak to cast a spell, but at least I can give you some help. She replied with a kind smile, seeing that Lith wasn't moving, Yondra laughed and showed him how to perform the silent shroud array. When Lith was done, a black dome surrounded the camp, preventing both light and sound from spreading outside of its premises. Now no one can see or hear us. The barrier it produces is not very strong, but as you can see, it's a very useful formation. Thanks to the array, Lith could see the area surrounding them as if he was wearing thermal goggles. It was quite useless for someone capable of using life and fire vision, but it would allow him to rest more easily when others would relieve him from guard duty. Thank you very much. Lith said while copying the spell in his grimoire along with his thoughts about how to turn it into true magic. Don't mention it. By protecting you I'm protecting myself. I'd like to talk about many things with someone as peculiar as you are, but alas, I'm beat. See you later. Yondra checked on her assistant condition and after she made sure he was just fatigued as she was, she fell asleep. Lith followed her example and went checking on his friends. Morik didn't seem to need his help and judging by his snoring, he was having a good time. Quilla and Floria were both sleeping, invigoration confirmed to him that there was nothing wrong with them. Since there was no point in waking them up, Lith started to circle around the edges of the formation while using accumulation. The tunnel was quiet. There was no noise nor energy signature coming towards them, yet the space around them was far from being empty. Chapter 633 Under the crystal mines, he could see a flow of world energy so big that it made mana geysers look like drinking fountains. There were also life forces inside the ground, the kind of which he had never seen before. He couldn't notice any of it earlier because he was in the middle of the raging storm that was Mogar's essence. It was also the reason he had been unable to chase Korg only now that Lith was far enough, could he glimpse the magnitude of the natural phenomenon that gave life to mana crystals. Does the life force belong to awakened crystals or to Mogar itself? Thank heavens we left the mines. Being exposed for long to such a vigorous flow of world energy might speed up Floria's awakening process. It would be a shame if I had to kill the entire expedition to protect our secret. Yonder and Morik seem to be nice people, but seem is not enough to, who are you planning to kill? Floria's voice took him by surprise and make Lith flinch. No one. What are you doing here? You should be sleeping. I don't believe you. Your eyes were ablaze and you were making the face. 
She shook her head. What face? Lif asked. Your battle face. When you look at people as nothing but corpses to dissect. You know, it hurts thinking that when we first met, you looked at me that way. If I knew what it meant back then, I would have never asked you out. Floria chuckled. Do you mind company while you stand guard? I think I'm still tense from the ambush and I can't fall asleep, no matter how hard I try. I must have given her too much life force. Lith pondered. I've no such face. He lied through his teeth, making her giggle. And these eyes are not because I'm angry. I call this life vision. It allows to those like me to gauge our opponent's strength and to see even through walls. He said while using a quick hush to prevent others from hearing him. Seeing that Floria had become beet red and was covering her chest and nether regions with her arms, Lith rushed to explain. It came out wrong. I don't mean I can see through clothes or something, I see people as featureless lumps of energy. I can't even tell a man from a woman unless they are very close. Really? Do I have your word? Her arms didn't move an inch. Yes, I swear on my family. Am I making my perverted face? He said while looking straight at her body. According to Camilla, he had that one too. Definitely not. Floria relaxed as the realization he actually had a perverted face stung at Lith's pride. Why are you telling me this now? Floria asked. Because there are a lot of things down here and I don't know if they are friendly or hostile. You already know enough about me and I need your trust so that the next time something happens, you'll do as I say. Lith also wanted to check how much he could reveal about himself without shocking someone he cared for. Who among my men is the strongest? Floria asked, curious to put his ability to the test. Physically, the small guy with red hair. Magically, the woman sleeping near the people from the Earth Griffin. You're correct. Helion has an uncanny constitution and Jerth is the only one in the team who got into one of the great academies. Wait, what do you mean those like me? She knew about the hush zone, but she still lowered her voice until it was barely audible. There are others? Yes. Nalia was one of them. Why do you think she only kidnapped me? She was afraid that I could mess with her plan, and she was right. Suddenly many things started to make sense to Floria. Why both Lith and Nalia could emit an aura without the use of spells, how he had been able to notice the slave items despite they all had a different shape, the revelation was quite a big shock, so she needed to sit down for a minute. Could she shapeshift too? No. As far as I know, only Emperor Beasts and I can shapeshift. Undead too. He said after a while. Are you a human or an Emperor Beast? The shock in her eyes was growing stronger, but Floria was just surprised, not scared. I wish I knew. My parents are humans, and so are my siblings. As for me, I'm me. I can't give you a better answer, sorry. Floria stood up, never averting his gaze. She couldn't stop asking herself how she looked through those blazing eyes. Do you mind if I ask you a personal question? Lith said, grateful that she wasn't prying further. Not at all. What in the gods' names did you do with your hair? It was so. His hand moved towards where the soft mass once was, before stopping midway. And now is so. There was no way to express his disappointment without being rude. Floria's hair had always been a delight for his touch and his nose. After losing the gatekeeper, seeing her with the pixie cut was like one blow too many. Men are idiots. You've lost your blade, I almost died, you opened to me four years late, and your biggest worry while we are stranded hundreds of meters below the ground, guided by the rudest man I've ever met, it's the length of my hair? She was laughing heartily, bringing back for both of them many happy memories. I didn't do anything to it. My hair is alive and kicking. Floria grabbed a small silver hairpin in the back of her head and took it off. A cascade of waist long hair fell down from her head, giving Floria back the appearance she had at Journey's birthday party. I cut them once I joined the army, but I got permission to grow them back once I became an officer. My mother too nagged at me for my looks, so I asked dad for help. Long hair might be nice to look at, but for a fighter is nothing but a nuisance. So, he did this for me. The moment she put the hairpin back, her hair rolled up like a shutter while it was compressed as if it was vacuum packed. Can I see it? Liz's Forgemaster curiosity was piqued. The hairpin turned out to be a mix of dimensional, air, and light magic. It was the most complex useless pseudo call Lith had ever seen, son of a gun. Lith thought as invigoration revealed several little runes covering the hairpin. Not only was Solus right about the kingdom knowing about the runes, but also that Big Oaf used so many resources for his daughter's hair and made my gatekeeper so frail. He was quite pissed off by Orion's double standards, first, unless we're talking about people, I'm always right. Second, hello Kettle. My name is Pot and you are black. Solus replied. As if mentioning his name was akin to a summoning ritual, Orion's rune lighted on Lith's communication amulet, drawing his attention. Is Journey okay? Did something happen to Freya? Lith asked before Orion could even utter a word. There was no other reason he could think of to explain the call. On the rare occasions they had talked to each other, it had always happened in person. Chapter 634. What the heck are you rambling about? Do you think that if something like that had happened to them, I would be wasting my time on social calls? I would be hunting Manohazas down while one of my men seeks your help. I'm calling you because of an outrageous rumor I heard a few hours before. Some of my Forgemaster colleagues in the expedition say that you claim to have crafted an Orichalcum skinwalker armor. At first, I paid it no heed, but when I called my little flower to hear about her mission, she confirmed it. Is it really true? I need to hear it from your voice. Orion said, Lith furrowed his brows while looking at Floria, who just shrugged. The cat was already out of the bag. There was no point in denying it. She said, hurting Orion's feelings. The idea that one of his daughters could keep secrets from him was terrible. Yet Floria had never shared with anyone Lith's secrets just as Freya never talked about Protector's ability to shapeshift into a human. Yes, it's true. Lith injected a bit of his mana into the skinwalker, making it turn into a quicksilver-like liquid that covered him from head to toes and made him resemble a humanoid metal golem. Amazing. That's supposed to be impossible. The Thunderbird's feather and the Orichalcum release wild energy whenever they interact, making the spell unstable. I tried countless times with as many variations but I never succeeded. 
How the heck did you do it? Orion asked. There's no such thing as a wild energy release. Lith wasn't going to give away his secret, but if he wanted to obtain something decent to replace his lost weapon, he had to drive a hard bargain. The first step was baiting the prey with an honest, but useless information. It's just that the Orichalcum amplifies the feather's energy field, so if you had planned to handle a spell with 100 units of power, you actually get one with 130, which is more than your spell is devised can harness. It makes sense. Orion pondered. Orichalcum has the property to amplify energy-based enchantments. It's the reason Orichalcum is considered so precious since its hardness is just above Damascus steel levels. Still, I handle tons of Orichalcum, yet only a few crafting techniques always fail, like it happens for the Skinwalker. How do you explain that? Because the interaction between ingredients is very strong and it significantly varies with the amount of adamant in the Orichalcum, Lith replied, only a true mage like him could comfortably wait for the pseudo core to stabilize before fusing it with an enchanted item. Fake mags use spells that would barely last 20 seconds and they had no way to assess how great the amplifying effect was. They could adjust the energy output with a tier 5 spell, but without life vision or invigoration, it would still be like a blind man trying to kill a bird with a single arrow. Would you like to share your method? I've struck a bottleneck in crafting armors because to upgrade my products I would need to use Orichalcum or adamant, but the little bastards always mess with my spells. Orion's request was the closest thing to a taboo between mags. Sharing spells was something that could be done only on a voluntary basis, and usually no one would reveal one of their trump cards. Would you like to share your crafting methods? Lith replied with a sneer. Of course not. Orion sighed. What about an exchange? I heard that the gatekeeper has been destroyed. I can give you an even better weapon if you provide me with an Orichalcum skinwalker as a study subject. Orion wanted to exploit the situation as well. Any decent warrior knew that a weapon was more than a tool. In their line of work, it was a lifeline. I first need to see what you're offering. As you can see, my crafting process made the armor much more versatile than a normal skinwalker. A gatekeeper is good, but it's not enough. To use it at its full power, it takes a lot of mana. On top of that, it was too frail. It almost broke during the events in Otha, Makosh, and even Jambel. What good is a weapon that it's not able to protect my life and that requires to be protected? Lith painfully remembered every time he had come close to sacrifice the gatekeeper to protect his life. Fine. You're right. Orion yielded, especially because Floria was giving him a bad, bad look. It was just a gift for a 13-year-old and one I didn't like much at that. I'll make you something worthy of a ranger. You have my word. Lith hung up after showing Orion exactly what his armor could do. Lith didn't ask him for anything specific because he knew that as a craftsman, Orion's pride would force him to give his best to not fall short of Lith's skill. Making specific requests would have been like giving him boundaries, whereas this way Orion could do whatever he wanted and Lith was free to refuse the trade if he considered it to be unfair. To Floria, Lith said, well, at least now I can put one of my prototypes to good use. You have no idea how many tweaks it took to craft something that could store my full power without it exploding into my face. Are you really going to give Dad just a prototype? A faulty item? Now she was giving Lith a bad, bad look. Not faulty, just not the best one. He will tinker with it a lot, probably even damage or destroy it. There's no reason to waste a good armor when even a mediocre one follows the same principles and has the same properties. Lith shrugged. If your father is even one bit like me, if I were to give him a masterpiece, he wouldn't bear the thought of destroying it and limit his experiments as a consequence. This is yours, by the way. Lith handed her a chainmail set that even under the dim light of the camp shone like a precious gem, creating a rainbow on the tunnel ceiling. As I told you, I made a lot of them, but I only need one. You've already almost died today and if something happens to you, I would never forgive myself. I might not be in love with you anymore, but I love you nonetheless. Lith said. I, I can't accept it. It's too precious. Both his gesture and his words made Floria incredibly happy and sad at the same time. Lith still cared for her deeply, but not like before, when he looked at her, she could almost perceive an invisible wall between them and its presence hurt her way more than she expected. Precious, yes. Rare, not so much. I have already given one to Tista and to the rest of my family as well. It took a lot of work to get this right, so I have plenty to spare. I have even one for Quilla and Freya. So get down your high horse and accept my gift. Floria took the armor and imprinted it immediately. There were just cyan crystals bonded with the metal. They proved that it was indeed a prototype and that Lith lacked powerful resources. Chapter 635 in Floria's family, purple crystals were a given for almost everything. Yet even most archmages couldn't afford many of them, along with the natural treasures, metals, and ingredients. The Inna's family was one of the most ancient and richest in the Griffin Kingdom, after all. Did you tell Camilla? She asked while hugging the chainmail suit as if it was something precious and delicate as a newborn. About what? Lith asked. About the things you told me. She deserves to know and the longer you wait, the harder it will be for her. I don't see how time can make accepting me for whatever I am harder. Lith chuckled. Not that. If she really cares for you, she will be a bit scared at first, but then she will start wondering, why did he wait for so long before telling me? How many more things is he hiding? Camilla might start doubting your feelings and her own as well. Floria conjured a stone dome around herself to get changed into the skinwalker armor, using the cover from the hush zone to not alarm the others, she's right, you know. Sola said, I know. Lith replied, after his pocket watch marked the passing of the hour, Lith woke up a couple of soldiers and went to sleep. He had already used invigoration a few times and with no gatekeeper to help him, he needed all the edges he could get. After four hours had passed, Quilla went to ask Morik to resume their journey. I'm still beat, but we can move. If that witch didn't hunt us down after so much time, she's likely moved to an easier prey. Let's move. The ranger said. Lith recovered the mana crystals and dispelled the silent shroud while Floria took her place at the center of the group to better coordinate her men, while Quilla moved to the rear, near Lith. Any advice on how to get stronger? My magic has grown since our days at the academies, but I think I've become as physically weak as a kitten. She said. 
Do like I did when I was at the academy. Train until your muscles hurt, eat meat, use light magic to assimilate the food and rebuild your tissues. Rinse and repeat until you are too tired to continue. Sounds dull. How long would it take? Quiller asked, making Lith feel her arms muscles. A week to get some meat on those bones and a few months to get stronger. Was his reply. Months? I thought it would be easier. I mean, you and Floria make it seem easy. We trained a lot over the years. If there was a shortcut, everyone would take it. Besides, even if you had a magical way to regain your stamina at will, you would still need to sweat a lot. It's just like magic, it takes time and effort. There's no, become an archmage by training five minutes a day, cheat in life. Lif shrugged, Professor Yondra and her assistant, Raina Loman, joined them after a few minutes. Raina was wearing the uniform of the Black Griffin, a black magician's robe that was made out of a material that seemed to be made out of living darkness. He was the same age as Lif, around 1.72 meters, 5 feet 8 inches, tall, with red hair and blue eyes. The black of his robe made him appear even thinner than he already was. Lif couldn't believe that he was a forge master, being muscular wasn't a prerequisite, but a forge master's body would be tempered by harnessing the enormous amount of mana that the advanced crafting processes required. Raina was holding his chest, and his breath was already short despite the fact that they had just finished resting. After receiving the mana crystals and a new spell from Yondra, Lith felt it indebted to her, so he decided to further smoothen up the previous incident between them. Lith placed his hand over Raina's shoulder and gave him a bit of life force before treating his injuries. The young man stopped slouching as his chest stopped hurting. Thank you, but we didn't come here for that. I hoped we could resume our earlier conversation. Yondra said, throwing a mean look at her pupil. Kid, I'm old, so I need time to recover from a bad wound. What's your excuse? Do you realize you are making even a complete stranger notice your weakness? At those words, both Raina and Quilla blushed in embarrassment, they were in a similar situation, seeing them walking side by side, reminded Lith of the odd forge he had found inside the lost city of Huriel, she's the best next thing to an archaeologist, plus Yondra is a forge master. I forgot to ask Orion about it, but maybe she is even more likely to know what that was. Lith thought. I brought him on this expedition to show him that even being an historian requires strength and guts. Yondra said. Sure, we spend most of our days sitting behind our desk doing research, but when you actually need to search for relics, you can't just ask to monsters and beasts to kindly step aside and let you do your job. You need to learn how to fight, damn it. But Professor, what about the army or the mercenary guilds? Isn't it easier to get their help rather than pointlessly risking our lives? Raina asked. The army will help you only if you have solid evidence of a discovery that could benefit the kingdom. Quilla replied. As for mercenaries, I wouldn't trust them to be satisfied with a few coins if you find a priceless treasure. They are mags too. Exactly. Yondra nodded. This is likely to be the easiest expedition you'll ever take part in. We have two rangers, an elite squad of soldiers, and six professors. The number of things that can go wrong with all this firepower is very limited. Easiest? Raina was flabbergasted. We almost got wiped out before even starting. My dear, that almost makes all the difference in the world. When I was your age, my so-called bodyguards tried to kill and rob me after I stupidly showed off how much money I had. I wanted to buy their loyalty, not give them a motive, and yet, Raina swallowed several times, wondering why he was the only nervous one. Quilla was shorter and wimpier than him, yet she looked confident. Lith used the sudden silence to tell Yondra about his recent trip to Huriol. He didn't mention the sword, the booklet, and not even his theory about the lost city being actually a lost academy. Lith had checked the army database, yet Huriol was always referred to as a city in the official documents. Even if Yondra knew the truth, she was unlikely to share it with him once Lith reached the part about the black and white forge, her eyes lit like stars with greed and wonder. Are you sure? A whole forge? She asked more than once, as if she couldn't believe her own words. Yes, I can show it to you. Lith materialized a hologram of the forge, mimicking its shape-shifting pattern. Good gods, how unlucky of you. You found and missed a forge made of pure Davros. She said. I didn't miss it. It was bolted to the ground and when I attempted to take it away, the city tried to kill me. There's a big difference. What's Davros? Chapter 636 the strongest metal known to man, even stronger than pure adamant. Yondra's words made Lith internally scream in frustration. He clenched his temples, taking deep breaths before finding the strength to ask, Why have I never heard about it? What makes it so special? It's a legendary metal, said to be indisruptible. It can be broken, only melted, and refined into ingots. It's so rare that I've seen it only when I was allowed to study the artifacts belonging to Valron Griffin, the first king. In all my years, I've never seen it again, and you say there was a whole forge? Yes. Any idea why it shapeshifts? Lith asked. Ideas? No. Only a legend, if you're interested. Lith nodded for her to continue, Yondra first explained Lith how according to the law, Mogar, the great mother, had given birth to the six gods of magic. There was one god for each element and according to such legend, those blessed by the gods would bear their mark on their hair or fur. Lith looked at Quilla's hair and her silvery streaks, finally understanding the meaning of such an odd coloration. According to the fable, the gods had shared part of their essence with all things on Mogar, even metals. Normal metals would receive the blessing of two gods at most, the only exceptions were Adamant and Davros. Adamant was considered a metal where the elements had failed to achieve a perfect balance, as it was proven by the fact that instead of absorbing the light, Adamant would split it into its components like a prism. Davros, instead, was supposed to be a metal where the elements of destruction, fire, and darkness would battle against those of creation, light, and earth, while the remaining two with their dual nature would try to keep the balance, water gave life, but ice would take it away and the same applied to air and lightning. The conflicting natures of all six elements refused to coexist, so the three factions would always be eternally at war. Locra Silverwing, the first forge master, had written in her diaries that it was up to the mage to tip the scale by adding the seventh element, the only one that the Davros lacked. The element of life, more commonly known as mana. It sounds like a load of rubbish. Lith said. I would agree with you if the artifacts I studied didn't shapeshift anymore. 
I saw King Merin using the sword of Saifal, and he can make the whole blade change color according to the element he needs to boost. I wasn't much younger back then, but I can still count. The sword turned into seven colors. Red, yellow, black, white, blue, orange, and emerald green. The Davros ingots, instead, would follow a pattern similar to the one you showed me. Wait, are you telling me that adamant is nothing but dead Davros? Lith asked. At least I think so. The royal family has ingots of Davros, but no one knows how to use them. Plus, if the legend is right, then it's only a matter of time before they lose their special properties. Otherwise why let experts like me study Valoran's armor or his sword? Lith's mind started spinning like a top, trying to put together everything he had learned ever since he had arrived on Mogar. The shades in the hair of living creatures, the different colors of mana cores and crystals, the seven eyes of his hybrid form, and now even the Davros, if I'm right, life happens on Mogar when the six elements the world energy holds become one. According to such logic, by absorbing enough world energy, living creatures can become awakened by becoming part of the planet's breathing cycle. A blood core would be nothing but a mana core which has lost its light element and craves for it, whereas a black core it's nothing but pure darkness. Also, it would explain why the Davros forge I found back in Huriel almost had a core whereas the adamant one Zolbrish paid me with doesn't. Lith thought. Do you mind me asking why you're telling me so many things? Not to sound ungrateful, but most of them sound like classified information. The kingdom usually likes to play close to the vest. Lith didn't believe in generosity, especially from someone he had just met, his companions, the Inner's couple, even the royals, they were all indebted to him. Their bond of trust was based on having been together through thick and thin, or on the services he had provided. He could smell that something was off with Yondra. You're quite perceptive. Yes, it's classified information, but you work for the kingdom as well and I am looking for someone that could inherit my legacy. Rainer might take my place as history professor in a few years, but I doubt he'll become a decent forge master any soon. The kid lacks motivation, and even if he finds it during this expedition, I don't have that much time left. Yondra said. I'm sorry, professor, but I checked your condition earlier, and you are just fine. Why do you talk like that? Lith was getting more confused by the second. The offer wasn't that good either. He wouldn't take an awakened master lightly due to all the responsibilities and the obedience it would imply, let alone a fake mage one. I'm not talking about death, young man, only about retirement. Yondra laughed. I've lived for over 60 years and I'm tired of a life of duty. I want to spend what time I have left with my family, doing things I like. I was thinking about it for a while and almost getting killed by a random creature as if I was just a first year student made me think. I wasn't able to defend my assistant, heck I couldn't even defend myself. It made me feel terribly old and helpless. Discovering that a kid has succeeded in crafting Orichalcum artifacts whereas I failed at it for over 40 years sure didn't help. She sighed. Orion told me that you might be interested in working for an academy and I'd be glad, if you could replace me in the forge mastering department once I retire. The white griffin can't offer you the same opportunity. The professors there are too young, it would take decades for a spot to open. Interesting. So it must have been her telling Orion about my new skinwalker armor. I might work with this development. Maybe I could even ask her about the runes and the sword I found in Huriol. Lith thought, Yondra insisted on her pitch and Lith listened to her while using Solus and Life Vision to keep their surroundings in check. He noticed that the underground was populated by several creatures, but they would all shy away from their lights. Some would follow them for a while, but after finding no opening and maybe even perceiving the power exuding from the expedition, they would soon leave. Solus identified some as magical beasts, others as monsters, whereas the rest were a complete mystery, unfortunately, none of their mystical sense could see more than a silhouette, so Lith couldn't even figure out which was humanoid and which was just a two-legged creature. The walls and the ground were too rough to have been carved, so the passage had to be natural. The scratches and the claw marks he spotted on several occasions, though, were not. Chapter 637. PND no one oh, they were too regular as if someone had carved directions in the stone to not get lost. Lith pointed them to Yondra, who carbon copied them with a piece of paper and chalk. How the heck did you notice them? She blurted out after calling the rest of her colleagues to take a look at his discovery. Secret of the trade. Lith replied since revealing his fire vision was out of the question. The humidity in the cave had filled the carvings with water, making them stand out like a sore thumb to his thermographic vision. After studying the carvings, the unanimous conclusion was that they were indeed some kind of ancient language. If I'm right, our expedition will go in history books. Said Professor Elkers from the Fire Griffin. I recognize this alphabet. It's an ancient dialect of the ODI language. Cheers and applause to both Lith, and Elkers erupted from the group as everyone took their books out of their respective dimensional items to decipher the writings. The ODI. Most of the professors and their assistants repeated enthusiastically so often that it almost resembled a chant. Who the heck are the ODI? Morik said, followed by the soldiers, fuck me sideways. The ODI. Lith thought, they were the reason he had chosen to be assigned to the Keller region in the first place, but he had never predicted to stumble into their legacy with so many people to babysit, worse than that, the professors could actually do more harm than good, so he started to think of a way to ditch them with no consequences for his military career. What's wrong Lith? Quilla asked. You're doing your I'm screwed face. Seriously, we have spent too much time together. Lith didn't like being read so easily. Floria he could understand, but Quilla too, after setting a perimeter to defend the blabbering professors, Lith took Morik, Quilla, and Floria aside to share with them the history of the ODI Kala had taught him about, according to the books in Scarlet's lab, they were an ancient and powerful race that had conquered all illnesses. They had reigned above the other races until they had become so conceited to resort to forbidden magic in the attempt to become immortal, they had developed spells able to move the conscience of an individual from one body to another, achieving eternal youth. Their plan had backfired for two reasons. The first was the fact that the new body was younger, but the talent for magic wasn't carried over. The second was that their victims and the ODI lower class had rebelled to such use of their children, leading to a revolution that had wiped the ODI from the face of Mogar. On top of that, the ODI were considered to have laid the foundation for lichhood. Let me get this straight. Morik said. 
If any of this crazier story of yours is true, then rather than ruins we might stumble into a populated city since those guys are supposed to live as long as they got a spare body. Also, they might have access to technology as good as ours if not even liches. Lith nodded in reply. He doubted the ODI could have actually progressed that much, but it was better to be safe than sorry. Okay, I'm out of here. I'll call my superiors and abort the mission. I've got plans. I'm too young to die just a few months before retirement and in the company of a group of fossils at that. Floria waited for the ranger to be far enough before saying. Anything else we should be aware of? Yes. The ODI were incredibly arrogant and racist. Quilla said. They believed to be the master race and that everything besides magic was below them. They were divided into caste according to their magical talent. I'm telling you this because if somehow their protections are still working, they'll discriminate us based on our mana. Another thing. To avoid doing menial jobs they had slaves, but for protections they used golems. Lith and Floria stared at Quilla with surprise. How do you know all this stuff? They asked in unison. Because even though what they did was wrong, they reached the apex of body sculpting. All historical sources agree on the ODI having truly defeated all illnesses, it's not just a groundless legend. They managed to do something we still can't. If we get our hands on their data, at least the sacrifice of their victims will do some good. We could achieve the same results without injuring anyone. Quilla was trying to convince herself as well as the others. She couldn't stop thinking about the moral implications of using such bloodstained knowledge. My biggest fear is that the modifications the ODI underwent to become immune to disease might have also caused the collapse of their society. Such a deep change in the life force might have easily affected their minds. She thought. Is the expedition you needed my help with also related to the ODI? Lith asked. Yes. Their empire was located in the Keller region, but aside from some small ruins, nothing relevant has ever been found. I joined this expedition hoping I might find something that could help me to locate their capital, Resha, but I would have never thought we would find something in the ODI language. What if we are about to discover Resha itself? It's unlikely. A capital is a place that must be easily accessible. A city with a constant flow of people, merchandise, and a lot of guards. Floria said. Signs on the walls and underground tunnels make me think more about a secret facility of sorts. Their debate was interrupted by Morik's return. God damn it. The High Command ordered to continue with the mission and seal all the communication with the outside. He took a small device the size of a glass marble out of his dimensional amulet. A short pulse of orange light spread through the tunnel, drawing the attention of the professors. Lith expected them to be enraged by such lack of trust, but they looked all smug instead. Excellent move, Ranger Eerie, said Professor Garku from the Crystal Griffin. She was one of the youngest in the group, a woman in her early forties with several blue streaks in her light brown hair and dark eyes. According to the markings found by Ranger Verhen, we are about to find the ruins of Kula. What's that? Lith asked, turning to Quilla, who shrugged in reply. I've no idea either, but since it must have taken a lot of effort to build something so deep below the earth, it must be something important. Captain Anas, I don't need to tell you how security has just become of paramount importance. Garku said. We'll keep protecting you at the best of our abilities. Floria nodded. Not us, foolish child. I mean our discovery. Ranger Eerie, didn't you explain anything to her? No, because you butted in before I could. Morik said with a snort. ODI ruins are considered a state secret. Revealing their position or stealing any kind of artifact and knowledge is an act of treason. According to my commanding officer, all ODI ruins discovered so far contain priceless treasures. Everything we found is considered a royal property. At that point, Morik turned to Floria. We're now under martial law and since you are the highest ranked officer, the command is now yours. It makes me happy because everything that goes wrong it's your fault and not mine. Chapter 638. What are your orders, Captain Anas? There was something in the way Morik said the word that made it sound like an insult. Let's move. We need to reach the ruins as soon as possible. Ranger Eerie, you and two of my men take point. Ranger Verhen, cover our back. Everyone else, if someone tries to sneak away from the group, strike first and ask questions later. The three soldiers nodded, making the assistant professor swallow. None of them had expected their bodyguards to turn into their jailers, Morik picked up the pace and so did everyone else. Everyone walked in silence, they were too busy watching their steps to waste energy chatting. Lith was alone with Quiller again and was now worried about another unexpected turn of events. The more they advanced, the fewer creatures he would spot along the corridors until the group was completely alone, whatever Kular is, it seems that no one dares to come close to it. Let's hope I don't meet my third lick. Lith thought, after more than four hours of walking, the group needed a break. From that moment onwards, only the members of the military were allowed to stand guard, whereas the others had to stay grouped together, making it harder for anyone to escape from their watch. Aside from Moss, nothing grew inside the tunnels, making them all look identical. As hours turned into days, most members of the expedition started to fall into depression. There was no sunlight, the air was stale and smelly, making it painful to breathe from time to time. Morik was still able to find his way thanks to the marks he had left while escaping from the Abomination Goblin hybrids, but every time he opened a new passage, he could see doubt and mistrust in the eyes of the others. They were growing afraid that he had lost his way and their lives in the process. The group was so deep inside Mogar that dimensional magic was useless. All places looked the same, so opening a warp steps was no longer an option. Using earth magic with no idea where they were was likely to result in getting stranded or even cause a fatal cave-in. The impossibility to do anything but walking, sleeping, and eating was a heavy burden for everyone which worsened with each rest they took. The dullness of their routine turned the enthusiasm of the discovery into a bleak, hopeless silence. More than once one of the assistants had a claustrophobic attack and needed to be sedated. According to Lith's pocket watch, only four days had passed, but to everyone the march seemed to have lasted weeks. Here we are. This is where I was forced to stop during my first visit. Now it's all up to you, smarty pants. Morik said, the group had reached a huge underground cave of irregular shape which was at least 100 meters, 330 feet, wide with a ceiling about 20 meters, 66 feet, high. 
Once again, Lif could see that aside from Moss, there was no life form dwelling in the vicinities. The floor was too regular to not be man-made and several corridors departed from the cave. Each one of them had been clearly realized with earth magic and was wide enough to allow a huge carriage to easily pass. Where do they lead? Lif asked. I don't know. I had no time to play explorer, my priority was survival. The moment we were cleared to leave, we took the same path back to the surface. It was the safest route. Morik replied. As you have probably noticed, there's not much to eat down here, so any predator that gets stranded will welcome our arrival as if we're a free meal ready for the taking. We can't close the passages without running out of fresh air but we can't leave them like this. The two rangers started to put tripwires and alarms along the corridors while the professors studied the structure at the end of the cave. There was a huge door there, so perfectly crafted that it would have been invisible if not for the moss that over the years had grown inside its small crevices, outlining its shape. It was a double door made of rock, so high that it almost reached the ceiling and so wide that three carriages could easily pass together through it. The problem was that there was no sign of its activation mechanism. Soon the cave was filled with light and noise as everyone did his best to find a solution to the conundrum in front of them. The array detection spells perceived several magical formations protecting both the door and the wall, making them immune to earth magic. How the heck can those things still work? Aren't arrays supposed to fade without maintenance? One of the assistants asked. There are several possible explanations for this phenomenon, but your clearance level is too low to learn about any of them. So shut up and help us open this damn door. Gaku replied, Lif only needed a glance to learn the answer to that question. Just like most of the lost cities, whatever was behind the door had been built above a mana giza. The arrays could draw their sustenance from it and unless an event of catastrophic proportions happened, they would last until someone turned them off, Lif and Solus consulted all their warden books, but the design of the arrays was unknown. The only thing they were certain of, was that they were powerful and that they would react badly if someone tried to forcefully open the door. There are several points in the wall where the word energy has been accumulated and compressed. It can't have any other purpose than to act as a defense mechanism in case of attack. Lith thought. To Morik Yondra asked, do you have any suggestions on how to open the door? No. During my first visit, my main worry was not dying of starvation and fortifying the place. He pointed at the south wall, where a few small buildings had been created with earth magic. The ground in the vicinities was full of holes big and deep enough that moving recklessly would likely result in a sprain or worse, depending on how badly one would fall. What about you? Floria asked. Now that she was aware of Lith's life vision, she could expect one of his usual miracles. Dot. None. He used hush to avoid being heard. The cave was so full of echoes that even a whisper would be carried around, making it noticeable. The design of the arrays is too complex to understand something on a first glance. I need to study them carefully and then I'll let you know. Are you saying you can see arrays too? Floria was flabbergasted. As clearly as I can see you. Unlike people, they are entirely made of mana, so it's much easier to notice their details. Be careful with the door, I think it's surrounded by magical traps. The situation made no sense to Lith. He knew thanks to life vision that no one was around, yet Morik had told him how they had met so many monsters during their stay to be forced to fortify the place, and even resort to eating them, the question is, did it happen out of pure bad luck, was it some kind of automatic defense mechanism like the arrays, or did someone send the monsters to kill them? Lith thought, I guess it's only a matter of time before we learn the answer. Solus replied. Chapter 639. Soon fatigue trampled over the renewed enthusiasm from reaching their destination. The professors had come prepared, they had all the necessary to set up a few defensive arrays before going to sleep. I don't know how long we'll stay here, but we can't allow depression to dull our wits. Give me a few minutes. Professor Yondra said, after a while, the cave was lit by a sphere of light that resembled a small sun, positioned in the middle of the ceiling. The array provided both light and warmth, even giving the ceiling a blue color. A second array made the air fresher, ridding it of the excess humidity. Despite their simple effects, the two combined arrays made wonders to lift the morale of the expedition. The solar cycle array will reproduce the solar phases, including sunset. Yondra explained while checking her pocket watch. This way we can recover our normal sleep cycle and have an artificial night with an artificial moon that will provide us light. Morik had already sealed the path behind them, so Floria's soldiers could now guard the natural corridors without worrying that anyone could escape. Without Ranger Eerie there was no way out and the cave offered no privacy. The group expanded the building Morik had previously created and split it into separate spaces for men and women. Once the camp was set, a hot meal consumed around a fire gave everyone the energy they needed to resume their task with optimism. Now the members of the expedition didn't feel lost anymore. They had a purpose, a roof, and light to guide their way. While Lyft searched the stone door for a way in, he noticed that Floria and Quilla had joined the rest of the team. Both of them had what looked like a thin wand made of silver that resembled a conductor's baton. They would strike with it at any unusual rock or apparently out of place detail they found, each time the wand hit, it would produce a ding, but nothing else. Since Forgemaster professors like Yondra had a similar tool, Lith felt compelled to ask, Quilla, what is that thing? A royal Forgemaster tool. If you cast the proper incantation, it forces an enchanted item to reveal its nature. She explained. It can tell you what a spell does? Lith was as shocked as his voice sounded. No, silly. She laughed. It just reveals the magical nature of an otherwise seemingly normal item. Then it's up to the Forgemaster to study it. We're looking for some kind of enchanted secret compartment. Since when the two of you are forge masters? Lith asked. I started to practice it seriously after, you know, I killed Uriel. I spent the entire year I was cooped up home learning the basics. It helped me a lot to keep my head clear. Her voice was sad but firm, Quilla had come to terms with the actions the slave ring had forced her to commit, but that couldn't erase the guilt she felt for the death of one of her best friends. I, instead, started as soon as I finished my boot camp. Floria was eager to change the topic, she didn't want to let Quilla dwelling too long on such bad memories. I couldn't stand my men having poor equipment because there's never enough budget. Plus I always wanted to follow my father's footsteps. Once I got rid of grades, I could finally take my time and learn things at my own pace. Why have I never heard of such a tool? Lith was kind of envious. 
He didn't need it, but it would have made it much easier for him to justify his findings with life vision. Also, if he had Orion's teachings and resources, the sky would be the only limit for his true forge mastery. You can always dump Camilla and marry Floria, if she's okay with it. Sola sneered, sorry, you are right. I should stop thinking with my wallet. Lith replied. Because it's a secret of the trade. Yondra said. Only royal forge masters know how to craft one and only they can entrust one to someone else. Doing that puts in danger their own title and status. It's part of the legacy of Valeron Griffin, the first king. Are you perchance interested in my offer now? Lith was about to give her a polite but firm hard pass when his nose caught an unfamiliar scent. Now that the air was clear, his perceptions were back to their full efficiency. What's that noise? Morik said putting everyone on the alert, how the heck did he hear something above our voices? Lith thought while running toward the entrance and activating life vision. The previously empty tunnels were now filled with unknown creatures. They triggered all the alarms the two rangers had set along the way before finally coming into the light. It was a group of magical beasts with the appearance of humanoid crabs, who stood over two meters, six foot seven, tall. There was no head above their shoulders, just a pair of stalks ending with eyes that moved independently, allowing them to have a 360 degree sight. Their bodies were covered with a thick and pale white chitinous exoskeleton that made them look like stone colossuses come to life. They had huge pincers instead of hands, big enough that they could easily chop a bull's head off, they had no equipment, but between their bulky size and their bright green mana cores, Lith could tell that they probably didn't need it. The soldiers stuck at the creatures with their blades, but they were easily repelled by the exoskeletons without leaving a scratch, then, the soldiers activated the spells imbued in their magical rings, unleashing lightning bolts against the magical beasts while seeking the protection of the array. The electricity slipped over the humanoid crabs like rain on a window, inflicting no damage. Using fire magic was too risky inside caves. The air was thin and the only fresh oxygen was that provided by the ever-present moss. Fire might make the cave inhabitable or destroy the moss needed for the group's survival. Hence the well-trained soldiers used earth magic to conjure a barrage of earth spikes to crush open the exoskeletons, or at least pin the creatures against the walls long enough for the professors to prepare a powerful spell that would finish them in one fell swoop. Unfortunately, the creatures only needed a wave of their pincer hands to overpower the control of the soldiers over the spikes and threw them. Against the barrier. The crab beings were smart enough to aim for someone who wasn't the one who had cast the spell, so that they could actually hurt them. Don't waste your spells. Dinner here is called tack. Their only weak points are the joints and the eyes. Morik said point one of his twin short swords pierced into the midriff of the tack in front of him, hitting its white cartilage with surgical precision despite it being almost indistinguishable from the same coloured exoskeleton. The creature tried to crush the ranger with its pincers, but Morik stepped back, taking out the blade from the open wound as a trickle of blue blood came out of it. He also hit the creature with a palm strike, apparently using the momentum of the hit to propel himself backward faster. Right after the dodge, a thud could be heard and smoke came out of all the joints of the tech as it collapsed to the ground, making them visible. Chapter 640 Morik had actually cast a fireball right through the open wound and into the innards of the creature, using its own hard shell to trap the powerful explosion inside the beast. I like my crab well cooked and now you know where to hit. Time to earn your pay, boys. He said with a feral smile before moving on to the next opponent. Lith's blade, one of the failed prototypes, went for the eyes instead. He wanted to check why Morik had chosen such a dangerous strategy when there was a much easier target. The answer came in the form of the eye stalks actually being articulated peduncles capable of being folded back into the shell in case of danger, plan B it is. Lith thought, putting the blade back inside his pocket dimension. Fusion magic empowered his body as Solus turned into her glove form, fully enveloped by the silver protection of the oracalcum. The fist struck the tech's abdomen like a jackhammer, lifting the creature off the ground of a few centimeters as cracks spread over its armor. The waves of pain the hit caused made the eyes reflexively pop out, allowing Lyft to grab them with his free hand and discharge lightning directly into them. The electricity traveled straight into the brain of the tech, killing it on the spot. A second creature, incredibly nimble despite its size, circled around its dead companion and released a hail of razor-sharp ice crystals, water fusion is a game two can play. Lyft thought, now that he knew the two elements tech could use, he could predict their basic strategy. Lith sidestepped the attack, letting it harmlessly strike the barrier as a palm strike injected a volley of plague arrows inside the enemy. Seeing that Lith had killed two enemies in the same time he had needed to kill one, Morik clicked his tongue. Fine. Let's get serious. Pick hammer. Morik said, sheathing and unsheathing his blades in the blink of an eye. The weapons shape shifted into one handed battle hammers that closely resembled Solus's forge mastering hammer. Having both a hammerhead and a pick, Morik struck with the pick side of the weapon at the carapace of the closest tech, but to no avail. His strength wasn't enough to pierce its rock hard shell. At least not until a second later, when the second hammer hit the head of the first one as if it was a nail. The pit crushed both the exoskeleton and the heart of the creature, instantly killing it. The soldiers and the professors were so shocked by the display of raw power in front of their eyes that they stared dumbly at the scene, incapable of moving a muscle, the tech started to coordinate their moves, attacking in waves and dying in waves. Morik would crush between his hammers any pincer that came too close for comfort, whereas Lith used water fusion to be as nimble as the tech's and air fusion to be faster than them. Every one of his palm strikes would send one of the creatures flying against its comrades, spreading his deadly touch to all of them since Plague Arrow's ethereal nature would pierce through any kind of matter until all of its energy was exhausted. Good gods. Jerf said. She was the second most powerful mage in her unit after Floria. I thought they were just tall, dark, and rudesome, but those two are not human. Are all rangers like that, Captain? No. There is a reason why unlike the academies the army ranks monster cadets above the special ones. Floria replied snapping out of her reverie. Which one did you date? The less rude one. Now stop flapping your gums and drink your potions, they need backup. She was right. The first group was already dead, but a much larger one was flooding out of all tunnels. Are we really going to stand here like morons? Professor Syndra from the Lightning Griffin yelled. Captain, buy me five seconds and I'll close the curtains on this madness. Floria nodded and started yelling orders. Stall them with hit and run tactics, there's weakness in numbers. Darkness magic may be slow, but there's too many of them. 
if you shoot in the middle, you are bound to hit some of them. What can I do? Quilla asked. Stay behind me and get ready to treat the wounded. The techs were too many, forcing the two rangers on the defensive, back to back to avoid being surrounded. Nice glove. Morik said. Nice weapons. Also, duck. Lith replied while clapping his hands and emitting a silvery sound due to the auric alchem covering them. What duck? Oh shit. Morik kneeled just in time as Lith's hands released a ring of darkness energy that expanded outwards, mowing through the horde around them. The spell wasn't strong enough to kill so many techs, but it temporarily weakened them. It allowed the two rangers to escape the encirclement, and find shelter inside the array. Floria's soldiers were shooting darkness magic non-stop, killing dozens of enemies at once while she unleashed her tier 5 mage knight spell, Boom Box. All the spells in a mage knight's grimoire could be cast with only one hand, making their casting speed exceptionally fast. Their greatest downside was their very short range, but against so many enemies amassed in the little space between the tunnels and the barrier, there was no such problem. Point five square-shaped ice shields with a side length of 7 meters, 23 feet, surrounded the techs from all directions but below, trapping them. Before the creatures could smash through the ice, a sphere of wind exploded in the middle of the spell. The thunderclap was followed by a shockwave that rebounded on the ice walls after being amplified by a resonance effect. The shockwaves grew in power every time they hit an ice wall, piercing through all the prisoners after each sonic speed rebound. The techs crumbled like sand castles facing a high tide, but more of them came out of the tunnels. Everyone, step back. Professor Syndra said. He lifted both his arms, conjuring a tidal wave out of thin air that crashed against the techs both inside the cave and those still inside the tunnels. No offense, Gramps, but all that water will just make much easier for them destroying the array with enough ice to make winter look like summer. Morik said, Professor Syndra's lips curled up in a disgusted expression. It was hard to tell if he was more insulted or annoyed by the ranger's obvious remark. Once you're old, you need to eat a lot of fish. It's good for your memory. Corona discharge. Syndra said with a flat tone, the mother of all lightning bolts erupted from his body, in the wake of the tidal wave. Corona discharge was a tier 5 war mage spell. It used water to soak the opponent so that the following bolt of lightning could bypass all protections and hit the weak spots of an enemy. In the text case, their eyes, like all tier 5 spells, both the water and the lightning were guided by Syndra's will, making them impossible to escape from. Over 50 techs died in an instant, their bodies emitting the characteristic aroma of stewed lobster. Are you thinking what I'm thinking? Lith asked. Yes, I call dibs on the well-cooked ones. I know we just ate, but all this action made me work an appetite. Morik replied. Chapter 641. Those words made Lith almost slap his own forehead, but luckily he remembered in time about the auric alchem still covering his hands. Those are water creatures, but there can't be a big enough water body around here to sustain such a big colony. If that was the case, we should hear the underground water stream or at least smell a lot of humidity in the air. Does any of you perceive any of that? He asked, the group started to sniff the air like a pack of hounds. No. The air is drier than many places we crossed on our way here. Said Professor Garku. Exactly. So where the heck did they come from? Why we didn't hear them coming despite the ever-present echo? Those are good questions, but I can at least answer one of them. Professor Yondra said. Text manipulate earth. They must have made the ground softer to avoid making noise. That doesn't explain why they were so focused on us. If they were starving, they would have eaten their fallen first. Instead, they kept attacking like their lives were on the line even though we did nothing to provoke them. Lith looked at the tunnels they were empty again. There was no trace of scouts or survivors fleeing from the scene, it doesn't make sense. My paranoia sense keeps tingling. He thought. I think he is right. Professor Syndra said. Either the ODI's longevity is a hard truth rather than a myth, or we must have activated some automated defense mechanism. No matter the answer, both of them mean that we are in front of the discovery of a lifetime. Half of us will, with all due respect, I give the orders here, Professor. Floria cut him short. Before resuming our search, the wardens must strengthen the barrier while my soldiers and the rangers rest. In the meantime, all those that didn't do anything will guard the tunnels. Sir, yes, sir. Morik said spitting a bit of tech meat from the arm he was chewing. How certain are you that they didn't just come here following our noise? She asked Lith with a whisper. Remember this? Lith tapped the side of his eyes, resuming to speak as soon as she nodded him to continue. I'm 100% sure that those corridors were empty. Then there were 10 techs and after we started killing them others popped up. I mean it. I didn't see anyone walking. Then please rest and help us to find a way to open that door. This place is already giving me the creeps. Lith used accumulation while he looked around the cave. He remembered that both the White Griffin Academy and his tower had surveillance mirrors, so the idea that someone was actually looking at them from a distance was quite likely. Life Vision scanned every centimeter of the cave, searching for the transmitting device. Divination didn't exist, to spy on someone it was needed a transmitter that would capture the reflected light like a camera would and warp the images to the mirror. Dot IT could have been anything, but its magical aura was supposed to be visible, unless it's cloaked. Solus suggested it wouldn't make sense. Only awakened can sense mana, and I doubt that those ODI creeps were awakened. Otherwise each body they occupied would have lasted centuries and they would have kept their magical talent. Lith replied, maybe they weren't awakened, but they might have been aware of their existence. Solus suggested, Solus, do you realize that you've become a bigger pessimist than I am? Those words put an end to their argument and made Solus wish they were both wrong. Solus about the ODI and Lith about her, unlike invigoration, accumulation had no rejuvenating effects, it would simply absorb the surrounding world energy and feed it to Lith's mana core, making it stronger. Since whatever Kula was it was built on a mana Giza, Lith could draw much more nourishment than usual from the environment. Even though hours of accumulation don't amount to much of a power-up, if I'm right about someone operating Kula as defenses, every bit can help. He thought as his enhanced body naturally recovered his mana and stamina, while Morik slept to recover from the fatigue of the fight, Lith ate some food and searched for the activation mechanism of the door. The entire stone wall had been enchanted and several arrays overlapped on its surface, whoever did this was indeed a master warden. Solus thought. 
The rooms comprising the various arrays never touch each other and have an even spacing between them, allowing the rooms to work in perfect harmony. On top of that, it makes really hard to understand which room belongs to which array. I'm afraid that I was right about the ODI being aware of Awakened, maybe and maybe not. Lith replied. There are things like Scarlet's Pantene or General Vorga's staff that can make them visible to the naked eye. So far the only thing we know for certain is that they were crafty bastards, Lith placed his hands on the stone wall, as if he was searching for crevices or a hidden switch, and activated invigoration. It was the only means he had to bypass any kind of cloaking device that could hide the truth from his eyes. Invigoration required Lith to override someone's or something's mana flow with his own. It was a skill he had developed as a kid and it was second nature to him. Unfortunately, he had never used it on something that big. There was only so much space he could cover without spreading his resources too thin, dulling his senses. To make matters worse, the complexity of the arrays, and the enchantment of the wall made it hard for him to properly examine their countless details dot on the bright side, Solus could now deactivate her mana sense and focus solely on deciphering the incantation by sharing Lith's senses. Lith's antics drew more than one surprised look and several scoffs. Ranger Verhen, this is a waste of your abilities. If groping a wall was enough to bypass a protective array, then Wardens and Forge Masters wouldn't have spent so much time and effort developing their spells for tasks like the one at hand. Professor Syndra said, there was no mockery in his voice, only sincere worry. If that idiot of my assistant was half as capable as Lith, instead of cackling at him like a child. He thought. Thanks for your concern, Professor. Yet we must consider that the ODI might have taken spells into account and resorted to some kind of mechanical trigger. Lith replied with the first believable explanation that came to his mind. Excellent point. Did you hear that, Kalil? Take a lesson from Ranger Verhen and use your brain. If by the end of the expedition your contributions amount to nothing, I'll have you fired. Just like the other assistants, Kalil had been noting down his master's findings so that he could later revise and make sense of the bigger picture. The rest of the time, the youths had been laughing behind the wall groping Ranger's back, suddenly, there wasn't much to laugh about. Instead of mindlessly writing, he started to rack his brain for a solution to the conundrum at hand. Chapter 642 By the time the artificial sun started to set, the members of the expedition decided to call it quits for the day. Yondra could make the sun rise whenever she wanted, but that would mess up their sleep cycle even more. Everyone was tired either because of the constant spellcasting or from trying to make sense of the collected data about the wall. Some, like Quilla, had a splitting headache from doing both, Morik and Floria's soldiers were pretty relaxed instead. They had slept, eaten, and spent their time playing dices or cards while guarding the tunnels. How do your weapons work, exactly? Lith asked Morik while eating dinner. The problem with the wilds is that you never know what mess you're going to stumble into. So I had a good forge master made me Orichalcum weapons capable of shapeshifting at will. The sheaths are part of the weapons and the key to trigger their shapeshifting abilities. If I need them to be heavier, the extra mass comes from the sheaths. They are also made with orichalcum and are thicker than they look. Solus studied their pseudo core with mana sense and was relieved to discover that they had no runes engraved on their surface. It seems that we are right. Runes must be a state secret. The pseudo core is very complex and it even required purple crystals to be stabilized. She thought. They shape shift? That's it? Lith asked. That's it, my ass. Morak was offended. They saved my life countless times. They have a few minor incantations too, but nothing more. Energy based properties and orichalcum are hard to not mix together, smart ass. I don't have that kind of money. He said while looking at the skinwalker in envy. Sorry, I didn't mean to belittle them. It's just that between the orichalcum and the purple crystals, I expected something a little flashier. What does your gauntlet do? Morik asked, ignoring the apology. Not much, yet. It's a work in progress. So far it can store a few low-tier spells and serve as a last-ditch weapon. The glove's fingers turned into claws. I think it's very useful already. If you ever mass-produce them, I call dibs. Why use stone as its foundation though? I told you, it's a work in progress. I use cheap materials because I constantly upgrade it. Lith replied. No duh, man. You are too stingy. Those magic crystals are smaller than my eyes and green and yellow at that. No offense, but that's lame. Lame? I've worked my ass off for years to get those two, gems, things, whatever they are. Solus thought. Can I please punch him on the nose? Any idea about how to open the door? Lith was stuck between a rock and a moron, so he was eager to change the topic. None and I don't even care. I get paid no matter the result of the expedition. Fighting an eldritch and those techs should be already worth a hefty bonus. Anything more is just gravy. Since there was nothing to get from him, except maybe getting cleaned up at gambling, Lith went to speak with Quilla. Aside from the professors and Solus, she was definitely the smartest person in the cave. How's your head? Lith asked. After I treated myself, the pain is gone, but I'm still foggy. I can't waste a tonic on our first day. She replied while massaging her temples. Gods, I feel so useless. I'm more of a deadweight in battle now than when we were still at the White Griffin and I can't even open a damn door. That's not true. You saved Floria's life and many others. As for the door, I'd say you are in good company. Lith tried to cheer her up. That was days ago. The only thing I've achieved today is getting Prime Callus on my fingers. She showed him her right hand. After swinging the Forge Master wand for hours and using healing magic to treat blisters and skin irritation, her skin had hardened. Quilla could easily get rid of them, but since she seemed to have many hours of wand swinging ahead of her, it would have been pointless. While they were talking, one of the assistants passed them a copy of the information collected by the members of the expedition during the day. Withholding knowledge in front of a common hurdle was pointless. Each professor wanted the glory for themselves, but unless they got past the door, there was no glory to take. The data had been sorted so that each array could be studied separately from the others and from the door's enchantment, making it easier to identify their rune patterns and energy nodes. There was a lot of warden jargon on each piece of paper and Lith could only understand the terms that Kular's arrays and those he knew had in common. Quilla squinted her eyes hard as if there was something she couldn't focus properly on. Great, my headache is back. 
I give up. Good night, Lif. She put the notes in her dimensional amulet and stormed away, why didn't you help her with invigoration? Solus asked, she's tired and frustrated with herself. The headache gives her a reason to rest and blow off some steam. If I make her head clear and she still fails, Quilla will feel twice as useless. Once because I fixed something that she couldn't and the second time because she would have no excuse for failing to open the door. Lif replied, Lif wasn't prideful. He didn't care how he solved the problem as long as he succeeded so he had no qualms asking for help to his betters. He walked towards Yondra's campfire. Up to that point, the professor from the Black Griffin was the one he had the best relationship with. She had already taught him a few things and maybe she was willing to expand his understanding of ancient arrays. Professor Yondra, maybe it's a stupid question, but why no one has tried to use Clean Slate to open the door? Clean Slate was a tier 4 Forge Master spell that would temporarily disable an enchantment, so in theory, it might solve their problem. It's not a stupid question, Ranger Verhen. This array here dash, she said while showing him one of her notes. Prevents the lock from being tampered from the outside. If we use Clean Slate, it will trigger the first energy node and cause a chain reaction that will activate all the other arrays. Damn. I can't even use Invigoration, then. He thought. It's not a spell, but it's likely to be perceived as an external energy. I don't know what most of the other arrays do, but they are too powerful for a blind tinkering approach. Lith started to ask her about all the runes he was unfamiliar with and Yondra was happy to answer all of his questions. They had got off on the wrong foot, but the more time Lith spent with her, the more Yondra reminded him of his late mentor, Nana. Yondra wasn't that old nor her back hunched, but the fierce light in her eyes was the same as Nana's and so it was her shameless approach to get what she wanted from people. It's fantastic that someone as young as you are has already comprehended the importance that every single room comprising an array has. Most students are only interested in learning how to cast an array and how to bring them down. They don't care for the hows or the whys involved in the process. She patted his back before yawning. Chapter 643. It's hard to miss their importance when you see how runes affect the space around themselves, and how the order of their activation can make so that the effects of two arrays comprised by the same runes are completely different. Lith thought. Alas, I'm too old and tired to keep going. The moon is high already. Get some rest. If more creatures attack us tomorrow, I'll be counting on your protection. Yondra smothered the fire with a finger snap and entered the women's quarters, Lith remained alone for a while, sorting the new information acquired with Solus and taking notes on his own papers to later store them inside Solaspedia. Soon fatigue gave him a headache and his brain begged him for a break, fighting is so much easier. He sighed, your body can withstand a lot, but your mind still needs to relax. Go to sleep, I'll keep an eye on the situation. Outside her tower, Solus was unable to sleep or rest. It gave Lith an edge in many situations, but in the long term, it affected her sanity, Lith went to sleep near a guard post, ready to act at the first sign of danger. He trusted no one. Morak was too strange and the soldiers too weak for his taste. The professors were magically strong, some even more than Lith, but as Korg had demonstrated, it only took a single shot to take them down, paranoia was a cruel mistress, but it had served him well too many times to ignore her. Except when it was dead wrong, of course. When morning came and nothing happened, Lith cursed at himself, hindsight is always 100% correct. Solus chuckled, the members of the expedition went back to study the door and before any of them could notice, dawn turned into sunset. Lith had even tried using fire vision at noon to spot hidden compartments. If a switch was camouflaged under a fake rock, it should have shown a different coloration at his thermal vision when compared with the rest of the rock wall, after being heated for hours by Yondra's spell. Unfortunately, even this attempt failed, Lith spent dinner with Yondra and Quilla, comparing notes in search for a solution. The expedition was Lith's best shot at getting his hands on ancient ODI technology that might help him solve his reincarnation problem. If we crack this riddle and in the future I find more ruins on my own, I'll know how to get in. If we fail despite so many wise mags working together, I might as well check the ODI off my list of possible solutions. He thought, during the third day, Lith started to become restless just like the assistant professors. The older mags knew that solving ancient mysteries required time, effort, and luck, whereas their aides took failure personally. After whispering, open sesame, in front of the door, obtaining nothing in return but an awkward echo, Lith asked Professor Garku, the language expert, what's the ODI word for friends? Glavrish. Why? After a painful second that shattered his last hopes, he replied, no reason. I was just curious. He said while Solus laughed her ass off at his expense, when dinner time came, Lith decided to give a break to both himself and Yondra, spending the evening with his friends. After receiving her own skinwalker, Quilla's mood had improved a lot, but she was getting gloomier with each passing day. Gods, it's so frustrating to me. I'm probably the one that knows more about the ODI among all the assistants taking part in the expedition, since I've been researching them for over a year now. Yet my contribution is close to zero. Quilla said. I'd rather not work while I eat. If I hear another word about arrays, I'm going to scream. Lith said. But since we are already there, maybe there's something we are missing. When I taught magic to Tista, I improved my foundations by learning from my own teachings. Maybe if you tell us what you know about the ODI, we could better understand their way of thinking. First of all, they were conceited, self-centered bastards. Quilla said with a voice full of spite. Their laws allowed them to have slaves, as long as they weren't ODI, and they treated the other races worse than their cattle. The ODI would use their slaves as guinea pigs, infecting them on purpose with the illnesses they had yet to cure. When healing magic wasn't enough, they would resort to body sculpting, permanently altering their subjects' physiology trying to make them immune to congenital diseases. Once they achieved perfect health, they moved on altering their appearance so that every member of their race would be born with what they considered to be perfect proportions. For decades they attained countless feats, uncaring for their costs since they weren't the ones paying for it. Then, they tried to defeat aging and failed. You know the rest. They were obsessed with the search for perfection in every aspect of their life. I mean, look at the arrays. The word was enough to make Lyft's head throb. The spacing between the rooms, the way they overlap with each other, and the door at the same time. It's a seamless formation with no weak points. Lith reviewed his notes inside Solaspedia, comparing them with Quilla's words. It's indeed an amazing piece of work. 
he said, his eyes fixated in a blank spot as he examined the rooms one by one and forced himself not to puke. Even if there are five arrays covering the door, the resulting structure resembles that of a musical score. Each rune is perfectly placed, one flows into another and is reinforced by the other rooms surrounding it as it in turn reinforces them. Yeah, it's almost like. That's it. I think I know how to open that door. Quilla stood up abruptly, flipping her plate. Only a well-timed use of spirit magic saved the innocent food. She dragged Floria and Lyft to Professor Garku's campfire to share her success with them. Garku was the head of the expedition, her permission was required before making an attempt at opening the barrier. We got it all wrong, Professor. There aren't five arrays, just one and I know how to open it. Quilla said. Nonsense, Majoners. Any of us, you included, can detect five different structures and their unique power nodes. We have even identified the purpose of each one of them, no, that's where you are wrong. You have identified the purpose they have when you take them separately and that's why there's no solution. Please humor me. What happens if you consider them as a single array? What becomes of their runes? Professor Garku sighed, using water magic to write down the information about the different arrays on a single page. I can't just say no to Majoners. At least she has shown initiative and confidence. The morale is already bad as it is. Trying and failing is better than letting yourself fall into despair. She thought dot at least until the entire picture appeared in front of her eyes. This is amazing. The five arrays actually do combine into a single one with its own purpose. She blurted out as her colleagues started to huddle up behind her back, looking at the piece of paper in her hands. Chapter 644. Dinarom, exactly. They split the array into different parts to disguise its real structure. Quilla said. It's more than that. Said Professor Neschel, the master warden from the Earth Griffin. The five arrays can work both individually and as one. The ODI found a way to make overlapping arrays more than the sum of their parts. But you are right. The final array is the weak spot because once you discover the truth, it allows you to destroy them all at once. It's unbeatable if you don't know the trick behind it, but once you do, you can topple them all like a house of cards. It would be revolutionary otherwise. She sighed. Neshel admired the ODI for their ingenuity and despised them at the same time for their conceit. They had clearly thought that no member of the lesser races would notice the fatal flaw in their creation. Excellent work, Quilla. Said Professor Fester from the White Griffin. I'll make sure that you are rewarded properly by the Academy. Without your insight, we might have wasted days standing in front of the door. Thanks, Professor. She was brimming with joy. Can we open it now? Absolutely not. All those present said in unison. We have no idea what lies beyond the gate and we are all tired. We will work on the sixth array after we are fully recovered and are ready for any surprise the ODI might have left behind. Professor Garku said Quilla was kind of disappointed. After struggling so hard and for so long, she had to continue waiting to see if the fruits of her labor would pay off. Lyft didn't share her anxiety. He didn't need life vision or mana sense to perceive the danger that kind of array posed to his life. The next morning, the professors used earth magic to conjure a table made of stone and worked together to safely open the door. As soon as all the papers were laid on the stone surface, Lyft made his proposal. I don't think that opening the array is a good idea. Destroying it will require the same energy and it's much safer. Are you insane? More than one professor said. That kind of technique in laying arrays constitutes a relic by itself. Even if it's a faulty product, we could study it and learn a lot about the ancient ODI magic. We might even find a way to improve their creation. Professor Sindra said. Indeed. But what if we open the door, trigger a trap, and the arrays activate again? What if they shoot us in the back the moment we walk through that door? Is a single relic worth our lives? He spoke looking in Floria's eyes. She was the commander of the expedition and the only one who was aware of the anomalies occurred while battling the Tex. I agree with Ranger Verhen. She said. Take your time to study and copy the array formation if you must, but no one is going inside until that thing is taken down. The first rule for every combat situation is to have a clear retreat path. If the ODI's defense system identifies us as members of the lesser races and the gate closes behind us, we'd have no time to open it again. Leaving our back exposed is out of the question. My decision is final. What started as a low grumble soon rose in intensity, until outraged yells echoed throughout the entire cave. Give it a rest, will you? Morik's voice overcame them all like a roar. We could be attacked by a whole army and I would miss their arrival because of your yapping. If you want to die, leave me out of it. The bickering went on until it started to grind on Floria's nerves. Maybe you're not familiar with how the army works. The discussion is over. She said. Maybe, and maybe not. Professor Garku replied. Over two-thirds of the members of the expedition disagree with you. We demand to speak with your commanding officer. How dare you questioning my judgment? Her voice was low, yet it was perfectly audible and scarier than any angry yell or threat. I dare because I think that due to your young age you fail to realize how important this discovery might be, Captain Inners. Ours is not just the temper tantrum of some old fogies. Garku replied. We are concerned that your hasty decision can harm the development of magic and the kingdom itself. Not to mention that albeit Ranger Verhen has a point, I believe that your past relationship is affecting your judgment. Being careful is good, being paranoid is not. As the head of the expedition, it's in my right to veto your decision if it damages the kingdom. Fine. Floria knew Garku was right, since there was no emergency situation and the army communication amulet still worked, she had to rely the message. Yet it was the first time during her military career that someone had disrespected her orders so blatantly. She broke the communication silence and called the high command, explaining to them everything that had happened. She mentioned Lyft's insight on the most recent attack and emphasized the risks that keeping the array would imply. Interesting. Commander Berrien replied while tapping his mahogany desk with his forefinger. Who proposed to preserve the array? He asked, judging from his choice of words and his tone of voice, the professors understood that he agreed with them so they introduced themselves one by one. With the Mage Association's bleak-looking future, receiving the support of a rising star in the army like Berrien could lead to countless benefits. 
Even some of those who had previously agreed on destroying the formation switched sides. Only Professor Yondra and Professor Sindra were adamant in putting their safety first and didn't change their mind. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your honesty. I have to agree with Captain Anas and Ranger Verhen. They both have a 100% mission success rate, so I'll trust their judgment since it's the only reason you are still alive. No offense, Professor Garku, but without Ranger Eri the coordinates of the ruins would be lost. On top of that, in case the expedition gets wiped out, the kingdom would have lost some of their most valuable subjects. Captain Anas is right. Study the formation as much as you want and take it down when you are ready. Over and out. Berian's calm attitude disappeared as soon as the communication ended. Damn idiots. I didn't invest so much to keep Ranger Verhen under my command just to lose him to preserve a crappy array. Even if he wasn't there, I would think twice before putting at risk one of the Inez's daughters on a whim, but two of them. I like my head where it is. Once he managed to calm down, he called his secretary and instructed him to update the status of the expedition. I don't know whether those professors suffer just from hubris or dementia, and I don't care. Flag their personal files as unfit to command for the next missions. Meanwhile, in the cave, Lith was sighing in relief, I'm not willing to risk my life for those morons, worst case scenario I'd have been forced to commit insubordination. Luckily for me, Berian earned his spot by working in the field. He thought. Chapter 645 the silver lining is that now we know who is worth protecting and who is just dead weight. Sola said, making Lith worry about her mental condition, she was perfectly fine, it was just that the closer she got to achieve her human body, the more protective toward Lith she became. Sola still valued all lives, but she was willing to make sacrifices to preserve her own happiness. To her, a bunch of suicidal idiots wasn't worth the risk of a lifetime of solitude, many of the professors swallowed loudly, thinking they had just signed their own death warrant. Garku, instead, wasn't worried. Berian was just a single man that coincidentally was in charge. There were many others in the army that would share her vision and help her to protect her status, it's pointless to worry about a minor failure. Bureaucrats only care about results. If I bring back something valuable, this blunder will be dismissed as an insignificant incident. She thought, the expedition team started to examine the array down to the smallest details, double-checking everything. Quilla was very annoyed by the prolonged wait. She was eager to see what was on the other side of the wall. It took them half a day to complete their study, and another half to make sure that their spell would destroy the formation in the safest way possible. The morning of the second day after Quilla's epiphany, the spell was finally cast, just as Professor Neschel had predicted, by tampering with the sixth hidden array formed by the overlapping of the other five, their finely balanced structure collapsed. Two arrays were destroyed, while the other three became purely ornamental, the door unlocked, turning on its hinges as if it had been properly preserved for all that time. Moss and dirt fell from its crevices, throwing up a lot of dust. Oh shit! Was the collective opinion of the expedition the moment they could see what was waiting for them. Kula wasn't a city, a village, nor a shelter. It was formed by long rectangular buildings that looked all the same. They had been built out of some unknown pale blue material that was neither rock nor metal. It emitted a bright luminescence that made the whole area around the buildings as clear as the day. The roads connecting the buildings were covered by a layer of dust several centimeters thick. It proved how no creature, living or not, had walked them during the last decades, each facility had only one access, consisting of wide double doors made of metal, and no windows. Each door was sealed by a yellow array visible to the naked EYE.IT was shaped like three concentric circles inscribed with unknown runes, and fueled by both purple crystals and the mana giza underlying cooler, with life vision, Lith could see that there were cable-like devices that ran across the whole compound, carrying the world energy to the various arrays, including those the expedition team had just deactivated. This is a fucking military base. Morik said, taking the words right out of everyone's mouth. Lith, what do you see? Floria asked. Her question made no sense to the others, yet no one dared to move. Any country would react to intruders accessing to a secret compound with extreme prejudice. The ODI were likely to have left a lot of nasty surprises behind. The coast is clear, but we can't allow ourselves to relax. Everything, and I mean everything, is still perfectly functional. He pointed at the arrays on the doors, which were supposed to have faded centuries before. Lith started to chant gibberish while preparing his spells, quickly followed by Morik and Floria's soldiers. Once he was done with his preparations, he took a step forward. The door and the stone wall started to flash with bright red color and emitted a high-pitched noise. The surviving arrays activated one after another, but because of the damage they had sustained, they could only produce a series of sparks and sizzling before imploding with a thud, Lith kept watching around, waiting for something to happen. Morik's log, add to my report how the old fossils would have been the death of us if we didn't destroy the arrays before entering. He said, drawing on himself several mean looks, Morik was about to reply when Lith's prudence paid off. Life vision showed to him a life force rushing through the several centimeters thick dust layer covering the floor, making it come to life. It took the form of a colossus over three meters, ten feet, tall with bright yellow eyes. Aside from the eyes, it had no features nor definite shape. The whole dust cloud was its body, and the creature used it to try and drown Lith. Oh gods! A sand golem! Said Professor Elkers in a panic. It's supposed to be impossible. Where the heck might the core of that thing be? Floria didn't care if it was possible or not, the only things worrying her were that it was standing right in front of them and that Lith had yet to react. Hold your fire! She said while raising her open hand in the air to reinforce her command, sand golem my ass. Lith thought. Golems have no life force whereas this thing is alive. The obvious response would be to burn it, but if it was me, I would have filled the air with something volatile. Even finely dispersed flour is highly flammable and if this thing is what I think it is, the resulting explosion might kill me. Lith was right about almost everything. The creature in front of him was alive and flammable, but it wasn't an explosion the real threat fire posed. It was a fungus-like creature he was facing and the dust was actually its spores. Putting it ablaze would have caused a small explosion strong enough to send them flying everywhere, killing the expedition in a matter of seconds. The creature was capable of moving each spore individually and was using them to flood Lith's respiratory system, making it impossible for him to breathe or cast new spells. The spores were also able to feed upon their host and drain their fluids to increase their numbers. Surviving to such multi-pronged attack was nigh impossible. 
unless of course one had fusion magic. The darkness coursing through Lith's body fed on the spores and turned them into nourishment while invigoration allowed him to study their attack pattern. Ingenious. Lith said while releasing a series of darkness magic pulses that slaughtered his grain-sized opponents. The fungus emitted a prolonged, bass noise that Lith interpreted as pain, the creature retrieved all of its spores, condensing them to assume a physical form. Gods there are so many things we can learn from the ODI. Professor Garku said while following Lith's lead and releasing a wave of darkness energy. The creature opened its body in response, letting the spell harmlessly pass through the empty space it had created. Lith would have liked to give the professor a piece of his mind, but the eyes of the creature were drawing his attention. There was no fury, pain, or battle spirit in them. Lith knew that look, it was how Carl and Tista looked at him when they were little.it was hope. Chapter 646. That thing is no golem, it's alive. Lith yelled without averting his gaze from the fungal creature in front of him. Life vision and mana sense kept scanning the surroundings, trying to make sense of the creature's odd behavior, hope. What kind of fool would look at his sworn enemy with hope? Lith thought as a black aura enveloped his body, protecting him from the deadly spores. Maybe you're looking at the issue from the wrong angle. Why would a seemingly immortal creature bother to defend this place? The ODI are no more, and if Mogar's fungi are like those on earth, killing one is nigh impossible. Especially if the spores share a hive mind. One of them is enough to regenerate the whole creature from scratch. Solus pointed out, it shouldn't care. Unless it's bound to this place, of course. Lith thought, his train of thoughts was interrupted by the creature using earth magic to make a hail of stalactites fall from above. Lith had no problem dodging them, but the creature grabbed and used them as clubs. The spores arranged themselves in tendrils capable of freely attacking Lith from every direction. The pseudo arms had no bones nor joints, so they could change their trajectory at any time, forcing Lith to blink away before being trapped. We need to help him. Kalil, Professor Syndra's assistant, was tired of waiting on the sidelines. Unlike the others, he wasn't just a theoretician. One of his specializations was Battle Mage. A wave of his hand unleashed the tier 5 spell, Fire Arms. A volley of flaming hands the size of an adult intercepted the clubs and clawed at the enemy at the same time. Each one of the magical hands was made out of air and cyan flames. The wind element allowed them to grab anything without inflicting harm, or could boost the flame's intensity at any given time according to the situation. If it's a sand golem like Professor Garku says, my spell will turn it into glass. If it's a living being like Ranger Verhen says, then fire arms will kill it. No matter the species this bird belongs to, mine is the right stone for the kill. Kalil thought. Don't use fire, you idiot. Lith said, crashing Kalil's heroic dreams, the spore cloud exploded with a series of small thumps, spreading the mushroom creature's minuscule limbs past the door. Only those like Floria who had blind trust in Lith had prepared a darkness barrier to protect themselves. All the others resorted to air or earth magic, but such elements couldn't do anything against a pollen-sized attack. Kalil took the brunt of the spore wave, coughing madly while he started to bleed from all of his orifices due to the mycotoxins the creature released as it grew inside his body, the infection spread so fast that it took it seconds to entirely cover the youth's skin. Light magic is useless. Professor Syndra said after his attempt to save his assistant's life only accelerated the spreading of the disease, which was now also covering Syndra's hands. It's a fungus. Lith yelled with his last breath as the creature now enveloped his body widening its own, pummeling at him non-stop with its appendices. Lith could kill the nearby spores with darkness magic, but they were just expendable, the entire cooler was covered in them, giving the creatures almost infinite mass to draw upon. Lith turtled up, infusing his skinwalker with mana so that the orichalcum protected him from head to toe. The spores couldn't touch him anymore and the stalactites were just normal weapons. Thanks to the Thunderbird's plume, the skinwalker was immune to blunt attacks. At least until he had enough mana to keep the armor in its boosted form, any ideas? Lith asked while searching for a way out, working on it. Solus replied. There must be something that forces the creature to stay here. Now that I know the creature's energy signature, I should be able to locate its core from a distance if I focus hard enough. If it has one, though, Floria and Quilla had their own battle to fight. Aside from Morik and Yondra, the rest of the expedition was dying. Quilla could only treat one person at a time, whereas Floria was racking her brain to find a spell that could turn the tides of the battle. Think, Lith think. How do you coerce a plant to do your bidding? A hostage? Nonsense. With a hive mind, one is all and all are one. A slave ring? Even more idiotic. How do you put a ring on a bunch of spores? They would just need to cut off the F, that's it. The hive mind is the key. The ODI must have infected part of the spores with some kind of slave agent. It would be enough to take control of the entire creature due to the consciousness the spores share, if I'm right, the enslaved spores must be somewhere nearby. A place where they are protected by random harm but have enough resources to survive. If it was a sealed container, over time they would have died of starvation, on it. Now that she had at least an idea of what to look for, Solus could restrict her search parameters, even if his intuition was right, Lith had yet to find a way to escape from his predicament. Most of the spells he had at the ready weren't suitable against such a creature and origin flames were now an even worse option than they had been before, even though they were mystical, they were still made of fire, and to make matter worse, they would hurt Lith along with his enemy. He had avoided using them because an explosion made by origin flames might have wiped out both the expedition and Kula. If we get out of here alive, I'm going to ask for a raise. Morik complained while cleansing another professor from the spores. He wasn't much of a caring guy, but he was aware that as soon as the fungus was done with the fossils, he would be its next target. This is never going to work. Quilla blurted out in desperation. With only three healers and fourteen patients, some already in critical condition, fighting the spores as if they were not sentient was a losing battle. She stopped treating Professor Fester and started to spread short and weak pulses of darkness magic all around her. Are you insane? Your spell is going to affect us too. Morik said. No, she is a genius just as you are a moron. Yondra said. The pulses she emits are strong enough to prevent the spores from spreading but weak enough to be stopped by our armors. She's buying us time by acting as a human array. A reckless genius. Yondra thought while treating her next patient as fast as she could. You can't improvise spells, which means she is using first magic. 
covering an area that big, while keeping such fine control over the pulses must put an immense burden on her body, Yondra was right. Unlike awakened ones, fake makes were unable to stimulate their cores to produce more mana without the help of magic words and hand signs. Even producing the effects of a tier 1 spells with first magic would endanger their lives. I in the meantime, Floria had never felt so helpless. The sword and spells she had practiced so hard were useless against the monstrous fungus, especially now that it held Lith inside its clutches. Chapter 647 I can't use fire unless I want to repeat Kalil's mistake. Earth would only squash Lith, the same applies to darkness. I'm no healer, so I can't help the infected. What are the elements I can safely work with? Air and water. Floria thought. A sudden idea popped up inside her head. It was dangerous and likely to backfire, but Floria had learned from her father that she had to fight with the options she had, not those she might want. Regretting to have never learned a single tier 4 war mage spell, she unleashed a barrage of the tier 3 spell, Frostbite. Fake mags couldn't amplify the strength of a spell below tier 5 at will, so Floria had to compensate for the lack of quality with speed and quantity. A frozen wave after another struck the mass of living, spores surrounding Lith, limiting their movements and making those closing in to replace the mass lost due to Lith's dark aura fall to the ground. The fungal cage became thinner by the second as its external layers were frozen and the internal layers were sucked dry by darkness magic. Lith managed to escape by releasing a sudden burst of his aura that scattered the creature's remains away while Floria's unrelenting barrage of spells prevented the spores from taking a physical form again. Why you didn't do that earlier? Lith asked while flying to her side. Because I was afraid that something like that would happen. The moment she stopped casting to catch her breath, the spores broke out of the ice and started to multiply at a terrifying rate. If something that size lived for so long and kept such a huge mass, then the ODI must have left it plenty of food. Food plus lots of water, make the problem even bigger. Lith completed the phrase for her, so she was aware of the risks and yet she used water anyway. How can she still trust me so much that she bet her life on me finding a way to beat this thing? Lith thought, maybe it's not just trust. Maybe she wasn't willing to abandon you. Feelings don't fade just because we want them to. Solus hated it when Lith was so dense, but being cynical also made him blind to the most obvious and cheesy answers. I hate to ask you for this after all the troubles we had to escape from that living prison, but I need you to get back in the belly of the beast. Metaphorically, of course. I can't find anything from here, so if you are right, the corrupted spores are in some place deeper inside Kula. It would explain why the creature didn't attack as soon as the door was opened. Probably if its consciousness gets too far from the corruption, the mind link might be broken. It had to wait for us to be in position, Lith mind whimpered before saying, thanks for your help, Floria. Also, please don't get mad at me. Then he seemingly threw in the gutter all of her efforts by charging at full speed against the spore cloud that was now so big, that it covered the entire cooler from her sight, I really hope Lith does have a plan. Otherwise, that creature will have to get in line to kill him, because I call dibs. Floria thought as she was now left alone against a raging storm of deadly spores, only half the creature was following Lith. The remaining half was determined on crossing the entrance and dealing the finishing blow to the crippled expedition team. Then, it would have all the time to focus on the last invader standing, well, at least protecting is what I do best. Floria activated her tier 5 mage knight spell, Death Bastion. It conjured a stone wall infused with darkness magic that quickly replaced the open door, sealing Kula as entrance. The spores tried to seep through the crevices in the newly formed rock, but darkness magic killed them faster than they could advance. Then, the creature tried to overpower Floria's control with its own earth magic, but tier 5 magic allowed her to infuse her will inside her spell. On top of that, darkness magic wouldn't make a distinction between the spores and their mana. It devoured them both, giving Floria an edge in the willpower tug of war for the control of the earth surrounding the city gate. On the other side of the gate, Lith moved as fast as a bullet, using waves of dark energy to force the enemy to open a path for him. At the same time, he cancelled some of the spells he had at the ready, and started weaving new ones that were better suited to handle his current situation, this plan sucks so badly for so many reasons. Lith thought. The ODI should have ordered the creature to protect the container holding the corrupted spores. The closer I get, the more focused on me the creature will become. If on one hand it will help me to understand how close I am from my destination, on the other hand, it's also likely that once I become its only mark, things will get even more difficult, Lith flew above cooler as blue buildings, but kept himself away from the ceiling. The fungal creature had already proved to be able to manipulate earth and the fight was already unfair as it was. Tidal waves of spores were surrounding Lith from all sides. They couldn't keep up with his speed, but they had no need to. The creature was slowly collecting all of its mass, sealing all the possible way outs with living walls made of spores mixed with earth. Each one of the walls was at least 2 meters, 6.6 .6 feet, thick and kept expanding by the second. Their hardness was also increasing, making them able to withstand most tier 3 spells without effort. The creature had spent centuries trapped inside Kula, with nothing to do but eat, multiply, and develop its skills, found it. Solus said. Same energy signature, but stuck below the ground. In front of the third building on your left, the moment Lith came 100 meters, 330 feet, close to the container, the defense order took priority. The entirety of the creature moved against Lith, giving Floria and the healers the respite they so desperately needed. Even the spores infecting the expedition members willingly abandoned their victims and tried to reunite with the main body. Unfortunately for them, the moment they were far enough from the humans, Floria, Quilla, Yondra, and Morik shot a darkness pulse that wiped them out from the face of Mogar. Quilla collapsed as soon as she made sure that her patients were alive, not a second sooner. Yondra cursed at her old age. She had not much stamina left and Quilla was not faring any better than the victims of the spores, Morik was whistling. He had done his part so he could pretend to be exhausted and wash his hands of the rest. I in the meantime, Lith had just landed on the spot Solus had identified. He conjured his tier 5 spell, setting Sunday. It generated a globe made of darkness imbued flames around him to act as his last stand. I'll stall for time, you take care of the container. He said, Solus glove detached from Lith's arm, using invigoration to make sure there weren't hidden traps or arrays, while Lith filled the space of 10 meters, 33 feet, around himself with black flames, his own magic couldn't harm him nor Solus, whereas it would incinerate the fungal creature as if it was paper thrown into the fire. Chapter 648. Lith's problem was that if you toss enough paper at once, it can end up smothering the flames, fuck me sideways. 
I wish I had added the air element to the mix. A tornado of black flames would be much harder to overpower. Lith thought while looking at the incoming avalanche, again, only hindsight is 100% correct. Solus replied. Plus, making two elements coexist is already hard. If there was a third one, you would be complaining about not having enough mana to maintain it active for long, as she had feared, the container was protected by several arrays. They were layered one upon the other, to force the enemy to waste their time deactivating them one by one. It was a perfect plan since with the fungal creature on a rampage, Lith and Solus didn't have more than a few seconds at their disposal. Even an invigorated setting sun could only hold for so long. I really hope you ODI are all dead, otherwise I'm going to kill you. Lith said while making the black flame so tightly packed that they almost became solid. The first tidal wave of spore was turned into ash on impact, but the second one managed to penetrate the barrier, and the third went deeper. Tons of spores were crashing on him non-stop from every direction, Lith was too focused on slowing their advance to keep his breathing rhythm. Invigoration had been sealed by the simple raw power of the creature's onslaught. Did they really devise this strategy to fight awakened ones? Lith thought while the enemy was seconds away from eating his face, nah. You know the ODI. Too arrogant to admit that the devil is in the details. Solus said as the arrays collapsed in unison, allowing her to destroy the corrupted spores. The moment the creature was freed from the mind control spell, it stopped its attack, after that, most of the cloud died, leaving only enough spores to form a humanoid figure that creepily resembled Lith down to the smallest details. He had no idea it was the creature's way to show respect toward a member of another race, thanks, human. Even though we doubt that freeing us was your real purpose, we can't argue with results nor justify our attempts to end your life. The creature said. Unfortunately, Lith couldn't understand the beast's language, let alone miss its dot he used that moment of respite to rekindle setting sun back to its full power. You have no idea of the pain we endured. Centuries of slavery spent having our mind violated every day, and forced to increase our numbers despite the pain having our consciousness split between such a big colony inflicted to us. We'll hinder you no more. May the Great Mother bless you. The lith-looking creature beckoned with its hand and a small ring floated in the space between them, we don't know if it's powerful or not. Its magic comes from the accursed ODI and it's useless to us. We pray it will aid you in your journey. Please, forgive us. The creature gave him a deep bow before bolting away. Only when Solus and Life Vision confirmed Lith that there were no more spores did he lower his spell, okay. First of all, how the heck did you crack so many arrays that fast? He asked while using spirit magic to lift the ring before studying it with Life Vision. Lith had no idea what it was, but he could recognize blue glowing runes when he saw them. It was actually an incredibly menial task. What do so many powerful arrays need to work? She asked while studying the ring with her mana sense. Its pseudo core wasn't very complex and the gem on top of it was just green. It made both Lith and Solus very happy. A lot of mana. So? Lith replied, do you see mana crystals around here? No. Wait, don't tell me that. Lith couldn't believe that an entire race could be so shrewd and yet so idiotic, bingo. I just cut the mana crystal cable that supplied the arrays with the world energy from the mana geezer and they dissipated. Easy as flipping a switch. Solus wrapped herself around Lith's arm before returning to her ring form, Morans. As for the gift the creature left us, it must be a trinket someone lost and never bothered picking it up. Which is awesome. It might as well be our Rosetta Stone for studying runes. Lith thought, putting the ring inside his pocket dimension, Lith had already returned to his peak condition thanks to invigoration. He flew back to Kulara's gates, to check on Floria and Quilla. Maybe on Yondra too. The rest of the expedition might as well die for what he cared. It's me. Let me out, the creature is gone and the area is safe. Lith said once he reached the Death Bastion. What's my mother's name? Floria asked. She wasn't leaving their lives up to chance. For what she knew, someone or something might have been imitating Lith's voice. Journey. Your father is Orion and your dog Lucky. In name and in fact. Floria dispelled Death Bastion, giving Lith a solid punch in the stomach right before hugging him with enough strength to squeeze out the little air left in his lungs. Thank the gods you're all right. You almost scared me to death. Again. She quickly searched his body for injuries and when she found none she said, please, help Quilla. She's not getting better. Floria had no idea how he could still be so energetic and couldn't care less. Kalil was dead and many others were on the brink of death, Quilla included. Yondra was deathly pale, her breathing was irregular and she had barely enough life force to remain conscious. Morak was black, blue, and pale as well. Once the creature had ceased its attack, Floria had politely demanded that he pulled his weight, Lith first checked on Quilla. Her life force was so faint that it couldn't hold her mana core together. It was still intact, but her body was already past the point of recovery. Unless one could use invigoration, of course, Lith had her drink a tonic and gave enough life force to fill two balls. Only then did her condition stabilize and her skin turn from pale to pink. Lith then gave a bit of life force to Yondra before moving on to the others. Floria's soldiers and the rest of the assistants were just unconscious. The proper treatments and Quilla's care had prevented them from dying on the spot, but unlike them, the professors weren't so young anymore. They all need life force and I've not enough for all of them. I can save one, maybe two, but the rest is up to their luck and constitution. Saving them all would have meant revealing his secret. Lith wasn't willing to put at risk his entire life work for a bunch of self-entitled strangers. Use mine. Floria offered him her hand, which he promptly examined. That makes two more tops. Which means that one or two of them have to die. Make your decision, Captain. In that moment, he wasn't speaking as her friend, but as her field healer. Floria didn't think twice about her answer, and she hated herself for it. Save those who are more likely to survive. It's pointless to waste life force on those who might die even after getting treated. On the battlefield, terrible words had been invented. Resource management, collateral damage, rules of engagement, they were all fancy terms to describe the forms of murder that the human society considered acceptable. Chapter 649. Lith didn't play favorites and obeyed his orders. Professor Garku was his first choice being the youngest among her peers and the language expert. Then came Professor Neshel. 
her condition was as bad as the others, but she was the only master warden in the group so Lif presumed he might still need her help. After saving them, Lif had enough strength to save only one professor. His choice was between Professor Elkus from the Fire Griffin, the one who was better at deciphering the ODI language, and Professor Syndra, who was a war mage. The ODI's protections were all heavyweight and Syndra could kill dozens of enemies with a single spell. Professor Fester from the White Griffin was the most useless member of the team. Aside from a historian, she was also a master alchemist and a mage knight. The former was inconsequential for the expedition and the latter was ruined by his old age. This is up to you, Floria. Both of them can be useful in their own way and their survival rate is identical. Lif said. He was panting and his breathing was irregular. Using so many times tier 4 healing magic without invigoration was truly exhausting, thank the god Squilla is still unconscious. She would cry her eyes out knowing the old, meek Fester is going to die. Floria thought. She wasn't faring any better than Lif. It was her life force he was using now, and even after drinking a tonic and eating some food, she still needed rest to recover. Is it impossible to save them both? She asked. Lif shook his head in reply. Then save Elkers. So far, all the threats we faced required more brain than bronze, not to mention that Syndra's contribution to the expedition has less significance compared to Elkers. When Lith was done, both Floria and he were on the verge of fainting. Why didn't you ask Morik to contribute? He asked, glad that Solus was able to keep watch and that it would only take him a few breaths to recover in case something else happened. Because he is already tired from all the healing he performed. We need at least one person able to stand guard while we rest. Floria fell asleep the moment she finished her explanation. Lith followed her lead after using invigoration to restore half of his strength, just to be safe. Luckily, the arrays were all still standing since Professor Neshel was alive and well. Morik's guard duty was hellish due to his fatigue, but relatively safe. When Lith woke up, bad news was waiting for the survivors of the expedition team. Professors Fester and Syndra were dead, and so was Nilla, Professor Garku's assistant. Many tears were being shed, either due to shock or for the loss of precious friends. The professors had known each other for years, and even if they were rivals, they still respected their competition. On top of that, seeing a veteran mage die that easily filled their hearts with the fear of being the next one to fall. Reyna was crying like a lamb sent to slaughter. The easiest expedition, my ass. We're dying like flies. Professor Yondra, please, I want to go home. Field work is bound to be unpredictable, son. We came searching for ruins and we found a military compound. No one could have predicted this outcome, otherwise the team would have been assembled very differently. It was Kalil's naivety that brought this disaster upon himself and us as well. She replied, bursting into a violent cough she was unable to repress. To save her beloved assistant, the old professor had given her all and some more, Reyna regained his cool, performing on his mentor a quick diagnostic spell. Oh gods, Professor Yondra, what have you done? Don't speak, you need to rest. He forced her to lie down. Despite her protests, Yondra was now weaker than a child and unable to get up without help, thinking about his previous words. Reyna felt like an egotistical prick. He went in search of a healer while cursing himself for his helplessness. Quilla was still asleep, the professors were still weakened, leaving only Morik or Lith as a possible choice. Professor Yondra and Ranger Verhen are in a good relationship. He should be willing to help. Reyna thought. The youth was shocked seeing the ranger's appearance, Floria and Morik had suffered no damage as well, but even after eight hours they still bore the signs of exhaustion. Floria was slightly pale and had bags under her eyes, despite having plenty of sleep, Lith, instead, looked like someone who had just arrived there after a relaxing vacation. How is this possible? You have fought that thing, healed people, and yet you look amazing. Do you have a reason to disturb me or are you just hitting on me? Lith had relieved Morik from guard duty for a while, to allow his fellow ranger to get some sleep. Reyna inwardly cursed and explained to him how dire Yondra's condition was. Lith wouldn't have believed a single word if not for the honest fear he could see in Reyna's eyes. It's impossible. I personally checked on her before going to sleep, but taking a second look can't hurt. You stay here and if any of the traps I set up make a single noise, scream. Reyna nodded, staring at the tunnels in front of him as they were the open moors of as many beasts, ready to release unknown horrors upon him. He was scared of them, but he was terrified at the idea of losing the closest thing to a family he had ever had, so he calmed his heart and kept an ear to the ground, Lif discovered that Yondra's condition was actually worse than Reyna had described. Her life force was such a mess that he needed to use his tier 5 scanner and chisel spells to stabilize her, the moment he was done, she opened her eyes abruptly. What the heck did you do to damage yourself that badly? Lif asked. I simply did what was necessary. Reyna and the other assistants needed help. If it wasn't for this old body, the poor Nilla would still be alive. I collapsed before treating her. Yondra sighed. That was stupid of you, it almost cost you your life. Nilla was barely twenty. She has had all her life in front of her whereas I squandered mine. I spent so much time researching magic that I almost lost my family. 